Got them! Yes, ladies and gentlemen, we've got the names of the winners in the first big jingle contest, and we're going to announce them later in this program. So stay tuned while new post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, you aren't going to let them get away. I don't have any choice, Patsy. You bet you haven't. You got your name on that confession, sister? Yes. Here it is. Give it to me. I have to sign it, too. Oh, brother, wait till this story gets around town. Nick Carter lets a killer get away. And even furnishes the car the killer escapes in. (laughs) Ha-ha! It'll be the biggest laugh of the year. And now, the case of the absent clue. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. As a good businessman... Jeff Greeley never overlooks the chance to put his merchandise in a new and promising location. The merchandise in this case is little slips of paper with numbers on them. They sell for whatever you want to pay, from a nickel on up. And the new location Jeff has in mind is a small suburban candy store owned by Paul Elliott and his wife Ruth. Right now, Jeff is giving the Elliots a sales talk. Your cut ought to double the profits on this joint, Mr. Elliott. You'll get a big play from the kids at that school down the street. Listen, the numbers game is a racket. When I sink so low that I have to cheat school kids out of nickels and dimes and start them gambling with their lunch money... Elliot, you've got the only place in this neighborhood that fits in with my plans. Then you'll have to change your plans. There was another guy that didn't want to cooperate. Somebody busted all his plate glass windows one night. You can't scare me. The other guy wasn't scared either. It wasn't until after a couple of guys slugged him that he decided to play ball with us. Paul, phone for the police. Don't bother, Elliot. I'm going. But I'll call around again in a couple of days. Maybe you'll change your mind. That's the place, Barney. Slow down till I heave this brick. Easy now. A bullseye. Now step on it. Anything interesting in the mail, Nick? No, not so far, Patsy. Say, what have you got there? A new fountain pen? Oh, no. It's one of those tear gas guns that looks like a fountain pen. Sergeant Matheson gave it to me. Oh, he did? Uh-huh. That yeah, was nice of him, wasn't it? Yeah, sort of handy to have in your purse, don't you think? Uh, sort of dangerous, if you ask me. Tear gas is nothing to fool with. Oh, Nick. Well, what do you know? What is it? This letter. It's from a fellow I haven't heard of since we were kids. Paul Elliott. Oh, I thought it was a case. And maybe. You know who Jeff Greeley is? Small-time racketeer, isn't he? Yeah, He's running a numbers game in the suburbs now. Oh? And a crooked one at that. Hmm. Huh. He's trying to strong-arm Paul into peddling the number slips for him. Strong-arming? How? Well, Paul and his wife have a small confectionery store out in Beechwood. Yeah? The front window's been smashed twice. And Greeley's warned him that next time it'll be a lot more serious unless Paul gives in. Well, can't the police do anything? Not without proof. And Greeley's too smart to let him get anything on him. Hmm. You know, I think I'll drive out there this evening and talk it over with Paul. Oh, you can't go tonight, Nick. Oh, why not? Because tonight's the annual banquet of the Downtown Boys Club, and you're the guest of honor. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, I'll go afterwards then. And I want to put this off, Betsy. No telling when Greeley will pay Paul another visit. Well, that's the store there on the right. The one the two men are coming out of? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, you can park right behind that green sedan that the men are getting into. Oh, yeah, no. Hey, by George. Huh? The one with the yellow gloves. That was Jeff Greeley. Jeff Greeley? What? Do you think we ought to follow them? 
No, not now. I, I want to see what's happened inside the shop. Okay. Come on. Well, at least they haven't thrown any bombs or smashed another window. That's right. Well, I'm worried. Hmm? Paul said Greeley promised him the next time it'd be more serious. Help! Please help me! Yes, what is it? Oh, my, my husband, he, he's hurt. Are you Mrs. Elliot? Yes, I, my husband, he, he's in the back there. Please do something. I'll go, Patsy. You stay here with her. Yes. Oh, Mrs. Elliot, what happened? Those men, the two that just left, they hit him. They... No, don't worry. Everything will be all right. How is he, Nick? Shall I call an ambulance? No. That won't be necessary. You mean he's, he's all right? I'm afraid not, Mrs. Elliot. Paul's dead. Oh. Dead? Oh, Nick, she's fainted. Oh, I shouldn't have broken the news to her so abruptly. Oh. Here, Patsy, take care of her. I'll call Maddie and tell her to put out a general alarm for Jeff Greeley on a charge of murder. All right, the police will be here in a few minutes, Patsy. How is she? Still unconscious, Nick. I just dipped my handkerchief in cold water at the soda fountain. I'll wipe her face with it. You've got it smeared with makeup. Oh, no, I won't. She isn't wearing any. You mean that peaches and cream effect is natural? Of course it is. Some women are lucky. Oh, she's coming out of it. How do you feel, Mrs. Elliot? I... Who are you? My name's Carter. I'm a private investigator. I used to know Paul years ago. You said... You said Paul was... Please, Mrs. Elliot, try to tell us what happened. Paul. Paul and I stayed late to unpack some new stock. He was opening the crates in the back room, and, and I was in the storeroom when Jeff Creeley and that other man came in. How long ago was that? Oh, it was only a few minutes ago. I heard Paul quarreling with him, and, and the sound of a fight, and then... Yes? I came out of the storeroom just in time to see... to see Creeley. The one who was wearing yellow gloves? Yes, that's him. He picked up the crowbar Paul had been using to open the crates, and... And he hit him with it. Did they see you? No, I don't think so. When Paul fell, they, they ran out the front way. Yes, we saw them leave as we drove up. <laughs> no, he did. Oh, Paul. Well, try to control yourself, oh, Mrs. Elliot, please. I used to nag him, but he didn't make more money. But oh. it was only because I loved him and wanted to be proud of him. Of course it was. And now... Now it's too late. Mrs. Elliot, if you can identify Paul's killers... I can. I saw them kill him. And I'll never rest until those men are in the electric chair. Well, did you find anything, Nick? No, no, Matty. This ledger of Greeley's is the only thing in the whole apartment. Yeah, there's plenty of evidence in it to convict Greeley of running a numbers racket, but that ain't important now. Hey, wait. Huh? Here's an interesting item. What? October 17th. Farm, $18,375. Oh, can you imagine a bright light character like Jeff Greeley buying a farm? What would he do with a farm? <laughs> Use it as a hideout, and I'll bet that's where he is right now. Hey, you're probably right, Nick. But we don't know where this farm is located. If he bought it for a hideout, the chances are it ain't even in his name. Well, some of his friends might know, if we could get them to talk. Yeah, well, maybe. We'll round up a few of them and try anyway. Yeah. Oh, uh, how about the medical examiner's report, Matty? Bruises, contusions, cut on the left eye. Oh, they must have beaten him pretty badly. And then finished him off with a crowbar. Oh, it's going to be a pleasure to get my hands on those guys. I don't suppose there were any fingerprints on the crowbar, Sergeant. Huh? No, Patsy, not a single one. What? Well, why should there be, Nick? Greeley was wearing gloves. That's right. Greeley was wearing yellow gloves. Well, now, look, we don't need a fingerprint. Mrs. Elliot's testimony will be enough to convict those two rats. Yeah, but if anything happened to her, you wouldn't have any case at all against Greeley. Nothing is going to happen, Patsy. We got her in a downtown hotel under an assumed name. Where? She's registered at the Kemble Arms on East 49th Street under the name of Mrs. Anna Davis. Yes? Mrs. Elliot? No, no, I... My name's Anna Davis. <laughs> I know, Mrs. Elliot. It's all right. I'm William Jeffords from the district attorney's office. Oh, oh I didn't know. 
There have been a couple of new developments in the case, Mrs. Elliott, and the D.A. wants to see you in his office right away. All right. Just a minute. I'll get my... This is the car, Mrs. Elliott. Here, I'll open the door. Thank you. I... That man at the wheel. That's Jeff Greeley. Get in there. Ah! Nice work, Eddie. Now, you keep a quiet back there. I got some driving to do. Swiftly, Jeff Greeley heads the car toward his upstate hideout. While in the back seat, struggling helplessly, is the woman whose story could send him to the electric chair, if she lives to tell it. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the absent clue. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Jeff Greeley, racketeer and gangster, has kidnapped Ruth Elliott, the murdered man's wife, and the only person who could testify that he killed Paul Elliott. At headquarters, Nick and Matty have just learned that Mrs. Elliott has disappeared from the downtown hotel where they had her registered under an assumed name. Greeley did this, Nick. It's got to be Greeley. The doorman at the hotel saw two men force her into a car, but they got away before he could call a cop. Oh, there's no use getting excited, Matty. Oh, how long do you think Greeley is going to let her live, knowing her story will send him to the chair? But how do they find out where she was, Sergeant? I checked that, Patsy. They yeah. used the old registered letter gun. Huh? The man went to Mrs. Elliott's apartment with a letter she had to sign for personally, and the superintendent told him where she was. The superintendent? But how did he know? I told her not to let anybody know. He said that after she found what hotel we put her in, she called him and gave him the address in case of an emergency. Well, we've sure got the emergency. Now, you can say that again. We've got to work fast. Oh, sure, sure. But what do we work on? The location of that hideout Greeley has in the country. Nick, we've been working on that and got exactly nowhere. Matty, Greeley's brother would know where it is if anybody would. Nick, we questioned him for over an hour this morning. All right, then. We're going to question him some more. Okay, okay. I'll have him brought up. But I tell you, it's no use, Nick. Pete Greeley's dumb, but he's plenty tough. Okay, it's up to us to be just a little bit tougher. <laughs> Will you guys lay off of me? I tell you, I don't know nothing. Don't give me that, Pete. Your brother Jeff bought a farm last October, and you know it. Uh, Listen, you lame brain stumble bum. I'm going to make you tell me where that farm is if it takes me from now until Christmas. I tell you, I never heard of no farm. Hey, wait, 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 Matty. Just had an idea. Yeah? We can find where that farm is. By consulting the state registrar of deeds. Well, how will that help if he bought it under a different name? Well, we know the farm was bought on October 17th and that he paid $18,375 for it. So what? So we checked the records. It's not likely that more than one farm changed hands for that exact price on that particular day. Hey, Nick, you got something there. Yeah, Matty, we'll have the exact location of that farm inside of four hours. Yeah. Well, what about Pete here? You can't hold me. I ain't done nothing. Why, you No, 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 no. Wait, Matty. You may as well let him go. Okay, okay. But I hope you come back to see us, Pete, when you can stay for a long, long time. Hey. I want to send a telegram. Well, <laughs> that's what we're in business for. Uh, uh, do you have it written out? Yeah, 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 right here. And it's got to go fast, see? Naturally. Our telegram's always... Uh, what is this first word? James. J-A-M-S. It's a guy's name. Oh, oh yes, of course. James, uh, Crane, is it? That's Graham. What's the matter, stupid? Can't you read? Well, uh... Hey, I... hey, hey, give me it. I'll read it to you. I don't want no mistakes. Uh, yes, that would be best. Uh, James Graham, Rural Route 6, Box 124. Rural Route? Oh, there'll be an extra charge for messenger service, uh, unless they have a phone. Okay, stupid, so send a messenger. They got no phone. Uh, Horton's Grove, New York. Dear James, your friends from downtown are coming up to see you. Never mind that, Pete. I'll take that. Carter, where'd you come? I've been trailing you ever since you left headquarters. 
Why do you think we let you go? Uh, just a moment. I'll have to have that paper. Forget it. I'm going to deliver this message personally. Is this the place? This is it. Oh. But where's Greeley's car? Do you suppose he didn't come here after all? Somebody's been here. Look at those tire tracks. Well, then if he's gone, we're too late. No harm in looking around. Better stand to one side. Okay. We're going to knock on the door. We might get bullets for an answer. Well, be careful, Nick. Do you hear anything? Not a sound. Is it locked? Yeah, and I'm going to break it in. Those tire tracks prove they had some reason for coming here. And it may have been to, to dispose of a body. Oh, Nick, I hope not. Here it goes. Now, let's see what we can find in here. Good. But, listen. Do you hear that? Yes. Seems to be from this room over here. Yes. Nick, it's Mrs. Elliot, bound and gagged. And she's alive. Oh, thank heavens. You untie the gag, Patsy, while I get these ropes off her hands and feet. Right, Nick. Uh, there you are, Mrs. Elliot. Oh. Are you hurt? No, no, I'm all right. I... I heard your voices now. I started pounding my heels on the floor. That's the tapping we heard. All right, now you're loose. Tell me, did Jeff Greeley bring you here? Yes, he and two other men. They said they were going to kill me. Where are they now? I heard them say something about going into town for cigarettes. Well, then we better hurry. We've got to get away before they come back. Yeah. What? What's your rush? Oh. Really? You can all relax now, because you're not going nowhere till I say so. Jeff Greeley stands in the doorway, a revolver in his hand. And it appears that instead of rescuing Ruth Elliott, Nick and Patsy are themselves caught in the same trap. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of the case of the absent clue, today's adventure with Nick Carter. Nick and Patsy found Ruth Elliott bound and gagged in the deserted farmhouse where she had been taken by Jeff Greeley. But just as they were about to leave... Greeley appeared in the doorway, a revolver in his hand. You can all relax now, because you're not going nowhere. You got back from town with those cigarettes in a hurry, didn't you, Greeley? I never went. Barney and Eddie took the car, and I stayed here to keep an eye on things. That was smart. Now keep on being smart and put away that gun. I'll put it away. After I make sure that you three ain't going to talk now or ever. Nobody's going to get away with framing me. Framing you? Yeah. If I fry, it won't be for something I didn't do. Well, if that's all that's worrying you, Greeley, you can put that gun back in your pocket. I know you didn't kill Paul Elliott. What's that? He did. He did. I saw him. No, Mrs. Elliott. You killed your husband. She I did? Can... It's a lie. That's why you kidnapped her, isn't it, Greeley? Why, sure. I've been trying to make her tell the truth so that I'd be cleared. I can understand that. What chance would I have in a court when it's my word against hers? You wouldn't have any chance. Unless you had a confession from her, signed and witnessed. Yeah, and that's what I've been trying to get. And I'll get it, too, or else. I won't do it. I won't. He can kill me first. I see your point, Mrs. Elliot. You'd rather be shot than go through a trial and die in the electric chair. You can't prove a thing, any of you. Look, Mrs. Elliot, how about this? If you did sign such a confession, and Patsy and I witnessed it... Greeley might be willing to let you take my car and get away. So why not? I'll hold Carter and the girl here long enough for you to get clear out of the country. No, I didn't do it. It's your only chance, Mrs. Elliot. You ain't kidding. I... You'd really keep him here long enough for me to get out of the country. Yeah, and I'll give you enough dough to do it with. All I want is to clear myself. Well, all right, I'll do it. Good. Now, here, I got a pencil. And she can use the paper and Patsy's notebook to write the confession out. Oh, but Nick, you're not going to let her go. Not really. Do you see any other choice? No, but... Then give her the notebook. Oh, Nick, you must be... Patsy. Oh, here. Now write as I dictate, Mrs. Elliot. Go ahead. I hereby confess that I killed my husband, Paul Elliot, and that Jeff Greeley is completely innocent. Now, sign it. There. Sign your name as witness, Patsy. Well, I... 
All right. You... You are going to keep him here, aren't you? You bet I am, but not for your sake, sister. I just want everyone to know that somebody finally got the best of Nick Carter. What do I do with this, Nick, now that I've signed it? Well, hand me the notebook and pencil. I have to witness it, too. Wait till it gets around town that Nick Carter let a killer get away and even furnished it with a car to get away in. <laughs> It'll be the biggest laugh of the year. Better than stopping a bullet, though. Oh, I broke the point on this pencil. Uh, Patsy, let me have your fountain pen. My fountain? Yes, you have it in your purse, haven't you? Oh, oh, yes, yes, of course, Nick. Hold it, sister. What? What's the matter? Just toss that purse over here, baby. I'll get that fountain pen for him. Oh, all right. Here. That's a girl. I just want to make sure you didn't pull any tricks. Here's the pen, Carter. Oh, you know I wouldn't try any tricks at a smart boy like you, Jeff. Oh, there's no ink in this pen. Huh? I'm afraid I'll have to use tear gas. <laughs> All right, let's go of the gun, really. Let go. I've got the confession <laughs> bit. Give me Don't move, gun. Mrs. Elliott. Yes, I don't know when you are. You keep your hands up, too, Greeley. Oh, Nick, my gas. Go on, through the door, Greeley. <coughs> we'll wait for the rest of your gang out where there's some fresh air. <laughs> Nick, would that confession Mrs. Elliot signed have held good in court? Oh, not for a minute, Patsy. It was obtained under duress. But the one she signed when we got her to headquarters will hold good anywhere, especially with the proof we have to present to a jury. And I suppose that clears Jeff Greeley completely. Clears him of the murder charge, but he still faces a sentence for extortion, assault and battery, carrying a gun, operating the numbers racket, and kidnapping. Golly. It's going to be a good many years till he'll be a free man again. How did you know he didn't kill Elliot? I didn't know. Hmm? But I began to wonder when Mrs. Elliot overdid the heartbroken wife act by pulling that phony faint. Phony? Why, it looked perfectly real to me. Ah, but it wasn't, though. When you faint, Patsy, the blood rushes from the head and you become very, very pale. Oh, so that's why you were surprised that her makeup didn't come off when I bathed her face. Mm Mm-hmm. She still had that peaches and cream expression. But that wasn't any reason to accuse her of murder. You must have had another clue. I did. A clue that wasn't there. A clue that wasn't... Oh, what do you mean? Remember, there weren't any fingerprints on the crowbar that Paul Elliott was killed with? Well, why should there be any? Greeley was wearing gloves. True enough, but Elliott had been working with a crowbar, and he wasn't wearing gloves. His prints should have been all over it. And since they weren't, I knew somebody must have wiped them off. And it wouldn't have been Greeley because he was wearing gloves anyway. Right. So it had to be Mrs. Elliott. Nobody else was there. You mean that after Greeley and the other man came in the store and beat up her husband, she saw her chance to murder him and put the blame on them? According to her confession, they left Paul lying on the floor unconscious, which gave her a perfect opportunity. But why? What motive did she have? Money. She killed him for money? Yes. Paul had a lot of insurance. Oh. And they hadn't been getting along for a couple of years, so she thought she saw a chance to commit the perfect murder. (laughs) Well, Nick, that little tear gas gun of mine certainly came in handy, didn't it? It certainly did. Lucky for us that Jeff didn't take a closer look and see that it really wasn't a fountain pen. I guess you're glad now that I had it in my purse, huh? I still say it's a dangerous thing to carry. But it isn't. Look, Nick. Unless you push the little button here. (laughs) Patsy, you little idiot. How did I know it would go off? Oh, Nick, open a window or something. Quick. (laughs) And now... The winners of the four 1948 Super Deluxe Ford V8 four-door sedans in the first new post-war old Dutch cleanser contest, which closed February 28th. Nick, suppose you do the honors. I'll be glad to, Mike. These folks have won themselves a brand new Super Deluxe Ford V8 four-door sedan. Mrs. L.J. Elman of Route 1, Odessa, Florida. Mrs. J.J. Bartlett of 1705 Summit View Avenue, Yakima, Washington. Mrs. H.E. Brower of 16618 South Woodruff Avenue, Bellflower, California. And Mrs. M.L. Burns 
of 203 Wilmot Avenue, Bridgeport 7, Connecticut. My only regret is that I can't award these Fords in person. I'd certainly like to see the smiles that wreathe the happy faces of these winners. So would I, Nick. And to all these Ford and other prize winners, congratulations. We'll have more winners next week, so be sure to listen. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silburn. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. The Girl Scouts, 36 years old this week, have pledged themselves to send 100,000 kits of clothing to destitute children overseas. To help in this project, call your local Girl Scout office. This is Michael Fitzmaurice speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. More winners! Yes, the winners in the second Big Jingle Contest will be announced today. So listen now while new post-war old Dutch cleanser... Famous for Chasing Dirt presents... Nick Carter, Famous for Chasing Crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined... as new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. I'm getting cramped hiding under this desk. Do you really think he's coming? $50,000 is pretty tempting bait. And he sounded plenty interested over the phone. Well, if we only had a light in here, maybe... Quiet. I... Listen. Someone's forcing the window. Hold tight, Betsy. I think that's our man. This is contest number four. After this, there's just one more. Yes, sir. Here we are already at the fourth week of Old Dutch Cleanser's five exciting weekly contests. Been putting it off, haven't you? Been saying, I'll get my entry in tomorrow for sure. And while you've been putting it off, other folks have been winning brand new 1948 Ford sedans. There's still plenty of chance for you, though, if you act promptly. Again this week, Old Dutch is giving away four brand new super deluxe Ford V8 four-door sedans and $500 in cash, just for supplying a winning last line to this jingle. For faster cleaning with new ease, just say, new post-war Old Dutch, please. With activated seismatite, da-da, 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 da-da. We want a last line only, rhyming with seismatite. Later on, I'll give you a sample last line, so have pencil and paper handy to copy it down for guidance. Mail your entries to Old Dutch Cleanser, Box U, Chicago 77, Illinois. Box U, Chicago 77, Illinois. Include the windmill pictures from two packages of Old Dutch with each entry. If you didn't win this week, try again. The more entries you send, the greater your chances of winning. Send one in tonight. And now, the case of the last old-timer. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. If you ask Waldo McGlynn, crime isn't what it used to be. No, sir. Give Waldo the good old days when Nick's father, Sim Carter, was one of the country's leading detectives and his right-hand man was Waldo McGlynn. Those were the days when crime was crime. But today, at Nick's office, Waldo's audience isn't very attentive because Nick is inspecting a new camera and Patsy is finishing some letters. But Waldo still holds forth on his favorite subject. 
I tell you, Nick Foy, we had real criminals in them days. You didn't catch them fellas by using a microscope and a lie detector. No, sir, you had to stand up. Anything else? Oh, uh, no, thanks, Patsy. Hey, you know, with a fast lens like this, I could down here take pictures in the dark. Ah, oh, it, Patsy. I wish you wouldn't interrupt me. Now I forget what I was saying. Oh, that's easy. No, sir, you had to stand up and shoot it out. Huh? Shoot first and ask questions afterwards. That's the way we work. Uh, I didn't and... say all that. Well, not yet, anyway. <laughs> but you were going to. Oh, I know that routine by heart, Waldo. I've heard it so often. <laughs> all right, laugh. Go ahead. But you'll find out I'm right. And before long, too. You know who got out of Sing Sing this week? No. Who? Nitro Nelson. That's who. The king of the safe crackers. Oh, yes. I heard my father talk about him. You're sorry. Your old man and me shot it out with Nitro and his pal, Dan Brinkley, after they pulled that Cohen securities job and killed the night watchman. Oh, I thought they got the chair for that, Waldo. No, only Dan Brinkley was executed. Nitro testified against him and got off with a life sentence. And they released him this week? Yep. Paroled after serving 25 years. Oh. So, Nick, you better look out for the biggest crime wave this old town has seen for many a day. Well, I doubt whether Nitro is much of a menace anymore, Waldo. Well, hmm? your boy must be past 70. Well, so what? He still knows more about cracking a safe than all these modern yeggs put together. Oh, you just give him a flask of nitroglycerin, and he will... Waldo, go... those methods are out of date. Modern safes can't be cracked as easily as those old-timers. Okay, okay, you just wait and see. All right, Waldo. I promise to call on you the very first time I get a case involving a blown safe. <laughs> Nick Carter speaking. Uh, hello. Uh, this is Cornelius Jones of Jones Fisher and Caraway. Oh, yes, Mr. Jones. Somebody broke into our offices here at the factory last night. Murdered the night watchman. Got away with our payroll. Well, have you notified the police? Well, of course, but well, we'd like to have you on the case, too. Will you help us out? Okay, I'll be out there in 30 minutes, Mr. Jones. Splendid. Oh, by the way, where was the money? In a safe? Of course it was. The thief got it by blowing the door of the safe clear off its hinges. <laughs> What did I tell you, Nick boy? What did I tell you? One case doesn't make a crime wave, Walter. Uh, just the same. Oh, Patsy, you have the camera, haven't you? I sure have. Well, here's Mr. Jones's office. Come on. Very well, Horace. I'll take two safes of this QS2 model. I want delivery as soon as possible. I'll have them for you inside of a week, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, I'm Nick Carter. Oh, come in, Mr. Carter. Come in. Thank you. This is my secretary, Miss Bowen. Hello, Mr. Jones. How do you do? And my assistant, Mr. Waldo Aloysius McGlynn. How do you do? How, How do you do? do? Meet Mr. Lewis of the Hercules Safe Company. Mr. Lewis? How do you do? Hercules Safe Company, huh? You investigating the robbery, too, Mr. Uh, Lewis? No, no. I'm a salesman, not a detective. I just sold Mr. Jones two of our latest models, one for the factory here and one for the downtown office. Yeah, we should have sold them to me before this thing happened last night. Well, you can't see I didn't try, Mr. Jones. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Jones, would you mind showing me where the safe is? I'd like to take a few pictures. Pictures? Yes, I'm testing a new camera with a special lens for detail work. Say, that's quite a camera, Mr. Carter. May I see it? Certainly, help yourself. Hmm. I've read about these, but this is the first one I've ever seen. Well, F-14 lens, that's unusual. Golly, I'd like to have one of these. Yeah, well, you get those new safes here by Saturday. I'll buy a, a roll of film. <laughs> They'll be here, Mr. Jones. Come on, Carter. I'll show you where the robbery took place. You can get all the pictures you want. Well, there's the safe, Mr. Carter. Uh -huh. The police have been over everything, of course. Oh, gee, that is an old-fashioned safe. Yeah, I'll say it is. Hmm. Modern safes couldn't have been blown open so easily. Thief must have used nitroglycerin, too. See where he plugged up the cracks with soap? Yeah. Let me take a look and look, Nick Boy. Yeah, go ahead, Walter. Go ahead. Hey, Mr. Jones, where was the night watchman's body found? Oh, just outside in the corridor. He was uh -huh. shot. The janitor found him when he opened up this morning. Nick Boy, this is one of Nitro Nelson's jobs, if I ever saw one. Oh, uh, Walter, you've got Nitro Nelson on the brain. I know what I'm talking about, oh. Patsy. In the old days, we could recognize the work of every big-time safe cracker in the business. Well, if you're right, Walter, we'll find out pretty soon. I see the police have been dusting for fingerprints. And it looks as though they've found plenty. Yeah. Well, as soon as we're through here, we'll go down to headquarters and check with Maddie. <laughs> Ah, 
I'm waiting for a report on those fingerprints now, Nick. And when it gets here, you'll find out I'm right, Matty. Oh, yeah? Uh, this takes me back 25 years. Nitro killed the night watchman on that job, too. According to court records, his partner killed him. You could never make me believe that. Dan Brinkley wasn't the killer type. But Nitro swore Dan did it, and the court believed him. Oh, were you at the trial, Waldo? Sure, sure, Nick. I had to testify. Oh. Yeah, I remember how sorry I felt for Dan's wife and kid when the judge passed the death sentence on him. It's funny why their faces keep sticking in my mind the way they do. Oh, that's probably the report, Nick. Sergeant Matheson, homicide. Yeah? Uh-huh. Okay, Peterson, thanks. Waldo, I gotta give you credit, huh? You sure called the turn this time. What? You mean those were Nitro Nelson's fingerprints, Matty? As plain as day. What did I tell you? In spite of his age, the old boy must be pretty spry to pull a job as neat as that one. Well, I'll be... And you mark my words, this is only the beginning. Nick Boy, you're up against a real crook this time. <laughs> Darn it, Patsy, it doesn't seem possible. Three more safe robberies in five days, and all of them exactly like the first. Nitro, Nelson, Nick Boy, just like I told you. Well, I can't argue with you anymore, Waldo. He found his fingerprints on every safe. I can't even get a lead on him. The day Nitro left prison, he must have gone directly to some hideout. Yes, I know, Patsy, I know, but where, where? Uh, you know, ever since we saw that first safe he blew, I've had a feeling that there's, there's something I ought to remember. Huh? Something in my mind keeps going back to that courtroom 25 years ago. Well, when you remember what it is, let me know, Waldo. You gave us the right steer the first time. Maybe you can do it again. And, Mr. Carter, when I opened up the office this morning, this is what I found. Uh-huh. A crack safe with the door blown right off its hinges. And almost $40,000 in negotiable security is gone. Or is the window open as it is now, Mr. Harris? Yes. Nothing's been touched. Oh, but Nick, this is the top floor. Whoever cracked that safe couldn't have got in through the window. No, but he could have lowered himself down f from the roof with a rope. Oh. In fact, Miss Bowen, it's the only way he could have got by our watchman without being seen. That'd be quite a trick for a 75-year-old man. Not for Nitro Nelson, Nick. You know, if he'd only waited till next week, we'd have our new safe installed. I'll bet not even he could crack that. <laughs> hey, Patsy, huh? come here. Yeah, what is it, Nick? What does this look like to you? I found it here on the floor in front of the safe. Why, it... It looks like a bit of gelatin. That's what I thought. Gelatin. I think we finally hit on something. Nick! Yeah. Nick, boy, I got it! What, Walter? What I was trying to remember. But I ain't sure, so so let me work it out on my own, will well, you? shouldn't you tell Nick so the two of you can work it out together? Nope, I got to do this myself. Just give me 24 hours, Nick, and if I don't find Nitro's hideout, then I'll tell you, okay? Well, oh, all right, all right, Walter, but be careful. Sure, I'll be careful, but I caught that old son of a gun once, and I can do it again. <laughs> Matty, flash that enlargement of the fingerprints on the screen again, will you? Okay, Nick, but what's the use? It's exactly the same as the prints of nitros we have on file. Sure it is. No question about it. I know, I know, but... Yeah. Every whirl, mm -hmm. every loop, every ridge is there. What's bothering you, Nick? I'm looking for something that isn't there. Uh, huh? Something that isn't there? Oh, just a minute, Nick. Sergeant Matheson, homicide... Where's that? 347 Hillside Road, eh? How long ago? Okay, I'll run out and have a look. Yeah, I'll leave right away. Okay, Thompson. Trouble, Sergeant? Yeah, somebody found a dead body in the cellar of an old house out on Hillside Road. You want to come along, Nick? All right, Matty, I can finish up here when we get back. Come on, Patsy. <laughs> The body's down in the basement, Sergeant. This way. How did you happen to find it, Mr. Wilkins? I was out in my backyard when I heard a shot. I live in the next house down the road. Yeah? And then a minute later, I saw somebody run out of here carrying a suitcase. He jumped into a car and beat it fast. So I came over to see what was up. Was the door unlocked? Yes. It was wide open. 
Well, I thought that was funny, so I kept looking around, and finally I found this dead man in the cellar. You didn't move him, did you? No. I just looked from the top of the steps, and I ran and called you. This, uh, the basement door? Yeah, he's right at the bottom of the steps. See? There he is. Good grief. Nick, look. Great Scott. It's Waldo. At the foot of the cellar stairs in a deserted cottage, Nick's old friend and assistant, Waldo McGlynn, lies stretched out with a bullet hole in his chest. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Got your pencil? Got your paper? Get set, because here's where we repeat the contest jingle and give you a sample last line to copy down. First, the jingle. You don't copy this down, because all Old Dutch wants from you is a last line. For faster cleaning, with new ease, just say, new post-war Old Dutch, please. With activated seismotite, ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. Get the idea? Instead of those ta-ta-ta-tas, you think up a last line that rhymes with seismotype. Here's that sample now. Copy it down for guidance. Your sink and tub come shiny bright. That's not a winning line, just a sample to go by. The main thing is get going now. Mail your entry in tonight. Address Old Dutch Cleanser, Box U, Chicago 77, Illinois. Box U, Chicago 77, Illinois. And don't forget, each entry must be accompanied by the windmill pictures from two packages of Old Dutch Cleanser. Any resident of continental United States can enter, except Cudahy employees, their advertising agency, or families. Entries must be original and submitted in, con- uh, in contestants' own name, judged on originality, suitability, and aptness, and judges' decisions are final. Duplicate prizes for ties. All entries become Old Dutch property. Again this week, four new 1948 Ford sedans and $500 in cash will be won by somebody, and it might as well be you. Now, back to the case of The Last Old Timer, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. Sergeant Matheson took Nick and Patsy with him to investigate a report that a body had been found in the basement of a cottage on Hillside Road, only to discover that the man who was shot is Nick's old friend and assistant, Waldo McGlynn. A few minutes later... Well, I managed to stop the bleeding at least. I'm afraid he doesn't have much of a chance... Hey, Maddie, when will that ambulance be here? Any minute now, Nick. I suppose Waldo was following that clue he spoke about when he came oh, here. Probably. I wish now I'd made him tell me just what it was. Oh. Even if he recovers, it'll be days before he can tell us what happened. Hey, Nick, there's something over here I'd like to show you. If you can leave Waldo for a minute. All right, all right, Maddie. There's nothing more to be done until the ambulance arrives anyway. What is it? Here, behind this partition. Take a look. What? Why, those are safes. Yeah. Four old-fashioned safes. And each one has the door blown off the hinges. How do you know? Uh, Mr. Wilkins. Yes? You know who lives in this cottage? Well, yes. I own the place. And about a month ago, I rented it to an old man named Triplett. An old man? How old? Why, he must have been 70, 75. Hmm. Hard-boiled old gent, too. Huh? Felt like one of those gangsters in the movies. You what? see, Nick, it was Nitro. This is the hideout we've been looking for. Well, how about those four safes, Mr. Wilkins? Do they belong to you, too? No. I never saw him before. Well, how well did you get to know this, Mr. Triplett? Why, I I didn't get to know him at all. The fact is, I haven't even seen him since he rented the place. Hey, Nick, I've been looking at those safes. Yeah? You know, only three of them were blown open. The door's wide open on the fourth, but it's not damaged. Yeah, I noticed that too, Matty. Probably the fourth one was used to store the loot from the robberies. But why would he have four safes and then blast three of them open? Well, he was practicing, Patsy. Hey, look. It took three attempts to get this first one open. It was still a clumsy job. Yeah, but the technique was better on this next safe. Uh, he did a perfect job on the third one. Well, I get it. After 25 years in jail, the old man had to do a little practicing in order to get back his skills. <laughs> Come over here, Matty. Yeah? Bring your flashlight. Okay. Pretty dark in this corner. Why don't you find something else? Throw the light down here on the dirt floor. Okay. Hey. See what I mean? Yeah. The dirt isn't packed down as hard as it is in the rest of the cellar. Better get some men out here and start digging. Right. What for, Nick? 
Wouldn't be surprised if they find the body of Nitro Nelson. Ah, right, careful, boys. Lift them out easy. Why, that's Mr. Triplett, the old man who rented my house. Maybe he was Mr. Triplett to you, Wilkins. But he was Nitro Nelson to the police. But, Nick, it can't be Nitro. Look at the body. It must have been buried there for at least a week. Perhaps even longer, Maddie. But it's still Nitro. Well, that's impossible, Nick. Those robberies started less than a week ago. And you know Nitro did them. You found his fingerprints on every safe. Yeah, and fingerprints don't lie. Well, if they're not lying this time, Maddie, the only answer is that the robberies were committed by a ghost. And you don't believe in ghosts, do you? Nick, please, give with some answers. How did Nitro's fingerprints get on those safes after he was dead? Well, Patsy, you know what happens when you develop photographic film. Well, only in a general way. Why? Well, film is covered with a thin layer of sensitized gelatin. Yes, I know that much. Okay, then. When the film's put in a developer, the developer turns the exposed part of that gelatin black. And it eats away the unexposed part. Go ahead. I'm still with you. Now, suppose a photograph of a fingerprint were printed on a very thick layer of that gelatin. Uh Uh-huh. And it were left in an extra strong developer until all the white spaces between the ridges were eaten away as deeply as, as say, a a thirty-second of an inch. Why, I suppose the black part, the ridges of the fingerprint, would stand out like a a rubber stamp. Exactly, Patsy. Like a rubber stamp made out of gelatin. Then somebody took a photograph of Nitro's fingerprints and made one of those gelatin rubber stamp things out of it. Yes, see? Oh. I began to wonder when I found that bit of gelatin on the floor by the safe in Harris's office. Uh-huh. Must have broken off when he put the prints there. Then, when we enlarged the prints at headquarters just now, I was sure. Yes. Uh, you said you were looking for something that wasn't there. What did you mean? Patsy, there are pores in all human skin. Naturally. But not in gelatin. No matter how much we enlarged those prints, there wasn't a single pore mark. That's why I'm sure the fingerprints were faked. Well, all right, sir. We know Nitro didn't rob those safes, but who did? I want you to phone all the companies that have been robbed. After we've made those calls, I think that'll give us the answer to your question. Hello? Hello, Lewis. Yes? This is Cornelius Jones of Jones Fish and Carraway. Oh, yes, Mr. Jones. About those two safes I ordered from your company. Yes? Could you possibly deliver one of them this afternoon? Uh, I'm afraid not, Mr. Jones. But I, I've got over $50,000 in cash and securities here that just came in. And the banks are closed for the day. Now, all we have is that old safe in our downtown office. I, I don't trust that anymore. I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Jones. That old safe will have to do until tomorrow night. But before then, I'll take care of everything. That's our promise. So, do you really think he's coming? $50,000 is pretty tempting bait. And Joan said he sounded plenty interested over the phone. Well, if we only oh, had a... Listen. Someone's forcing the window. Hold tight, Patsy. I think that's our man. All right, don't move. I've got a gun on you. Oh, the... Turn on the lights, Patsy. Right. Mr. Lewis. Yes, but perhaps he'd rather be called Mr. Brinkley. Brin- so you know, do you? I do. Your father was Dan Brinkley, wasn't he? Yes, Dan Brinkley. The man Nitro Nelson sent to the electric chair for a killing he did himself. That's what Walter was trying to remember. Huh? Walter was at Brinkley's trial, and he recalled the resemblance between you and your father. Yeah, who's Waldo? He's Nick's assistant. The man who trailed you out to the cottage. The man you shot, Brinkley. And he may die. Well, what did you expect me to do? He ran down the stairs waving a gun and yelling for me to give up. Sure, I shot him. Then I grabbed the stuff out of the safe and beat it. Well, you're not going to beat it this time. I'm not? Look, do you think I'm going to the chair like my father did? You don't have any choice. No? Well, look at what I've got in my hand. What have you got in that bottle? Nitroglycerin, sister. Oh. You take a shot at me, Carter, and we'll all be blown into a million pieces. Oh, put that gun away. You won't get away even if I do, Brinkley. This whole place is surrounded. This is the end of the line for you. Okay, then it's the end of the line for all of us. Oh, don't throw that bottle, don't! Here it comes! Ah! (laughs) 
With all his force, Brinkley hurls the bottle of nitroglycerin directly at Nick and Patsy, preferring to die with them rather than be captured. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, ladies, the margarine color problem is solved. Mixing bowl mess ended by new Delrich Easy Color Pack Margarine. To color, just knead the bag. No tax on your time, energy, or budget. And Delrich naturally tastes better, fresher, because its delicate country sweet flavor is sealed in. A new American favorite. Now for the conclusion of the case of the last old timer. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Nick and Patsy trapped George Brinkley as he was about to blow open the safe of Jones, Fisher, and Calloway. But Brinkley holds a bottle of nitroglycerin above his head and says, Okay, Carter, this is the end of the line for all of us. Don't throw that bottle, don't! Here it comes! Ah! Oh, my hand! The bullet only grazed you, Brinkley. Stop whimpering. Oh, Isn't there going to be any explosion? No, Patsy. When he threw the bottle, I, I managed to catch it. Oh, gee. Oh, we're... Still lucky it didn't explode. Yeah. Oh, brother, I never want to do that again. Neither do I. Oh. Well, come on, Brinkley. I want you to meet an old friend of mine, Sergeant Matheson of Homicide. <laughs> Nicky, you sure it's all right for us to see Waldo today? Sure. The nurse said he was conscious and asking for it. Right. Ah, here's his room. Oh, hi there. Oh, hello, Waldo. Hi, Waldo. Gosh, I'm glad to see you. Hi, Patsy. Oh, Nick, boy, there's something i got to tell you. That salesman for the safe company. He's, He's Dan Brinkley's son. And well, you I... trail him to that cottage on Hillside Road and well, he shot you. Yeah, yeah. We know all about it, Waldo. We caught Brinkley last night. You, you, you did? How? Oh. Well, to begin with, I couldn't believe a man night rose age could pull those jobs. Oh, but Nick, boy... What's more, I figure those jobs were pulled by someone who knew where there were old-fashioned safes that could be blown open by night rose out-of-date methods. So when two of the victims mentioned buying new safes, Nick figured that a safe salesman trying to sell them new ones would know all this. And it didn't take long to find out that Brinkley or Lewis had called on all the victims. You sure, but... And when I discovered the secret of the phony fingerprints, I remembered Brinkley's interest in photography. Photography? How, how does that feel? Oh, we'll tell you later, Waldo. After you feel better. It's enough right now to tell you that Brinkley's mother brought him up hating Nitro Nelson. So when Nitro got out of jail, Brinkley was there to meet him. And Nitro didn't recognize him. That's why he agreed to teach him his methods of safe cracking for $1,000. But after Brinkley learned the technique, he strangled the old man and buried him in the cellar of the cottage. So it, it wasn't Nitro that blew them safes after all. Sorry to disappoint uh... you, Waldo. But you can credit the younger generation with those jobs. Uh, I guess that's why you caught him so easy. In my day, you had to stand up and... Shoot shoot it out. Shoot first and ask questions afterwards. That's the way we work. (laughs) All right, laugh. Go on, laugh. Oh, Waldo. And now... The winners of the four 1948 Super Deluxe Ford V8 four-door sedans in the second new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser Contest, which closed March 6th. Stand aside, Mike. I'm doing the honors here. Okay, Nick, go ahead. Friends, it gives me great pleasure to announce that brand new 1948 Fords were won by Mrs. M.T. Bird of 16 Lexington Avenue, Needham Heights, 94, Massachusetts. Mrs. J. M. Bramlett of 1825 A Street, Lincoln, Nebraska. Mrs. Frieda Carlitz of 94 East 57th Street, Brooklyn 3, New York. And Mrs. F. D. Long of 208 Northeast 4th Street, Galva, Illinois. And to these lucky people, let me say, may you have many happy hours of driving pleasure. Yes, and let me add, to all these Ford and other prize winners, congratulations. And be sure to listen next week for more winners. But now, Nick, how about next week's adventure? Well, Mike, next week we're going to look for a piece of rope. That's right. One you could buy in any hardware store for a dollar or two. And yet two murders were committed because somebody wanted it. Yes, and after the killer got his hands on it, he didn't want it anymore. So he gave it away. Well, this all sounds very mysterious. What's the name of the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Magic Rope. Nick 
Carter, presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy, Ed Latimer played Matty, and Humphrey Davis played Waldo. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. The Campfire Girls, the homemakers of tomorrow, are having an anniversary this week, and to them, the Cudahy Packing Company says, Happy Birthday, and many happy returns of the day. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Third contest winners. Yes, folks, later we'll announce the Ford winners in the third big jingle contest. So listen while new post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction... Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, why do you want us all here in the workshop? Because, Patsy, this is where the great Canestro cooked up his most famous illusions. And it ought to be a good place for me to pull a couple of tricks, too. Now, don't tell me you're going to pull rabbits out of a hat. Rabbits? No, Patsy. A killer, I hope. Well, all good things come to an end sometime, and the Old Dutch Cleanser Contest comes to an end this coming Saturday at midnight. This is the last week to enter and win a brand new 1948 Ford sedan or a share in the big cash prizes. If you've put it off so far, enter now. If you've entered before, enter again, because your chance of winning is still just as good as anybody else's. And it's so easy to win. All you do is supply a winning last line for this jingle. Listen. For faster cleaning, with new ease, just say, new post-war, old Dutch please. With activated seismatite, ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. Remember, all we want is a last line, something that rhymes with seismatite. Get a pencil and paper handy, and later on I'll give you a sample last line to go by. Just a few minutes' time might win you a brand new super deluxe Ford V8 four-door sedan or a crisp new $10 bill. Somebody's going to win, and it might as well be you. Get your entry in now, tonight. Each entry must be accompanied by the windmill pictures from two labels of Old Dutch Cleanser. Mail to Old Dutch Cleanser, Box U, Chicago 77, Illinois. That's Box U, Chicago 77, Illinois. Entries must be postmarked before midnight this coming Saturday. It's your last chance, so get going. And now, The Case of the Magic Rope, today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Tonight, at the Elton Theater, magicians from all over the country will compete for the Fulton Award, a $10,000 prize for the best illusion of the year. But the greatest magician of them all, Carlos Canestro, will not be present. Confined to a wheelchair since his almost fatal accident last year, Canestro sits in his workshop, talking to Alma Whiting, once his assistant, now a leading contender for the Fulton Award. <laughs> you know, Alma, I suggested the idea of the Magician's Award to Mr. Fulton myself. But I did not think he would take me seriously. Why not? He can afford it. With all his millions, he certainly can. Funny how so many people take up magic as a hobby, isn't it? Uh, with Fulton, it is more than a hobby. It is an obsession. But all he's ever learned is a little sleight of hand. But let him get on a stage, and he's as happy as if he had made another million dollars in the stock market. Oh, Carlos, uh, I've simply got to win that $10,000 prize tonight. Uh-huh. Yeah, perhaps you should have this. That piece of rope? That piece of rope, my dear, will mystify the world. It is the most spectacular illusion of my whole career. Oh? How does it work? No, 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 no. That is Canestro's secret. 
When I return to the theater... You? I w- you expect to work again? But of course I do. I'll be out of this wheelchair very soon now. Well, I... Uh, well, that, that's good news. Alma, you will tell me what happened to me the night of the accident? It was the equipment, wasn't it? The equipment was all right, Carlos. You slipped, that's all. But I couldn't have. I had done that trick a thousand times. Why did I fall through that trap door, Alma? Why? Why? Oh, Carlos, Carlos, you mustn't get excited. It's bad for you. See how your hands are trembling. Here. Let me hold them in mind for a moment. There, now. Uh, oh. Huh? I beg your pardon. Uh, Mrs. Canestro. Carlos, dinner is ready. Wheel yourself into the dining room, will you? I want to say something to Alma. Very well, Catherine. Come back again soon, Alma. What I have to say won't take long, Alma. Mrs. Canestro, what you saw didn't mean a thing. I don't want to hear any lies. You've been in love with my husband for years. Oh, that's ridiculous. If you weren't so crazy, I told jealous... you never to come here. Now get out. And don't come back or... Or what? You'd better be pretty nice to me, Mrs. Canestro, or I might tell the newspapers exactly why Carlos fell that night. And you wouldn't want that, would you? How are you doing, Patsy? That's the end of it, Nick. Ah, oh, it's 25 after 7. How'd you like to take in a stage show? Oh, why, well, that would be wonderful. I haven't been to the theater in months. Oh, I'll answer it. You get your hat. Right. Nick Carter speaking. Who? Oh, yes. I see. Yes, I'll I'll be right over. Oh, Nick. No show? Nope. Not even any dinner. That was Mrs. Canestro, wife of the great magician. Well, what did she want? She wanted to tell me that her husband's been stabbed. <laughs> dead for at least two hours. Mrs. Canestro, when did you find the body? Only a few minutes ago. I opened the door and there he was with that knife in his chest. You ever seen this knife before? Yes, it was part of Carlos' magic act. He kept it here in the workshop with his other props. I suppose you've notified the police. No, not yet. I did not know what to do. I'll call them, Nick. All right, uh, but uh, get me a clean envelope first, will you, Patsy? Why? Did you find something? Yes. Canestro evidently tried to put up a fight. Oh? The fingernails in his right hand are broken as if something had been torn out of his hand. And these bits of fiber were under his nails. What? He looked like the stuff they make rope out of. That's what I thought. Here, put him in the envelope. Uh Rope? The rope trick, Mr. Carter. It is gone. What rope trick? It is an illusion Carlos was working on. He wouldn't tell me how it worked, but he said it was the most spectacular trick he'd ever created. It was here on this desk only this afternoon. Ah, a trick as good as that would be worth a fortune to any magician. That must have been what he was shouting about. Shouting? What do you mean? Well, we had an early dinner, and I went up to my room about six. Yes? And a few minutes later, I heard Carlos screaming at someone. He was in a rage. I didn't think anything about it at the time. Carlos was always excitable. Remember what he said? He was shouting, No, you cannot have it. No one can have it. And you haven't any idea whom he was talking to? No, I haven't. People were always dropping in. He'd go to the door in his wheelchair and let them in himself. That is how Alma Whiting got in this afternoon. Alma Whiting? Yes. Isn't she a magician, too? Yes, she was. She was here this afternoon. Maybe I better talk to her. You'll find her at the Elton Theater competing for the Fulton Award. Say, I read about the Fulton Award in the paper today. Yes. It's a $10,000 prize for the best magic trick of the year, isn't it? Yeah, maybe... It could not have been, Alma. She left an hour before this happened. Just the same, Mrs. Canestro. She may be able to give us some information. Patsy, get that police call through right away. We're going to see a show tonight after all. I beg your pardon, Mr. Fulton? Who let you into my box? I distinctly told the... My name's Nick Carter. Uh, Nick Carter, the detective? That's right. This is my secretary, Patsy Bowen. How do you do? Well, I'm uh, happy to meet you both, I'm sure, but uh, what are you doing here? I'd like to talk with one of your performers, Alma Whiting. But perhaps you could tell me when the best time would be. But Elma's on in a few minutes. Is it something urgent? It is, if you call murder urgent. Murder? 
Carlos Canestro was stabbed to death about 6.30 this evening. Canestro? Stabbed? I, I can't believe it. Sorry, but he was. And Miss Whiting seems to be the last person who saw him alive. Mr. Fulton, tell me, have, you, have any of the magicians done a rope trick here tonight? A rope trick? No, no. Canestro dead? The greatest magician the world has ever known dead. Well... Can you take us backstage and introduce us to Miss Whiting? Oh, certainly. I'll take you back just as soon as Marvello finishes his act. He's nearly through. I have to stay and judge the contest tricks, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, watch closely, please. Oh, this is the contest trick coming up now. I call your attention to this very familiar object I hold in my hand. A common, ordinary piece of rope. Amy. Do you suppose that rope could be the one? I don't know, but I hope to find out before long. Watch your step, Miss Bowen. Uh It's uh, pretty dark backstage here. Oh, there's Alma. Alma! Alma. Yes, Mr. Fulton. Uh, this is Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen, Alma. Hello. How do you do? Alma, do you something do? terrible's happened. Canestro is dead. Is what? He was stabbed about 6.30 this evening, Miss Whiting. Who killed him? That's what we're trying to find out. You mind telling me where you were at that time? I was right here in the theater rehearsing. I suppose you can prove that. Yes, of course I can. Marvella was here, too, and he saw me. If you think you're going to put the blame on, on me, you're out of your mind. <laughs> What's the audience laughing at? Oh, that's the comedy magician going on after Marvello's act. Oh. Uh, do you want to talk to Marvello, too, Mr. Carter? Yes, I do. I'll uh, get him right away. Mr. Carter, I don't understand this. Why would anybody want to kill Colas? Well, Mrs. Canestro thinks it was to steal a magic trick he just perfected. That's ridiculous, and she knows it. Nobody who knew Carlos would do a thing like that. Why not? Because he... Well, I, I mean, they'd know they couldn't get away with it. Why not? Look, I've got to check my props. I'll talk to you when the act's over. Is that all right? Okay, thanks. Uh, what do you think, Nick? There's something she isn't telling us, Bessie. And I don't know whether she's afraid of me or... Hey, whether... I thought this was a magic show. What's the idea of the clown act? Comedy relief, I suppose. Kill time while they strike one act and set up the next. Uh, Mr. Carter, this is uh, Marvello, one of our best magicians. Uh, is it true, the great Canestro... He's dead? Yes. Uh, you'll excuse me, won't you, Mr. Carter? I have to get back to my box before Alma's act starts. Sure, go right ahead, Mr. Fogel. Uh, Marvello, what time did you get to the theater tonight? About six o'clock. Anyone see you here at six? Certainly. I spoke to Miss Whiting as I came in. I see. You're her alibi and she's yours. What are you getting at? A solution to a murder, I hope. Marvello, where's the rope you used tonight? Why, I have it right here in my coat book. That's funny. Now, don't tell me it's disappeared. I... Uh, uh, no, 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 of course not. I... Oh, here it is in my left pocket. I thought it was in the right one, that's all. I see. Mind if I borrow it? Borrow my rope. For what? I'm sending it to the police laboratory. Police? Maybe this is the rope that'll kill Canestro's killer. <laughs> Alma Whiting's act's almost over. Morning, Maddie. I asked him to send an officer over here to pick up that rope. Oh, are they going to make a comparison test? Yeah. And if those fibers we found under Canestro's fingernails are from the same rope that Marvello used, it'll show up... Nick, under... look. What? You may have another rope for the sergeant to pick up. Look what Alma's doing out there on the stage. Yeah, what's she doing up there on that platform? Let's listen. Ladies and gentlemen, your own representatives from the audience have examined this rope to be sure there is no trickery. They themselves have tied the rope firmly around my neck. Huh, two rope tricks tonight. You have huh? seen the rope tested with a heavy sandbag. You have seen with your own eyes that it does not reach within eight feet of the floor. Hey, is she going to jump also, off that no, platform with the rope around her neck? That's it. Of course, as soon as she falls, she'll be out of sight behind that screen. Oh, I'm glad it's her instead of me. My hands are securely tied as well as my feet. Looks like a good trick. This mm. tool has been done by the committee from the audience. If it's Canestra's rope trick, though, she may find this is only a rehearsal for the real thing. And now, the leap of death! Nick, she jumped! Yeah. Well, what now? Well, there shouldn't be a dead pause like this. Why doesn't she come out from behind that screen or whatever she's supposed to do? I don't know. 
Has something gone wrong? Look, those men. They're running back at the screen. And Mr. Fulton's coming up over the footlight. Betsy, something has oh. happened. Come on. Yeah. Curtain, Joe! Bring down the curtain, you knuckle! You there! Move that screen out the way! Oh, Nick, look! Quite stuck. The trick didn't work. She's dead. Oh! <laughs> At the end of a rope, the rope which she hoped would win her the $10,000 Fulton Award, swings the lifeless body of Alma Whiting. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Well, folks, this is your last chance to get in on the Old Dutch Cleanser Jingle Contest. The deadline is midnight this coming Saturday, so get going now. And wham! Maybe you'll be the winner of a brand new 1948 Super Deluxe 4D8 four-door sedan. Just for thinking up a last line to this jingle. For faster cleaning, with new ease, just say, new post-war, old Dutch please. With activated seismatite, ta-ta, 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 ta-ta. You give us a last line only, something to rhyme with seismatite. Get your pencil now and I'll give you a sample. Ready? Both sink and tub come shiny bright. That's not a winning last line, just a sample. Get a handy entry blank from your dealer or use plain paper. Mail to Old Dutch Cleanser, Box U, Chicago 77, Illinois. Got that? Box U, Chicago 77, Illinois. Include windmill pictures from two labels of Old Dutch with each entry. Any resident of continental United States may enter, except Cudahy employees, their advertising agency, or families. Entries are judged on originality, suitability, and aptness, must be the work of contestants, and submitted in their own name. Judge's decision final, all entries become Old Dutch property. Duplicate prizes for ties. Remember, Saturday midnight is the deadline. Get your entry in now. Now, back to the case of the magic rope. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As the police clear the theater, the body of Alma Whiting is lowered to the stage, and Nick Carter begins his investigation. She's dead, all right. Her neck's broken. But Nick, what happened? What went wrong? I don't know. Hey, does anybody here know this trick? How it was supposed to work? Yes, yes, I do. Who are you? I'm Sam Foster. I do the comedy clown act. Well, what was the trick she tried to do? Well, she was supposed to jump off the platform onto the stage. But the rope was too short for her to reach the stage. I was watching when they tested it with the sandbag. I know, but there's about five foot of slack concealed in that crossbar the rope hangs from. Oh. Alma could release it by stepping on a foot switch on the platform. Then when she hit the floor, she could grab the rope and yank it tight with her hands to make it look as though she was suspended in midair. Uh-huh. The audience couldn't see her behind the screen, of course. But her hands were tied. Oh, no, no, no. She got them loose during the patter before she jumped. Now, my part of the act was to come up through the trap door in the stage and take her place. Oh, I see. Then she'd step out in front, pull away the screen, and instead of Alma being suspended there, the audience would see me in this clown suit hanging from the noose by my feet. The whole thing took only about five seconds. Then the trouble must have been with that foot switch that was supposed to release the extra rope. Yeah. Something must have gone wrong with it. Oh. Show me that switch, will you? Sure, sure. Works by electricity. Here. See this wire running up the back of the platform to the... Hey, look. Nick, the wire's been caught. Well, for the second time tonight, Patsy, we're face to face with murder. (sighs) Nick, what's the idea of coming back here to Canestro's house? Remember what Alma Whiting said? That no one who knew Canestro would have killed him to get the rope trick? Yes, but... I don't know what she meant by it. Neither do I, but I think perhaps Mrs. Canestro does. Hmm? Why, Mr. Carter... Sorry to disturb you, Mrs. Canestro. Please, not now. Come back tomorrow. I'm sorry, but this can't wait. Please. Oh, but Nick's trying to help you, Mrs. Canestro. Nobody can help me. No, Carlos is gone. Dead. Maybe I should be glad he's at peace now. No more suffering. No more... No more what? Had he been ill? No. No, except for the lameness, his health was perfect. What was wrong, then? 
His mind? His mind? Who said anything about his mind? Well, Alma Whiting told me that... Alma Whiting, I might have known. Look, Mrs. Canestro, your husband was a famous man, a public figure. You can't hide important facts about a man like that. But I, I had to. His public knew him as the great Canestro, a name that meant as much in the theater as Bernhard, Caruso, Pavlo. Of course it I did. I could not shatter that illusion. I could not let the world know that the great Canestro had lost his mind. Oh, that's awful. So that's what Alma meant by saying that anyone who knew Canestro wouldn't steal his trick. Alma knew. That is what caused his accident. His mind snapped during the performance that night and he fell. Alma is the only one who knows. You say no one else suspected your husband's condition? No. He always talked rationally when he had visitors. He'd boast about the new illusions he was creating. Poor, pitiful little tricks that wouldn't fool the baby. I knew his rope trick was no good, but I... No, someone's at the door. I'll go. Why, uh, hello, Carter. Marvello and I stopped by to see whether we could do anything for Mrs. Canestro. I'm glad you did, Mr. Fulton. Come on in. You too, Marvello. Oh, thank you. Oh, Patsy. Will you and Mrs. Canestro come into the workshop here, please? I want to try an experiment. Of course, Nick. An experiment? Don't tell me you're going to try to produce rabbits out of a hat, Mr. Carter. Rabbits? No, Marvello. I'm going to try to produce a murderer. <laughs> You mean you got us all here in the workshop just to tell us Canestro's rope trick was worthless, Mr. Carter? Well, I thought you might be interested in knowing it was worth about 50 cents, the cost of the rope itself. Then that proves I did not steal it. You saw my rope trick, you heard how the audience applauded. My Marvello, I got a report from the police laboratory on that rope you used tonight. The fibers match those I found under Canestro's fingernails perfectly. What are you trying to say? I'm saying that your rope is the one that was stolen out of this room early this evening. The rope somebody killed Carlos Canestro for. No. No, I did not do it. It is a lie. I'll tell you who killed them. Mrs. Canestro did it. What? She was wildly jealous of Alma and Carlos. Everybody in the profession knew it. That is a lie. Then, after she killed him, it would have been easy enough for her to sneak backstage and cut the wire on that foot switch. A good theory. Except for one thing. What's that? Alma Whiting left me to check her props just before I talked to you, Marvello. And she certainly wouldn't have overlooked testing anything as important as that switch. Her life depended on it. Uh, naturally not. All right, but... then. The wire was cut after she tested it. In the last two or three minutes before she started her act. And at that time, we were all standing within a few feet of the platform that contained the switch. If Mrs. Canestro had been there, I'd have seen her. So you're trying to put the blame on me, huh? No, I'm not. You were talking to me all during that time. Then Marvello couldn't have done it. No, he couldn't. And nobody else was there except the stagehands. Well? I think we can count them out, Mr. Fulton. They'd have no reason to kill either Alma or Canestro. But that does not leave anyone but to... Dick, watch him. He's getting away. Stay where you are, Fulton. Carter, put away that gun. You don't seriously think that a man in my position... I don't think, Fulton. I know. Here, Patsy, you hold the gun while I frisk him. Right. This is ridiculous. I could buy and sell Canestro a hundred times. Why should I steal anything from him? Because there are some things that money can't buy. And that rope trick was one of them. You're being silly. Am I? You're crazy about magic, Fulton. And when you couldn't buy that trick, you killed Canestro to get it. Has he got a gun, Nick? No, there's nothing on him. Keep him covered while I call a police car. Uh-huh. Police headquarters? And hurry. Oh, Patsy. Yes, Nick? Patsy, uh... Oh, look at me for a minute. Yes, Nick? Can you see any... Thanks! <laughs> got the gun away from me. Yes, thanks for looking at Carter instead of me, Miss Bowen. Oh. Now put down that phone, Carter. Okay. Guess I was kind of dumb, wasn't yes, I? Yes, you were, and I'm in command now. But you killed Canestro, didn't you, Fulton? Yes, you were right about that. I thought so. I've always wanted to own one great trick, one real illusion that no one else had. So I tried to buy the rope trick from him. But he laughed at me, said his trick was much too good for a mere beginner like me. I flew into a rage... And grabbed the knife off the desk and stabbed him. Yes. He shouldn't have laughed. And after you found out the rope trick wasn't worth anything, you tried to put the blame on Marvello by planting the rope on him, didn't you? Naturally. When I brought Marvello across the stage to you, I took the rope he'd used out of his right coat pocket and put Canestro's rope in his left pocket. So it was you who tried to frame me. Yes, Marvello. 
Even Canestro couldn't have done a neater bit of sleight of hand than that. What about Alma, Fulton? When I switched the ropes on Marvello, I looked up and saw her watching me, so there was nothing else I could do. Oh. All right, what's your next trick? A disappearing act? Exactly. I'm going to lock you all in here while I take my leave. Stand away from that door, Carter. Sorry, Fulton, I'm not moving. Get away from that door, I'll put a bullet in you. You're not leaving this room, Fulton. Oh, Nick, please, he means it. I know he does. And so do I. All right, if that's the way you want it... While the others stand by dumbfounded, Fulton at point-blank range fires his revolver directly at Nick Carter's heart. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now, ladies, the margarine color problem is solved. Mixing bowl mess ended by new Dell Rich Easy Color Pack Margarine. To color, just knead the bag. No tax on your time, energy, or budget. And Dell Rich naturally tastes better, fresher, because its delicate country sweet flavor is sealed in. A new American favorite. Now for the conclusion of the case of the magic rope. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In the workshop of Carlos Canestro, world-famous magician, J.B. Fulton makes a desperate attempt to escape as he points a gun at Nick's heart and says, Get away from that door, Carter. I'll put a bullet in you. You're not leaving this room, Fulton. All right, if that's the way you want to... <laughs> what the... All right, you through playing with that gun, Fulton? You are. Please notice that I've got you covered with a revolver that shoots real bullets. Oh, Nick, for love of Pete, what happened? That revolver Fulton has only shoots blank cartridges. What? I picked it up here in the workshop. It must be the gun Carlos used in his act. I guess it was, Mrs. Canestro, but Fulton didn't know it. Why, you dirty... Skip it, Fulton. All right, Patsy, call headquarters and tell him to come here and pick up Fulton the Great. <laughs> When are you going to tell me about that gun trick? Oh, that? Why, there's nothing to it, Patsy. Huh? Haven't you ever seen a magician have somebody shoot a gun at him at close range? Uh, not until I saw Fulton do it to you. Well, the magician announces what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Then he gets people up on the stage to examine the gun. Army officers, if possible. And it's a real gun? Certainly it is. But after the gun's been examined, the magician's assistant makes a quick switch. Oh, I get it. The gun that fires blanks is substituted for the real gun. That's it. And that gun has no hole in the barrel for the bullet to come out of. Well, I sure wish I'd known all that when I was holding that gun on Fulton. <laughs> you see, I didn't have a nickel's worth of proof that Fulton was guilty, Patsy, so I had to trick him into a confession. I've learned from experience that a murderer talks a lot more freely with a gun in his hand. Well, he certainly talked plenty. <laughs> I guess it only goes to prove the truth of the old saying. Oh, what old saying is that? Why give a man enough rope and he'll hang himself. And now, the winners of the four 1948 Super Deluxe Ford V8 four-door sedans in the third new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser Jingle Contest, which closed March 13th. Well, Nick, are you going to make the awards? Am I? Mike, I've been looking forward to this all week. Here are the folks who get those brand new 1948 Fords. Eileen Brassfield of 221 Emerson Avenue, Aspinwall, Pennsylvania. Mrs. Helen Hill McWilliams, in care of E.S. West of 167 Park Street, East Orange, New Jersey. Mrs. Robert L. Perry of 2314 West Adams Street, Phoenix, Arizona. And Mrs. Helen Jane Stage of 6926 Parnell Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. And let me add that I hope these lucky people get as much pleasure driving their Fords as I had in awarding them. Yes, to all these Ford and other prize winners, congratulations. And remember, we'll have more winners next week, so be sure to listen then. And that reminds me, Nick, what about next week's adventure? Well, Mike, you might call it a story about pirates, the modern kind, who operate on the highways instead of on the high seas. Are you referring to the thugs who robbed those big motor freight trucks? Uh-huh. And, Mike, we'd still be locked in the cellar of that abandoned brewery if Nick hadn't figured out a perfectly fantastic way to escape. What do you call the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Martyred Rat. <laughs>
Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Evelyn Goodman and Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Want to know who won? Well, we'll tell you later when we announce the Ford winners in the fourth big jingle contest. So listen while new post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. If you're all through, Mr. Carter, we'd like to remove the body. Yeah, we're through, officer. Well, what do we do now, Nick? Go back to town? Right. Oh, and when we get there, Patsy, remind me to call the newspapers. The newspapers? Why? Because you can locate all sorts of things through a newspaper ad. And maybe if we advertise, we can locate a murderer. And now, the case of the martyred rat. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's past midnight. And beside a dark highway 50 miles west of the city, a young man stands in the driving rain, swaying weakly as he tries to flag down a passing car. His left arm hangs useless, the hand red with blood that drips steadily from under the sleeve of his leather jacket. Hey. Hey, buddy. Hey. You want a ride? Hop in. Okay. I thought there wasn't anybody ever going to stop. Oh, Nick, he's hurt. Look at his hand. Hey, let me help you. What's the matter, fellow? Uh, You've been in a wreck. We'll get you uh, to a doctor right away. No, no. Never mind the doctor. Get me to the nearest police station. Police? What happened? Were you held up? Yeah. Three guys. They hijacked my truck. Shot me. I... Uh, uh, uh. Oh, Nick, he... He passed out. Is this Mr. Henry Barton of the Barton Motor Freight Company? Yes. Who are you? My name's Carter, Mr. Barton. I'm speaking for one of your drivers, Red Kennedy. What? Is Red in trouble? Yeah, he asked me to let you know that his truck was hijacked tonight, ten miles west of Elm City. Good heavens. That truck was carrying a load worth almost $30,000. How about Red? Is he all right? He's been shot, but it's only a flesh wound. The doctor says he's in pretty good shape. You tell that doctor that I want Red to have the best of everything. What did you say your name was? Carter, Nick Carter. Oh, you're a detective, aren't you? Well, yes, I'm a private investigator. All right, then, go to work. Find out who held up my truck. Get that cargo back. Report to me tomorrow afternoon. Now, now wait a minute. I haven't said I'd take this case. I'm asking you, ain't I? How about it? <laughs> okay, I'll do it. For Red's sake, I don't like seeing people hijacked. Fine. See you in my office at 2 o'clock sharp. Good night. <laughs> Dickens, are you doing back on the job today? Oh, hi, Miss Connor. Good afternoon, Miss Bowen. Well, how's the arm, Red? Ah, it's okay. Well, you can't drive with it, can you? <laughs> I'm no driver, lady. I'm the superintendent. Last night was an emergency. Oh. Hey, Red, shall I check the load on this crate? Yeah. Oh, oh Les, I yeah. want you to meet Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen. This is Les gone. Oh, how do you do? Hello, Les. How do you do? This is a guy that ought to have this hole in his arm instead of me. Hmm? That was supposed to be his run last night. Oh, how come it wasn't? Well, I... Uh... <sighs> I was sick, and the boss asked Red to take over for me. I see. Lucky for you. Yeah. Come on, folks. I'll take you to the boss's office. He's waiting for you. Well, 
Well, Mr. Carter, what did you find out? So far, not much, Mr. Barton. We huh. did go out and take a look at the truck last night, but we couldn't tell anything from that. What do you mean? It's parked half a mile off the main highway on a side road. Yeah, that's where the hijackers made me drive so that they could load the stuff into their own truck. How about uh, tire tracks? Don't you detectives locate criminals, uh, things like that? Well, not unless there are tire tracks, Mr. Barton. Now, you see, there's plenty of mud where the truck was parked, sort of red clay, but the rain had washed out any wheel marks there might have been. Mm-hmm. In other words, you haven't found out one blame thing. Now, see here, Mr. Barton, you can't expect miracles. Miracles? Ha! <laughs> Look. What? Can you give me a list of everything that was stolen last night? Yes, I've got it right here. Cigarettes, nylons, silverware, electrical appliances, chemicals, and a lot of small stuff. Hmm. Most of those things could be easily disposed of. Yeah. Oh, uh, by the way, Red, uh, what about Les? Think he can drive tonight? Sure, Les is okay, Mr. Barton. Oh, is that the driver who was sick last night? Sick? He was drunk. Sending back to Kittery's boarding house to sleep it off. Made Red take over the run. Oh, look, boss. Les wasn't drunk. I told you that last night. I smell liquor on his breath. All right, so he had a drink, maybe two, but he never done it before, did he? No. He better not do it again. If it hadn't been for you, I'd have fired him on the spot. Well, Mr. Barton, I'll let you know as soon as I've got anything definite. Good. And don't make it any later than the day after tomorrow. But why bother starting the car, Nick? That truck's blocking the driveway. I know. We can't get out until someone moves it. Uh, maybe half an hour. I'm going to try this other driveway. Okay, but... I notice it goes around the building. I ought to come out on the opposite side. Golly, this is a big old place. There used to be a brewery in the old days. Makes an ideal warehouse and truck garage. Well, I hope this drive doesn't come to a dead end in the back of the building. Well, we'll know as soon as I make this turn. Ah, it's okay, see? The road goes right on out. Oh! Nick, that was a shot! Oops! Hey, uh, didn't hit you, did I? Oh... No, but what's the big idea? Yes, I, I was just shooting a rats. Oh, and... a big game hunter, huh? Yeah, look, lady, this place is swarming with rats. <laughs> you come out of that big drain from the old part of the building, the part they don't use no more. And you shoot them as they come out? Is that the idea? Yeah, you betcha. Mr. Barton pays me a dime apiece for him. Sometimes you get ten or twelve one afternoon. How much does Mr. Barton pay for innocent bystanders? Hey, uh, I'm, I'm real sorry if I scared you, ma'am. Oh, may, maybe I better introduce myself. Uh, I'm Amos Kittery. I'm kind of a caretaker around here. Kittery? Yeah. Any connection with Kittery's boarding house? <laughs> you betcha. My daughter-in-law runs it. Then I bet you know Les Garner, one of Mr. Barton's drivers. You Bet you. Rooms with us. Oh. Lucky for Les, he wasn't making his regular run last night, wasn't it? I suppose you heard that his truck was hijacked. Yeah, you bet you. Funny thing, too. Les must have had a feeling something was going to happen on that run. Well, why do you say that? Oh, because he, he was nervous and jumpy all day long. Oh? Like as if he was uh, dreading something. Dreading something? Yeah, yeah. He even started to drink in the middle of the afternoon. Les never done that since you know him. That's so. Yeah, you betcha. Acted like he had to work up his courage and go to work. <laughs> he, he got so drunk the, the boss wouldn't let him drive. <laughs> so he stayed home safe and fed, huh? Yeah, not so as you'd notice it. Went right back to the saloon and started slugging him down again. Then all of a sudden he jumped in his car and lit out. Lit out for where? <laughs> no telling. Didn't get back till almost daylight. And was that car a mess? Let's give me a dollar to wash it off for him today. Doggone this red clay you ever did see. Red clay? Yeah, you betcha. Like to never got it off. Nick, that road last night. Yes, Betsy, I know what you mean. Mr. Kittery, where is your daughter's boarding house? Well, uh, when you get on the street, just down the driveway there, she's about a half mile straight ahead on the left-hand side. There's a sign out in front. Uh, why? Because if any of that red clay is still stuck under the fenders of Les's car, I want to compare it with some I took off a truck. Uh, ain't likely they'd be the same. Maybe not, but if they are, Les Garner is going to have to do some pretty heavy explaining. <laughs> Patsy, I'm afraid it's true. Finished your analysis, Nick? Yeah. Clay from the hijacked truck and that from Les Garner's car have exactly the same chemical composition. Oh, then they must have come from the same place. No question about it. But 
If Les was in on the hold-up, Nick, do you think he faked being drunk in order to get out of driving? Look, Patsy, suppose Les was approached by the hijackers and agreed to let them know when he'd be carrying a valuable load. Yeah. Well, they might have arranged a fake hold-up. Why, yes. That could account for his nervousness that day. Right. Then when Barton refused to let him drive, Les would have had to get in touch with the mob and warn them that somebody else would be driving. And that might be how he got the clay on his car. Of course, we don't have any actual proof. No. Oh, just a minute. Nick Carter's office, Patsy Bowen speaking. I want to talk to Carter, young woman, right now. Oh, yes, sir. You better take it, Nick. It's Mr. Barton. Oh, okay. Hello, Mr. Barton. Hello. Think I have some news for you. Oh, you do? Well, I've got some news for you. Another one of my trucks has been hijacked. Another one? Yes. Who was driving it? Les Garner? But, yes. How did you know? I'll tell you later. I don't let Garner get away. Don't worry. He won't get away. Good. The hijackers put a bullet through his head. So Les Garner, the man Nick counted on to lead him to the hijackers, has been killed. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the martyred rat. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's now three o'clock in the morning. Nick and Patsy have driven out to the scene of the holdup with Mr. Barton. State police are detouring traffic around the big truck still parked beside the highway. The body of Les Garner slumped over the wheel. From the angle of the wound, Patsy, it looks as though whoever killed Garner stood here on the running board. Yes, and it must have happened without any warning. Otherwise, Les wouldn't have just sat there behind the wheel. Ah, you're right. There wasn't any fight. Just plain cold-blooded murder. Yeah. Then you'll be taking another big loss, won't you, Mr. Barton? No, oh, I won't lose anything. All my trucks are fully insured against robbery. This cargo wasn't worth much anyway. Oh, it wasn't? No, no, the whole shipment consisted of tin kitchenware, toys, rat poison, cheap lampshades, dried fish. Nothing valuable. Well, I hope the hijackers were plenty disappointed. They weren't, though. Hmm? At least they went to the trouble of unloading this stuff, even after they saw what it was. Oh, they must have been pretty dangerous, too, right on a busy highway like this. Uh, maybe they took the truck off uh, on a side road to unload it and then brought it back here. No, Mr. Barton. Les was killed here. The bloodstains show that his body hasn't been moved from behind the wheel. Uh, uh, if you're all through, Mr. Carter, we'd like to take the body into town. Okay, officer, and thanks for your help. That's what we're here for, Mr. Carter. Okay, Doc, you can take over now. Oh, by the way, officer, yeah? exactly what time was the body found? Uh, let me see. Got it down here. Uh, 12.45. 12.45? Yep. But you didn't notify Mr. Barton until after 1.30. That wasn't our fault, lady. We tried to phone him, but there wasn't any answer. Yeah, well, I, uh, <clears throat> my pinochle club met last night, and I, uh, I didn't get home till after one. Pinochle club? Yeah, but come on, come on, let's get back to the car. Oh, that's a good idea. Hey, Mr. I'm Barton. getting cold. Yes. How long would it take to move the sort of load you had on this truck from one truck to another? At least uh, half an hour. Why? I'm trying to figure out what happened. Well, it's plain enough. They made a big haul the first time, so they tried it again. And then no, they... no, no, no. Hijackers don't rob just any truck. They always have information about which trucks are carrying valuable cargoes. But, Nick, this truck didn't have a valuable cargo. Which proves Mr. Carter is wrong for the second time tonight, young lady. The second time? Didn't you say that Les Garner was mixed up for the hijackers? I did. Well, the fact that they had to kill him to get the cargo proves you were wrong there, too. No, Mr. Barton. The hijackers didn't kill Les in order to get that worthless cargo. They stole the cargo in order to cover up his murder. What? You mean that Les was murdered so he couldn't talk about the first robbery? Exactly. What? The truck was hijacked to make it look like another holdup. Oh, you're crazy. Who knew what was on that first truck and what route it was going to take? Les knew, and Red, as superintendent, knew, even before he took over his driver. But that's all. Well, didn't anyone else know? Absolutely not. Not even you? Well, yes, yes, of course, I knew. Oh, but... uh, Patsy, hmm? when we get back to town, remind me to call the newspapers. Call the newspapers? But why, Nick? Because you can locate all sorts of things through a newspaper ad. And maybe, if we advertise, we can locate a murderer. Hey, Mabel, listen to this in the personal column. Wanted to contact motorists who are driving west from Deaver Springs Friday night between 11.30 p.m. and 1 o'clock. Call Surrey 905. Herbert! We were on that road about there. Yeah. Let me write that number down. Maybe I can help this guy out. Yeah. 
Yes, Mr. Hammond, I'm trying to get information about a trailer truck that was parked just beyond the top of the long hill ten miles west of Deaver Springs Friday night. A uh, Barton Motor Freight Truck? Yes. Did you see it? I'll say I did. I got stuck behind it at the bottom of the hill and had to go all the way up and low. That's why I remember the name. Well, uh, do you remember what time that was, Mr. Hammond? Why, uh, yes. As a matter of fact, I had the car radio on waiting for the 1230 news. It started just as I went around him at the top of the hill. Was there another truck on the hill at the same time? Uh, no, just one other passenger car and me. If we were both stuck behind the truck. You say there was another passenger car? Yeah, and you know there was something funny about that, too. What was that? Well, I stopped about a mile farther on because I thought I had a flat. Uh-huh. But neither the truck nor the other car ever did pass me. Well, maybe the car turned off on a side road. Ah, uh, there aren't any on that stretch. Well, what sort of a car was it, do you know? No, no, it was behind me. All I could see was the headlights. Afterwards, Mabel and I wondered what happened to it. I think I know what happened to it, Mr. Hammond. In fact, with what you've told me, I think I know the answer to a lot of things. Oh, Nick. What's the idea of exploring the basement of this old warehouse? Oh, I thought it might be interesting to see what's down here in the unused part of it. Oh, but it's like a, a dungeon down here. I can... Nick. <laughs> Something ran across my foot. Yeah, probably a rat. A rat? Oh, dear. I thought we'd run into some rats. That's why I warned you to wear slacks in your heavy walking boots. Oh, but... Oh, honestly, this part of the building is alive with them. Oh. Here. Let's see what's on the other side of this door. You seem to know exactly where you're going. Look where I threw the flashlight. See those marks in the dust? Uh, oh, yes. Well, I'm following him. But if you asked Mr. Barton, he probably would have sent somebody along to... To clear the rats out of the way, at least. I didn't want Barton or anybody else to know we'd be snooping around this part of the building. Oh, here's another door. Do we go through that, too? Mm-hmm. Oh, golly, it's musty in here. Yeah. This must have been used for storage rooms when the place was a brewery. <laughs> oh, Nick, it's another rat. Look, Patsy, you insisted on coming oh, along. Oh, no, but... Hey... They still use this room for storage. It's full of boxes and crates. Yeah, let's see what they are. Mm -hmm. Marvel kitchenware. Dried herring. Siotex lampshade. That's it. What? That's the cargo that was supposed to have been stolen from Les Garner's truck last night. And it wasn't stolen at all. Say that again. Oh. That truck was unloaded before it ever left the warehouse. Nice figure, but... Mr. Carter. Red. Red Kennedy. Yeah. And don't reach for your pocket, Mr. Carter. You couldn't draw very fast wearing them heavy gloves. My gun is aimed at you right now. I wore these gloves for protection against four-footed rats, Red. And you... You hijacked your own truck? Yes, then murdered his own partner. That jerk wasn't my partner. I gave Les a chance to get in on the deal, but he was a nice little boy that didn't believe in taking things that didn't belong to him. You saying that Les Garner wasn't mixed up in that first robbery? He would have been if Barton had let him drive that night. But he didn't really want any part of it. That's why he started drinking. But he was there that night. The red clay on his car proved it. Yeah, he was there. Trying to talk me out of it. <laughs> he said he was appealing to my better nature. So that's how you got shot. There was a fight No, him. I just left at the jerk and sent him back to town. Well, then who shot you? I put that bullet hole in my arm myself. You... Just to make the hold up look like the McCoy. For a $30,000 cargo, it was worth it. And then when you learned that Nick was suspicious of Les, you killed him. That's right. Oh. Jellyfish would have spilled everything if he'd been pinched. So I unloaded his truck, told him his schedule had been changed, and that he was to pick up a load in Pittsburgh. And when he left, I followed his truck, flagged it down, and got rid of him. Won't be so easy getting rid of us, Red. No? No. If anybody hears shots coming from this part of the building... Are you a... kidding? You can shoot off a cannon down here without nobody hearing it outside? No. No, I got a better idea. Yeah? What is it? You're going to get locked in down here by accident. Oh, no. Yeah, wait a minute, Red. Sorry, Carter. Maybe I'll come back and see you again in a couple of years. Oh, Red, Red, please. Oh, Nick. Nick, what are we going to do? Get away from the door, Patsy. I want to try something. But we can't. Did it work? No. Did you? Bullets don't mean a thing against the door like that. But, Nick, nobody knows we're here. Nobody will come looking for us. We, we've got to break out of here somehow. We can't break out. Maybe if we yell out enough, somebody will hear us. Patsy, and... these walls are over a foot thick. No one can possibly hear us. No one can possibly... Oh, Nick. 
Dick is like being in a tomb. Dick! Dick, we're buried alive! Locked in a forgotten basement room of the old brewery, unable to break out or make themselves heard, Nick and Patsy are faced with almost certain death. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the martyred rat. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Red Kennedy has left Nick and Patsy to die, locked in a small windowless basement room deep inside the old brewery. Now Nick examines the door with his flashlight. Can, can you do anything with the lock, Nick? There isn't any lock on this side, not even a keyhole. It's all on the other side. Oh, if only somebody knew we'd come here. Oh, oh. What's the matter? Oh, another rat. They're all over. Oh. Hey, rats. Yes, rats. Look, Patsy, those rats must come from somewhere. And these are brick walls. Huh? There has to be a... Now, let me see. Yeah, there it is. There what is? A drain pipe. Here, hold the flashlight while I move some of these boxes. Oh, Nick, have you got an idea how we can get Martin out? Martin said this stuff included a shipment of rat poison. Yeah, but... Shine the light on this box. Uh-huh. Sure kill rat poison. They die outside. Outside, Patsy, and the rats can get outside through the drain pipe. Oh, but what good does that do us? Look, when I was a kid, I used to make rabbit traps out of a box, a stick, and a piece of string. Yeah, but Nick... You prop the box up with a sting and tie the string to it. Then when the rabbit goes under the box after the bait, you pull the string and the box falls down on top of it. Well, I still don't Patsy, see. Patsy, if we can get some of these rats into a trap, maybe they'll get us out of the trap we're in. Nick, what time is it? Four o'clock in the afternoon. Been in here 23 hours. I... I guess it didn't work, did it? Afraid not. It was such a nice scheme, too. Tying messages to the legs of those rats. Then letting them eat the rat poison. And escaping to the drain pipe. Darn it. <sighs> One or two of them must have got through. The boxes containing the poison said they always go out into the open air to die. Well, maybe they died. And nobody found them. Yeah, maybe. Father! But... Father! Oh. Now listen. Oh. Oh, where are you? Patsy, that's Martin. He's found us. We're here, Mrs. Martin. In here. I tell you, Carter, when old Amos Kittery brought me that dead rat with a message tied to its leg, I thought he was crazy. I don't blame you, Mr. Barton. I gambled on the chance that Kittery would either shoot or find one that had a message tied to it. Well, it turned out to be a good gamble, but why did you think you would find the stolen cargo where you did? Because Garner's truck was seen climbing the hill at 12.30, just 15 minutes before his body was found. And you told us it would take at least 30 minutes to unload the truck. That's why I figured that truck must have been empty when it left the warehouse. I see. Then when I heard about the car that followed Garner up the hill, but no farther, I was pretty sure the driver of it was the one who killed Garner. Why? Well, there was nothing wrong with the truck, which meant that Garner wouldn't have stopped without being flagged down. And by somebody he knew. Yes, you're right there. He wouldn't have stopped for a stranger. It also had to be somebody who worked here, Mr. Barton. Sure, otherwise the driver of that car wouldn't have known the route. And he wouldn't have had a chance to unload the truck before it pulled out of here. Well, it could have been me, of course. Don't think I didn't think of you. Oh, oh you did, did you? Of course I did, but I checked your alibi. Uh, you uh, didn't do very well in that pinochle game, did you, Mr. Barton? Uh, no. <laughs> That's why you didn't care to talk about it. Mm, well, by the I... way, Red's confessed that the first cargo, the one that was hijacked when he was driving, is hidden in an old barn nearby. You better send out a truck for it. Yeah, I'll do that right away. And, Carter, I've got to give you credit. You did a fine job. Oh, thanks. But the, there's just one thing. Yeah, what's that, Patsy? Well, I still loathe rats, but I feel kind of sorry for the one that got our message through. We poisoned him, and then he saved our lives. <laughs> well, he was a martyr in a good cause, Miss Bowen. <laughs> we'll bury him with honors. Yes, Patsy. And every year on this day, you can put a piece of cheese on his grave. <sighs> And now... 
the winners of the four 1948 Super Deluxe Ford V8 four-door sedans in the fourth new post-war old clutch cleanser jingle contest, which closed March 20th. Nick, you mind if I make the awards this week? Sorry, Mike, but it's been just too much fun giving away Fords. Okay, go to it. Try and stop me. Well, folks, here are the lucky people who get brand new Fords this week. Mrs. Bruce Gordon, Box 636, Hamilton, New York. Ann Hall, 5500 North Newland Avenue, Chicago, Illinois. Mrs. Theodore Payne, P.O. Box 408, Washington 4, District of Columbia. And Mrs. Vera Peter, 8017 North Whitney Road, Milwaukee 11, Wisconsin. And to all these fortunate folks, as well as to all the other contest winners, let me say congratulations. And remember, we'll announce winners of the last week's contest as soon as possible. So be sure to keep listening. And Nick, that reminds me, what do you have in store for us next week? Something real exciting, Mike. You see, it all started when an East Indian Maharaja lost a 100-carat diamond. Oh, no, Nick. It really started when the movie producer's daughter disappeared. Well, maybe so, Patsy, but it was because of the diamond that we found a dead body 3,000 miles from where it should have been. Hey, take it easy. This is getting too rich for my blood. What do you call this story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Star of Evil. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. Because of the state of our schools, the future of 28 million American children is in peril. This means we must all work to improve educational conditions because the future of these children and their teachers is the future of America. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined, as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Look, Batty, you have a description of the killer, don't you? Yes, Scubby, and what a description. An average size man wearing a dark overcoat. Why, I can pick up a dozen suspects on every corner with that description. Uh, it's going to be tough, all right, Matty. Yeah. You don't know where the murdered man went last night? You don't know whom he was with? You don't even know where he was killed? Are there any clues at all, Nick? Just one, Scubby. And you're looking right at it. Yeah, a fine clue, that is. A dead body with a knife in its back. And now, the case of the henpecked husband. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. <laughs> Professor Harold Thompson has never been inside a gambling house in all his 53 years. His wife wouldn't allow it. But since reading about the game of roulette in his encyclopedia, the professor is willing to risk Mrs. Thompson's anger because he has a wonderful plan. That's why he's come to Nick Carter. I shall win $20,000 each evening, Mr. Carter, and then cease my activities. Well, what do you want me to do? First, show me the establishments where this game is played. Second, ascertain whether the roulette wheel is honest. And third, see that I'm not, uh, robbed of my winnings by some footpad. Well, Professor, what makes you so sure there will be any winnings? Well, from reading the article on roulette in my encyclopedia, I have avowed a system of wagering by which I can't possibly lose. Take my word for it, Professor. You can't possibly win. Not over any period of time. Oh, but you don't know my system. Here, uh, let me have a piece of paper. Believe me, Professor Thompson, no system will beat a roulette wheel. Ah, but it's quite simple to the mathematical mind. Hmm. Now, here we have... Oh, my fountain pen is dry. Excuse me. 
Nick Carter speaking. Sergeant Matheson, Nick. Oh, what's on your mind, Matty? How's about having dinner with me tonight? My wife's visiting her mother, and I hate eating alone. Why, sure, Matty. Good idea. Patsy's gone down to Cuba for a few days, so I'd probably be eating alone anyway. All right, then suppose you pick me up at my office about seven, huh? Will do. See you then. Okay. So long. I filled my pen from your inkwell, Mr. Carter. I hope you don't mind. Oh, no, of course not. No. I have withdrawn $2,500 from my savings account, and I'm ready to begin operations. Do you want to help me or not? I do not. All I want to do is to keep you from throwing your money away. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter. In that case, I shall proceed without you. Good day. Hey, Daisy, take a look at the little old guy at the roulette table. Hey, he's doing all right, isn't he? Yeah, he's doing too good. Hey, look, maybe I ought to go over and get acquainted, huh? Yeah, feed him a couple of drinks and keep him playing till the house gets those chips back. Mm -hmm. I don't want him leaving here with that kind of dough. Number four, black. Oh, there you are. Why, you lucky boy. You won again. But of course, I intended to. <laughs> I was standing right behind you. Maybe I brought you luck, huh? Today's my birthday, you know. Really? Mm-hmm. Well, you must give me your address so that I can send you some flowers. Flowers? Are you... Here, I, I brought you a drink. Place your bets, ladies and gentlemen. A cocktail? Oh, but I mustn't. My wife never allows me to take intoxicants. Oh, go on. It won't hurt you. Gee, you got a lot of chips there. Yes, my winnings amount to $22,000. Um, where can I exchange them for money? You don't mean you're quitting. Oh, I must. It's long after midnight. I don't know what my wife will say. Not leaving, are you? Well, you can. Not when you're winning. Come on, be a sport. Well, since I have an extra $2,000, I shall wager it on uh, number 33. Hey, wait a minute. You can't bet two grand's on a number. 100's a limit. It's all right, Maxie. But, boss, the numbers pay 35 to 1. Who's running this place? Okay, okay. It's your funeral. Uh, that's all. That's all. No more bets. Thank you, Mr. Uh... Beal. Harry Beal. Mr. Beal. Actually, I'm throwing away this $2,000. You see, I don't wish to win more than 20000 tonight. And uh, number 33. Hey, you won again. My, how extremely fortunate. Yeah, another 70 grand. Maxie, close it up. Everything. No more play tonight. Okay, boss. Hey, Harry. He's got 90,000 bucks coming. What are you going to do? I'm going to pay it. Uh, come on back to my office, sport. We'll have a few drinks to celebrate your good luck. Then I'll cash in your chips. Imagine me winning all this money. Imagine. Oh, my. Oh, my. Come on. Come on, Palsy. You'll be all right when you get in the car. Oh, he's all right now, Maxie. Oh, but I should have been home long, long ago. Yeah, maybe you'd like to stop for another drink before you go home, huh, Prof? Oh, no, Miss Gilmore. No. I, I, I might become a bit uh, tipsy. And, and, and my wife... Yeah, she don't like drinking, huh? My wife doesn't like anything. My wife doesn't like anybody. Except uh, her brother Wilfred, of course. He's been visiting us uh, for nine years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's the boss's car, Prof. This blue convertible. Pile in. Very well. Uh, I shall drive. Oh, no, no. I'm driving, chum. You sit in the middle. Oh. Okay. Oh, well, where do you live, Prof? Far, far away. In the suburbs. Eastview. Oh. Hey, Maxie, it's going to be too windy driving out there with the car all open like this. You better put the top up, hadn't you? Not the hell. Do them good. <laughs> I assure you that I am quite capable of driving. Hey, Prof, grab your hat. What did oh, you... Too late, it's gone. Oh, so it is. Well, if you will let no, me no, out... No, you sit uh... still. I'll get it. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, let me... Prof, what are you doing? You don't want to get behind the wheel. Maxie's coming back. Hey, hey, no. hey come back here. Prof, turn around. Go back for Maxie. Uh, Thompson never turns back. <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter with you? I, I, I was thinking of my wife. If she could see me now with you, Miss Gilmore, she'd murder me. Oh, dog, got it. Sure, Miss Patsy. She's away. I only. Hiya, Nick. 
How's things? Why, hello, Scubby. Long time, no see. Been pretty busy, Nick, but the newspaper's hitting a new low just now. What? You mean there's no story worthy of the attention of a hotshot reporter like Scubby Wilson? Not a thing. That's why I dropped in to see if you had any hot tips. Oh, uh, not a thing, Scubby. Hey, where's Patsy? Oh, taking a little vacation in Cuba. And do I miss her? Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, do you want me to type that for you? Uh, no thanks. It's just about finished now. Hmm. But uh, oh, excuse me. Nick Carter speaking. Morning, Nick. Matty. Oh, hi, Matty. Uh, you remember the little guy who wanted to play roulette? The one you told me about at dinner last night? Professor Thompson? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what about him? Well, I'm on my way out to his house in Eastview. I thought you'd like to come along. Uh, what's happened? The prof was found in a ditch north of the city about 8 o'clock this morning, Nick. Stabbed in the back. <laughs> Uh, when did you see your husband last, Mrs. Thompson? He left immediately after dinner last night, and... Is your name Mrs. Thompson? Well, now, look here. Never mind, Wilfred, dear. I feel strong enough to talk now. Oh, don't excite yourself, Hannah. Remember your indigestion. All right, now, Mrs. Thompson. You know, I when suffer I... terribly from nervous indigestion. Well, last night, when Harold wasn't home by midnight, I was so furious. So worried, Hannah. Yes, so worried that poor brother Wilfred had to get out of bed and phone the doctor. Mrs. Thompson, do you know where your husband went last night? I do not. Some den of iniquity, no doubt. What makes you say that? No respectable place would keep a man out after midnight. You're right, Hannah. When the doctor left at 1.30, I told brother to lock the front door and bolt it. Well, the medical examiner says Professor Thompson was killed at least an hour later than that. And we found him clear on the other side of town. Did you say he'd been robbed? That's right. His pockets were turned inside out. If his pockets were empty, Maddie, how did you identify the body so quickly? His initials were in his hat band, Scubby. And the inside pocket of his overcoat had been overlooked. His notebook and a letter were there. <laughs> I can't imagine why anyone would want to rob Harold. I never allowed him to carry more than five dollars in cash. According to what he told Nick, Mrs. Thompson, he had just drawn twenty-five hundred dollars from the bank. Twenty? He wouldn't dare. Now, Hannah, don't excite yourself. And only last week he objected when I spent fifty dollars to get brother a new suit. Well, my dear, you know Harold never liked me. Can't Wilfred buy his own clothes? Wilfred is temporarily out of employment. Mr. Carter... Did my husband mention why he drew that money out of the bank? I think he intended to play roulette with it, Mrs. Thompson. That's what he was doing, gambling. Throwing his money away and then getting himself killed. There's always the insurance, Hannah. Huh? Why, why, Wilfred, of course. Ten thousand dollars. And in a case like this, we'll be able to collect double indemnity, too. <laughs> Isn't that right, Mr. Carter? <sighs> You'll have to settle that with the insurance company. Twenty thousand dollars. Well, brother dear, I guess everything is all right after all. Hey, Nick, where are we driving to? An address I found in the professor's notebook, apartment 9B, 176 Van Arnhem Street. But he had a couple of dozen addresses in that book. Why pick this one? Who lives there? I don't know, Matty. There wasn't any name. But the address was written in blue ink. What? And everything else in the notebook was in black ink. You think the blue ink means something, Nick? I do, Scubby. See, the professor filled his fountain pen in my office late yesterday afternoon with blue ink. Which oh. makes you think he wrote down this address after he met you, huh? It's the way I figure it. And it may be someone who was with him last night. Uh. Well, 176 should be in this block. Yeah, this building on the right is the only one that looks like an apartment house. Yeah. Now, I can't see the number, but there's a guy walking over here that ought to be able to tell us. Hey, you fellas sure made good time. Is this 176? Yeah, you're the police, ain't you? I am, but... Well, what... come on, and I'll take you up. Up where? We're looking for apartment 9B. Sure, I know. I'm the one that sent for you. What? You sent for the police? Yeah, I'm the superintendent of the apartment house. It was me that found the body. What body? Daisy Gilmore's, of course. Like I said over the phone, she'd been murdered. <laughs> And so the address in the dead professor's notebook had led not to a solution of the case as Nick hoped, but to another murder. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the henpecked husband. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. 
As Nick examines the lifeless body of Daisy Gilmore, Matty questions the building superintendent of Daisy's apartment house. That's just the way she was when I found her about 15 minutes ago. I seen right away she was dead, so I called the cops. Yeah? And what business did you have in this apartment? Well, uh, I come in to clean up like I always do on Saturday afternoons. I get five bucks for it. Uh Uh-huh. How long do you think she's been dead, Nick? At least eight or ten hours, Matty. She was stabbed, wasn't she? Just like the professor. Yeah. Yeah. Judging from the wound, I'd say it could have been the same knife. Yeah, then I'll bet he was killed here, too. It was inside someplace. Well, what makes you think that, Matty? Oh, I forgot you and Nick didn't see the body of the professor. No. Well, the knife didn't go through his overcoat. What? They put that on him after he was dead. Hey, no. hey, could Miss Gilmore have been killed at 4.30 this morning? Might have been done that long ago. Why? Well, I seen a guy coming down the stairs from this floor about 4.30. Or maybe it was closer to 5. You say he was coming down the stairs? Yeah. I thought it was funny he didn't take the elevator, and I bet that's why. I bet he just killed her, and he didn't want anybody to see him. Would you recognize the man if you saw him again? Oh, sure. He was about my size, and he wore a dark overcoat. That's a swell description. Well, uh... Look, you, what were you doing prowling around at 4.30 in the a.m.? Mr. Wagner on the floor below this couldn't find his key when he come home, see, so I had to get up and let him in. Look, do you know whether Miss Gilmore was acquainted with the professor? Sir Thompson? No, but they might be able to tell you at the 60 Club where she was. The, the 60 Club? Hey, Nick, that's a gambling joint. Sure it is. It's Harry Beale's place. And the professor was going to play roulette last night. Sounds like a definite lead, Matty. Look, Nick, I don't want to leave here until the medical examiner and the fingerprint boys come. Maybe you'd like to go over and talk to Beale, huh? I certainly would, and right now. Come on, Scubby. <laughs> Harry Beale, what about it? I'm trying to find out whether a Professor Harold Thompson was in your club last night. Hey, Maxie, the guy wants to know if we saw the prof last night. Is he kidding? Then you do remember him. I wish I could forget him. He cleaned out the joint. You mean the professor won? He took 90,000 bucks away from me, that's all. Oh, oh. And in cash. I'll be darned. That roulette system of his worked. Look, mister... There ain't any roulette system that works. The prof won in spite of his system. That's what I get for running an honest wheel. Never again, believe me. And you say the professor had $90,000 in cash when he left here? Yeah, my cash. Not only that, he took my car and my girl. Daisy Gilmore? That's her. Oh, so maybe you were jealous, huh? Of the prof? (laughs) Don't make me laugh. Look, if Daisy would have held the prof's hand even, he'd have fainted. How do you happen to take your car, Harry? Hey, I told Maxie here to drive him home to be sure he got there safe. Yeah, especially since he was slightly plastered. And Daisy was going along, so, so I thought this I... this jerk lets him get away from him. What time did all this happen? Oh, about 2 a.m. What's your idea of all the questions? It wasn't long after that that the professor was robbed and murdered. You mean somebody knocked him off? Yes, somebody who knew he had that money. You knew about it, Beale. And so did you, Maxie. Hey, what are you picking on us for? What about Daisy? She was with him. We weren't. Both of you knew that, too. Maybe you expected her to get the money away from him. Maybe that's why one of you was waiting at her apartment when she got home. Waiting with a knife. Huh? What did you say? You mean Daisy got her, too? She's dead? She sure is. And you two got a lot of explaining to do. Now, look, you can't pin anything on me. I was still here at the club at 4.30. I got a dozen witnesses. What makes you so sure Daisy wasn't killed after 4.30? Uh... Well, I... Look here, Harry. The superintendent of her apartment building saw a man leaving between 4.30 and 5, and he says he'd recognize that man if he saw him again. Maybe you'd better come down to headquarters and let him take a look at you. I... All right. All right, so I was there. When I closed up the joint, I hopped a cab to Daisy's place. When I walked in, she was already dead. So that's your story, huh? Well, Harry, I think they'll want to hear that at headquarters, too. Okay, okay, I'm not afraid to go down there. Maxie, get me my hat. Okay. Isn't that it on the desk there beside you? That gay 90s model? Yeah. <laughs> Not much. Uh, that belongs to the prof. What's that? Sure. That's how he got away from me. His hat blew off, and when I got out of the car to get it for him, he drove off and left me. So that's what's happened. Come on, Scubby. We've got work to do. Hey, copper, I thought you was hauling me in. Haul yourself in, Harry. I'm going after the real killer. Thompson, did your husband own a car? Yes, but I didn't let him drive it. I always felt much safer with Brother Wilfred at the wheel. Where's the car now? Wilfred took it down to the Holloway garage to have the oil changed. Oh, he did, huh? Yes. 
I thought a drive might clear my head after that drug the doctor gave me. You've had the doctor again today? No. She gave me something awfully strong last night. He said, I'm going to give you enough of this so that we can both get some sleep. <laughs> he doesn't like being called out at night. Hmm. Just one more question, Mrs. Thompson. How many hats did the professor have? He had two. Why? Where are they now? Well, he was wearing one of them when he was killed. The other's on the hall tree, right? No, it isn't. Wait, it's gone. He must have lost it. That beautiful three-dollar hat of all the never mind, never mind about that now. How do I get to the Holloway garage? <sighs> it's down the street about six blocks. You going to see my brother? Not only going to see your brother, Mrs. Thompson. I'm going to ask him some very pointed questions. <laughs> Look, Nick, you're not really sure that Wilfred killed the professor, are you? I'm positive, Scubby. Okay. But why? Well, the professor lost his hat at the 60 Club, and yet he was wearing his other hat when he was found dead. That proves he got home safely. But suppose he went out again. Oh, no, not him, Scubby. Not at 3 o'clock in the morning. Besides, the front door was locked and bolted. Mrs. Thompson was in a heavy sleep induced by a drug. So Wilfred must have let the professor into the house. Sure. After he killed him, he got the overcoat and the second hat off the hall tree put them on the body, and then drove to the other side of town and dumped it in the ditch. Sure. Thought he'd make it look like a holdup. You think Wilfred also knocked off Daisy? I'm sure of it. The wounds in both bodies were made by the same kind of knife. Probably one he got from the kitchen. Oh, but Nick, how could he know about We'll the... find out that out later. Here's the Holloway garage just ahead. Hey, did you notice that car that just came out of the garage, Nick? Yes, and brother Wilfred was driving it. His sister must have phoned ahead to warn him. Oh, I should have expected that. Now, oh, darn it. Hey, do you think that we can catch him? Unless that bus of his can make better than 90 miles an hour, I can. Hold on, Scubby. We're gaining on him. Yeah, it won't be long now. Oh, brother. Hey, you weren't kidding when you said hold on. Can't you even slow down on the curves? Not if I want to catch this guy. Well, take it easy. We're almost up to him now. Look, Scubby, I'm going to pull up alongside of him. But do you want me to yell at him to no, pull no, over? No, no, it won't do any good. He knows what we want. Uh, sure, but... I'll have to force him over to the side of the road. Well, he's not slowing up any. Then I'll crowd him some more. Hey, Nick, look out! He's cutting into us! For the love of Pete, Nick, watch us! At high speed, the killer swerves his car directly into Nick's. And with a crash, both autos leave the highway. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the henpecked husband. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Driving at high speed, Nick Carter tried to stop an escaping killer by forcing his car to the side of the road. But the killer, realizing he's been trapped, smashed his car into Nick's. With a crash, both cars left the road. It's now a few moments later. Oh... Brother. Oh, was that a narrow escape? Oh, you hurt, Scubby? I don't think so. Oh, my joints seem to work okay. Oh, how about you? Uh, nothing serious, I guess. You know, for a minute there, I thought we were going to turn over. Darn lucky we didn't. Darn lucky I had good brakes. I managed to slow down a little before he hit us. Oh, come on. Holy cow. Look at Brother Wilford's car. There's our wreck for you. Uh, huh. The way he's wrapped around that tree, it's a wonder if he's not dead. Try opening the door, Scubby. Okay. Uh, no, no soap. It's jammed, but good. In that case, we'll have to bust a window and haul him out that way. Look out, I'm going to heave this rock. Let her go. <laughs> well, well, listen to that. Brother Wilford's still alive, I'm glad to say. All right, give me a hand, Scubby, and we'll get him out. Yeah, sure thing, Nick. My head. Oh, oh. skip it, Wilfred. Save your strength. I'm dying. I'm dying. Yeah, and Maddie's just dying for a little conversation with you. Come on. Let's go down to headquarters. What's the doctor say, Maddie? No bones broken, plenty of bruises, and a possible concussion. We'll know in a minute, Nick. It's a wonder we're not all dead after what happened. Uh, you can come in, Sergeant. Doc says no concussion. You can talk to him if you want to. Brother, I sure do. Come on, Nick. You too, Scubby. Okay. I'd like to know what in heaven's name was the idea of chasing me and wrecking my car. Now, if you think you... Look, Wilford, instead of asking questions, 
Suppose you answer, sir. But I tell you, when I... When the professor came home last night and told you that he had won $90,000, you killed him, didn't you? Sergeant, that's ridiculous. No, it but... isn't, Wilford. You unbolted the door and let the professor in when he came home last night. I've told then you Then you I... killed him with a knife you got from the kitchen. That's not true. Then you put the professor's hat and coat on the dead body and took it out in the suburbs and dumped it in a ditch. Now, where'd you hide the money? Carter, you can't prove a word of that. Well, but we can, Wilfred. You can't even prove Harold came home after being at that gambling den. No? When the professor was found, he was wearing a hat that he had left on the hall rack in the hat and the hall rack of his home when he went out for the evening. Well, nevertheless, I... You didn't know that he left the hat he was wearing at the club, did you? He left his hat at the... He did. And with Mrs. Thompson asleep under the influence of the opiate, you were the only one who could have let him in because the door was bolted. All right. I did kill him. The old tight wad. Come on, Wilfred. Where's the money? In a shoebox in my closet. Uh, look, how did you find out about Daisy? I, I saw her sitting in the car when I let Harold in. And knowing she could swear that he got home safely, you had to get rid of her. Well, I... So you asked the prof about her, and he told you everything. He even gave you her address, which he'd written down in his notebook. All right, if you know everything, why ask me? We'd just like you to hear you tell it, that's all. So long for now, brother. We'll have a confession ready for you to sign in a little while. Oh, Nick, do you still have that notebook, the one with the professor's roulette system in it? Sure, no. I do, Scabby. Why? Well, I was just thinking I'd sort of like to copy down the system he figured out to beat the game. Scabby, are you nuts? No. If he could win 90 grand with it, why? I don't see why Scubby, I can't Scubby. possibly... You ought to know better. Whatever the professor won, he won in spite of his system, not because of it. Oh, yeah, sure, Nick. You're right. But I'll bet I can write a swell story on it for the Sunday paper. (laughs) Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Ed Latimer plays Matty. John Kane is Scubby. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Friends, despite the progress made in the treatment of cancer, we can't let up in our fight to stamp out this dreaded killer. Yes, every three minutes, someone dies of cancer. And the fight against it can be carried out only with your help. So give and give generously to the American Cancer Society. Give more than before. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. War Old Dutch Cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined... as new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser... brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters... in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, if only he'd come. He's ten minutes late now. I want to see him just as much as you do, Patsy. I sure hope he can tell us what we want to know. Twelve hours on this case, and we don't even know the victim's name. That's true, Patsy. (gasps) Great Scott! Nick, is he... did they... Yes, Patsy, they did. He'll never tell us anything now. He's dead. Now, the case of the nameless blonde... Today's exciting adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As our story opens, Nick has just returned to his office from lunch. Finding no one in the reception room, he makes his way back to the laboratory, where Patsy Bowen greets him. Oh, Nick, you have a visitor in your office. Oh, I have? She came right after you left, a very attractive blonde. That's nice. Who is she? (laughs) She wouldn't give me her name. Okay, let's see what she wants. Well, Miss... Why, she isn't here. Nick, look. Behind your desk. Great Scott. She must have fainted. Let's have a look. Why, this woman hasn't fainted, Patsy. She's dead. And that 
puts the story on your mysterious blonde, Nick. Medical examiner finished his autopsy about ten minutes ago. So her death wasn't from natural causes. Not with that much poison in her. Huh. I don't even know who she was. There was nothing on her to identify her. Well, I let the newspaper photographers take her picture. The edition should be on the streets by now. Have you seen them? Now, Patsy's out getting the papers now. Uh-huh. Well, somebody may be able to identify her. I'll let you know if anything develops. I'm back, Nick. Okay, Maddie. Thanks for calling. Right. Her picture's on the front page of all the papers, Nick. Let me see. What'd the sergeant have to say? Just that our nameless blonde was poisoned. Poisoned? Yeah, she was fed arsenic three hours before she died. But, but Nick, I thought arsenic resulted in violent death. Well, she looked more as if she'd suffered a heart attack. Well, sometimes it acts this way. What? Then she just came in here and toppled over without uttering a sound? Mm-hmm. That's why you didn't hear her. Oh. Well, I guess I'd better straighten up this office. The sergeant's men certainly made a mess of your desk. You'd think they'd... Nick. Yeah, what is it? These aren't your keys, are they? Well, let me see. Well, no, I never saw them before. Then they must belong to that woman. She was sitting here before she died, and... Well, look here. Well, what is it? There's a name printed here on the case the keys are in. Oh? It's almost worn off, well, but can I... can you make it out, Nick? Just Simon Grenander. Simon Grenander? Yeah. Well, that's an odd name. Is that all it says? Yeah, just the name. Hand me the city directory, will you? Yeah. Thanks. Here. Now, let's see what we can find. There we are, G. Grimley, Grim, mm-hmm. Grendel. Well, there's no Grenander at all. Oh, then we... Oh, I'll get it. Okay. Nick Carter speaking. Uh, Nick, this is Matty again. Yeah? We got a nibble on that picture in the paper. You mean somebody identified her? No, but a cab driver just came into my office. He says he recognizes her as a fare he picked up downtown yesterday. Good. He took her out on Lafayette Road. Lafayette Road? Yeah. Well, that's a pretty swank neighborhood. <laughs> I'll say. Now, the street number was 1720. 1720? Yeah, I'm on my way out there now. Patsy and I'll meet you there. 20 minutes. <laughs> Okay, Matty. Hello, Sergeant. Oh, hiya, Patsy. Well, this is the place, Nick. I thought I'd wait for you two before I did any investigating. Oh. Gee, the house is completely dark. Yeah, it don't look like anyone's home. Not the friendliest place I've ever seen. Uh-uh. Ring the bell, will you, Matty? Right. There is oh. no use trying to get in. Uh, what the... Stand right where you are. Don't try anything because I have a gun. Hey, look, who are you? Who are you? And what are you doing trespassing on private property? We happen to be the police, mister. The police? Yeah. Yeah, now who are you? I'm the caretaker. My name is Weber. Nobody home here? No. There's no one living in the house now. Hasn't been since the funeral. Funeral? Whose funeral? Mr. Stokes. He died just last week. He lived here alone. Do you mean Marvin Stokes of Stokes and Whitaker, the big real estate company? That's right, miss. Oh. Were you here all day yesterday, Weber? Sure. I'm here all the time, day and night. And maybe you can tell us the name of the visitor you had yesterday. Uh, visitor? Yes. I, uh, I did not have any visitors yesterday. Look, we know a woman came to this house in a taxi cab late last evening. Now, who was she? You're crazy. No woman came here. The cab driver says he let her out here and she walked up the steps before he drove off. That is not so. Who's Simon Grenander? Simon Grenander? I have never heard of anyone by that name. All right. You have the authority to let us in this house? No, I cannot do that. You would have to see Mr. Stokes' partner, Mr. Whitaker. He is the only one who could let you in. Why Mr. Whitaker? Because he is in charge of this property now. Okay. I guess that means we drop in on Mr. Whitaker. Well, you go ahead, Nick. I gotta get back to headquarters. See you later then, Matty. Okay. Come on, Patsy. <laughs> Mr. Carter, you can get into the Stokes home anytime you want to. Thanks, Mr. Whitaker. However, I doubt that it will throw any light on this mysterious woman you've been telling me about. Well, why do you say that, Mr. Whitaker? Because, Miss Bowen, it's hard for me to believe that Marvin Stokes had any dealings with a woman. Oh? He and I were partners for 20 years, Mr. Carter. And in all that time, he had no interest in women at all. In fact, he was woman shy. It was an obsession with him. But, 
this gets screwier and screwier, Nick. The only thing we're sure of about that woman is that she went to Stokes' house. Well... And now we find that she had no reason to go there and that nobody saw when she got there. Oh, by the way, Mr. Whitaker, does the name of Grenander mean anything to you? Simon Grenander? Mm, no. No, I've never heard the name before. To the best of my right... Excuse me. Hello? This is Sergeant Matheson of Homicide. Is Nick Carter there? Yes, just a moment. For you, Mr. Carter. Thanks. Hello? Nick, Matty, we got another bite on that newspaper picture. Oh? A guy named McIntyre just called to say he thinks he can identify the dame. Say his name's McIntyre? Yeah, Captain Ernest McIntyre. I'm meeting him at the morgue in 20 minutes. Okay, Matty. We'll get over there right away. Oh, what the devil's keeping that guy? He's 15 minutes late already. Oh, take it easy, Sergeant. He'll be here. Oh. Hey, Matty, you have any idea who this Captain McIntyre is? No, he just said he was a retired sea captain. I asked him if... What's that? Holy smoke, those were shots. They're right outside. Yeah, come on. Right. Now, look, there's oh. a man lying there. He's been shot. Yeah. Killer must be in that car that just pulled away, Nick. Yeah, it's the only way he could get out of here so fast. Yeah. Well, whoever blasted this guy did a good job. He's dead. Nick. Do you think this is Captain McIntyre? Wait till I see whether there's any identification on him. Yeah. Hey, what's that, Nick? Billfold. Find anything in it? Yeah, he's Captain McIntyre, all right. Uh, well, how do you like that for a lousy break? Well, now we know somebody's determined to keep us from identifying that woman. So determined, in fact, they'll even commit murder to do it. <laughs> And so, once again, Nick is frustrated in his desire to learn the identity of the nameless blonde. We'll see what happens next in just a minute. And now, back to the case of the nameless blonde. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As we pick up our story, two hours have passed since the death of Captain McIntyre, the man who promised to identify the mysterious woman Nick found murdered in his office. Now in the bright moonlight, Nick, Patsy, and Sergeant Matheson approach a small waterfront shanty. The next shack down the beach should be the one where McIntyre lived. Yeah, what do you expect to find in the captain's shanty, Nick? Well, there's just a chance, Matty, that McIntyre had something in his possession that'll tell us what he himself would have told us if he'd lived. Huh? Like what the dead woman's name was and who poisoned her? Yeah, the key to her death must be her name. Uh-huh. Otherwise, why would somebody be so darn anxious to keep us from learning what it was? Well, that makes sense, but... Uh-oh. That's McIntyre's shack over there. There's somebody in it, Nick. Yes. The lights are on. It looks as though somebody's moving around inside. Come on, we got to hurry. Yeah. Hey, the lights went out. Oh, better watch it. We'd make swell targets in this moonlight. Hey, get down, Patsy. Hug the sand. Whoever's in that shack spotted us. And doesn't want us to spot him. Uh, he's staying in the shadows, Nick. He must have gone around behind the shack. I'm going after him. Now, hold it, Matty. What? I have a feeling those shots were meant to cover a getaway. There's no use trying to catch him now. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right, Nick. Well... Aren't we going to take a look in that shack? You bet we are. Watch your step, Patsy. I'm okay. Okay. Careful now. I'm going to open the door. Keep your gun ready, Matty. Uh, don't worry. Oh, it's open. Uh-oh. Well, gee, it's dark in here. Can you find a light? Maybe there's a switch by the door. Yeah, here we are. Oh, boy, look at this place. Looks like a cyclone hit it. I expected something like this. Yeah. If we're right in thinking that McIntyre was killed to stop him from telling us who the woman was, then the murderer was pretty sure to have the same idea we had. Certainly. Nick. He'd come here to look for evidence that might help us to identify her. Then it was probably the murderer who took that pot shot at us. Could be. Nick, yeah. there's someone on the porch. Okay, you guys, what's going on here? Take it easy, brother. This thing in my hand ain't no water pistol. Who are you? The police. Police, huh? Yeah. Well, what's the idea of tearing a joint apart? What's that to you? It so happens I bunk here, copper. Thought this was Captain McIntyre's shack. It is. Him and me, we live here together. I was Mac's first mate before he quit shipping out. What's your name? Gunther. Al Gunther. Uh-huh. Well, you better start looking for a new roommate, Gunther. Captain McIntyre's dead. Dead? Of course, you wouldn't know anything about that. No, I wouldn't. Or about the woman he was going to identify when he was murdered. You mean somebody bumped Mac off? That's right. Well, I'll be done. Well, say, you don't seem exactly broken up about it. 
What do you want me to do, sister? Bust out and cry? We all gotta die sometime. Who gotta lie? Gunther, you ever hear of a man named Simon Grenander? Simon Grenander? Why, uh... Well, it looks like he has, Nick. Uh, no. Uh, no, 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 I ain't. It don't mean nothing to me. What do you do for a living now, Gunther? Me? Who else? I'm working on a private yacht. It's owned by a guy named Whitaker. Whit- Whitaker? Yeah. What's wrong with that? Not a thing. Good. Anybody got any objections if I fill my pipe? Not at all. Go right ahead. Thank you. Very expensive humidor you keep your tobacco in. It ain't mine. It's Max. May I see it a minute, Gunther? I can't stop you, can I? Well, no. What is it, Nick? There's a very interesting inscription on the lid of this humidor. Yeah, what's it say, Nick? June 1938. To Captain Ernest McIntyre with deepest gratitude. From Marvin Stokes. Uh, you say we can get in the Stokes house this time, Nick? Yes, Betty. I called Whitaker's home. His sister Elizabeth said she'd meet us there and let us in. Well, what do you think that'll get you, Nick? Oh, look, Patsy. Two people have been murdered. And the only link between them is that somehow they were connected with Marvin Stokes. I know, but... For one thing, I hope I can find something in Stokes' personal papers to tell us what kind of favor Captain McIntyre did for him ten years ago. Yeah, and maybe we can find out why the woman who died in your office went to his house after he was dead. Yeah, I hope so. The answers to those questions should tell us who the woman was and why she was murdered. <laughs> find anything of interest in Mr. Stokes' correspondence, Mr. Carter? No, not yet, Miss Whitaker. Oh. But they're not even halfway through yet. Where did the sergeant go, Nick? Oh, out to find Weber. Said he was going to okay, see... Okay, 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 Weber. Get in there. Yes, yes. And it sounds as though he found him. Well, I finally got the truth out of this guy, Nick. He was lying, all right. He was? Yeah. The dame who died in your office was here in this house. Okay, who was she, Weber? I... Don't know her name. She did not tell me. Then why did you lie about her being here? I... I had orders not to let anybody in. She gave me $20 to forget them and... Well, and you I... took that bribe and then were afraid to admit it. Yeah. I was afraid Mr. Whitaker would fire me. Nick, look what I found. Hmm? Uh, let's see. Well, well. What is it, Nick? Recognize the woman in this photograph, Matty? Do I re... Holy smoke! It's the blonde that died in your office. And listen to what's written on the bottom. To Marvin, from Marjorie, with all my love, always. Oh, no. No. Miss Whitaker, what's the matter? You know this woman? No. No, I never saw her before. Oh, Nick, she looks like she's going to faint. Sit down here, Miss Whitaker. Hey, what's eating her anyway? You better tell us the truth, Miss Whitaker. I don't want to talk about it. You say you never saw this woman before, and yet a picture of her almost makes you faint. Why? Well, because she... Oh, I always suspected there was another woman... That's why Marvin wouldn't marry me. What? Yes, I loved Marvin Stokes. I loved him for years, but there was something standing between us. Now I know it was... It was Marjorie. And it also gives you a pretty good motive for poisoning her, Miss Whitaker. Poisoning her? Yeah. Well, that's absurd. I never laid eyes on her. Well, how could there be a woman in Stokes' life that neither you nor your brother knew anything about? Well, there's only one answer to that, Mr. Carter. He must have met her the year he spent abroad. Abroad? What year was that? He went to Europe in the summer of 1938. Well, now, this is beginning to add up. Hey, Patsy, give me the Stokes papers for 1938. Uh-huh. 47, 44, 40. Yep, 1938. Thanks. Here they are, Nick. Now, let's see. March, April, May, June. Hey, what's this? Hmm? What did you find, Nick? Cablegram sent to Stokes. Signed by Alphonse de Grasse, manager of the Hotel Louis Cot. That's the hotel where Marvin always stayed when he was in Paris. What's it say, Nick? Congratulations. Reservations changed as requested. And it's addressed to Stokes on the SS Simon Grenander. Sa- Simon Grenander? Hey, Nick, that's the name that's on the dead woman's key case. Well, I'll be darned. It's not a man at all. It's a ship. Oh, brother, now this oh. case is more balled up than ever. Not at all, Maddie, not at all. What? Huh? I'd say it's beginning to clear up quite nicely. Nick, 
Nick, if you really know who the murderer is, why the dickens don't we go get him instead of sitting around the office waiting? We're waiting for Maddie to track down the proof. Meaning the log of the S.S. Simon Grenander? Yeah. He's going to call us from the harbor master's office. But what do you expect to find in the log? Oh, well, look, Patsy, we know that ten years ago, in 1938, a ship's captain named McIntyre performed some sort of service for Martin Stokes. Something that Stokes was grateful for, right? Yes, but... We also know that Stokes met a woman named Marjorie in 1938, and that she was in love with him. But right? go on, so what? Remember what the cablegram said? Well, of course, congratulations, reservations changed as requested. Right, now why would a hotel manager cable Stokes his congratulations? Why... And why would Stokes want his reservation changed? Well, I don't know. Patsy, think... What's one of the functions of a captain on a ship at sea? One of the... Why, he can marry people. And that's why the congratulations... Now you're and what... catching on. In other words, I believe Captain McIntyre married Marvin Stokes to this Marjorie, whoever she was. But can and... you prove it? Well, I hope I can. And I think the log of the Simon Grenander will bear me out, if we can find it. Uh-huh. Marjorie and Stokes must have separated. We know she didn't come back to America with him. Apparently not. But now after Stokes is dead, this Marjorie suddenly bobs up. Now, who's the one person who'd be most anxious to get rid of her? Uh, you tell me. Well, if Miss Marjorie could have proved that she was Stokes' legal wife, she'd have had a claim to his estate, no matter what kind of a will he left. Why, I get it. Whoever inherited Stokes' property would have had to get rid of her or lose his inheritance. Right. And Thomas Whitaker was the sole heir to Stokes' estate. That's what the will says. Then... Then Whitaker is the murderer. I believe he is. Well, I'll be darned. Of course, it's still just a theory. If there's no record of the marriage and the log of the S.S. Grenander, then... Oh, oh, that must be the sergeant now. Nick Carter speaking. It's Matty, Nick. The S.S. Grenander was junked a couple of years ago. What? Don't tell me the log's lost, Matty. No, no. No, I just spoke to the manager of the steamship company that owned it. He says all the ship's papers are stored in the warehouse on Pier 32. Can he get the log for us? Yeah, he says he'll give me the key to the warehouse. So I'll pick it up and meet you there, huh? Okay, Matty. Pier 32. Right. Fifteen minutes. <laughs> This way, Nick. Boy, is this some fog that's rolling in? I yeah. can't see a darn thing. Hold on to my arm, Patsy. Hey, you're pretty sure Whitaker's our man, huh, Nick? All adds up that way, Matty. Yeah. Of course, I can't swear to it, but I certainly. <laughs> Back against the wall, quick. Can you see anyone, Nick? No. Fog's too heavy. You got your gun, Matty? Yeah, I got it all right. What am I going to do with it? When you can't see what you're going to. Listen, someone's running toward the end of the dock. Yeah. I can see a shadow. Stop, or I'll shoot! Okay, if that's what you want. <laughs> Matty, I think you dropped him. Yeah, come on. Do, do you think it's Whitaker, Nick? My theory's right, it should be. He came down here after the log, too. That's the last piece of evidence he had to dispose of. All right. Here he is. You dead, Matty? Oh, blast it, yes. I didn't want to kill him. Oh, crack this fog. Nick, look. What is it, Patsy? This isn't Thomas Whitaker. What? No! No! It's Captain McIntyre's first mate, Al Gunther. Bewildered, Nick, Patsy, and Matty stare down at the body on the dock. Does this mean that Nick's deductions were wrong? That it was Gunther and not Thomas Whitaker who committed the murders? We'll bring you the conclusion of this adventure in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of the case of the nameless blonde. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Standing in the ghostly glow of a small electric lantern on a fog-shrouded dock, Nick, Patsy, and Matty stare down at the man who has just died, surprised to learn that it is not, as Nick had predicted, Thomas Whitaker. Oh, Nick. This means Whitaker wasn't the killer. It must have been this man, Gunther. Patsy's right, Nick. Looks like your big theory kind of blew up in your face, didn't it? Maybe, Matty. And then again, maybe not. What? Take a look at Gunther's body. He was shot once in the head. So what? I fired three times, two of my shots missed, one hit him. Sorry, Matty, but all three of yours missed. Oh, now, The look, bullet that Nick. killed Gunther wasn't fired from your gun. What? Now, Nick, Your gun can't... is a forty-five police automatic. The what? wound in his head was obviously made by a gun of a much smaller caliber. Holy smoke, Dick, you're right. Which means that Gunther was the goat for somebody else. He was down here with a murderer. And the murderer killed him, hoping we'd think we'd caught our man. Yes. And that means the murderer is still somewhere on this dock. Quite right, Miss Oh! Huh? And not too far away from him. That's Whitaker, Nick. I know his voice. Yeah. Wherever he is, I can't see him because of this darn fog. I can see you plainly, Carter. Under that light. 
Put your hands up, all three of you. Do as he says. Oh. He's already killed three people to protect his interest in Marvin Stokes' estate. So you figured it all out, did you, Carter? I'm sure you agreed that I had no choice once I learned that Marvin was married to Marjorie Lawson. Yes, and once she threatened to prove that fact by hiring me to find either Captain McIntyre, the log, or the Simon Grenander. Precisely. But she made the mistake of paying a call on me before she went to your office. I treated her well. In fact, I gave her a cup of coffee. With arsenic in it. Unfortunately, yes. And then when you heard that McIntyre was going to meet us at the morgue, you ambushed him outside and shot him before he could tell his story. Right again. Just as I'm going to shoot you. I don't think so, Whitaker. You told us to raise our hands, but you forgot to say anything about dropping our guns. Nice work, Nick, shooting out that light. Now he can't see us any better than we can see him. Hey, he's trying to get past us. There he goes. You can see his silhouette. Stop, Whitaker. Stop for us. Oh. you so long? Oh, I had to stay at the hospital while Whitaker made a statement. Oh, well, what'd he say? Everything was pretty much the way we figured it, Patsy. We? Well, you know what I mean. Marjorie Lawson, or Marjorie Stokes, I should say, arrived from London last week. Uh-huh. She'd been living there ever since she left her husband. Well, why did she leave him? Well, from what Whitaker said, they came from different social levels. Stokes was wealthy, and she was a shop girl. Oh. Apparently, after the honeymoon was over, he was ashamed of her. Well, that's a fine thing. Yeah. That's why they broke up only a few months after they were married. And that must be why Stokes never mentioned the marriage. Yeah, I suppose so. And the only proof Marjorie had of their marriage was in that ship's log. Hmm? No marriage certificate? No. Whitaker says she told him all her papers were destroyed in the London Blitz during the war. Oh, what a break. Yeah, wasn't it? She was probably looking for some kind of proof in Stokes' papers the night she bribed Weber to let her in. Uh Uh-huh. But she didn't find it. So she came to see me. It all makes sense, Nick. Uh, that is, except for Gunso. Where did he fit in the picture? Why, you put him in the picture, Patsy. I did? Uh-huh. By your reaction, when he said he worked for Whitaker. But... It made him curious. He went straight to Whitaker tonight to find out what it was all about. Uh-huh, and Whitaker persuaded him to help him find the logbook. So it seems. <laughs> but how about Whitaker, Nick? Was he badly hurt? Oh, uh, Maddie's bullet got him in the right leg. I think he'll be up and around in time to go on the last walk he'll ever take. Well, Nick, what about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week? Mike, it's one of my most unusual cases. It's about a man who prayed people to death. Prayed them to death? And did they really die? Oh, I'll say they did. And before it was all over, Mike, this man started praying for Nick to die. Well, I guess a lot of criminals have felt the same way about Nick. Uh, what do you call the story, Nick? I call it The Case of the Salesman of Death. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Ken Pettis and Lou Schofield. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Every ten minutes... Somebody dies of tuberculosis. Yet tuberculosis is curable and can be wiped out. And the sooner it's caught, the quicker and easier the cure. That's why, as a preventive measure, everyone is urged to have his chest x-rayed. Some local tuberculosis, uh, tuberculosis associations and health departments do this free or at very little cost. So check your chest. Get a chest x-ray tomorrow. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count... Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Each week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, 
Nick Carter, Master Detective. Well, Patsy, at last I know the name of the killer, how he murdered his victims, and why. Well, then let's go. Let's go where? Why, let's go arrest him, of course. Not so fast, Patsy. There's still one slight hitch. Hitch? What is it? Well, I know all these things, but I can't prove a darn one of them. And now, the case of the salesman of death. Today's exciting adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As our story opens, Nick Carter is just completing a telephone conversation with a would-be client. I understand, Mrs. Gordon, but... Yes, but if you don't... All right, Mrs. Gordon, I'll come out right away. <sighs> that Betsy was the rich Mrs. Benjamin Gordon of Park Avenue in Newport. Oh, you mean the one who gives so much money to charity and is mixed up in the East Bay Boys Club? That's the one. Well, what's with her? Seems someone wrote her a threatening letter, so get your hat. She's waiting for us. I've already got it, Nick, but, uh... Just what did this mysterious someone threaten Mrs. Gordon with, anyway? Apparently, someone is trying to kill her by prayer. Oh, mighty powers, too great for the mind of mortal to know, I pray you, grant the boon of death to the woman, Mrs. Benjamin Gordon. Oh, come in, Mr. Carter. Mrs. Gordon is expecting you. Thank you. I'm Albert Farmer, Mrs. Gordon's secretary. Now, this is Miss Bowen, my assistant. Oh, how do you do, Miss Bowen? How do you do? Uh, in here, please. Sorry, I, I dropped my cane. All right, got it. Thank you. I turned my ankle last week, and I'm still clumsy with this cane. Here, through this door, please. Uh-huh. Thank you. Mrs. Gordon, here's Mr. Carter and his assistant, Miss Bowen. How do you do, Mrs. Gordon? How do you do? How do you do? See, Andy, I told you you'd still be alive and kicking when Mr. Carter got here. Be quiet, Blake. This is my nephew, Blake Gordon, Mr. Carter. He's lazy and impertinent. Pay no attention to him. Now, Andy, you know Mr. Carter will suspect me instantly. Hmm. I'm the only one who has any reason to want you dead. I'm the only one who inherits anything except those charities of yours. That's enough, Blake. Well, Mr. Carter, you certainly took your time. I could have been dead before you got here. The time seemed longer because you're so upset, Mrs. Gordon. Of course I'm upset. Now, over the phone, you mentioned a letter. Yes, that horrid letter... Give it to him, Albert. Uh, here it is, Mr. Carter. Thank you. Hmm. Cheap envelope. Addressed in a typewriter, huh? But it has a return address. People who write threatening letters don't usually give their addresses. No, they don't. Temple of Thought, 5138 Second Avenue. That's the worst slum district in the city. What in the world is the Temple of Thought? I don't know. Now, let's see what the letter says. Uh-huh. Dear Mrs. Gordon, I'm happy to inform you that the boon of death has been requested for you. Oh. I've begun to pray for your release from life in accordance with the ancient ritual. I advise you to put your affairs in order so that you may enter into the peace of eternity with a free mind. <laughs> Signed, Rama, High Priest of the Temple of Thought. Well, I've seen threatening letters before, but this certainly beats them all. I feel sure it's from a crank. Don't you agree, Mr. Carter? Not necessarily, Mr. Farmer. Though it certainly is worded curiously. My theory is that Williams, the chauffeur, is behind this, Andy. Remember, when you discharged him last week, he threatened to kill you. We're not interested in your theories, Blake. Mr. Carter, you must catch this Rama person and lock him up immediately. All right, I'll call on him right away and see what he's up to. Have you notified the police? The police? No. Relying entirely on you. Albert. Yes, Mrs. Gordon. Go upstairs and make sure there are no prowlers lurking about. Certainly, Mrs. Gordon. And I'm going up and lock myself in my room until this Rama person is dealt with. I don't think you're in any real danger, Mrs. Gordon, but... Hmm. Well, I can't do any harm to take precautions. All clear, Mrs. Gordon. Then I'm going upstairs. Blake, you will see Mr. Carter and Miss Bowman to the door. Right o Andy. I hope you can ease the old girl's mind. You see, her bark is worse than her bite. Why, she's given away... That was the garden. Good heavens, she's falling downstairs. Oh, 
she fell all the way to the foot of the stairs. Oh, she isn't moving, Nick. What is it? What's happened to Mrs. Gordon? She fell down the stairs. Mr. Carter, is she? Sorry, Mr. Gordon. But your aunt is dead. <laughs> Now, look, Nick, I've been in the Homicide Bureau for ten years, and I've never heard of anyone getting prayed to death. That's strictly screwball stuff. I know, Maddie, but just the same, two hours after she received that letter, Mrs. Gordon died. But accidentally, Nick, Annie the maid and Blake Gordon the nephew swear they saw her fall down the stairs and break her neck when nobody was near her. That's true, I know, but... And her secretary who was upstairs swear there was no one in the upper hall. Well, even so, Okay, Maddie. it was an accident. She fainted or had a heart attack. Maddie... Did you notice that according to the coroner's report, there was a curious bruise on her body, a small round bruise directly over the solar plexus? So what? Naturally, she bruised herself falling downstairs. But she fell backwards. Oh, listen, Nick. All right. Will you... Anyway, I thought you'd want to question this Rama with me. That's why I left Patsy at the office and stopped by for you. Of course I want to talk to him, but I still say you don't kill people by praying them to death. <laughs> Maybe Mr. Rama has beat it. I doubt it. Let's try the door. Okay. Hey, it ain't even locked. I suppose we see what a temple of thought looks like. All right. Oh, brother. What a joint. You can say that again. That old loft all fixed up with red velvet curtains and funny-looking idols. Whew. Somebody certainly likes oriental incense. You oh. wish to see Rama, high priest of the temple of thought? Hey, hey. Where did you come from? From behind the curtains. I was meditating and could not answer your knock. You, Rama? I am Rama, and you are the police. What, uh... You have come to question me about the death of Mrs. Benjamin Gordon. Hey, how do you know she's dead? It ain't been announced yet? The spirits arranged for me to be informed. It was I who killed her. Oh, you're admitting it, huh? I am not admitting it. I am stating it. Then you're confessing to murder. Now you are being ridiculous. It is not yet the crime to pray for someone to die. It's got us there, Mary. No. I thank you for realizing the obvious. We're not here to charge you with murder. We want information. Rama has no secrets. Then suppose you explain what you're up to and fast. I am an oriental mystic. It happens I know a rare and ancient eastern prayer that frequently brings death within a very short time. You mean so... you're in the business of selling death? Yes. But quite legally. Well, of all... The... There are many people who desire someone's death. Sure, but... They come to me and pay what they can. I provide the death prayer. I make no guarantee. But if death does not occur within one year, I refund the money. It is a simple business transaction. <laughs> Just how many times have you been successful to date? More than you will believe. I will give the names of six persons who I have provided with death. You may check them for yourself. You're darn right we will. Suppose you tell us who it was that ordered Mrs. Gordon's death. I do not know. What do you mean you don't know? The order came by mail with $500 bills enclosed. 500 The note was composed of words clipped from newspapers and simply asked me to pray for the death of Mrs. Gordon. Uh-huh. So you prayed and she dies? Yes. So the transaction is closed. Why, you ought to be... Pardon me. No. Hello? Yes, this is Rama speaking. Thank you. I was sure you would be satisfied. I understand. Goodbye. Hey, who was that? That gentleman was the client who ordered Mrs. Gordon's death. What? He said that he is highly pleased with my services and is sending me an order for a second death prayer tomorrow. Well, apparently Nick has encountered a new and baffling method of murder. We'll find out more about it in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the Salesman of Death. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It is the morning after the mysterious death of Mrs. Benjamin Gordon. Nick and Patsy at the office are trying to puzzle out the truth of the case. <sighs> Nick... Could Rammer have had anything to do with Mrs. Gordon's death? Or was it just one of those horrible coincidences that she fell down the stairs? The answer is no to both questions, Patsy. Mm. Well, 
Do you suppose Mrs. Gordon's nephew and that maid Annie are lying when they say they saw a fall down the stairs and that nobody was anywhere near her? Well, could be. Mm -hmm. So far, Blake Gordon is the only person we know who has a motive. Yeah. He gets $100,000 in the old lady's will. And he needs it. Well, he get more, except that the rest of her money goes to charity. True. Say, how about that show for Williams Mrs. Gordon fired last week? Oh, we're checking on him. Oh, well, just the same, I can't help believing that Rama may have some kind of strange power. Yes, on the face of it, Rama's powers are very convincing. Only I'm not convinced. Well, yesterday he said his client was going to order another death prayer. And if somebody else dies now, then we'll know Rama's on the level. I hope we can see to it that no one else does die. Maddie's going to let me know if he gets a report from anybody who... Hey, Nick! Uh, Nick! Hey, what the devil's the matter, Maddie? Come on, Nick. I got a squad car outside. Just had a phone call from old Hiram Worth. That devil Rama has started praying him to death. Hiram Worth? Yeah. Well, he's one of the richest men in the city. Now, look, Maddie, I better phone him first. Oh, for the love of heaven. I want to tell him we're on the way and want him to be careful. It'll only take a minute. Well, okay, but make it fast. That Rama guy's probably praying for him to die right this moment. Yeah, yeah. Hello? Hello, I'd like to speak to Mr. Worth, please. I'm sorry, but that is impossible. But this is Nick Carter speaking. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but Mr. Worth cannot come to the phone. He died five minutes ago. Look, Gibbs, you say that after Mr. Worth read that letter from the high priest Rama, he phoned Sergeant Matheson and then stayed in his library with you on guard outside. Is that right? Yes, sir. And no one came near him? No, sir, not a soul. Mr. Worth was very much upset at reading about the death of Mrs. Gordon, and he was taking no chances. Did he know Mrs. Gordon? Oh, yes, sir. The two of them founded the East Bay Boys Club. Mr. Worth was chairman of the Board of Governors, and Mrs. Gordon was treasurer. I see. In fact, they had an appointment to meet only today to look into its affairs. They were very disturbed about something. Yeah, well, that's got nothing to do with the fact that they got killed. Now, let's... Uh, not so fast, not so fast, Matty. What? This East Bay Boys Club seems to be a link between Worth and Mrs. Gordon. The only genuine link we found. Well, sure, but... Well, as much as their deaths must be tied together somehow, maybe it's through this boys' club. I don't see how they could be, Nick. Well, neither do I yet. But, Gibbs. Uh, yes, sir? You didn't leave the house for a single minute. Well, just long enough to slip outdoors and mail a letter for Mr. Worth. But I wasn't gone more than a minute or so. What was the letter you mailed? Why, this morning, along with the letter from this Rama person, Mr. Worth also received a letter from a Mr. Smith in Raleigh, North Carolina, offering to sell him a rare early American glass bowl at a very good price. Mr. Worth is... was very keen on early American glassware. So I've heard. Go on, please. Well, he'd been searching for just such a bowl for years... In fact, only last month he wrote Mrs. Gordon, who also collects glassware, asking her to sell him the bowl she owns. Uh, she refused. So, you see, he was delighted to learn that one was for sale. And while he was waiting for you, he made out his check, sealed in the self-addressed envelope Mr. Smith enclosed, and sent me out to post it immediately. Uh, which you did, huh? And when I returned, Mr. Worth was perfectly all right. But five minutes later, he cried out... I rushed in. There he was, slumped across his desk. Dead. Gibbs, I'd like to see the envelope, the letter from this Mr. Smith arrived in. Uh, yes, Mr. Carter. It ought to be right here. Yes, here it is. Mm hmm. Hey, Matty, look at this. What? The return address is Raleigh, North Carolina. But this envelope was postmarked right here in the city. Then it's a phony. Yes, Matty, a very deadly phony. Unless I miss my guess, whatever killed Hiram Worth is in the U.S. mail. And we can't get it back. Hi, Patsy. Well, you look pleased with yourself. I am. Last I'm making some progress. Oh, such as what? I discovered that the finances of the Bay Boys Club are in bad shape. Really? Yes, ma'am. And my guess about Hiram Worth's death has been proved correct. Huh? He was killed by poison mucilage and the flap of that letter he sealed just before he died. But, Nick, how did you get hold of that letter? Fortunately, Hiram Worth was a very methodical man. Uh-huh. He put his return address on the envelope when he sealed it. Oh, so when the post office couldn't deliver it back to the fake address written on it, it came right back here. Right. 
And an analysis showed that there was enough poison in the mucilage and the flap to kill three men. Yeah, but who sent the letter, Nick? Rama? I'd guess the man who hired Rama didn't trust Rama's powers any more than I do. And decided to help them out a little. Uh Uh-huh. Have you any idea who he is? Logically, only one person could have done it. Oh, but logic isn't proof. No, it isn't. I haven't any proof yet. And that means we'll have to make him trap himself. Trap himself? Mm-hmm. How? I have a plan in mind. Very elaborate. But if it works, we'll be able to wash the whole case up tonight. Oh, that'll be swell. And as our first step, Patsy, we're going to call on Mr. High Priest Rama. <laughs> is Mr. Carter and his attractive assistant. Please to enter the Temple of Thought. Thank you. What's that um, wreckage you're playing? It is the ritual drum which signals the unseen powers that I command. The powers of death. You mean you're praying somebody else to death now? It is so. This morning my new client wrote in closing still a third order. And may we ask who this new victim is to be? You may indeed. I was just about to inform you. The drums of death, Mr. Carter, are beating for you. So now, Nick himself is to be prayed to death. And when the high priest Rama begins his strange spell, something fatal always happens. We'll find out how Nick evades the deadly fate that has already overtaken at least two victims in just a minute. And now for the conclusion of the case of the salesman of death. Today's Nick Carter adventure brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It is evening. And at Nick's request, everyone connected with the case, including Sergeant Matheson, has gathered at the Temple of Thought. Uneasily, they sit in a circle in the dimly lighted room, while Rama, the mysterious high priest, stands aloof in flowing robes and a fantastic turban. Quiet, everyone, please. Quiet, please. I know you're all wondering why I've asked you to come here. Well, the answer is... That one of you is responsible for the deaths of Mrs. Gordon and Mr. Worth. With Rama's help, we're going to punish that person. Before we begin, I want to be sure you're all here of your own free will. First, Mrs. Gordon's nephew, Blake Gordon. I don't, Miss Carter. I haven't been so intrigued in years. Mrs. Gordon's maid, Annie. I said I'd come and I'm here. But I don't like this place. It scares me. We won't be long, Annie. Oh. Albert Farmer... Mrs. Gordon's secretary? I'm here voluntarily, Mr. Carter. Glad to help out if I can. And Gibbs, Mr. Worth's valet? I'm here because you asked me, Mr. Carter. I don't like it, but if it will help avenge Mr. Worth's death, I'll stay. And last, Williams, Mrs. Gordon's former chauffeur. Sure, I'm here in my own free will. I shut off my mouth when the old lady fired me, but I never touched the old battle axe. I'm here to see I ain't trained. Then we can get going. One person here tonight used the strange and mysterious powers of Rama to bring death to two people. It's only simple justice that we should use Rama's mystic powers to bring punishment to that person, who, it seems, cannot be touched by the law. (laughs) Hey, look, Nick. Later, Matty. Silence, please. Rama? Rama is at your service. Begin the prayer of punishment for the one who paid you to bring death to Mrs. Gordon and Mr. Worth. Rama will invoke the ancient ordeal by fire, used for ten times ten thousand years to make the guilty known to his fellows. Slowly the blood in the guilty one's veins will come to a boil. He will feel his skin on fire. Heat will envelop him. And if he does not speak, he will die screaming in madness. You can't be serious about this, Mr. Carter. Really, no, that sounds absurd. Hey, Nick, for the love of Mike. Silence, please, everyone. I'm perfectly serious. As the guilty person will discover when the incantation begins to work. Rama, begin. Almighty oh, power is beyond the knowing of mere mortals. Your servant calls down the ordeal by fire upon the one who has willed the deaths of others. I begin the first drum of the fire ritual. <laughs> I 
I'm enjoying the music, but nothing seems to be happening. I'm afraid. I want to go home. Hey, you got to let me out of here. Those drums are giving me the willies. Mr. Carter, I can't stand it much longer. I can't. Silence, everyone. Oh, this is all just a trick of some kind. Stop those drums and let us out of here. Why, Mr. Farmer, you're perspiring badly. Your face is flushed. You feeling too warm? No. No, of course not. But you're trying some kind of trick, and I've had enough. Stop those drums, I say. Rama, stop the drums. Turn on the lights. Rama hears and obeys. But the spell cannot be stopped. Mr. Farmer, your face is streaming with perspiration. Your skin is as red as fire. You sure you don't feel uncomfortably warm? What if I do? You can't fool me. You're up to some hopeless pocus pocus. I, 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 you poisoned me. You're, you're trying to pin this whole thing on me, but you can't do it. You haven't had a thing to eat or drink since I... you came here. You haven't been poisoned. You've turned the heat on in here. You're all in some kind of a plot. No one else is suffering from the heat. No, Mr. Farmer. Rama's spell is working and nothing can stop it. Nothing but a confession by the guilty person. You're lying. Rama's just a fake. I looked him up. I know just how big a fake he is. Then why do you feel as if you were on fire? Your skin is burning hot. That proves Rama's spells are no trickery. No. I've used Rama to fool you all from the beginning, but you can't use him to fool me. I won't be tricked into confessing. I won't be... I... But you have confessed, <laughs> Farmer. Okay, Matty. Put the handcuffs on him. <laughs> Now, listen, Nick, I want a few facts out of you. And so do I. Facts? Well, you both heard Albert Farmer's confession after he realized he'd given himself away, and you know how he killed Mrs. Gordon. Yeah, yeah, sure. He hid behind the draperies at the head of the stairs, and when she got within a couple of steps to the top, he jabbed the end of his cane against her solar plexus as hard as he could. She fell head over heels down the stairs and broke her neck. Uh Uh-huh. And she was in such a position that her nephew and maid who were downstairs couldn't see the cane. That's what made it look like an accident. Okay, that's that. And you already know how Farmer killed Worth with the poison envelope. And you also know the motive behind both murders. Well, sure. Albert said they were going to investigate the affairs of the East Bay Boys Club. Yeah, but what did he have to do with the Boys Club? Well, think for a minute. Hmm? Hmm? Mrs. Gordon was treasurer of the charity. Okay, but... Now, would a woman as old as Mrs. Gordon do the actual work herself? Uh, Why, of course not. She'd give the job to someone else. Hmm. And the natural person for her to pick would be her secretary. Then Albert handle all the money she and Worth contributed. Right. Yeah. And he managed to steal about $30,000, as I discovered by checking the books. Yeah, but Nick, why were you so sure Albert was guilty? Because of that fake letter to Mr. Worth. Hmm? It had to be sent by someone who knew Worth wanted a bowl such as the one described in the letter. And also knew he wanted it so badly he'd be sure to answer by return mail. Yeah, I see what you mean. Now, Gibbs, you remember, told us Worth had written Mrs. Gordon asking her to sell him the antique bowl she owned. Uh Uh-huh. So she knew he wanted a bowl, Gibbs knew it, Worth knew it, And the person who handled Mrs. Gordon's correspondence knew it. In other words, Albert Farmer. But that still wasn't proof. That's why I had to use an elaborate psychological third degree on Albert in order to trick him into confessing. He used Rama to confuse us, so I used Rama to confuse him. (laughs) Well, uh, Nick, does Rama really have any supernatural powers? (laughs) Of course not. Albert was simply using him for camouflage. Hmm? Rama's just a clever faker who thought up this death prayer racket about a year ago. But if Rama's a fake, what happened to Albert there tonight? That, Patsy, was psychology, not magic. Psychology? Sure. Albert Farmer came to the Temple of Thought feeling he could bluff his way through anything that happened. But fear finally caught up with him. You mean that even though he knew Rama was a phony, he started to think all that incantation baloney might work? Maybe. In any case, Farmer began to feel trapped. He got uneasy, nervous, his blood pressure went up. And then when you started to give him the business... Then the heat was really on. Mm. He couldn't take it any longer. Broke out in a cold sweat and then made a slip. After that, getting a confession out of him was duck soup. Nick, I got to hand it to you. You sure figured out a new way of turning the heat on a killer. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Robert J. Arthur. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. 
Next Saturday, and in the days to follow, millions of red paper poppies will appear on coats and dresses all over America. In this way, with our dimes, quarters, and dollars, we help our disabled veterans to help themselves. We let them know, too, that we have not forgotten the sacrifices they made for us. So buy a poppy. Show that you remember. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. All right, Nick, suppose he is the murderer. You can't prove it. There isn't a shred of evidence. That's what we've got to find, Patsy. Yeah. And if the proof is anywhere at all, it's here in this apartment. Well, there's a closet or something over here. Okay, you look in there while I go over these papers. Uh huh. Don't try to struggle, Miss Bowen. This is a knife I am holding at your back. Now, the case of the tattooed cobra. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post war old Dutch cleanser. Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad is one of Nick's best friends. But it isn't a social call that brings Matty to the office this morning. Hey, uh, Nick, uh, you remember telling me last year that somebody wanted you to look for the heir to the Bristol estate? Oh, yes, Matty. The administrator of the estate, Mr. Alvin Hammond, called me in, but I didn't take the case. And you know why, Sergeant? No. It meant a trip to Europe, and Nick didn't want to go. Imagine. Mm-hmm. Well, Patsy, you know I couldn't go at that time. Oh, fooey. And uh, Nick, uh, Bristol's wife was a Polish girl, wasn't she? Yeah, yeah, she was. When she divorced him 20 years ago, she took their son back to Europe with her. Uh Uh-huh, and that's the last anybody ever heard of them. Oh, no, 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 not quite, Patsy. Mr. Hammond had some French detectives working on the case. They reported that the mother was dead and that the boy, Alex, supposedly died in a concentration camp during the war. So, who gets... ...goes to a distant relative in this country named George Davison. Ah. You don't happen to have a picture of Alec, do you, Nick? No, I haven't, but the French detectives got a good description of him from a fellow prisoner in the concentration camp. Yeah, yeah, I remember you telling me that. He's tall and slender with blonde hair and blue eyes, and he'd be uh, 28 years old now. Why, Sergeant, what a memory. He's lost a little finger on his left hand, and he's got a tattoo mark on his right hand. A blue and red cobra twined around the thumb, right? Matty, you're terrific. How can you remember all that from a casual conversation almost a year ago? I didn't. We fished him out of the East River this morning, dead. Well, there's the body, Nick. It's Bristol, isn't it? Uh, It certainly fits the description. It's just as the uh, sergeant described it, Nick. A red and blue cobra twined around the right thumb. I know, but there's one detail that's been kept a secret. They only told me because they expected me to take the case. Yeah, what's that, Nick? If this is really Alec Bristol, the cobra should be holding a shield in his mouth. It's his mother's family crest. That was to be the final identification. Well, uh. Nick, that, that's it, isn't it? Yes, it's there, all right. So he didn't die in a concentration camp after all. No. Must have come to this country to get his inheritance. No, well, maybe so, but he didn't get it. Why, what makes you think that, Matty? Why, his clothes, Nick. They were cheap and shabby. He wouldn't be dressed that way if he had three million bucks. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, in that case, I think I'd like to have a talk with Mr. George Davison. Davison? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, the guy who gets the money now that Bristol's dead, huh? Yeah. Of course, Davison may be perfectly innocent, but it should be interesting to talk to a man with three million motives for murder. (laughs) 
Davison will be here in a moment, Carter. He's upstairs in his room. So he's already moved into the Bristol home, has he, Mr. Hammond? Why, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. As administrator for the estate, I saw no reason to let the house stand empty, especially since I expected to turn the property over to him at the end of this month. That is, I did until I got a letter from Alec. Oh, you really heard from Alec Bristol? Yes, last week, Miss Bourne. We, we've been running advertisements in European newspapers, 15 different countries, hoping that Alec was still alive. And he saw one of the ads? Yes, he was living in Marseilles. He, he wrote that he was taking the next boat for the States. What a break. The minute he gets here, someone stabs him in the back and throws his body in the East River. I can't understand why he didn't get in touch with me as soon as the boat docked. I bet George Davison is glad that he didn't. Yes. Oh, I like George well enough, but, well, Martin Bristol and I were lifelong friends. And I did hope I could turn the estate over to his boy. Oh, I say, Hammond, you uh, didn't tell me we had guests. Oh, come in, George, come in. Uh, Miss Bowen, Mr. Carter, this is George Davison. Hello, How Mr. do you do? How do you do? Well, uh, what's everyone looking so serious about? Don't tell me the long-lost son and heir has finally arrived. Yes, George. Alex has arrived, but he's dead. Dead? Oh, I say, not really. Alec Bristol was murdered last night, Mr. Davison. Murder? Well, and the estate comes to me after all, eh? Uh, yes, I suppose it does, George. Well, who popped him off? Do you know? That's what I'm trying to find out. Mr. Davison... The medical examiner says the murder took place sometime between 10 p.m. and 2 this morning. Where were you at that time? Where was I? Yes. Why, I, I went up to my room about 9 o'clock to read. You remember, Hammond? Did you go out again? Well, no, of course not. But, but George... Yes, Mr. Hammond? Uh, uh, nothing. You started to say something. Uh, only that I remember now that George did go upstairs early. I see. Mr. Hammond, if Alec Bristol had sent you a letter or a cablegram to tell you the exact time of his arrival, could anyone else have got hold of it before you did? Why, yes, I suppose so. Dobson leaves the mail on a table in the entrance hall. Now, but... see here, Carter. Are you insinuating that I murdered Alec Bristol? Not at all, Mr. Davison. I'm merely collecting facts. I beg pardon, Mr. Hammond. Oh, yes, Dobson. There's a gentleman to see you, sir. Well, who is it? A tall young man, sir, with blonde hair. I didn't ask what he looked like, Dobson. Didn't he give you his name? Oh, yes, sir. He said his name is Alec Bristol. <laughs> I do not understand. Why have you sent for the officer? Because we're investigating the murder of Alec Bristol. But that cannot be, Mr. Carter. I am Alec Bristol. With that accent? Don't make me laugh. I have been in Europe since I am seven years old. Almost I have forgotten how to speak the English. Maybe, but if you're Alec Bristol, who's that guy down at the moor? I do not know. But surely Mr. Hammond will vouch for me. Two weeks ago, I write to tell him I am coming. That's right, Sergeant. Uh, at least somebody wrote to me. Yeah, it might have been that fellow we found in the river. No, 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 it was I. The description in the newspaper of Marseille, that too was I. Yeah, but that description fits the other man too. But the little finger which I lose in the accident of many years ago, the tattoo on my thumb. Those features apply to him too, including the family crest and the cobra's mouth. I... I cannot believe it. It is fantastic. I can figure it out easy enough. You read that description in the paper, realized that it fitted you perfectly. So you had that finger and thumb fixed up to complete the identification. Then you hopped a boat for America expecting to collect three million bucks. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Matty. You're forgetting one thing. What? The family crest and the tattooed cobra's mouth. He couldn't have got that out of the newspaper notices. It wasn't there. Okay, okay. So maybe he knew Alec Bristol a long time ago in Europe. He was familiar with the tattoo mark. Why must you assume that I am the imposter? Why could it not be the other man? Because you'd have a mighty good reason for bumping off the real heir. But who'd want to kill the fake one? I do not know. All I know is when my ship docks this morning at ten o'clock, I get off the boat Now, and... wait a minute. Wait a minute. You going to tell me they didn't send you to Ellis Island before they let you go? Why should they do that, Sergeant? I am an American citizen. My papers are all in order. The consul at Marseille checked them before he let me get on the boat. Matty, let's take him down to the pier. See if the captain of the ship can identify him. Yeah, and we'll stop off at the morgue, too. 
Maybe you'll recognize the other Alec Bristol. Then may I return here? You may if the captain of the boat knows you. Otherwise, you're going to the city jail. Well, uh, how about it, Captain? You know him? Why, yes, Sergeant. This man came over on my boat. And we didn't dock until 10 o'clock this morning, so he couldn't possibly have been in New York last night. Well, there's the body, Mr. Bristol. Did you ever see that guy before? No, Sergeant. I am positive I never see that man before in my life. Good afternoon, Mr. Bristol. Good afternoon. You are Dobson? Yes, Mr. Bristol. Come in, please. Oh, thank you. Mr. Hammond phoned that everything was settled, that I should take my orders from you, sir. Oh, that was kind of him. Yes, there's a letter for you, sir. It came just a few moments ago. A letter for me? Yes, sir. A registered letter. I signed for it. Here it is, sir. But how strange. I do not know anyone in this country. Just a minute, Bristol, if that is your name. Ah, Mr. Davison. Until your identity is proved, I don't think you'd better open any mail addressed to Alec Bristol. But Mr. Hammond is administrator of my father's estate, and as long as he is convinced, I... Well? Dobson. Yes, sir. Get Mr. Hammond on the phone, please, and ask him to come out here at once. Yes, sir. Is, is anything wrong, sir? If this letter is true, a great deal is wrong. Maybe I know now why that man was killed. Good afternoon, Mr. Hammond. Is Mr. Bristol in, Dobson? Oh, yes, sir. He's waiting for you in the library, sir. Thank Mind you. if we go in with you, Mr. Hammond? Oh, not at all, Carter. In fact, I'm glad you're here. Has something happened, Mr. Hammond? Oh, apparently, yes. Dobson says Alec found out something definite about the murder. Oh, yes, sir. He was very upset about it. Uh, come on in, Carter. Uh, is that why you're here? No. I came to ask the names of the people Bristol was living with in Marseille. Hmm? After all, the identity angle hasn't been established for sure yet. I don't think there's any question that he's the real Alec Bristol. Uh, oh, here's the library. Alec? Alec? Dobson, d didn't you say Mr. Bristol was in here? Oh, he was, sir. Those French doors are open onto the terrace. Perhaps he's out there. I don't think so, Betsy. Hmm? Look over there. High on the divan. Why, it's, it's a man's feet, sir. Carter, is it Alec? It's Alec, all right. And he's dead. Dead? Stabbed in the back. Oh. Just as the other one was. Better call the police, Dobson. Oh, yes, sir. I beg your pardon. No one answered the front door, so since it was open, I thought... Who I... are you? Where did you come from? What's the idea of walking into other people's houses without... Did you say other people's houses? I did. Unless I'm mistaken, this is my house. Your house? Yes. I am Alec Bristol. One apparent heir to the Bristol Millions is in the city morgue. Another lies dead on the library floor. And now a third tall, slender, blonde young man has appeared to claim the fortune. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the Tattooed Cobra. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Alec Bristol, heir to $3 million, can be positively identified only by a cobra tattooed on his right thumb. But one man with the secret tattoo has been found dead in the East River. Another has been stabbed to death in the library of the Bristol mansion. And now a third stands in the doorway, introducing himself. I beg your pardon. I'm Alec Bristol. You, you're? But... Perhaps I should have advised you of my arrival, but the plane arrived from Portugal only a short while ago. Nick, look at him. He's tall and blonde. All slender blondes named Alec Bristol seem to be a dime a dozen today. What's that? May I see your left hand? My... 
Oh, the missing little finger. Of course. Uh Uh-huh. Now the right hand. You mean the right thumb, don't you? With the tattooed cobra? There. It's there, Nick. Naturally. And the shield is in the cobra's mouth. My mother's family crest. Carter, I don't understand. Nobody knew about that crest except you and me and... And who else, Mr. Hammond? Uh, Well, George Davison. But but three men have shown up with that tattoo. How, How did they find out? Who told them? The police will be here in a few moments, sir. Thank you, Davison. Is Mr. Davison here? Why, no, sir. He left half an hour ago. Said he was going into the city for dinner in the theater. Did you see Mr. Bristol? I mean the dead Mr. Bristol, after Davison left. No, sir. After I phoned Mr. Hammond, I went back to the pantry and stayed there until you arrived. What do you mean, the dead Mr. Bristol? Look, don't you think someone should tell me what's going on? Sure, I'll tell you. Over here. I want you to look at something behind the divan. There. (gasps) Alec. Alec? You mean that's the real Alec Bristol there on the floor? Uh, Yes, but... I thought he was dead. He is. I mean, five years ago in the concentration camp, they took him away and... So that's how you found out about the tattoo. You knew Alec Bristol in the concentration camp. Yes. He was my best friend. Friend? And you tried to steal his inheritance? I tell you, they said he was dead. What difference could it make to Alec? When I saw the notice in the Lisbon papers with the description... You realize that it fit you as well as it did him, huh? Yes, except for the missing finger and the tattoo... So I found a doctor who agreed to perform the operation and keep his mouth shut. I got forged passports... Why, you swindler! How do I know you didn't murder Alec? If he had killed Alec Bristol, seeing the body wouldn't have shocked him into admitting that he was an imposter. But you're not going to let him go free. The police will take care of him. The man I want to talk to is George Davison. Uh, Speaking of Davison, Carter, I... There's something I didn't tell you this morning about him... I'm sure it doesn't mean anything, but... I know. You started to say something and then lied out of it. Well, perhaps you'd better tell the truth now. Well, it's only that... Well, I knocked on George's door during the evening and he didn't answer. Of course, he may have been asleep. Or he may have been out of the house committing a murder. Is that it? Well, I I don't believe it, but it's possible that... The real Alec Bristol was going to tell Mr. Hammond something about that first murder. That must be why he was killed. Do you know, Mr. Carter, it might help if we could only find that letter. What letter, Dobson? A registered letter that came from Mr. Bristol, sir. That's where he got the information he wanted to tell Mr. Hammond. Do you know whether he brought that letter into the library? Yes, sir. It was in his hand when he came in here. But it isn't here now? No, sir. I've searched the room thoroughly. Who else knew that he received that letter? Why, no one, except Mr. Davison... To me, of course. Uh Uh-uh, Davison again. Yes. Come on, Patsy. Let's get back to town. What's on your mind, Nick? Just one thing, catching a murderer. And I don't think it'll take very long now. (laughs) Matty, I want to do three things. Yeah, what? Find Davison, learn the identity of the man you fished out of the river... And find out who sent that registered letter. Uh Uh-huh. Well, Nick, we spotted Davison's car in the parking lot, and I got two men there waiting for him to come back. If he ever does. He'll come back. Uh, uh Uh-oh. Sergeant Matheson, homicide. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Mullally. It's a guy who sent a trace of letter, Nick. Good. The postal clerk went down and dug out the receipt, huh? Yeah. Uh, Get a pencil, Nick. I have one. Okay, go ahead, Mullally. Sent by William Jenkins, 440 Winton Avenue, apartment 5D. Got that, Patsy? Got it. Okay, Mullally. Good work, yeah. Thanks. William Jenkins. That name mean anything to you, Nick? No. But I think Patsy and I will go around to 440 Winton Avenue and see Mr. Jenkins. glad this is the last flight. Cheer up, Patsy. The exercise will do you good. Oh, I only hope Jenkins is home. I will know in a minute. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, here it is, 5D. Evidently he's home, too. The door's partly open. 
If he's home, why doesn't he answer? Here, I'll knock again. Nick, if Alec Bristol was killed so somebody could get that letter, and Jenkins wrote it, the fact this door is open might mean... Yeah. Yes, Betsy, it might mean the killer got here first. Let's go in. Right. Nobody here. Yeah, but look at this room. It's been turned upside down. Been thoroughly searched, all right. But for what? Look at all those papers on the floor. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. Here's a social security card made out to William Jenkins. And here's a letter postmarked Chicago, which may... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? What is it? Wait. Here's an Illinois chauffeur's license. And look at the picture on it. What? Why, that's the first Alec Bristol, the man they found on the river. Right. So William Jenkins was going to pass himself off as Alec Bristol. Obviously. And that brings up a very interesting point. What? Don't you see, Patsy? This whole thing was planned months in advance, so the amputation and the tattoo would have time to heal. Why, of course. Then last week, the real Alec Bristol wrote to Hammond, and the deal was off. That must have been a blow to Jenkins. Yeah. But how did Jenkins know about the letter? Why, I... And another thing. The tattoo on Jenkins' thumb included the final detail, the shield and the cobra's mouth. How could Jenkins have known about that? Well, the other imposter knew about it because he was a friend of Bristol's. But Jenkins wasn't. Yeah. Bristol looked at Jenkins' body and swore he'd never seen him before. And no one else knew of that shield except Davison, Hammond, and me. You think Davison and Jenkins were working together? Not Davison, Patsy. Hammond and Jenkins. Hammond and Jenkins? But why, Nick? What would Hammond get out of it? If Alec Bristol weren't found by the end of this month, Hammond would have to turn the estate over to Davison. Naturally. But if a fake Alec Bristol turned up, Hammond could turn the estate over to him, then he and Hammond could divide three million dollars between them. Why, of course. All Hammond had to do was to find someone who answered the general description, then arrange for the missing finger and the tattoo. Oh, but, Nick, you haven't any proof, none at all. Well, that's what we've got to find, something to show that there was a connection between Hammond and Jenkins. Well, there might be something here in Jenkins' apartment... If Hammond has already found it and destroyed it. Well, from the looks of this room, I should say the chances are good that he has. There's a closet or something over here. Maybe he overlooked that. Okay, you take a look in there while I go through these papers more carefully. Uh-huh. <gasps> Don't reach for your gun, Carter, unless you want the young lady to die. Make him let me go, Nick. Stay still, Miss Bowen. I'm holding a knife at your back. Don't struggle, Patsy. <sighs> Hammond, if you hurt her... I won't, as long as you both do as I say. Okay. First, toss your revolver over here. There you are. Good. You're a sensible man. So, you were hiding in that closet all the time, huh? I had to. I came here to destroy the receipt for that registered letter Jenkins sent to Alec, and before I could leave, you two arrived. What was in that letter, Hammond? The whole story, just as you figured it out. And when I told Jenkins that the real Alec Bristol had turned up and our deal was off, he threatened to get even with me by telling Alec about it, so I had to get rid of him. But you didn't know that Jenkins had already written Alec until Alec faced you with a letter. And then you had to kill him, too. That it? Quite right, Mr. Carter. Nobody saw me enter the house or leave it afterwards. And when I came back, you were just arriving. That gave me the perfect alibi. Well, well what's next? Don't think you can kill us, too. Not both of us. Of course not. I have enough cash hidden away to get me out of the country. And you're not going to say a word to the authorities until I'm safely gone. You seem awfully sure of that. I am, because I'm taking the young lady here with me. Oh, Nick, don't let him. Wait, Hammond, you can't take her. If I leave her, Carter, I'll leave her dead. I promise you that. Oh, no. Now get into the bedroom, Carter. I'm going to lock you in there before I leave. Nick, you can't just... He can't help himself, Miss Bowen. And Carter... If I hear you trying to break out or call for help before we're out of the building, I'll shove this knife right through Miss Bowen's back. Locked in the bedroom of William Jenkins' flat, Nick hears Hammond leave with Patsy. And he knows that Hammond won't hesitate to kill her if any attempt is made at a rescue. We'll find out what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the Tattooed Cobra. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Patsy walks slowly down the stairs and out the front door of the gloomy old tenement, conscious of the knife pressed against her back and of the man who's ready to use it if she attempts to break away. Now down the steps and across the sidewalk. You're 
You're not going to kill me, are you? I'm afraid I have to. Oh, no, please. Hammond! Huh? What? Oh, oh. Drop that knife, Hammond. Hammond. Drop it. You're breaking my arm. Drop it. That's better. All right, Patsy, pick it up. Got my gun out of his pocket. Sure, Nick, but where did you... I mean, how... When he locked me in the bedroom, he overlooked the fact that the bedroom window opened on a fire escape running down the front of the building. So I climbed down the fire escape and waited on the first floor platform until you walked across beneath me. Then I jumped him. He was going to kill me. Well, his killing days are over. Find the nearest police call box, Patsy. We'll hold him here until the police arrive. So George Davison will get the estate after all. Yeah. He's the only relative left now. Uh Uh-huh. Nick, there's one thing I still want to know. What? If Hammond planned to bring in a phony heir, why did he try to hire you to find the real one? Self-protection, Patsy. Huh? You see, if Alec Bristol really were alive, Hammond wanted to know it before he went ahead with the scheme. Yeah, I can see that it would have been disastrous for the real heir to show up after Hammond had produced a false one. Yes, Hammond might have got away with the first murder because Davison seemed to be the only person with a motive for it. But one killing led to another. Uh Uh-huh, and that led to me. I suppose he figured the state could only make him pay for one murder, no matter how many he committed. Yes, but when Hammond goes to the chair, he'll find that once is plenty. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count... Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. There's no way of telling which boy did it. They were all shooting at once. That's the point, Patsy. They were all in on it. And legally, they're all guilty. Oh, no, Nick. Not Bubs. Maybe the others, but... Patsy, I'm afraid the law won't make any distinction in his case. You mean that if one of the others fired that shot and Bubs didn't even know it, he's guilty? Yes. Technically, he's guilty of murder at the age of 12. Now, the case of the littlest gangster. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. A flashy cream-colored convertible is parked along a dark street in the poorer section of the city. With two small figures crouched in the front seat, talking in whispers. Bubs, will you quit chewing that bubble gum in my ear and hand me that piece of wire? Okay, Tim, but do you think we ought to? I will be driving this hack away in a minute. You've seen me wire past the ignition in a car before this. Yeah, but only so we could go for a ride. We never stole one before. We gotta start sometime. But supposing they can't... Okay, punk, come out of there. I, I wasn't doing nothing, mister. Trying to I... ice my car, huh? Why, I ought to... Oh, you leave him go. Turn him loose, you... Who do you think you're kicking, you little squirt? Oh, Graham Bubs. I'll learn you to fool with Moxie Reed. Gee... You ain't Moxie Reed. Ah, oh, so you heard of me, huh? You let him go. Quit kicking at him, Bubs. This is Moxie Reed. He's big time stuff. Yeah. yeah. I guess you do know about me. 
Honest, Moxie, we'd have never touched this crate if we'd have known it was yours. Okay, okay. So don't let it happen again. You... You ain't calling the cops? <laughs> Me and the cops ain't very friendly. But you two better grow up before you try lifting another car. But, Moxie, we gotta pull something big. Yeah, how come? Well, we got a gang, see? The East Side Scorpions... And we made a club room in an old empty house on Porter Street. Hey, and the place caught on fire from a cigarette or something, and it burned. It's just an old dump. But old lady Taltman, the lady across the street, she owns the joint, see? And she says if we don't pay $200 for the damage, she's going to have us all put in reform school. How'd she know it was your gang that started the fire? Oh, old Mr. Riley seen us coming out of the joint. He lives across the street, too, right next door to her, and he squealed on us. Who'd you say squealed? Old man Riley. He used to be a cop till he got too old. Is that so? Yeah. Now all he does is sit out on his front steps every night and spy on people. So you're going to let a dame shake it out for two centuries, eh? There ain't no way to stop her, Moxie. That's why we figured on swiping a car to get the dough. If it was my gang, I'd throw a scare into her so she wouldn't dare go to the cops. What would you do, Moxie? I'd get me a rod, that's what. I'd make sure the other guys in my gang had them, too. A gun? <laughs> Scares you, huh? No, nah, don't scare us. We've been wanting a heater for a long time. Ain't we, bubs? Uh, yeah. Sure, Tim. Look, if you kids really want to know how to handle this old dame, look me up in Mike Repper's pool room someday. After you get yourself some guns. <laughs> I came to see you, Mr. Carter. My Bubs isn't really a bad boy. You know that. Of course, Mrs. Harris. No boy is naturally bad. I remember when Bubs used to belong to the downtown boys club. He was about ten years old then. And the bubblegum champion of the block. Well, that's why they started calling him Bubs, isn't it? Uh-huh. He was an awfully cute youngster. He still is, Miss Thorne. But there isn't any boys club where we live now. So, well, he's got himself mixed up with this gang. A gang? He's only about twelve, isn't he? Yeah. But the others are all older. If something doesn't happen, Bubs will turn out to be just as bad as the rest of them. Oh, maybe you're exaggerating, Mrs. Harris. They surely didn't start that fire on purpose. Oh, no, but where we lived before, Bubs wouldn't have dreamed of breaking into an empty building. And already they got another place for the gang to meet. A deserted warehouse over by the waterfront somewhere. Hmm. Not having any place where they're allowed to meet and to play that starts a lot of boys breaking the law. Oh, it's that Tim Newton that's the worst. Bub thinks he's got to be just as tough as Tim is. And that boy's bad all the way through. How old is Tim? Oh, 15. Hmm. He can't be a confirmed criminal at that age. Well, he almost is. Now, Bubs is another hero he keeps talking about. A gangster named Moxie Reed. Moxie Reed? That is bad. <laughs> what am I going to do, Mr. Carter? If somebody don't raise $200 to pay for the damage to that house, Mrs. Tubman's going to have them all arrested. I'll talk to her, Mrs. Harris. And don't you worry. We'll get Bob straightened out. Only glad you came to me before he got into any real trouble. Right. How's that for a break, Mike? You're so uptight. Oh, yeah? Well, watch <laughs> me put that one ball in the corner pocket. Hey, Moxie. Hiya, Tim. Hiya, Bubs. What's on your mind? Hi, Mr. Reed. Hey, we got them guns you Easy, told Easy, kids. Will we use the back room, Mike? Yeah, sure. Go right ahead. This way, kids. You guys work fast, I'll say that. We had to. Old Lady Talman only gave us a week to raise the dough. One inside. Sit down. Moxie, you said you'd tell us what to do next. I was just kidding. Forget it. But you promised. So what? Maybe you'd louse up the deal and squawk to the cops that I told you what to do. We ain't no squealers. No. We didn't even tell the rest of the gang. They all think it's Tim's idea. We got the guns, six of them. Yeah. We put it into a shooting gallery after they closed up last night. What are they, 22 rifles? Yeah. And we only done it because you said you'd tell us what to do next. Well, if it was me... Yeah? I'd pick me up a car along about 8 o'clock tonight and drive by that old dame's house with a few of my gang. And shoot her? No, no. 
If I throw enough lead through her front window so she'd be scared to ever open her trap about me again. Sure, sure, I get it. But, Tim, what if she gets hurt? Quit beefing, will you? Nobody's going to get hurt. But maybe she will. We'll do it, Moxie. Just like you said. And we'll do it tonight. Mrs. Tellman, if you'll give the boys enough time to earn the money to pay for the damage to your building, I'll personally guarantee that you get every cent. And if you had them sent away to reform school, you won't be able to collect anything. It is not the money only, Mr. Carter. But someone has got to do something to break up these kid gangs. They're terrible. I'm trying to do something. Think I can get a boys' club started in this neighborhood? Uh, and then Believe we'll be to... me, it will do no good, Mr. Carter. These kids is mean. They smash windows. They steal automobiles. Mrs. Tillman, please, hold oh. off a few weeks before having them arrested. It's the only way you can be sure of getting your money. Yes, Mrs. Tillman, please do that. Well, all right. But if they step out of line just one more time, I send every last one of those kids to the reform school. <laughs> Now, wait till I twist these wires together, and we'll see if she starts. Tim, maybe if we went to old Lady Tillman and... Shut up. I'm going to try it now. She works. Where are we going to pick up the other guys? At the warehouse. Are there guns there, too? Yeah, and enough bullets to give old Lady Tillman the scare of her life. Good night, Mrs. Tellman. Good night, Mr. Carter. Good night, Mrs. Boyd. Good night. Oh, how are you tonight, Miss Riley? Oh, fine, fine, thanks. Just get the breath of air like always. Well, I think we've put in a good day's work, Nick. I do, too. But I still want to talk to Bubs. It's almost 8 o'clock. He ought to be home by now. All right, let's go by there and see. Nick, look at that car racing up the street. Isn't that Bubs leaning out the front window? Yeah, that's Bubs, all right. Hey, he's got a rifle. Look out. Yeah. Good grief. Come on, Patsy. Oh, they were shooting at Mrs. Tellman's house. Mrs. Tellman. Mrs. Tellman. It's Nick Carter. Are you all right? Mrs. Tellman. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, they tried to kill me. Look at my windows. Look at the holes in my front door. I'm thankful that none of the bullets hit you. I was afraid that maybe... Hey. Yes, what's the matter? If she's all right, you better come down here quick. Why? There's a man on the steps next door. He must have been hit by a stray bullet. I I think he's dead. Only a few steps beyond the bullet-riddled front door of Mrs. Tillman's home lies the body of the man who had informed on the juvenile gang, ex-police officer Riley. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now, back to the case of the littlest gangster. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Nick is examining the body of James Riley, lying dead on the steps of his home, following a hail of bullets intended to frighten his neighbor, Mrs. Tellman. All right, keep back, everybody, please. The police will be here in a minute. Poor Mr. Riley, such a nice man. Those murderers, those hoodlums. Did you see that, Mr. Carter? Do you know who it was? I'm afraid it was the boys who set fire to your building, Mrs. Tillman. Oh. We recognized one of them just before the shooting. Those little devils. I said they were no good. They should get the electric chair. Oh, but Mrs. Tillman. Oh, murderers. When they could not kill me, they should poor Mr. Wright. Well, I don't believe they did that on purpose. I know they did. They was mad at him than they was at me. He's the one told me they stopped the fire. Is that so? I didn't know that. Oh, it must have been an accident. They were shooting at the front of your house and one bullet went astray. No, Patsy, I don't think it was accidental. Oh, but The Nick... bullet that killed him struck the center of his forehead and came out just behind the right ear. Riley was sitting at the top of this flight of stairs. Well, what difference does that make? The difference between an accident and murder. Oh, but even if you're right, how can you ever find out which of the boys did it? They were all shooting at once. That's just the trouble, Patsy. When one of a group commits murder while they're all engaged in a crime, they're all equally guilty. Oh, no, Nick. You don't mean Bob's. Not that baby. Oh, thank goodness the cops are gone. Come on, Patsy, help me look for that bullet. It's the only chance we have to prove exactly who killed Mr. Riley. (laughs) 
right in the corner pocket, like I said. Okay, okay. So now I owe you four bucks. Well, Moxie, you gotta help me uh, out, Moxie. The cops seen us and they... Shut up, you kids. Come on in the back room. Now, what do you mean the cops seen you? When we was ditching the car, we let the other guys out first. And then just as we was What'd about... you do with the guns? Uh, they guess the cops got them. We left them in the car. Why, well, you idiots. Tim says we got to run away or they'll get us sure. Yeah, but we dasn't make a break for a few days. If you're hot, what are you coming to me for? I got no place to put you. We already got a place. We can hide out in our club room at the old warehouse. You'll take us there in your car, won't you, Moxie? If we go out on the street, they'll get us, sure. You're gonna run away in a few days, huh? Yeah. Well, maybe that ain't a bad idea. Will you take us to the warehouse, Moxie? Will you? Okay, kids. I'll do it. Gee, you're a real pal, Moxie. You're swell. Yeah, ballistics is making the tests now, Nick. Oh, well, what test is that, Sergeant? They're checking the kids' rifles against the bullet that killed Riley to see which one fired that particular shot. Well, how will that help? Well, you see, Pastor, every one of the rifles is covered with fingerprints. Uh-huh. And when we know which gun killed Riley, we'll know which kid did it. No sign of Tim and Bubs yet, huh? No, Nick, but mm. we rounded up the other four that was in the car, and we'll have them too before long. I still say it was an accident, a stray bullet. Look, Patsy, it don't make no difference. They were committing a crime when it happened, so that makes it murder. Patty, I don't go along with that stray bullet theory. Well, you're probably right, Nick. And if Riley was killed deliberately, I'll bet Tim Newton was the one that did it. Well, why Tim, Sergeant? I've been told he was plenty sore at Riley for telling the old lady the boys started that fire in the building of hers across the street. Well, I'm not surprised at that. Another reason I think Tim did it is because the other boys all said that shooting up Mrs. Tellman's home was his idea. I wonder if it was, Manning. I... You think the... You think the kids are lying? No. My Bubs' mother said he and Tim had been hanging around Moxie Reed lately. Hey, maybe you got something there, Nick. Moxie's just the kind of a guy to put ideas like that in the kid's mind. Say, who is this Moxie Reed anyway? Uh, well, Patsy, a few years ago, he wasn't much different from Tim Newton. Hmm? But he's developed into a first-class rat, a cheap gangster. Now, wait a minute. I wouldn't say cheap, Nick. He's getting plenty of dough from somewhere, or he wouldn't be able to run around in that big cream-colored convertible he's got. But you can't get anything on him, huh? No, no, not lately. Huh. You know, about seven years ago, we tagged him for a stick-up. Over on the... Hey, that's funny. Hmm? Well, talk about coincidences. Well, what's funny, Sergeant? The guy that hung that rap on Moxie was Riley, the man who was killed. What? what? Yeah, he used to be a cop before he retired. You say Riley was the one who arrested Moxie Reed? Sure, it was his testimony that sent Moxie up. That's what I've been looking for, Mary. Somebody who had reason to hate Riley. Somebody beside the kids. Hey, that's an idea, Nick. Moxie might have got the kids to shoot up Mrs. Tellman's home and got one of them to bump off Riley by telling him it would look like an accident and nobody could ever prove which one did it. Yeah, it could have been that way, Matty, but... Yeah, I think that... But... Oh, oh, wait a minute. Homicide, Sergeant Matheson speaking. Oh, yeah? Yeah, what did you find out? Is it the report from ballistics? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Malloy. It... It wasn't. But it had to be. Oh, you, you sure you didn't make no mistake? I know, but... Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. What's the matter, Matty? You know what, Nick? None of them six guns we found in the kid's car killed Riley. Good. But what do you mean, good? It only proves that one of those kids knew he was going to kill Riley. That's why he took the gun away and hid it so we couldn't identify it. You may change your mind after we talk to Tim and Bubs. What? Well, we ought to pick them up before long. Do you want me to give you a ring when we find them? No, no, I don't want to sit around and wait. I'm going out to look for them myself. Okay. In the meantime, I suggest you have some of your boys bring in Moxie Reed. Our club room's right at the top of these stairs, Moxie. You sure nobody will come looking around in here? Hi, this old warehouse ain't been used for years. They condemned it or something. 
Where's the room you kids are going to hide out in? It's this door. We got a padlock on it, so as if anybody ever did come in here, they wouldn't swipe any of our stuff. You got the key, Tim? Sure, I got it right here. Moxie, you've been a great guy, and we ain't ever going to forget it. Yeah. It was just like you belonged to our gang. Sure. Even coming down there to help us out. Down where? To old lady Tillman's house. What are you talking about? And you wasn't even going to tell us. We wouldn't have known what a swell pal you are if Bob's hadn't have looked up and seen you. It was swell seeing you standing in that window across the street pumping lead into the old lady's front door just like we was. So you saw me there, did you? Yeah. Oh, we didn't tell the other guy. That's but... good. I'll get in that room. Come on, Bob's. Tim, I... I think I changed my mind. Huh? If I was to run away... Well, it'd just about kill my mom. I'd rather go to the reform school. Are you nuts? Get inside there. I can't. I'm going back home. You're going in that room now. <clears throat> hey, what's the idea of hitting I'm... a little kid like that? That for you too, stupid. Get in there. Oh! Been nice knowing you. Nick, we've been driving along the waterfront for almost an hour. Isn't it time to give up and go home? Yeah, I guess so, Patsy. But Bob's mother said the boys had a club room in some deserted warehouse in this district. Seemed a logical place for them to hide out. Yeah, but it's so dark down here now, you can't even tell which ones are deserted. Well, I was hoping we'd find them on the street. This is where they came, though. It looks as though they got here first. We can come back again in the morning. All right. Hey, Betsy. Hmm? Look at that car up ahead. Well, why, it's a big cream-colored convertible. Like the one Sergeant Matheson said Moxie Reed owned. If I'm not mistaken, that's Moxie getting ready to drive off. Are you sure? No, but I'm going to cut in ahead of him and find out. Yeah. Stay right where you are, Moxie. Thought I recognized you. What do you want to do? Give me a medal? No, just want to have a little talk with you. If you don't mind. What do you like us in here for, Tim? I want to go home. Ah, quit blubbering, will you? Go on, chew your bubble gum. I lost it someplace. Okay, so quit crying anyway. I ain't gonna let nothing happen to you. There'll be plenty of people working around this neighborhood in the morning. If we yell loud enough, somebody will come and let us out. I want to get out now. Well, you can't. We could yell our lungs out and nobody would hear us, so shut up. Tim. Tim. Tim, do you smell something? Huh? Hey, I think I do. It smells like smoke. He did smoke. Yeah, and it's stronger over here by the door. Holy cow, the building must be on fire. What are we going to do? we got to get out. We can't. The door's locked. Help! Let us Help. out. Somebody. Fire. Get us out of here. We'll be burned out. Get out of here. Help. Hoping against hope that someone will hear them, the two boys pound helplessly against the heavy locked door. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of the case of the littlest gangster. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Unaware that Tim and Bubs are locked in a burning warehouse in the deserted waterfront district, Patsy listens as Nick questions Moxie Reed. I want to know where those two kids are, Reed. I don't know what kids you're talking about. Oh, yes, you do. Tim Newton and Bubs Harris. I ain't seen them in two or three days. Hey, just a minute, Moxie. You chew gum? No, and I don't go for all day suckers either. Well, there's a wad of chewing gum stuck to your trousers leg. And from the color, I'd say it was bubble gum. Does that mean something, Nick? Bubs Harris got his nickname because he's always chewing bubble gum. What? I'll bet this was some of his. See, it hasn't even begun to dry out yet. Oh, lots of kids chew bubble gum. I might have picked it up any place. And when we find you up here, the neighborhood where we expected to find Bubs and Tim, I think that gum means a whole lot. Nick, look. Across the street, those windows. The warehouse is on fire, Patsy. Yeah. You better turn on an alarm. There's a box right in front of the warehouse. Right, Nick. I'll get it. Look, Carter, I got a date. I've got to... What's your hurry? I'm getting out of here. I mean, I gotta go up and have... You wouldn't know anything about that fire, would you? No. Watch yourself. I'm gonna start a... You're not going anywhere, Moxie. You're staying here till I find out what's making you so jittery all of a sudden. Why, you, I'll... 
Oh, you want to play, do you? Well, how do you like that? Huh. Out cold. Must have swung harder than I thought. Nick! Oh, Nick! Yes, what is it, Patsy? Just as I turned the alarm, Nick, I thought I heard someone in the building. Listen. I'll bet that's the boys. Oh, you've got to save them, Nick. Here, take my handcuffs. Yeah. Fasten Moxie to the steering wheel of the car. Uh-huh. I'm going after those boys before they burn to death. <laughs> Tim! <coughs> Bubs! Where are you? In here, this door. It's locked. Can you open it? No, it's a padlock. All right, stand out of the way. I'm going to try to break it down. I think it gave a little. Try it again. All right. See, I was afraid nobody would come and... Never mind, never mind. Where's Bubs? Over there on the floor. He passed out from the smoke. Okay, I'll carry him. Come on. <laughs> Nick, look. The flames are coming up the stairs. We can't get out that way. Is there another way out of here, Tim? There's some windows at the back. Maybe we can jump. <laughs> Quick, show me the way. I'll follow with Bubs. <laughs> There's no time to lose. How's your ankle, Nick? Oh, you can stop worrying, Patsy. It's all right. Well, I guess you were lucky at that to get off with only a sprained ankle after jumping out of a second-story window. But it wasn't for that pile of trash I landed on. It might have been worse. Yeah. And if Bubs hadn't come to before we jumped, it would have been very much worse. Mm, I'm glad neither of the kids was hurt. Do you know yet what's going to happen to them? Well, I think I'll be able to get them a suspended sentence. Depending on their future good behavior, of course. Well, now that the boys' club is a certainty, their behavior shouldn't be any problem. Well, I think they've learned their lesson. It's a sense they'll never admire gangsters again, after the way Moxie treated them. Uh-huh. You know, you never did tell me how you figured out that Moxie killed Mr. Riley. I didn't know it was Moxie. But I was pretty sure Riley hadn't been shot by one of the boys in that car. Why? Because anyone shooting from a car wouldn't have had the gun more than five feet above street level. Mm-hmm. And Riley was sitting on the top step, his head at least eight feet above street level. Well? And the bullet went into the center of his forehead and came out behind his right ear, traveling a downward course. I see. If it had been fired from the car, the bullet would have traveled upward. Right. That's why I thought the bullet might have come from the second or third story of that empty building across the street. It did, too. That's where Bub saw Moxie. Yes, but the boys thought he was helping them frighten Mrs. Tillman. They didn't even know Riley had been shot until I told them. So that's why Moxie tried to kill the boys by setting that warehouse on fire, because he knew they'd seen him. Yeah. See, Moxie had hated Riley ever since Riley sent him up to the penitentiary for that stick-up seven years ago. Yeah. And when the boys told him of their trouble with a woman who lived next door, and also that Riley sat on the front steps of his house every night, well, it looked like a perfect setup for murder. Yeah, well, I still don't see how you could ever have proved it, though, if Moxie hadn't confessed. Well, we were lucky to get the proof first, and he confessed later. <laughs> it wasn't hard once we knew what to look for. We found the dealer from whom Moxie bought a twenty-two rifle exactly like the one he knew the boys were going to use. And later, we found the gun itself. So it wasn't such a perfect setup after all. Well, not for murder, but as far as Moxie was concerned, it turned out to be a perfect setup for the electric chair. Master Detective is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the network for the Indianapolis Speedway race tomorrow, the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime.
Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Now let's have the truth, Whitey. Where did you get that suit of clothes? Uh, the fella that got croaked, he took them off and gave them to me himself. Uh-huh, and I suppose he gave you his shirt and socks and necktie, too? Sure, sure. He said I'd need him to go with his suit. And he stopped the car so I could put him on. Was that when you tried to kill him? No, Chief. That's when he tried to kill me. Oh, Nick, this isn't getting us anywhere. You're wrong, Patsy. Now I know who really killed Mr. Atwell. Now, the case of the unexpected corpse. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning as Nick and Patsy enter the office of Sheriff Tabor in the little town of Plain City, Texas. Hiya, Sheriff. Hello, Sheriff Tabor. Well, I'll be dog. Nick Carter and Patsy (laughs) Bowen. What are you two doing out this way? Why, we're on our way back home from California, Sheriff. And since we had to come through Texas anyway, I reminded Nick of that invitation you gave us three years ago. Remember? Sure, I remember. (laughs) And you got here just at the right time. We had a murder last night. Oh, now, wait, Sheriff. This is purely a social visit. A murder? Here in Plain City? Oh, about ten miles east of here. A big oil man from Dallas named Leonard Atwell. He was shot and killed by some hitchhiker. Now, look, Sheriff. Well, I... how do you know it was a hitchhiker, Sheriff? Well, because we know Atwell started out from Dallas alone. Uh-huh. And when he we found the body, it was behind the wheel of his car with powder burns and a bullet hole in the right side of his head. Well, that sounds more like suicide. No, no, it couldn't have been that. The gun was gone, so was Atwell's money, his watch, and a big gold signet ring that he always wore. You found any clues yet? No, can't tell yet. I had everything that was in the car brought up here to my office and spread them out on those big tables over there. Come on, I'll show you. Well, I... I, uh, I put the tools uh, from the car in this table here, see? Mm-hmm. Now, I wonder uh, what I use this piece of rubber tubing for. Yeah, search me. Now, over here, these were the clothes he was aware of. I see. And hey, what's this little piece of adhesive tape? Well, that was on his right hand. There was a little scratch there. Oh. Now, look at this piece of tape. Hmm? See that flaw in the weave where it was torn off the roll? Mm, yeah. thing like that might be a clue. Sure. Now, uh, on this table here, I got his suitcases... And the stuff that was in them, clothes mostly. Hmm, this looks interesting. Last will and testament of Leonard Frank Atwell. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, he left everything to his wife in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Thought he was from Dallas. Well, he was, but he deserted his wife in Detroit 18 years ago. Uh, There's a letter there in that envelope marked to be opened in case of my death, asking her to forgive him and all that stuff. Looks of it, he must have been carrying that around a long time. Yeah, I guess so. I uh, suppose a man like that carried a lot of insurance. Mm, $150,000 worth. Oh, golly. Took out the policy only a couple of months ago. Right here in Plain City, by the way. $150,000, huh? Mm-hmm. Who gets it? Well, the wife, I guess. She's the sole heir. And the policy's made out to his estate. Hey, Sheriff, I don't see any first aid kit here. No, there wasn't one in the car. Just that stuff you see here. Well, then where'd he get that strip of adhesive tape? It's perfectly clean. Couldn't have had it on more than a few minutes. Well, maybe when he cut his hand, he stopped at a filling station or a lunchroom, and they fixed it up for him. Say, Patsy, now that sure sounds reasonable. Yeah, maybe if you can find that filling station or lunchroom, you can get a description of the man who was riding with that well just before he was killed. Say, that's a great idea. I'll do that. Couldn't have driven more than a few miles without getting the tape soiled, and if he should be... Uh, uh, I'm sorry to butt in, Sheriff. That's okay, Buck. Folks, this is Buck Henderson, my uh, deputy. That's Mr. Carter... And Miss Bowen. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? Hello, Buck. Uh, this telegram just come, and I thought it might be important. Oh, thank you, Buck. Oh, uh, say, Buck. Yes, yeah, Sheriff? I want you to hop in your car and start out on the highway toward Dallas. Stop at every filling station and lunchroom along the way and find out if Atwell stopped there last night. Good gravy, Sheriff. Dallas is 290 miles. Never mind. You just do what I... Well, I'll be dogged. Something wrong? Why, this telegram... It's from the chief of police in Dallas. You see, I wired him to send someone out to Atwell's home address and tell the folks there what had happened. Well? Well, the chief says they ain't no such address. It's a vacant lot. (laughs) 
We uh, came out here to see you, Colonel Gardner, because you knew Mr. Atwell better than anyone in the county. Well, yes. In the course of our business dealings, we became very close friends. Mm -hmm. His death has been a terrible shock to me. You have any idea why he should have given a false address? No, but I'm sure it wasn't done with any intent to deceive. I've never known a more honorable gentleman than Leonard Atwell. Oh? Then you didn't know he deserted his wife? His wife? Atwell told me he was a bachelor. Well, you'll get a chance to meet the bachelor's wife this afternoon. She's coming here? Yep. When I uh, notified her of his death, she wired back that she was taking the next plane. Colonel Gardner, would you mind telling us the nature of your business dealings with Mr. Atwell? Not at all. He bought some oil leases from me. $130,000 worth. Well, you didn't sign those leases over to him without getting the money, did you? Uh, as a matter of fact, it did. What? He gave me a certified check for 40000 at the time, and he was on his way here last night to pay the balance and pick up his note. You mean the hitchhiker who killed him got away with $90,000? Oh, no, Miss Bowen. It uh, wouldn't have been in cash, of course. Oh. This sure ought to be a warning to you, Colonel, not to go picking up folks on the road. I'm afraid I'm too old to change my ways now, Sheriff. You make a habit of doing that, Colonel? Why, every tramp in the in the country knows that this ranch is good for a meal and a night's lodging. Why, last winter, an old hobo got sick and died here. And the Colonel even paid for his funeral. Let well, up. Sheriff, there's little enough that we can do for those less fortunate than ourselves. Oh, uh, excuse me, please. Hello. Yes. Yes, he's here. Just a minute. For you, Sheriff. Oh, thanks, Colonel. Must be from the courthouse. Hello? Yes, this is Sheriff Tabor. You did? When? Yeah? Uh-huh. Fine. Fine. I'll come right back to town. Oh, Nick, we got him. A murderer? Yep. Caught him trying to peddle Atwell's ring and watch. Is it somebody from around here? No, it's some old bum, just like I thought. I'm sorry to rush off, Colonel, but we got a killer to take care of. Oh, you got me wrong, Chief. Honest, I never croaked nobody. Then where'd you get his watch and ring? I told you, I found it. And that suit he was wearing, I suppose you found that too, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's right, Chief. It was all rolled up in a bundle, like at the side of the road. Now, look, you, whatever your name is. Hey, it's Morgan, Chief. Whitey Morgan. Okay, Morgan. Now, why don't you open up and tell us what you did with the gun? I never had no gun. I'm a bum, sure, but I never hurt nobody in all my life. You hitched a ride with a gray-haired guy in a big sedan last night, didn't you? No. No, I never you did. You pulled the gun and you made him drive off on a side road. I've never seen the guy. on And after you killed him, you took his watch and ring. Then you opened up his suitcases and got yourself a new suit of clothes. No, didn't you, huh? no, no, I swear no. I didn't. Uh, no. Hey, look, Chief, you wouldn't send me to the pen for something I didn't do, would you? It ain't the pen you're headed for, brother. It's the electric chair. But Nick, he's bound to be the guy. How else would he get Atwell's watch and ring? And those clothes, they were Atwell's too. Okay, Sheriff, but why didn't he have any money in his pockets? You said Atwell always carried a lot of cash. Yes, but you didn't think he really did find that stuff, do you, Nick? No. If ever I saw a man trying to lie out of a bad situation, it was Morgan. But, well, that's pretty slim evidence in which to convict him of murder. Hey, Sheriff. Yes? Yeah? Sheriff, I found it. The place where Atwell got the adhesive tape? Well, I don't know about that, but he stopped at a filling station about 30 miles up the line and had the oil changed in his car while he was eating dinner. Good work, Buck. Yeah, and there was somebody with him, too, sort of an old gent with white hair. Whitey Morgan. I knew it. I got the kid from the filling station out in the office. You want to talk to him? Well, I can't right now. Not, not right now, Buck. Miss Atwell's due in about five minutes, and I've got to go down and, and uh, meet her. Uh, come on, Nick. The uh, undertaking parlors are at the back of the store here, Miss Atwood. Oh. I, uh, I want you to identify the body, just for the record, Julie. I can't believe it. After all these years, poor Leonard. Judging by the letter he left, he must have still thought a great deal of you, Mrs. Atwell. Yes, I don't suppose he ever married again or he'd have left the money to his second wife. Yeah, quite a pile, too. 
$150,000 on the insurance alone. I can't imagine Leonard getting rich. Why, 20 years ago, he couldn't even hold a job. Uh, right through this door, ma'am. All right. The blue casket over there. And to think everybody used to call him lazy and shiftless. I guess now they'll... <gasps> What's the matter, Mrs. Atwell? Why, th- that's not... Not your husband? Or... Oh, yes, of, co- of course that's Leonard, but... Uh... But what? Well, naturally, he's changed a lot in 18 years. But that's definitely Leonard Atwell. Sure it is, Nick. I know him myself. Everybody in town did. All right, then. Since we've identified the victim, suppose we go back to the jail and see what the kid from the filling station can tell us. You're sure you'd know this man if you saw him again, Whitaker? Oh, sure, sure. Him and Mr. Atwell stood around waiting while I finished changing the oil, and I got a right good look at him. Now, uh, Uh, Whitaker? Yeah? When my deputy brings the suspect in here, I don't want you to say anything till I ask you. Oh, no, 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 sir. By the way, did you notice a strip of adhesive tape on Mr. Atwell's right hand? And he said, well, I I don't think he had none, or I'd have noticed it when he he paid me for the oil. Here they are. Oh, Oh, Chief. Chief, you're going to let me go now. That's why you had me brung in here, ain't it? So as you can turn me loose, huh? Well, that all depends, Whitey. Do you still say that you didn't hit your ride last night with a gray-haired man in a big sedan? Oh, Chief, so help me. I never seen the guy in the car, neither. How about that, Whitaker? No, no, he he's a liar, Sheriff. That's the fella that was with Mr. Atwell when they stopped at the filling station. I'll swear it on a stack of Bibles a foot high. <laughs> With the filling station attendant's identification, the case against Whitey Morgan seems complete. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now, back to the case of the unexpected corpse. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. After a sleepless night in the county jail, Whitey Morgan has sent word that he's ready to tell the truth. And the sheriff has asked Nick to accompany him to Whitey's cell. Now, let's have the confession, Whitey. You admit you were lying about where you got that suit of clothes. Yeah, Chief. I didn't find him. This fellow that got croaked, he gave him to me. You what? He did, so help me. Right after he picked me up on the highway, he said it was an old suit that was getting too tight for him. And that he... suit was brand new. I don't care. That's what he told me. I suppose the shirt and socks and the necktie, they were too tight for him, too, huh? Well, he yeah. said I'd need them to go with the suit. Then later, when it got good and dark, he stopped the car so as I could get out and put him on. And that's when you killed him? No. No, honest, Chief. That's when he tried to kill me. Now, wait a minute. He did. I put on the clothes he gave me, and then when I was getting back in the car, he slugged me with a wrench. I seen it coming too late to duck, and that's all I know till I come to in a ditch someplace else. Someplace else? Yeah. He must have hauled me there in the car and dumped me out for dead. Yeah, so he got you all dressed up so you'd die happy, huh? He even gave you his watch and ring. I don't know nothing about the watch and ring. When I come to, I was wearing them. Oh, Whitey. Whitey. Whitey, when you were in the car with Atwell, did you notice a piece of adhesive tape on his right hand? Uh, no. There was nothing on his hand. You're sure? Yeah. What difference does it make, Nick? You're not going to swallow this crazy story, are you? Why didn't you tell us this at first, Whitey? Well, when the chief here said the guy had been croaked, I I got scared. I didn't think he'd believe me. You bet I wouldn't. And take it from me, brother. Neither will the jury. Hiya, Sheriff. Hi, Nick. Hello, Patsy. Hi. Well, where have you two been all afternoon? Oh, lots of places. The post office, the photographers, the garage where you put Atwell's car. What'd you go there for? Wanted to check the speedometer. It registers 9,485 miles. And that boy changed the oil in the car at 9,427, according to the sticker inside the door. So what? Well, from that filling station to where the body was found is a distance of 24 miles. From that spot to the garage here is 10 miles. That's 34 altogether. Yeah. But the car had been driven 58 miles. See what I mean, Sheriff? 
Atwell must have driven 24 miles out of his way for that piece of adhesive tape. For the love of Pete, Nick, I think that you're touched on that subject of that tape. We, uh, found something else too, Sheriff. Oh? A spot of blood on the floor in the rear of Atwell's car. I'm going to have it analyzed to see if it could possibly have come from that cut on Whitey's head. Oh, Nick, don't tell me that you take any stock in that wild story of his. Why, any five-year-old kid could make up a better lie than that. And, uh, so could Whitey, unless it happens to be true. But he's got to be lying. Why would Atwell give all that stuff to a tramp, then hit him over the head and throw him out of the car? Look, let me ask you a couple of questions, Sheriff. You said the suitcases were both neatly packed and locked. Why would Whitey repack them after killing Atwell and stealing the clothes? Why, I... uh... And what happened to the money Atwell always carried? Okay, okay, I give up. But do you know the answers? No, not all of them. But I can guess at a few. For instance... Atwell took out a lot of insurance only two months ago, payable to his estate. Yeah. Now, suppose Atwell planned to stage a fake accident with a car. And suppose he planned on having Whitey's body found behind the wheel, wearing his clothes, his watch, and his ring. Yes, but he couldn't got away with it. Everybody in town knew Atwell. Yeah, Whitey and Atwell were both about the same size and age. They both had gray hair. And if the body were badly burned... Burned? Remember that piece of rubber tubing? It would have been just the thing for siphoning gasoline out of the tank to be sure that the fire burned everything it was supposed to. Why, every insurance company knows that trick, Sheriff. It's been done a hundred times. Yes, but Atwell didn't do that. There wasn't any accident. The car wasn't burned. All right, maybe something went wrong at the last minute, and the plan was changed. I Remember know. how surprised Mrs. Atwell looked when she saw the body? Yes, I know, but she explained that. Yes, and she has some more explaining to do. I've been in touch with the Detroit police. And the surprise she got yesterday is nothing to the one I have in store for her today. Mrs. Atwell, you recognize this picture? Well, where did you get that? The uh, Detroit police found it in the bedroom of your apartment and transmitted it here to Nick by wire photo. Isn't that a picture of your husband? Well, yes, but... Well, it was taken more than 20 years ago, and he... Let me see it, Nick. Yeah, yeah, that's Atwell, all right. But I wouldn't have known it unless I was looking for the resemblance. Now, look at this picture. What is it? An ear? Right, Sheriff. The left ear of Leonard Atwell enlarged 50 times from that snapshot. You see, Mrs. Atwell, ears are as individual as fingerprints. They never change from birth to death, except in size. Say, I didn't know that. And this ear, Leonard Atwell's ear, is an entirely different shape from that of the man you identified yesterday as your husband. <gasps> All right, I, I I lied about it. I knew that wasn't Leonard. But, but I... But, Nick, it is Atwell. I know him myself. You mean you knew the man who posed as Leonard Atwell? I don't understand. Why should anyone do that? There's one obvious reason, Mrs. Atwell. That $150,000 insurance money. Hey, I get it, Nick. He was going to fake the accident like you said and split the money with her. But then she killed him in order to keep it all to herself. You're accusing me of... Of murder, you bet I am. No, 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 Sheriff. According to the Detroit police, Mrs. Atwell was attending a bridge party the night of the murder. I checked that angle. Well, she could have hired somebody to do it for her, couldn't she? Perhaps, but I don't think so. There was big money behind this impersonation. Nick? Nick, I have an idea. Didn't the colonel say that he signed those oil leases over to Atwell absolutely? Yes, in return for a check and a promissory note for the balance. Then maybe that was the real reason behind it. And the insurance was only part of the scheme to carry out the idea that he was a rich man. If you think he was cheating the colonel, you're barking up the wrong tree, Patsy. Nobody gets ahead of that old bird. Yeah, but the dead man did get absolute title to $130,000 worth of oil leases. And all he actually paid out was 40000 Well, even if the colonel never gets another cent, he's doing all right. What do you mean? Why, those leases ain't worth anything. He couldn't have peddled them to anybody around here for more than five or ten thousand. So that's it. Come on, Patsy. Huh? Hey, where are you going? To look for a roll of adhesive tape. Here's my first aid kit, Mr. Carter. Oh, it's an awfully big one, isn't it? Oh, on a ranch, you never know what may happen, Miss Bowen. May I look through the kit, Colonel Gardner? Certainly, Mr. Carter. I'd like to know why you're so interested. I'm interested because the man who was murdered two nights ago had a fresh grip of adhesive tape on his right hand. And I'm wondering whether it came from here. But Atwell never got to my ranch. I told you he was on his way. I know that's what you said, Colonel. 
But there was an extra 24 miles in his speedometer. In other words, he must have made a side trip of 12 miles and back. And this ranch is exactly 12 miles off the main highway. Are you calling me a liar, sir? Worse than that, Colonel. I'm calling you a murderer. Ridiculous. Leonard Atwell was my friend. The man who called himself Leonard Atwell was your stooge. You paid his expenses for four months while he built up the illusion of being a wealthy oil promoter. You're out of your mind. Why should I do such a thing? So that he could take out a big life insurance policy payable to his estate. And then make a will, starting with the usual clause about paying all just debts. Meaning that promissory note you hold, Colonel. There's a neat way to collect $90,000 for your worthless oil leases. <laughs> You're imagining things. Maybe so. The way I see it, the plan went like this. Atwell picked up somebody who roughly resembled him, dressed him in his clothes, then knocked him out. This man was Whitey Morgan, who was to be found dead in Atwell's car. And would be taken for Atwell because his body would be too burned for positive identification. Then you and Atwell would share the money you would collect from Atwell's estate because of that note for 90000 you held. But when Atwell, with Morgan's unconscious body in his car, came here to get your help in faking the accident, you decided that a substitute wasn't as effective as the real thing, so you killed Atwell. This is ridiculous. Then you emptied Atwell's pockets to make it look like a robbery. Then you took the unconscious Morgan miles away and dumped him by the side of the highway knowing he'd be the logical suspect in Atwell's murder. And you didn't burn the car because it was no longer necessary with a real Atwell dead in it. How do you expect to prove any such wild story? Atwell had no adhesive tape on his hand when he picked up Morgan. He did have it when he was found dead. If that tape came from your first aid kit, it'll prove he was here after he had set Morgan up for the fake killing. A very interesting theory, Carter. But not proof. You'll hand me the roll of adhesive tape from your kit. I think it'll give me the proof I need. Very well. All right. What? Get your hands up, both of you. Nick, he had a gun in the kit. Yes. I put it there when I went out of the room to get this kit, Carter. I thought there was something odd about your wanting to inspect my first aid supplies. Why? Because you remember the last time you used that kit was just before the murder? <laughs> a very shrewd guess, Mr. Carter. So you did kill that man, just as Nick said. With this very gun, my dear. It's too bad that you have to be so clever, Mr. Carter. What? What do you mean by that? I mean that you two are the only people who suspect I killed that stupid fool. So I'm going to kill both of you. Right now. <laughs> With his hands in the air, Nick hasn't a chance of reaching his own gun before Colonel Gardner's finger closes on the trigger. We'll see what happens in just a minute. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Unexpected Corpse. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In the living room of Colonel Gardner's ranch house, Nick and Patsy stand with their hands in the air, staring at the revolver in the colonel's hands as he says, You two are the only ones who suspect I killed that stupid fool. So I'm going to kill both of you. Right now. You're wrong, Colonel. The sheriff knows all about this. I told him not half an hour ago. <laughs> I'm too good a poker player to fall for a bluff like that, Carter. This is no bluff, Colonel. Uh, drop that gun. Table, you. Yes, Colonel. I've been standing outside that window. That was a mighty interesting confession. And thanks for telling us that this is the gun you killed your partner with. Why, Nick, you were right about this adhesive tape. It does match that strip on the dead man's hand. You can tell by that same flaw in the weave. So... Even if we didn't have the gun, that would prove he was here just before he was murdered. You're pretty smart, Nick. No mistake. By the way, Colonel, will you tell us why Atwell, or whatever his name was, had that adhesive tape on his hand? He scratched it while he was getting his suitcase out of the luggage compartment. Didn't amount to anything, but it was bleeding some. Well, Colonel, you ought to be right proud. You'll go down in history as the first man who ever hung himself with a piece of adhesive tape. Well, Patsy, I hope we can get home without any more distractions. Uh-huh. Nick, do you suppose they'll ever find out what happened to the real Leonard Atwell? Well, Patsy, that came out in the colonel's confession. Huh? Remember the sheriff telling us about that old bum that died on the colonel's ranch last winter? What? 
he was Leonard Atwell? Nobody else. When the colonel went through his effects, he found that letter to his wife asking her to forgive him for deserting her 18 years ago. Uh Uh-huh. That's where the colonel got the idea for cashing in on those worthless oil leases. Well, then it's no wonder the false Atwell resembled the picture of the real one. The colonel knew the type of person he needed for the impersonation. And he found him in Hollywood. A broken-down movie extra with a shady reputation. Uh Uh-huh. You know, Nick... I bet he never knew to the last minute that he was cast as the corpse in the colonel's little drama. Well, that corpse was an unexpected shock to almost everyone. Mrs. Atwell expected it to be her husband. The imposter expected it to be Whitey. And only the colonel knew who the unexpected corpse really was. And, um, he wasn't telling. And now, Nick... How about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week? Well, Mike, if you were a young man with all the money you wanted, and if you had everything in the world to live for, can you think of any reason why you would want to die? I can't think of a reason for wanting to die under any circumstances. Well, a young man named Miles Kincaid had a different attitude. Yes, he was found drowned in a lake, and yet he wasn't drowned in a lake. And before the case was over, Nick uncovered the reason for not just one, but for three mysterious deaths. Well, it sounds as though we're in for a lot of excitement as well as mystery. What do you call the adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Flowery Farewell. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silver. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined. As new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Why do you suppose he doesn't answer the door, Nick? I don't know, Patsy. Maybe if we look through this window, we can see. Well, Nick, what's the matter? What are you staring at? Look over there on the floor by the sofa, Patsy. Huh? Why, there's a man lying there. He's been shot in the forehead. Confound it. He's the one man in the world who could have told us why a young man who had everything to live for should want to take his own life. And now, the case of the flowery farewell. Today's exciting adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As our story opens, we find Nick seated at his desk in his office, intently studying the front page of the evening paper. Patsy stands behind him, reading over his shoulder. Nick, it says he was only 35 years old. Yes, Patsy, he was one of the richest industrialists in the world. (laughs) And he ends up by throwing himself in a lake. Oh, it just doesn't make sense, Nick. Why would a man like that take his own life? Well, the suicide note he left in his car tells why. It's reprinted here in the paper. Oh, is it? I didn't see it. Yeah, right down here at the bottom of the column. Hmm? It is not the number of years a man has lived that enables him to say his life was justified. It is the richness and fullness of his experience. I say farewell to my own life with deep regret, and yet I am convinced that it is better for a man to die in his prime quickly and painlessly than to let old age destroy him by slow stages. Well, pretty flowery farewell, isn't it? Well, I'll say. Imagine anyone sitting down and... Oh, I'll get it. Okay. Nick Carter speaking. Mr. Carter, my name is Mrs. Holt. Mrs. Douglas Holt. Yes, Mrs. Holt. I wonder whether you can come to my home this evening. My husband and I would like to speak to you about the death of our very good friend, Miles Kincaid. Oh, yes, the man who committed suicide. The man who died, Mr. Carter. Whether or not he committed suicide is what we'd like you to find out. Well, 
so far, Mrs. Holt. I'm afraid you haven't given me any really solid grounds for your suspicions that Kincaid didn't kill himself. But Mr. Carter Miles had everything in the world to live for. He was rich, famous, and happy. Well, according to his note, he wanted his life to end at the peak of his success. Yes, but what about his call to me yesterday? He said he had plane reservations and was leaving for Florida very soon. My wife checked on that, Mr. Carter. It's true. Yes, if he were going to commit suicide today... Why would he make arrangements for a trip at a future date? Let me ask you this. You're implying that Kincaid was murdered. But do you know of anyone who would have any reason to kill him? Well, no, I don't. How about you, Mr. Holt? No, I, I can't think of anyone. And yet you both knew him well, didn't you? Oh, yes. In fact, well, Miles and I had quite a crush on each other a good many years ago. That was before he introduced me to Douglas. He and I were partners at that time. We had a little organization that we called Inventors Incorporated... We broke up after a while, but we never lost touch with each other. And in all these years, he made no serious enemies? Well, of course, he might have, without our knowing it. Well, it still doesn't add up to murder, does it, Nick? No, not to me. Then you won't investigate this matter for us, Mr. Carter? Oh, I didn't say that, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I wish you would, Mr. Carter. I just know something's wrong somewhere. I've got a... Well, an intuition about it. Very well, Mrs. Holt. I have a lot of faith in a woman's intuition. There has been a murder. I promise you I'll find it out before the night is over. Did you talk to Sergeant Matheson on the phone, Nick? Yes. And you should have heard the horse laugh he gave me when I suggested that Miles Kincaid might have been murdered. Oh, that must mean the handwriting experts are sure about the suicide note. They are. Maddie says there's absolutely no question about it. Wasn't a forgery. Huh. Well, that pretty well settles it then, doesn't it? Mm, perhaps. But at least it won't hurt to take a look at Kincaid's home. Mm-mm. We're almost there, Nick. It's the house at the end of this street. All right. <laughs> Matty wasn't even going to hold an autopsy. Did you ask him to? I did, and he finally agreed to it. Good. All right. Hop out. Uh-huh. Uh, whom do you expect to see here, Nick? Kincaid's valet. A man named Harry Otis. Oh. Holt says he was probably the last man to see Kincaid alive. Yeah, but do you think you... What, what was that, Nick? Somebody moaning. Someone in pain. It came from those bushes by the side of the porch. Yeah, come on. There he is, Nick, lying in the bushes. All right, give me a hand, Patsy. Yeah. We'll pull him out. Yeah. Watch out for that branch. Okay. There, that does it. My head. Yeah, what happened to you? Who, who are you? Nick Carter, private investigator. Who are you? Harry Otis. I'm... I was Mr. Kincaid's valet, sir. Well, what happened to you? Uh, someone rang the doorbell a few minutes ago. I I opened the door, but there was no one there, so I stepped out in the porch. That's, that's all I remember. He must have been slugged from behind, Nick. Yeah, come on. Where are we going? Whoever slugged him may have wanted to get into the house. Could still be there. Okay, Nick. If Miles Kincaid committed suicide, Nick... What's this all about? Your guess is as good as mine, Patsy. Hmm. The front door is open. Don't make any noise. Uh -uh. No one in the living room. What, have you gone upstairs? Wait a minute. Listen. Nick, it's someone moving around. Right. Behind that closed door over there. Let's drop in on him. Unexpectedly. Right. Oh, confound it. Is the door locked? Yes. Oh. Guess we'll have to announce ourselves after all. Open up. Open this door. Oh, I'm firing through the door. Not hurt, are you? No, but it was awful close, Nick. Oh, it's all quiet in there now. Afraid he's giving us a slip. That gunfire was probably intended to cover his getaway. What are we going to do? Only one thing to do. Shoot the lock off. Stand back. Yeah. There. Oh, Nick, he must have gone out that open window. Yeah, no use going after him in the dark. Oh, shucks. Oh, will you look at this room? It must have been Kincaid's study. Well, it's a mess now. A friend tore it apart, every drawer, every what file. What have you been after? I don't know. But there is one thing I do know. What's that, Nick? As of now, I'm definitely interested in how Miles Kincaid really died. <laughs> Certainly, Mr. Carter. As Miles Kincaid's lawyer, I'm happy to help you clear up any questions you have regarding his death. Well, first, Mr. Randolph, who stood to benefit by his death? Well, all of his wealth is to be divided among various foundations and charitable institutions. What? 
He left no private bequest whatsoever? Only a comparatively small one to Melvin Dudley. Melvin Dudley? That's the publisher, isn't it? Yes, yes. Miles had arranged with Dudley to publish his memoirs, and he left a few thousand dollars to cover the cost. Then Kincaid was writing his memoirs at the time of his death. He practically finished them, though that fact wasn't commonly known. I see. But what about all his property holdings? He must have had an enormous estate. Not anymore. He'd sold everything in the past year, converted it all into cash. There's just one piece of land that he held on to. Oh, where's that? Over in the poorer section of town, on Montrose Avenue. That's to be sold at auction now that he's dead. But I don't understand, Randolph. Why on earth would he have disposed of all his possessions at the age of 35? Hmm. You'd almost think he knew he was going to die. He did, Miss Bowen. What? What? He and his personal physician and I were the only ones who were in on his secret. What secret? Mr. Carter, in six weeks, Miles Kincaid would have been dead of heart trouble. Why are we going back to the office, Nick? I want to call Mary and check on the autopsy. Oh. Nick... You promised Hope that before the night is over, you'd at least know whether or not Kincaid was murdered. Do you think you will? I don't know. All I found out so far is that he had a better reason than we thought for doing away with himself. Yeah, but that still doesn't explain the mysterious visitor at his house tonight. And also it... Oh, that's our phone, Nick. Oh, yeah, here. I got the key. Good. Hurry, Nick, before they hang up. Okay. Nick Carter speaking. Uh, Nick, this is Matty. Oh, yeah, Matty. I was just going to call you. What'd you find out? Kincaid was drowned, all right. His lungs are full of water. What? Well, that settles that. No, it doesn't, Nick. What do you mean? His lungs are full of water right enough, but the water was full of chlorine. Chlorine? Yeah. But there's no chlorine in lake water. You're right, Nick. But there's plenty of it in the city water system. And Miles Kincaid was drowned before he was thrown into the lake. Right. And that means murder. Nick knows at last that the wealthy young industrialist did not die by his own hand. But why Miles Kincaid left a suicide note, or why anyone would want to kill a man who was doomed to die from heart trouble within six weeks, are questions that are still unanswered. We'll continue this baffling adventure in just a moment. And now, back to The Case of the Flowery Farewell. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. As we pick up our story, a half an hour has passed. Nick and Patsy have joined Matty at the Kincaid home and, guided by Kincaid's valet, Harry Otis, have just entered the murdered man's bedroom. I see the bed's been made, Otis. Did you do that today? Uh, No, sir. No one's been in here all day. Well, in that case, Kincaid didn't sleep here last night, Nick. Apparently not, Matty. But his dressing gown's on the bed and there's one of his ties on the floor behind that chair. Yeah, was well, Kincaid fully dressed when your men found him, Matty? Well, sure. He had on a brown business suit, a blue shirt, and a green tie. A green tie? Yeah. Oh, no, no. You must be mistaken, Sergeant. Now, don't tell me. He had on a blue shirt and a green tie. But, Sergeant, Mr. Kincaid would never have worn a combination like that. He was very particular about his clothes. Now, listen, Otis. Hey, Matty, wait a minute, wait a minute. This all adds up. Huh? Otis, take a look around. Does this room seem just about the same to you as always? Why, no, sir, it doesn't. The bed's been pushed back farther than usual, and the chairs are all against the wall. Hey, I'm beginning to catch on, Nick. Otis, where were you when your employer retired last night? I had the evening off, sir. I drew his bath water for him, then I went out. Uh When I got back, I assumed he was asleep. You drew his bath, huh? Yes, sir. Well, Matty, at least we know how he died. But you think he was killed here, Nick? I do. He was probably getting undressed when the murderer found him. And they they had a fight? Yeah. That's why the furniture is out of place. Yeah. That would also account for the bruises on King Cade's face. We figured they was from being hit against the rocks in the lake. Yeah. Well, he was probably knocked unconscious in this room. Then the murderer took him into the bathroom and held his head underwater until he was dead. Oh, how horrible. Then he dressed him again. Must have been in such a hurry he didn't see the tie King Cade had taken off. So he grabbed one out of the closet without even noticing the color. And then he carried him out, shoved him in his own car, and drove to the lake. But what about the suicide note? I've got a little theory about that, too. What sort of theory? I'd rather not say until I've had a chance to confirm it. 
But how are you going to do that, Nick? By dropping in on a publisher named Melvin Dudley and asking him a few questions. I guess there's no one home. No, there must be, Patsy. I saw a light at the side of the house. Well, let's go around the side porch and take a look in the room where the light is. Uh Okay, Nick. Oh, you're just wasting time. No. Uh, Here, Nick. We can look in through this French window. Look at all those papers scattered all over the floor. Hey, looks like a cyclone's been through here. Hey, Matty. What? Look over there beside the sofa. Beside what? Sofa. Holy smoke. Nick, there's a man lying there. Smash the glass with your revolver. We've got to get in there. I'll say we have. All right, stand back. Can you reach the latch? Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Holy smoke. Look at this guy, Nick. Yeah. Shot through the head. That's Melvin Dudley, Nick. I've seen his picture in the paper. Well, you'll see it again tomorrow, Patsy, all over the front page. Hey, Matty. Yeah, Nick. This paper's on the floor. Huh? Ever seen any just like them? What? Yeah. Yeah, sure. They're the same kind of paper, the same handwriting as the suicide note. What I figured. And look, here's a typewritten letter among them. Huh? To Melvin Dudley from Miles Kincaid. What's it say, Nick? I'm enclosing the manuscript of my memoirs. Everything is here except the foreword, which I'm working on now. Well, there's the answer to your suicide note, Matty. What do you mean? It was written by Miles Kincaid, but it wasn't intended as a suicide note. Then what was it, Nick? A page from the foreword to his memoirs. The murderer stole it last night from Kincaid's house and planted it in Kincaid's car as a suicide note. Oh, no wonder it sounded so flowery. We're up against the smart operator, Nick. Plenty smart, Matty. But he's made one big mistake. Huh? When he killed Melvin Dudley, he should have taken those memoirs with him. Hello, Matty. Yeah. I've spent a very dull night reading Kincaid's memoirs. Oh, yeah? Find anything interesting in them? Yeah, but the most interesting part isn't there. Is that... I don't get you. Matty, unless I'm all wrong, these memoirs should hold the key to Kincaid's murder. How do you mean? Well, apparently, when Kincaid learned he was going to die, he decided to leave behind him a document that would expose somebody. Uh-huh. Somebody he hated. And you think this somebody got wind of it and knocked Kincaid off so as to get hold of the document? I do. But he didn't get hold of it because Kincaid had already sent it to Dudley. Uh Uh-huh. The murderer realized that after he went back and searched Kincaid's study. So he went to Dudley's house to get it and ended by killing Dudley. Right. But look, Nick, why didn't the murderer take the memoirs while he was there? He did. He what? At least he took that part of them which incriminated him. There's one whole section missing from the manuscript. Oh. Got any idea what was in that section? Yes, Mary, I have. Good boy. When Douglas Holt and his wife put me on this case, Holt told me that he and Kincaid were once partners in an outfit called Inventors Incorporated. Inventors Incorporated? Yeah. But there's no mention of any such organization anywhere in the memoirs. Hey, Nick. Then maybe the... I'm back, Nick. Oh, hello, Sergeant. Oh, hi, Patsy. Yeah, what did you find at the newspaper morgue, Patsy? You got any dope on Kincaid's background? Plenty, Nick. And about that company called Inventors Incorporated. Yeah? There's something funny about that. Funny? In what way? Why, there was a third partner. Third partner? Uh-huh. Huh? Who was he? A man named Peter Jarrett. Peter Jarrett? Mm-hmm. Huh. No mention of him in the memoirs, either. Hey, Nick, are you thinking this Jarrett guy might be our man? I don't know about that, Matty. But I am thinking that it's strange that Holt and his wife didn't tell me about this, Peter Jarrett. I wonder why. I know I should have mentioned Peter Jarrett to you, Mr. Carter, but frankly, I was sticking to an agreement that Miles Kincaid and I made long ago. What sort of agreement, Mr. Holt? To cover up for Jarrett in spite of the raw deal he gave us. Oh, uh, he gave you a raw deal? He certainly did. Hmm. Jarrett wrecked Inventors Incorporated by walking out on us one day, taking with him what little capital we had. And you never saw him again? No, never. But I'm confident he's still alive. Nick, Peter Jarrett must be our man. Well, he certainly had a motive for killing Kincaid. If Kincaid was planning to expose him in the memoirs he was writing. 
You say Miles was writing his memoirs, Mr. Carter? Yes, he was. They were practically complete when he died. Well, then it all adds up, doesn't it? Only a man like Jared who wanted to get hold of those memoirs before they were published would have had a motive for killing a man who was going to die anyway. Yeah, but the question is, how can we get our hands on Jared? Well, I can tell you where his wife lives. She ought to know where he's hiding out if anybody does. Oh, good. We'll go see her. I have an idea that when we find Peter Jarrett, we'll have this case sewed up. Yeah? What do you want? Are you Mrs. Jarrett? What's it to you? I'm Nick Carter, private investigator. A dick, huh? You get out of here. Not this moment, Mrs. Jarrett. I said, get out. Mrs. Jarrett, don't do that. Put that gun away, please. You come one step closer and I'll start shooting, so help me. I don't think you're going to shoot anyone with that gun. I'll take it. Why, you... And the next time you want to fire a gun, Mrs. (sighs) Jarrett, remember to lift the safety catch. Nice going, Nick. (sighs) Pretty darn smart, ain't you? Now, perhaps you better talk to us. I ain't talking to no cops. Why not? Because I'm sick of you guys. You've been hounding me for ten years, ever since Pete disappeared. You wouldn't know where your husband is, would you? Are you crazy? I wouldn't be living like this if I knew. Him with all that dough. When did you see him last? I ain't seen him since the day he went to work and didn't come home. And where was your husband working the day he disappeared? He was working over that house on Montrose Avenue. Montrose Avenue? What? Why, that's the one piece of property that Miles Kincaid held on to after he sold everything else. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mrs. Jarrett. I'm very grateful to you. What? I didn't do nothing for you. Oh, yes, you did. You just gave me the last piece of a very complicated jigsaw puzzle. Oh, Nick, what a horrible, musty old place. Should be musty. After all, nobody's been down in the cellar for over ten years. Not since Miles Kincaid and Douglas Holt closed up the business they called Inventors Incorporated. But what do you expect to find here, Nick? A key to three murders, I hope. Three? But only two men were killed. Patsy, if my hunch is right... Wait a minute. What do you see, Nick? Look where my flashlight's pointing. Notice anything about that slab of concrete over there? Uh, why, yes. It's a different color from the rest of the cellar floor. Right. Because it was laid at a different time. Let's see. It's about three feet wide and six feet long, isn't it? Nick, you think that's a grave? I do. I think a man has been buried under that slab of concrete for ten long years. Patsy stares at the circle of light from Nick's flashlight. Who was buried in the musty cellar on Montrose Avenue and what bearing his death has on the murders of Miles Kincaid and Melvin Dudley we'll find out in just a moment. And now for the conclusion of The Case of the Flowery Farewell. Today's adventure with Nick Carter brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Almost an hour has passed since Nick and Patsy discovered what Nick believes to be a grave in the cellar of the abandoned house on Montrose Avenue. They left the cellar for a time, but have now returned to it and are waiting impatiently. Not a sign of him yet, Nick. He'll be here, all right. Can't afford not to come. I still don't understand why you're so sure he's the murderer. You will before long. Yeah, but... Ah, hold it. Here he comes. Uh You down there, Carter? Yes, we're here. Come on down. What's this all about, anyway? Familiar territory to you, isn't it? It's been a long time since I was here. This is where Miles Kincaid and I had our laboratory. You, Miles Kincaid, and Peter Jarrett. Don't forget Jarrett, Mr. Holt. That's right. Well, by the way, have you got a line on his whereabouts yet? I've done better than that. I've found him. Well, well where is he? Right where you and Miles Kincaid buried him ten years ago. What are you talking about, Carter? I'm talking about murder. You and Kincaid killed Jarrett and buried him down here. That's ridiculous. Probably did it so that you could steal an invention of his. And you spread the word that he'd run off with your funds. You must be out of your mind. No, but I imagine you were nearly out of your mind when Melvin Dudley happened to mention to you that Kincaid was writing his memoirs. (laughs) Why should that worry me? Because you guessed that he was planning to expose your part in the murder. Something he couldn't have done during his lifetime without incriminating himself. What? When the police dig up Jarrett's body... They'll never dig it up. Because you won't be alive to tell them about it. Don't reach for your gun, Carter. I've got you both covered. 
Holt, you made a bad mistake when you admitted that your new Kincaid was a dying man. That was a tip-off on you. Especially since you neglected to tell me that fact when you hired me. Well, I slipped up once. But I won't slip this time. I'll take you first, Carter. No, Holt. I'll take you first. What the... Drop your gun, Holt. I can fight behind you. I'll kill you, you... Oh, my hand! (laughs) Oh, nice shooting, Nick. You cut that gun right out of his hand. And you made a nice dramatic entrance, Matty. (laughs) Well, uh, you set the stage for it, Nick, when you put me behind that packing box. Oh, I thought you'd never come out of there, Sergeant. Yeah, well, I'd have been out sooner, Patsy. Only my pants got caught in the nail. (laughs) Oh, Sergeant. Yeah, and my new suit, too. (laughs) Okay, Hope, let's get moving. No use hanging around this damp cellar. And we got a nice dry cell waiting for you down at headquarters. Then Jared's body was buried in the cellar, Nick. Yes, Patsy. And the case is closed. Uh Uh-uh. Not quite, Hmm? Nick Carter. Not until you've told me how Holt found out that Kincaid was dying of heart trouble. Well, according to the statement Holt gave Matty down at headquarters, Kincaid told him. He did? Mm Mm-hmm. When Holt went to inquire about the memoirs, Kincaid gloated that he'd be dead in six weeks and that everybody would know that Holt was a murderer. But why on earth did Kincaid want to expose Holt? Patsy, don't you remember what Mrs. Holt told us? Hmm? That she used to go with Kincaid? Well, Kincaid never forgave Holt for taking her away from him. Oh, I get it. He couldn't get even with Holt until after he himself was dead. That's right. Yeah, but I can't understand why Holt brought you in on this case. He didn't. His wife did. What? You mean it was her idea to hire you? Sure. She knew nothing about the murder of Peter Jarrett. And she had no idea that Holt had killed Kincaid. She just didn't believe that Kincaid had killed himself. Mm-hmm. And when she wanted to call you, her husband had to agree with her so she wouldn't get suspicious of him. That's it. Oh, brother. When you walked into that house and took the case, it must have been life's darkest moment for Douglas Holt. The darkest so far, Patsy. But the state is planning an even darker moment for him in the very near future. <laughs> Can you tell us something about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week, Nick? Next week, Mike, we're going to meet a man who was honest and upright for five years in order to build up to a fraud worth half a million dollars. Only his plan broke down because he put his fraud in an envelope. A fraud in an envelope? Well, that sounds exciting. What do you call this adventure? I call it the case of the King's Apology. (laughs) Friends, this is Nick Carter again. And I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of the Cudahy Packing Company to salute the 49th Annual Convention of the National Association of Retail Grocers, which begins today in Atlantic City. The independent retail grocer is your good neighbor, bringing you fine foods from all parts of the nation and of the world. So let's all doff our hats to this very important businessman, the independent retail grocer. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Lou Schofield and Ken Pettis. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Nick, look out! Quick, Patsy, down on the floor! Come back here! 
cannot back your dirty lousy... Look, they the curb oh. deliberately. I saw them. Crazy fools, they could have killed us. You're not kidding, driver. Look at those windows. Hey, those ain't... Oh, yes, they are. They're bullet holes. And now, the case of the great impersonation. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. When Jack Blaney was police reporter on the Morning Blade, he and Nick saw a lot of each other. But they lost touch when Jack moved to Center City as city editor of the Daily Crusader there. And then, late one night, Nick received a long-distance call. Hey, where are you calling from, Jack? Center City? Yes, I'm still at the newspaper office. Everybody else went home hours ago, but I'll be here until morning, except that I'll probably have to run out for cigarettes in a little while. Big story coming up? Oh, plenty big. I'm going through the morgue, checking every crime story here for the past ten years. Why, what's the big idea? Nick, there's a gang in this town that the local cops haven't been able to touch. They don't even know who's at the head of it, but I know. Anybody I ever heard of? I don't want to mention names over the phone, but they're mixed up in everything. Gambling, stolen cars, black market, building materials, and now counterfeiting. Well, look, Jack, you better get in touch with the Treasury Department then. Counterfeiting's their job. No, no, I want to get the evidence myself first. This is really big stuff, Nick. And if I swing it, it'll give me a national reputation as a newspaper man. But, Jack, if you know so much about their operations and plans and you know who's at the head of the outfit, you're I haven't any proof, Nick. I just happened to overhear a scrap of conversation between a couple of drunken mobsters in one of our local gin mills. They mentioned their boss's name, and then I heard something about Arlie Grinner, and then... Arlie Grinner? Yeah, He's going to supply the counterfeit money, and the mob here will distribute it. Look, Jack, take my advice, will you? Call the Treasury Department. This I'll is... make a bargain with you, Nick. If you'll come out here for a few days and help me get proof to back up what I know, I will call them before I take any action. Now, wait a oh, minute. Oh, it means a lot to me, Nick. Breaking this story will put me ahead ten years in the newspaper game. I'll have offers from... Okay, okay. Patsy and I'll catch the next train. Oh, swell. Well, now I'll get back to work. So long, Nick. Goodbye. See you tomorrow. Right. Shut off the recorder, Benny. That's all there is. They hung up. That sneaking rat, Blaney, hiring a private eye from the big town. Oh, when the boss hears this record, he'll blow his top. Well, the boss must have figured something was up or he wouldn't have had us tap Blaney's phone wire. Hey, I hope he thinks of some way to keep this Carter guy from coming here. I heard Don't about him. Don't worry and... about Carter. When his train pulls in tomorrow, we'll be ready for him. But tonight, we're going to take care of Mr. Blaney. Come on, Patsy. Here's a cab. Say, Nick, Center City's quite a place, isn't it? Oh, sure. Almost 100,000 population. Golly. Hey, get in, Patsy. Yeah. Where to, brother? The morning crusader officer. Check. Hey, there's another cab around. I'm in a hurry to get to the Hotel Bradford. Be all right with you if I... Oh, well, that's all right. We don't mind sharing oh, the ride. Uh, uh, never mind. I think uh, I see another cab coming now. Thanks. <laughs> If she can see a cab coming, she has better eyes than I have. I think she changed her mind when she saw us, Patsy. What's the matter? Do we have leprosy or something? You know who that was? No, who? Arlie Grinner's girl. Arlie? Her name's Connie Mills. Oh, well. No wonder she didn't want to ride with us if she recognized you. She probably did. I've run into her several times around New York. I wonder what was in that bag she was carrying. Hey, buddy. You know any people in New York? Yes, quite a few. Why? Any theatrical producers? Oh, yes, a couple. Hey, how about give me a letter of introduction, huh? Well, I don't know. I'm talent, see? Undiscovered talent. One of them stars of tomorrow. Yeah? Listen. Am I mortified? Am I burned up? I'm standing on the street corner with Don Priago by my side. In person, when up comes this discourteous individual. He steps up on my toes, puts a penny in my mouth, and tries to weigh himself. Ha-cha-cha-cha. I got a million of them. I got... That was Jimmy Durante, see? Oh, uh, yes, yes, we see. Uh, how about this? Now, you listen to me, young Dr. Killjoy. I'm an old man. Maybe I'm not the surgeon I used to be. But at the same time... Hey, watch I out for w- that truck! Get that hack little up along! Yeah, shut up. And I was Lyle Barrymore. Driving the truck, you mean? No, nah, that's the impersonation I was doing. <laughs> I can impersonate anybody. Maybe you like to hear Edward G. Robinson. Oh, not while we're in this heavy traffic. I can drive this hack with my eyes closed. Oh, don't argue with him, Nick. He'll try to prove it to you. 
From now on, I'm running this mob, see? Yeah, me, little squeezer. You're taking orders from me, see? Yeah. If I have to put a hole in somebody's head... Look out! Quick, Matthew, down to the floor. Come back here. Come out back, you dirty... Push it to the curb deliberately. I saw them. Oh, the crazy fools, they could have killed us. You're not kidding, driver. Look at those windows. Hey, those ain't... Yes, they are. Bullet holes from a machine gun. office, Nick. See on the door, Jack Blaney, city editor. Girl said to walk right in, but did you notice how oddly she said it? Yes, as if she were frightened or something. Well, maybe Jack can explain. Yeah. Hi, Jack. Well, how are you, Mr. Carter, Miss Bourne? I'm Chief Ramsey of the Center City Police Department. The police? When the receptionist but... phoned to say that you were here to see Mr. Blaney, I recognized your name, so I asked her to send you in without saying anything. Anything about what, Chief? About the fact that Blaney was murdered at 3 o'clock this morning. What? Murdered? Well, that was only a couple of hours after he phoned me. How did it happen? A couple of hoodlums waited in front of this building with a machine gun. Oh. Your local boys seem to like machine guns, Chief. They used one to welcome Miss Bone and me just a few minutes ago. Huh? They did? Well, what in the Sam Hill... I demand action. I demand it. My city editor's been shot down on the street like a dog. Like a dog, mind you. Uh, Mr. Hanford, uh, these are some friends of Blaney's from out of town, Mr. Carter and Miss Bowen... Uh, Mr. Hanford is the publisher of the Daily Crusader. Hello. Howdy, glad to see you. Sorry to have to meet under such tragic circumstances, but I'm throwing every resource of this paper behind the hunt for these mad dogs. Every resource. Any idea why Blaney was murdered, Mr. Hanford? Well, of course I have. Of course I have. The Crusader's a newspaper with a mission. A mission. That mission is to stamp out crime in Center City. And you think Jack was killed simply because he was your city editor? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. We have a well-organized criminal element. Well-organized. Not they afraid of the Daily Crusader. Afraid of us. They know we'll get them someday. Uh, the Daily Crusader and the police department work pretty close, Mr. Carter. As a matter of fact, Mr. Hanford here was directly responsible for making me chief of police. Oh, you bet I was. I have influence in this town. Influence. I wanted a police chief who was honest. Hey, even if he isn't smart. Uh, now, Mr. Hanford... That's the truth, Ramsey. Everybody knows it. Everybody. But by the eternal, if you don't clean this town up now, clean it up, I say. Well, I, I'm trying, Mr. Hanford. You know that. And if Mr. Carter will help out... As far as Jack Blaney's murder is concerned, you bet I'll help out. And I think I know just where to start. I'm sorry, sir. There's no Connie Mills registered at this hotel. <sighs> But, Nick, she certainly said the Bradford Hotel. Maybe she's using another name, Patsy. Oh, yeah. Uh, look, Clerk, the young lady I mean probably came in about an hour ago. She has red hair. Hannah red hair. Was wearing a green dress, a green and white hat, and... Oh, I remember her. But she checked in under the name of Turner. Uh, wait till I look at the card. Oh, using an alias, huh? Uh, here it is. Miss Jean Turner, New York City. That's probably the one. Uh, you'll find her in room 1018. Thanks. Come on, Chief. Yeah? Hello, Connie. What's the idea? What is this, a pinch? Is it, Mr. Carter? No, Connie. We'd just like to look around and ask you a few questions. Well, uh... Just a minute. To... Nick, if she locks that but door... She won't get it locked. There. Now, look, Connie. Watch her. Watch her. She's trying to get a gun out of that suitcase. No, no. It's a package of something. Keep it between her and that window, Chief. I'll head her off yeah. on this one. Oh. <coughs> uh, let go. Let go. Come on, Connie. Please. Let's see what you're so anxious to throw out the window. If I had a rod, I'd teach you to rub a the lake. There. Here, Patsy. See what's inside this package. All right, Nick. Hold oh, still. Hold oh, still, Connie. Be a good girl. Well, good gravy. It's money. Why, there must be a couple of hundred thousand dollars here. And I'll bet every dollar of it's counterfeit. Connie here is associated with a counterfeiter named Ollie Grenner, Chief. Huh? Treasury men have been trying to prove something on him for months. And Grenner had a deal on with the head of the gang here in Center City. Jack Blaney told Nick about it not two hours before he was killed. Why, I figure it. This gang leader found out that Jack knew about him, and that's why Jack was killed. Come on, sister. Who are you bringing this stuff to? I don't know. You don't know? How could you deliver it if you didn't know who it was going to? I won't say another word till I see my lawyer. Okay, Connie. Lock her up, Chief. And keep her arrest quiet as long as you can. Now, see here. Shut up, sister. Mr. Carter, I'd appreciate it if you'd come along to headquarters with us and bring that phony money. Sure, glad to, Chief. Patsy, you better stay here. 
And if there's a phone call, pretend you're Connie and stall until I get back. Right. Now, don't let anyone in but me. I'll be back in 30 minutes. <laughs> Almost 30 minutes since Nick left. I ought to be here any minute now. Nothing's happened. Oh, there he is. Coming, Nick! Oh. Gene Turner, ain't it? Why, uh, uh, why, yes, yes, I'm Gene Turner. We're from the Bois. Well, well who, who do you mean? Never mind who we mean. You got the stuff? The, the stuff? Oh, oh, he, the you... The funny money, baby, the yeah. funny money. Oh, ready to pay off in real dough. Yeah, 50 grand. Show us, Slim. Uh, yeah. Does that convince you that you're talking to the right guys? Well, I, I... You see, boys, there's been a little hitch. Have you got the stuff for ain't you? Well, uh, well, not right now. But if you'll come back in half an hour... Oh, what kind of a runaround is this? You knew we'd be here for it at 9 o'clock tonight. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But, uh, look, come back in half an hour and I'll explain. You'll explain sooner than that, baby. Well, Get but, your hat. But... My hat? Yeah, you're going to explain to the boss in person. Afraid to resist and hoping she can continue to carry out the bluff, Patsy has no choice but to leave the hotel with the two gangsters. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now back to The Case of the Great Impersonation. Today's adventure with Nick Carter... Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. After sending a telegram to the nearest office of the Treasury Department, informing them of the counterfeit money found in Connie Mills' luggage, Nick returns to the Hotel Bradford, expecting to find Patsy waiting in Connie's room. Finding the room empty, he goes to the hotel desk. Miss Bowen? Yes, Miss Bowen. Oh, the young lady who came in with you. Yes, yes, have you seen her? Why, she just this minute left with two men. With two men? Well, they must have been coming down the elevator as you went up, Mr. Carter. What do they look like? Well, they were rather hard-looking, flashily Which dressed. Which way they go? And, oh, through the street door. Perhaps you can still catch them. It hasn't been more than a minute since they left. Howdy! You looking for a cab? Yeah. The girl who was with me when you picked us up at the station. You see her just come out of the hotel with two men? Sure, they get into a black sedan. Uh, that's it. Up at the corner, waiting for the red light. Oh, there they go. The light's changed. Catch up with them. No, let them get away. Anything you say, pal. Hey, you really going to introduce me to some of them theatrical producers? Catch that car. I'll introduce you to every producer in New York. Rather, you made a deal. Hey, you know what I forgot to do for you before? Cary Grant, listen. Never mind the impersonations now. Catch that car. What do I do with them if I catch them? Force them over to the curb. Hey, look, I'll get in trouble with the curb. Do what I tell you, will you? This is a matter of life or death. Okay. Okay, chum. Now? Yeah, shove them over. Then stop in front of them so they can't get away. Right. Here goes. <laughs> Of this young man? Why, you alone in this car? Certainly I am, but don't think I'm helpless. I'll scream for the police. I'll... Look here, driver. I thought you said Patsy and those two men were in this car. Gee, pal, I thought it was this one. All these big black sedans look alike. I'm sorry. Tell me about it later. Sorry, madam. It was all a mistake. Well, all the idiots... Driver, take me to police headquarters right away and see if you can impersonate a cab driver in a hurry. Well, Boss is going to be mighty interested in why you ain't got that dough. And whatever your reason is, it had better be good. But I, I told right, you save that. Save it for the boss. Now, right through this door. Okay. Hey, boss, I brought. Slim. I told you and Benny never to come here to my home. I told you that. Mister Hanford. What's she doing here? This is the girl Ollie Grannon sent with his stuff, boss. But she ain't got it. And she acted so funny about it, we thought you'd. You want... fools. Fools, both of you. So you're the boss, the great reformer, the man who fights crime. Shut up. Why, Shut up. You... Is something wrong, boss? This isn't the girl Grenner sent. She's Nick Carter's assistant. His assistant, do you hear me? But we went to room 1018 at the Bradford like you told us, and she said her name was Jane I don't Turner. care. I don't care what she said. So you're the gang leader Jack Blaney found out about. And it was you who killed him, you dirty... A regrettable necessity, my dear. A regrettable necessity. Now I'm afraid we must take the same measures with you. What? The same measures. We got to bump the dame off, too? Oh, no. Hey, look, no. boss, this ain't so good if she's Nick. You do as I to... tell you, exactly as I tell you. Perhaps we can make it appear an accident. Oh, no, please. Please, what no. What kind of an accident? I don't know yet. I'll have to think it over. I have to think it over. You wouldn't... Take her out to the old uh... place, wait for a call from me. When I make up my mind. Okay, boss. 
Come on, yes, baby. Sir. We're going right. Let me go. I'll, I'll scream. I'll raise the whole neighborhood. Oh, no, you won't. I, I, uh... Too bad I had to slug your sister. Now you won't get no chance to scream ever. got Patsy. How do you know? The desk clerk said she left the hotel with two hard-looking characters. She wouldn't have stirred out of that room until I got back unless she'd been forced to. Maybe we'd better go see Mr. Hanford. Who's chief of police in this town? You or Hanford? Why, uh, I am, but him and me always work together, and I kind of depend on well, this him. this time, let's depend on the police force. I want to talk to the men who know the districts where this gang might have a hideout. Oh, sure, Mr. Carter, anything you say. Allenby, send Myerson and Dunphy in here on the double. Sorry if I seem impatient, chief, but Anything happens to Patsy... I know how you feel, but I still think we ought to talk to Mr. Hanford. I was just reading the editorial he wrote in tonight's paper all about the Blaney killing. Yes, yes. I'm sure it's a fine editorial. Oh, you bet. A real tearjerker, too. About how Blaney was working late, and when he stepped out to get a pack of cigarettes, he... What? Got... Huh? Let me see that editorial. Oh, sure, here. Yes, Chief, you're right. I think we should go see Mr. Hanford. Good. I'll get a squad Don't bother. I have a taxi waiting outside. Come on. What's the meaning of breaking... Look here, Hanford. I'm going to give you just two minutes to tell me where your thugs have taken Miss Bowen. And if you don't tell me, I'll wring your scrawny old neck. What? No, no, no. Look, Mr. Carter, I know you're excited, Excited? But... I've gone way past that, Chief. The gang leader you weren't able to find is a man who's been your unofficial advisor, Mr. Cyrus Hanford. Get out of your mind. Out of your mind. You listened I... in on Blaney's phone call to me last night, Hanford. You heard him tell me he knew who was behind the gang, so you had him killed before I could get here. That's a lie. I didn't even know he made such a call. Take a look at this editorial you wrote in tonight's Daily Crusader. It says that Blaney was leaving the building to get a pack of cigarettes when he was murdered. There wasn't anybody else in the building he could have told that to. So how did you know his reason for going out at that time? Well, I, uh, I was only guessing. Only guessing. Mighty good guessing, Mr. Hanford, because Jack told me over the phone that he was going out for cigarettes soon. What about it? Listening in on that phone conversation was the only way you could have known about those cigarettes. And when you wrote the editorial, you unconsciously proved your own guilt. Hey, I never even thought of Mr. Hanford. But it is kind of funny that every time we'd plan a raid on one of the mob's gambling houses, they seem to know about it ahead of time. Do you think you can go into court with any such ridiculous, trumped-up evidence? They laugh in your face. Laugh in your face. Your two minutes are up, Hanford. You gonna tell me where Patsy is, or do I... I to... to let him lay a hand on me. I'll... He said he was gonna break your neck, and I, I... hope he does. Where is she? Don't I... look at me. I, I, I don't know. Where? I'm... He'd kill me. That's swell by me. Just don't hit me, Carter. Don't, don't. don't. I'll, I'll talk fast, then. I'll tell you. She, she, she hasn't been hurt at all. Not hurt at all. Let me use the phone. I'll, I'll have her here in a few minutes. Okay, go ahead. And to think that old buzzard's is making a sap out of me all the time. I'd like to take a poke at him myself. Uh, hello, hello, Slim. This is the boss. Yeah, the boss. You, you know what I said about the girl... About uh, you and Benny putting the girl uh, out of the way? Yeah. Well, uh, do it now. Do it fast. Kill her. Kill her. As Hanford shrieks the order for Patsy's death, Nick and Chief Ramsey grab frantically for the phone, but too late. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Great Impersonation. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Pretending he is phoning his thugs to bring Patsy back unharmed, Cyrus Hanford gives orders for her to be killed. Kill up! Kill her! Why, you dirty... Uh, save her now if you can. You murdering old devil! Uh, I, uh... Maybe you can prove I gave the orders to kill Blaney, Carter. Maybe you can. Uh... But they can only hang me once. And I'll have the satisfaction of knowing I paid you for your meddling. Oh, nope. gosh, Mr. Carter, if we only knew where they are, I could call out the radio cars. You're taking and... her to a farm, 15 miles out of town. By the time your radio cars get there, it'll be too late. Go ahead and call out your men, Chief. I'll be right back. Where are you going? I want to see a taxi about a man. What are you going to do? You go good to fight, sister. Sure. You keep twisting around like that, and it might take two or three slugs to do the job. No, you can't. Just one bullet right between the eyes. No, no. That's a phone, Slim. Well, so what? Well, nobody would be calling out here but the boss, would they? No. 
<laughs> okay, I'll get it. Hang on to it, Benny. You bet. <laughs> if you kill me, Nick, will find out. He'll run you down. Hush, Shannon. <laughs> yeah? Uh, hello, uh, Slim. Uh, this is the boss. Uh, this is the boss again. Yeah, boss? Is the girl still all right? Is she is she all right? We're just getting to that little matter now, boss. Well, everything's changed. It's all changed. Carter's found out about us. He's found out. Now we've got to get out. We've got to get out fast. Okay, but what about the dame? Bring her with you. We're taking her along as a hostage. Mm. Carter won't dare try to stop us if we have her in the car. He won't dare. Yeah, that's a smart idea, boss. I'll wait for you at the corner of Ninth and Livermore in a green and white taxi. Green and white. Now bring the girl and pick me up there. In 20 minutes. There's the green and white cab, Benny. Pull over and stop. Okay. As, as long as you're making a getaway, why not let me go? Quiet, you. Oh. Is that you? Is that you, Slim? Yeah, boss. And we got the girl with us. You'll have to get out and help me. Have to help me, both of you. Uh, come on, Penny. Something's wrong with the boss. What do you mean, wrong? Is he hurt? Well, I don't know, but... Hey, boss. What? He ain't in his cab. Keep your hands where I can see them. <laughs> you and Benny both. <laughs> the cops! Yeah. And if either of you'd like to make a run for it, we'll show you that cops can use machine guns, too. <laughs> Better drive a little faster, Chris. We don't want to miss our train. Uh, I'll get you there, pal. Nick, Pamphlet had an almost perfect setup, didn't he? Just about, Betsy. Huh? Of course, no one ever suspected the city's most fanatical reformer. Well, not only that, Hanford actually helped plan the campaigns against himself so that he knew every move the police would make before they made it. Yeah, but there were some arrests and some gambling houses were closed. Ah, but never any of Hanford's. He used the police to wipe out his competitors only. Oh, uh, well, I guess he knew what he was talking about when he said Chief Ramsey wasn't very smart. Well, it was ideal for Hanford's purpose. Yeah. Everyone knew the chief was strictly honest. And yet it was easy for Hanford to make a fool of him. Tell me, Nick, how did you ever induce Hanford to put through that second phone call? The one that made Slim and Benny bring me to the place where you and the officers were waiting. Oh, that. I couldn't make him do that, Betsy. But he did it. Oh, no, he didn't. He... That was Chris, our impersonating cab driver here. It was? Yeah, yes. that was me, in the flesh. But, but if it was Chris, how did you know what number to call? I listened very carefully to Hanford's dialing when he made his phone call. Oh, and you counted the click so you knew what the number was. Right, so while the chief called out his men, I dashed down and got Chris, who was waiting in his cab at the entrance to the building. I told him what number to call, and he made the call, in Hanford's voice. Well, I'll be darned. And don't, don't forget them producers, pal. <laughs> <laughs> I won't, Chris. They'll listen to you if I have to tie them down, and that's a promise. Yeah, gee, thanks. I'll do the same for you sometime. Uh, uh, the same for you. Oh, Nick, that really sounds a lot like Hanford. <laughs> Over the phone, it was close enough. It was the only thing I could think of that would be fast enough. And believe me, Chris gave a star performance. Yeah, it was a cinch. Everybody in Center City knows that funny way old man Hanford talks. I told you I could impersonate anybody. Chris, you're wonderful. Hey, I got another one I want you to hear. Margaret O'Brien. Margaret O... Oh, oh, no, no. <laughs> Nick, what about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser has for us next week? Well, Mike, it's a story of a girl who looked as if she'd never get a husband. And then when she did get one, she shot him. But Nick felt sorry for her, so he tried to send someone else up for the murder. You mean to say that Nick framed an innocent person for murder? Well, it's a long story, Mike. I'm afraid it'll have to wait till next Sunday. All right, but what do you call this adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Homely Bride. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. With millions of additional children entering our schools during the next few years the nation faces serious educational handicaps. Inferior education for our boys and girls may damage our prosperity, our traditions of freedom, our security. 
That's why we urge every adult to work with local civic groups and school boards to help improve educational conditions. Show by your interest and friendliness that you appreciate the importance of your children's teachers. They mold our nation's future. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined... as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, master detective. Miss Perry, I want you to take a look at this picture of Barclay's body. No, please. All Nick wants to know is whether Mr. Barclay was lying in that same position when you left the cabin. Stop talking about it. I said I killed him. What more do you want? I want a lot more. I want to get you out of this jail. And the best way to do it is by putting someone else in here instead. And now, The Case of the Homely Bride. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Agnes Perry is not a pretty girl, and she's so painfully timid that the gossips predicted she'd never get a husband, even with her father's millions. But you never can tell. It's early evening in the Perry home as Tony Barkley, handsome and self-assured, sits facing Agnes's father and her best friend, Linda Forsythe. Mr. Perry, I dropped in to tell you that Agnes won't be home for dinner tonight. You see, we're eloping. <laughs> Tony, not really. Oh, I'm so happy for you both. Well, I, uh... An elopement isn't necessary, my boy. If Agnes loves you... Loves I... me? Huh. She's mad about me. Oh, Tony, you clown. Oh, give me a handkerchief, somebody. Oh, here you are, Linda. Thanks. And don't say I'm crying, either. It's just that my glasses are getting misty. Agnes and I plan to meet in a little town upstate and be married tonight. In fact, she's waiting there for me now. Well, I... I don't understand... Isn't it a bit unusual to inform the bride's father before an elopement? Yes, but in this case it makes no difference. You couldn't stop us if you wanted to. But I don't want to, my boy. Of course, I don't know you very well, but uh, just before you came here from the West Coast, we had a letter from my old friend, Judge Hamilton. I know. A letter telling you that I was a fine young man. Plenty of money, good family. How did you know that? I wrote the letter myself. What? What? And since Judge Hamilton has been abroad, naturally, you haven't been able to check up on him. You wrote that letter? Yes. Forgery is one of my many accomplishments. You should ask the police about me. I'm quite a notorious character, really. You're joking. Not at all. I have a very interesting record. Swindling, fraud, picking pockets, armed robbery. Of course, those were when I was younger and my methods were more crude than they are now. Barclay. Incidentally, my real name is Tony Blaze. What's the point of all this? Well, I was thinking. It's going to be a wonderful story for the newspapers. Millionaire's daughter weds criminal. I'm beginning to understand. You think I'll pay you not to marry my daughter, is that it? Precisely. The only way to stop the wedding now, Mr. Perry, is by writing me a check for $100,000. 100000 Well, you're out of your mind. Mr. Perry... You know what would happen to a sensitive girl like Agnes if she married this man? You can afford the money. For Agnes' sake, pay him and... I'll give you 10000 and not one cent more. Oh, no. Marrying Agnes will be much more profitable than that. <gasps> Tony, you're not serious. Oh, but I am, my dear. I've just decided in a few months Mr. Perry will be willing to pay twice 100000 for a nice, quiet divorce. If I make Agnes unhappy enough. And believe me, I can... And will. Linda, call the police. Stay where you are, Miss Forsyth. That revolver doesn't frighten me. If either of you charming people tries to stop me, I'll show you I'm not bluffing. If you dare to marry her... Suppose you tell me all about it when I return from my honeymoon, Miss Forsyth. It's 
been almost an hour since he left, Mr. Carter. I tried everywhere to find you. I'm sorry, Mr. Perry, but Miss Bone and I were both out of the office. You've got to stop them, no matter what it costs. Well, it isn't money that's important now, Mr. Perry. It's time. Well, they can't get married tonight, Nick. Even if they could get a license, there's a three-day waiting period in this state. If he doesn't have a license already, Patsy. Yeah. And if they plan to get married in this state... Oh, if there were only some way to warn every minister and justice of the peace in this part of the country and to tell them... Wait a minute. Huh? There is a way. Well, how, Nick? By radio. Why, yes. The station manager of WQXQ is a friend of mine. And if he'll let us run an announcement every now and then... No, no, no. We can't put the story on the air, Carter. Think of the scandal. Well, Mr. Perry, the important thing is to keep your daughter from marrying this man, isn't it? Well, I... Yes, of course. All right. Go ahead with the radio announcements, Carter. Agnes, take thee, Anthony, to be my lawful wedded husband, to love, honor, and cherish so long as we both may live. Then, by the virtue of the power vested in me, I now pronounce you... Well, this is our cabin, Agnes. Not much of a honeymoon cottage, is it? Oh, I don't mind, darling. <laughs> Nothing matters except that we're married. Oh, Tony, I'm so happy. I... Here, here, stop there. No, no. There, that's the girl. Oh, um, I'd better go put the car out of sight. I don't want anybody to spot it. All right, darling. And while you're gone, I'll unpack your suitcase for Keep you. Get away from my suitcase. Well, Tony, I was only going to... Oh, un... I, I, I know, darling, but I'm rather fussy about my things. Uh, look, there's a radio in this cabin. See if you can get some music, huh? I don't want my bride feeling unhappy. believed to be in the vicinity of the state line. We ask all ministers and justices of the peace who may hear this broadcast not to marry any couple answering the description we have just given you, and to communicate with the station immediately. The man has boasted that the marriage is merely an attempt to extort money from the girl's father, and that he has a long criminal record. Oh. Your cooperation may no, prevent a tragedy. It. We now resume our midnight music app. But why did he act that way about the suitcase? As if he had something in it that he didn't want me to see. I've got to know. I've got to. A revolver. Oh, Agnes. Tony. I thought I told you not to open that suitcase. Tony. Why are you carrying this? Why, I... I, I always carry a gun, baby. For protection, that's all. Don't lie to me. It was on the radio that you're a criminal, that you only married me because of my father's money. All right, so I did. Why else would anyone marry a stupid little frump like you? Tony! Oh, no, 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 I don't believe it. You said... I said I loved you, huh? And you were sap enough to believe me. But it's cash I'm in love with, darling. Papa's cash. Oh, Tony, you... Oh, I hate you, I hate you! <laughs> Good! Good, I want it that way. You're going to hate me a lot more unless Papa pays up. I won't stay here a minute longer. I'm going home. Well, no, you're not. Take your hands off me. Tony, look. Why, you little... Slap me, will you? No dame can get away with that. Keep away from me, Tony. I can play rough, too. Don't you touch me. I'll... I'll kill you if you do. <laughs> Don't kid me. You haven't got nerve enough to use that gun. I will. I swear I will. I'm going to give you a little lesson in wifely, you... You! You little fool, you... Mr. Perry, well, where have you been? Do you realize it's 8 o'clock in the morning? I've been walking the streets for hours. When we didn't hear anything by midnight, I knew it wasn't any use. Well, it's a good thing somebody stayed here at the radio station. Nick's on the phone now. You mean they've been found? I think so. Listen. I see. Well, thank you, Mr. Megley. Yes, I'm sorry, too, but it was good of you to call. Goodbye. Who was it, Carter? A justice of the peace from upstate. What? He heard the announcement on the morning newscast. A justice of the peace? You mean they're married? Yes. Oh. He said he performed the ceremony at 10.30 last night. I... I see. Well, I suppose there's nothing to do now but go home and wait. Oh, I'll get it, Patsy. Uh-huh. 
You better go tell the announcer not to broadcast any more of those notices. All right, Nick. Nick Carter speaking. This is Linda Forsythe, Mr. Carter. Is Agnes' father there? Oh, yes, just a moment. For you, Mr. Perry, Miss Forsythe. Oh, I asked Linda to stay at my house last night. I wonder if Agnes has called her. Uh, hello, Linda. Mr. Perry, I have wonderful news. Agnes is back. She's there at the house now? Yes, yeah, she must have come home during the night sometime. Is that man with her? No. Uh, one of the maids found Agnes asleep in her own room a few minutes ago. But but she's locked herself in and won't talk to me. I uh, think Never mind, you... we'll be home in ten minutes. <laughs> Leave me alone. I won't tell you anything about it. But, Miss Perry, we know you and Tony Blaze were married last <laughs> night. And naturally, your father wants to know why you came home alone. Nick, why don't you give her a chance to get control of herself before you start firing questions at her? Maybe you're right, Patsy. Perhaps you'd feel better if you had some breakfast, Agnes. I don't want anything. I beg pardon, Mr. Perry. Yes, Gordon? There's a gentleman who insists upon seeing Miss Agnes. My daughter isn't seeing anyone. Tell him to go away. It wouldn't do any good if he did tell me, Mr. Well, Perry. Sergeant Matheson. Hello, Patsy. Hi, Nick. Hi, Matty. What are you doing here? Official business, Nick. What do you mean, official business? I didn't send for the police. The police? No, 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 I didn't do anything. Of course not, dear. He isn't here to see you. Uh, that's where you're wrong, Mr. Perry. I'm here to arrest your daughter on suspicion of murder. Agnes Perry's despair is equaled by the shock and grief in the eyes of her father as Matty makes the arrest. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to The Case of the Homely Bride. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It's a couple of hours later, and at police headquarters, Agnes Perry is giving her version of what happened in the tourist cabin the night before. When Tony admitted that, that he only married me in order to get money out of father, I said I was going home. He grabbed me and... And I... you had a fight. That's when you fell against the chair near the bed and broke your watch, wasn't it, Miss No, Perry? no, there wasn't any fight. I noticed the crystal is missing from your watch. And we found thin pieces of curved glass near that upset chair. I don't know anything about that. I okay, don't... okay, go ahead. What time was all this? Well, about 12.30, I think. Yeah? Then what happened? Well, I broke away from him, ran outside to my car, and drove home. And during the time it took you to get in the car, start the motor, and put it in gear, why didn't he catch up with you? Well, he, he, he didn't try. He only chased me as far as the door. He chased you to the door, yet you still found time to stop and pick up your coat? No, I didn't. I just ran. I didn't stop for anything. Okay, okay. Now I'll tell you what really happened. You fought with Tony Blaze about 3 o'clock. No! Not 12.30, because the medical examiner says he was shot sometime between 3 and 4 a.m. It was 12.30, I tell you. Huh? I mean, that's when I left the cabin. Oh, and when you broke away, you didn't run out the door. You picked up that gun of his and shot him. No, no, I didn't. After that, you didn't need to hurry, so you got your coat and purse, walked out to the car and came it's home. It's a lie. I didn't shoot him. All right, then why are your fingerprints all over the gun and only your fingerprints? I told you. I found it in his suitcase. I picked it up. Yeah. Excuse me. Excuse me, Matty. Yeah, Nick? I suppose you've had ballistics check the revolver to be sure it's the one that killed Tony Blaze. Well, naturally. All three bullets came out of the same gun. We dug two out of the wall, the one that missed him completely, and the one that grazed his head. There was a third bullet in his heart. And I see... Oh, why are you so sure it happened at exactly 3.15? Because, Nick, something aroused the woman who runs the camp. She realized later it must have been the shooting, of course. She looked out her window and saw Miss Perry here leaving. Wearing a coat? Yeah, a white coat you could see a mile off. That's how the woman knew who it was. Miss Perry was wearing that same coat when she checked into the place. She's lying. I left my coat at the cabin when I ran out. It's not there now, Miss Perry. But I did... Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's forget the court a minute, Matty. Huh? About the time element. Couldn't the woman be mistaken? No, not a chance, Nick. In the first place, she looked at her clock. In the second place, she wasn't even home until after 2.30. Oh. You see, Nick, none of the other cabins were rented last night, so the woman went into town to a party. I see. Now, look, Miss Perry, everybody knows Tony Blaze was a king-size heel... So maybe if you would admit the truth... I won't admit anything. To... You're trying to trap me. Okay, okay, then. I'll have to hold you for the grand jury. And I hope you've got a better story then than you have now. I 
can't believe it. Agnes accused of murder, policeman here in my home, searching for evidence. Please don't worry, Mr. Perry. No jury will ever convict Agnes under the circumstances. Maybe they won't, Miss Forsythe, if she'd admit the circumstances. But if she sticks to the story she told at headquarters, she may be charged with first-degree murder. Well, you're probably right, Carter. Even I can see that Agnes is lying. But why but... should she lie about such unimportant things? The time and whether or not she was wearing a coat... Well, she's hysterical, that's all. You don't know Agnes as I do, Mr. Carter. She's always been terribly shy, frightened of everybody. How long have you known her, Miss Forsythe? Well, only about six months, really. But, but we've been like sisters. Oh, Nick. What's the matter, Patsy? I asked Gordon, uh, the butler, you know. Oh, yes, yes, I know. Well, I asked him to come down here and tell you what he just told Sergeant Matheson. Tell him, Gordon. Well, sir, it's just that I heard Miss Agnes come home last night. And why didn't you tell somebody, Gordon? You knew how frantic we all well, were. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Perry, but I didn't know it was Miss Agnes at the time. I, I thought it was you, sir. Why should you think that? Could it have been Miss Forsythe here or one of the servants? Oh, no, sir. The only persons with a latch key are Miss Agnes, Mr. Perry, and myself, sir. Anyone else would have to ring the doorbell to get in. What time was this? About 4.30, Mr. Carter. I see. How did you happen to be awake at that time, Gordon? Well, after I locked the house at 1 o'clock, sir, I didn't sleep well for worrying about Miss Agnes. That's how I happened to be awake at 4.30 and heard the front door open and close. Then, uh, a moment later, I heard her open the door to the basement. The basement? Why should Agnes have gone down there? Well, that's what Sergeant Matheson wanted to know. So he went down to have a look. If Agnes was telling the truth about leaving the tourist camp at 12.30 or 1, she'd have been home long before that. But if she left at 3.15, the time would be just about right. That's what I was thinking. Mm. Well, Vic... Nick, I found it. What, matter? The white coat Miss Perry said she didn't wear home. She tried to burn it in the furnace, but there's still plenty left for identification. And look at those blood stains. Is that Agnes's coat, Mr. Perry? Yes, I... I'm afraid it is. And it's the last piece of evidence needed to smash that story of hers to smithereens. <laughs> Please, Miss Perry, don't look on us as enemies. Patsy and I came here to the jail hoping we could help you. That's the truth, Miss Perry. Why don't you tell Nick just what happened? Well, he was going to hit me. I warned him to stay away, but he kept coming with that awful look on his face. I was almost out of my mind with fear. I, I didn't even realize what I was doing. Oh, now, now, look, you mustn't get excited. You see, Nick, it was self-defense. Yeah, but the next thing is to prove it. Oh, how can you with everybody lying about me? Nobody's lying about you, Miss They're Perry. They're all lying. That woman at the camp, the police, even Gordon. They lied about the code, about the time it happened, even about my breaking my watch. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you still insist that the shooting took place at 12.30? And that you came back home without your coat? Of course I do, because it's the truth. And you didn't fall against that chair and break your watch, Chris? I didn't fall against anything. Hmm. hmm. Look, Miss Perry, how many times did you fire that revolver? Oh, I don't know, I don't know. Oh, wait. Wait. I have a picture here that the police photographer took of the body. I don't want to see it. You've got to. This is important. All right. Now tell me, was this the way he was lying when you left the cabin? No. No, he was more on his side and not next to the bed. He, he was over by the easy chair. He must have lived long enough to crawl a few feet. No, Patsy, uh, that last bullet killed him instantly. Well, please stop talking about it! I said I killed him. What more do you want? I want a lot more, Miss Perry. I want to get you out of this cell. And the best way to do it is by putting someone else here instead. Hello, Sergeant Matheson. This is Patsy. Nick just got back to the office, and he wants to know whether you have any report on those fingerprints yet. Uh, and the broken glass, too, Patsy. Oh, yes, the glass fragments, too, Sergeant. Okay, I'll hold on. He's gone for the report now, Nick. Good. Why this sudden interest in fingerprints? You know the only prints on the revolver that killed Tony Blaze was Agnes's. I know, but these are different. I got one of them from a teacup, and the other off the lock button on the Perry's front door. Off the what? A little button on the lock that you press when you want to leave the door off the latch. But what the... Oh, yes, Sergeant. They were. And how about the glass? I see Yes. Yes, I'll tell him. Goodbye. What did he say? Those fingerprints were both made by the same person. But it wasn't Agnes Perry. That's what I hoped for. 
And how about the pieces of glass? Well, it seems that Agnes is telling the truth about her watch, at least. Those fragments weren't from a watch crystal after all. They were optical glass. That makes things more interesting. Better get your hat, Patsy. We're going to travel. Ah, it's awfully nice of you to drive us up here, Miss Forsythe. Well, naturally, if talking to this woman at the tourist camp will help poor Agnes's defense, I'm only too glad. Uh, Is it straight ahead on this road? No, you turn left at the next corner and follow the river road. Turn left? Yeah, haven't you ever been up this way before? No. I had no idea it was so mountainous. Do you really think you can do anything to help Agnes, Mr. Carter? I do. As a matter of fact, I intend to prove that Agnes Perry didn't kill her husband. But but she confessed. I know she did, but I found a fingerprint on the latch button of the front door that's going to convict the real murderer. I don't understand. Uh, here's the turn, Miss Forsythe. Oh. I, I almost missed that. Yeah. And you turned right, Miss Forsythe. I told you to make a left turn. Oh, oh, uh, how stupid of me. I'll turn around. No, no, never mind. The tourist camp is on this road. But how did you know? What? Why, well, I didn't. <laughs> oh, what's the road? You'll go over the cliff. It's all right. I, I just swerved to avoid that dog. I didn't see it until it was almost under our wheels. <sighs> you, you almost gave me heart failure. It must be a hundred feet down to the river. Miss Forsythe probably didn't notice the dog because she doesn't see so well without her glasses, Patsy. My glasses? How did you know that I... You usually wear them while driving, don't you? Well, of course I do, but... But they're broken, aren't they, Miss Forsythe? You broke them last night in the tourist cabin where you killed Tony Blaze. That's utterly ridiculous. You say you've never been over this road before? I haven't. Yet because you were excited, you took the right-hand turn, even though I purposely told you to turn left. That doesn't mean anything. I'd say it means you made this same trip before. Last night, when you slipped the latch of the front door of the Perry home so that you could get back in unobserved. I did no such thing. Oh, yes, you did. Your fingerprint was on the push button of the automatic lock. The same print you left on a teacup this afternoon. Suppose I did touch that push button. You still can't prove I was ever in that cabin. I think we can. By having an oculus compare the pieces of broken glass found in the cabin with a prescription for your eyeglasses. All right, smart boy. So I did kill him. But I won't go to the chair for it. I'd rather die this way. Nick, we're going over the cliff! Linda Forsythe twists the wheel of the speeding car toward the edge of the cliff with its hundred-foot drop, intending to kill not only herself, but Nick and Patsy as well. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Homely Bride. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Rather than take a chance on the electric chair, Linda Forsythe turns the wheel of her fast-moving car toward the side of the mountain road, where there is a sheer hundred-foot drop. Nick, we're going over the cliff! Let go the wheel, you... Nancy, don't try to jump! Oh, oh, thank heaven. We hit a tree instead of going over. Yeah. I managed to twist the wheel enough to avoid that. Yeah, but... But even hitting a tree at that speed, I mean, why aren't we smashed up more? I managed to get my foot on the brake and jammed it down hard. Why did you have to go snooping around? They'd have acquitted Agnes, but... But it may be a different story for you. Why did you kill Tony Blaze anyway? He double-crossed me. I was the one he was going to marry, not Agnes. He said it would only be a bluff to get money out of her father. Then you were in on the whole scheme. Of course I was. Tony would never have been able to meet Agnes if I hadn't made friends with her and introduced him. And then you stayed right with her so that you could encourage the courtship, huh? I did it because I loved him. And he said he loved me. We were going to take the money and get married. And then he... And then he decided it'd be more profitable in the long run to marry Agnes and collect afterward. Yes. I knew where they'd gone, so I came up here to have it out with him. And then he got nasty. He hit me. So it was you who fell over the chair and broke your glasses. Yes. I must have gone crazy. I grabbed up the gun But Agnes said she shot him. She did. One bullet went wild and another grazed his head and made him unconscious. He'd just come out of it a little while before I got there. And you got the idea of putting the blame on her, huh? Yes. I was sure her fingerprints were still on the gun. Tony was still groggy. He didn't notice what I was doing. So I picked it up with my handkerchief. And finished the job. Then you put on Agnes's white coat before leaving the cabin so that if anyone saw you, they'd think it was she. That's right. Oh, Mr. Carter, what do you think they'll do to me? I don't know, Miss Forsythe. 
But since you're so fond of wearing Agnes Perry's clothes, we'll see how that prison uniform of hers will fit you. Well, Nick, what about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser will bring us next week? It's a story, Mike, about a politician who found an oriental dancer in his bathtub. Dead. And Nick didn't like the costume the corpse was wearing because it exposed an uneven suntan. But what suntan got to do with murder? It had plenty to do with this one, Mike. Along with a jealous wife and a sideshow barker and an old-fashioned political rally. Well, now, that sounds like quite an adventure. What do you call it, Nick? I call it The Case of the Candidate's Corpse. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silburn. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, When minutes count... Use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcast. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. What's the reason for the water seeping under that bathroom door, Mr. Nigel? Why, I I don't know, Mr. Carter. Then we better find out. Great Scott, it looks like the Johnstown flood. Good heavens. Oh, Nick, look. Yes. There's a girl in the tub. And she's been weighted down with a suitcase. And now, the case of the candidate's corpse. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Although it is only ten o'clock in the morning... Nick Carter has a prospective client in his office, a client whose pompous dignity is a bit startling. Sir, I am the Honorable Wilton Nigel. Oh, yes, yes, you're a politician, aren't you, Mr. Nigel? I, Mr. Carter, am a public servant. Statesman would be an apter term than politician. Uh, uh, won't you sit down, Mr. Nigel? Oh, thank you. Mr. Carter, I want you to protect me. Protect you? From what? I'm scheduled to be the speaker of the day at a stupendous political rally this afternoon in Springville. Uh, That's about 20 miles from here. Oh, I read about that. It's going to be an all-day celebration. There'll be a carnival and barbecue and fireworks. Yes, indeed. And my address is to be the feature event of the day. Uh, About 50,000 constituents are expected to hear me. And uh, you want me to protect you from them? Certainly not. Mr. Carter, there's a plot afoot. The, uh, Honorable Leonard Squire, my opponent, is tied up with a gangster element. And they'll stop at nothing to discredit me. What do they threaten to do? Well, they wouldn't dare threaten me. My information comes from a, a roundabout source. Information regarding what, Mr. Nigel? You're telling me practically nothing. All I know is that something's, uh, up. And that's not any more definite. You'll have to trust my judgment that you're needed, Mr. Carter. And I'll pay you $5,000 to keep me from being discredited at this rally. No, thank you, Mr. Nigel. If you'd give me the whole story, maybe I could help you. But under the Then you refuse to take my case? That's entirely up to you. I regret your decision. I thought I could count on you to help me. If you change your mind, my office still open. Good day. Honestly, of all the pompous old funny duddies. He's pompous now, Patsy, but it's obvious he expects to be deflated. The man's really frightened about something. I wonder what... Why, you don't think anybody tried to hurt him physically, do you? I don't know. I can't think of a better spot for a skullduggery than one of those old-fashioned political rallies. Well... Bands, crowds, excitement, noise. You know, Patsy, just out of curiosity, we're going to Springville. Nick, 
like, is this a political rally or a country fair? Well, it's supposed to be a political rally. Oh, festival. look. They even have a sideshow. Yes, with an oriental dancer who certainly should draw the crowds. Even if the Honorable Mr. Nigel doesn't. Oh, gee. He must be some politician if he has to resort to shows like this to get folks to listen to him. Yeah. Hey, come on. Right, yeah, let's listen to this barker. He's just starting his spiel. Gather up closer, gentlemen. On the inside of this tent, you will see Rosita, that dainty little oriental dancer doing a famous landslide dance. It's a sensation, gentlemen. It's daring. It's delightful. Okay, Rosita, go on inside. All right, gentlemen, step right up to the ticket post. Have your money ready. All right, I'll take two, please, miss. Thank you, How much? I'll take one, miss, please. Go on, Rosita, hurry up. No, I ain't going in, Harry. Not till I get the money you owe me. I ain't got it. You got more dough in your pocket today than you ever had in your life before. Now, look. Oh, I'm Jesse. tired of being a sap. I'm leaving, Harry. What? Why, I ought to slap you, silly. Where do you think you're going? I'm going to the hotel to see a guy with real money. <laughs> You're bluffing. Yeah? Ask the Honorable Wilton Nigel if I'm bluffing, you cheap chiseler. But you can't do this to me. What am I going to do? There's a couple of costumes in my dressing room, wise guy. Do the dance yourself. Hey, Patsy, did you hear what that dancing girl said about Wilton Nigel? I heard it, but I still don't believe it. You know, I think I'll go and have a talk with Mr. Nigel myself. But I thought you weren't going to take his case. Oh, I might have known you couldn't resist. Uh-huh. In other words, you don't want to come to the hotel with me? And listen to old windbag Nigel, I should say not. I'll amuse myself here where there's something interesting going on. Okay. Where will I find you when I'm through talking to him? I'll be somewhere near here. Oh, um, if you need Rosita there, give her my regards. <laughs> Yes? Is this Mr. Wilton, Nigel Sweet? It is, and who may I ask are you? I'm Nick Carter. I'd like to talk to Mr. Nigel. So do I, but he isn't here. You know where he is? If I knew, I'd be there too. Oh? And who, if I may ask, are you? I'm Mrs. Wilton, Nigel. Oh, you just wait till I get my hands on that man. Is something wrong, Mrs. Nigel? Wrong? There certainly is. You see, he and I went to a political breakfast and... Yes, I know. When I was here earlier, the desk clerk told me he was at that breakfast. So I went there to see him, but was told that he'd already left. He certainly did. When we were about half through, I left the table to make a phone call. And then when I got back, he disappeared. You know where he went? No, and nobody at the breakfast seemed to know either. So I waited for him. But when he didn't come back, I finally returned here alone. So, uh... You have no idea where your husband might be now, then? No, but two different bellboys told me that a woman came up here this morning. A young woman in a scanty oriental costume, even had a veil over her face. A woman who had... How long have you been here? Only a few minutes. Why? And how long ago did your husband leave the breakfast? About an hour ago, more or less. Oh, there he is now. Oh, hello, Stella, dear. Sergeant Matheson, this is... Hey, Nick Carter. Marty. Hey, what are you doing here? Mr. Nigel told the chief you turned him down. I did, but... Hey, aren't you outside your bailiwick, Matty? <laughs> well, it's my day off, and Mr. Nigel's a personal friend of the chief, and Sergeant so I... Matheson volunteered to be my uh, guest at this great political rally, Mr. Carter. Uh, hey, wait yeah. a minute, Mr. Nigel. Uh, hmm? What's that water coming from under your bathroom door? Water from hey, under looks the Looks like you need a plumber, Mr. Nigel. You better see what's the matter. Great Scott, it looks like the Johnstown flood. Oh, good heavens, you forgot to turn off the water after you shaved this morning, Wilton. I'll turn it off right now. Well, Stella, that water's coming from the tub, but I didn't take a bath this morning. Are you sure neither of you saw a girl in this hotel suite this morning? I'm sure I didn't, but I'm not at all sure what Wilton thought. Oh, now, Stella. Hey, 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 what's, what's all this about a girl? There's one here, all right, in the bottom of the tub, weighted down with a suitcase. Oh, for Pete's sake. Oh, a girl in my bathtub? <gasps> Mary. Yeah. You know anybody in the local police force? Sure I do. Why? You better give him a ring. Tell him what's happened. Okay, I will. Uh, look, Nick, uh, what do you figure killed her? That'll be up to the coroner, but whatever it was, it's obviously murder. Murder? Sir Nigel, will you come here, please? Well, well, all right. Ever see this girl before? Well, never. Most decidedly not. Mrs. Nigel. Oh, dear. I can't... <laughs> Oh, what a disgraceful costume. Uh, it looks like she was a dancer from that outfit she's got on. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll go see the local police chief, Nick. Oh, but if, if there's any publicity about this, it, it can ruin my whole campaign. Oh, yeah? Well, you got more in the campaign to worry about now. This is murder. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, oh, Mr. Carter, who on earth could have done a thing like this? I don't know, Mr. Nigel. Both you and your wife had the opportunity to kill this woman. But that's preposterous. You think I'd have anything to do with a woman like that? Well, she's from the carnival, isn't she, Mr. Carter? She is. 
And I happen to know she left the carnival grounds close to two hours ago. Where are you then? Why, at the political breakfast, and I haven't been back here since. And you, Mrs. Nigel, where were you? I, uh, why, I was, uh, oh, oh. Come on, to catch it, she's fainted. I've got her. Oh, good. Here, put her on the Davenport. I'll, I'll give you a hand. Oh, easy now. Now, there. She'll be all right in a minute. You better get her some water. Oh, well, of course, of course, Mr. Carter. Mr. Nigel, would you have any idea why your wife fainted? Why, no, unless it's the shock of finding a dead body in our bathtub. It wouldn't have been because she didn't want to tell me where she was, would it? Oh, ridiculous. She was at the breakfast with me. She's there all the time? What? Uh, uh, you may as well tell me, Nigel. I can easily find out from those who were there. Uh, yes. Well, no, Mr. Carter. Partway through the meal, she excused herself to make a phone call. How long was she gone? Well, as a matter of fact, when I left to meet Sergeant Matheson, she still hadn't come back. I see. Well, Mr. Nigel, as soon as we're sure your wife's all right, you and I are going to see whether we can find out why that girl's body is in your bathtub. You're going to this... this carnival sideshow? I am, Nigel. But, Carter, I can't be seen in a place like this palace of oriental wonders. Don't worry. We aren't going in. Thank heaven. The man who runs the show can give us the information I want. Oh, uh, pardon me, mister. Huh? Did you have a girl named Rosita working for you earlier today? Did I? Why, I still got a chance. Rosita, the snappiest little oriental dancer this side of Panama. There'll be a new show in just a few minutes, boys. Listen, mister. I had Harry Hall, boys. Outstanding producer, high-class educational and refined entertainment. And you're sure Rosita's still here? Why, sure, I'm sure. You'll see the little lady in all the glory in just a minute, boys. Give the music to the needle, Louie. All right, lucky, 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 lucky men, I'm about to show you the most beautiful bit of feminine polka tune you've ever seen. Rosita, the famous Oriental dancer. Come on out, Rosita. <coughs> Why, Mr. Carter, isn't that Thanks. your gun? It's Patsy. <coughs> Patsy Bowen may be able to pass as Rosita, the oriental dancer, to the satisfaction of the public, but not to the satisfaction of Nick Carter. We'll find out the reason for Patsy's masquerade in just a moment. Now back to The Case of the Candidate's Corpse, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In the dancer's dressing room, Matty, who has rejoined Nick, is eyeing High Hat Harry Hall, owner of the Palace of Oriental Wonders, with plenty of suspicion. Nick is still indignant at having found Patsy in a carnival dance act. <sighs> don't be stuffy, Nick. I was trying to help you. But, Patsy, I don't see how that... Look, ha after his dance had left, Mr. Hall was going to close up a show and leave town. And I thought you wouldn't want to let him get away, that's all. And you did right, Patsy. Thanks. Now, uh, Hall, suppose you start talking. Why did Rosita leave your show? Uh, she was just a dame with ideas, I guess. Yeah? You didn't owe her any money. Who, me? Owe the help money? She said you did. And she also said you had more money today for the first time since she'd known you. Where'd you get it? Oh, listen, smart guy. No, you listen. The local police have asked me to work with them. You mean that damn I'm... sick the cops on me while I'll slug that... Oh, no, you won't. Harry, she's dead. Come again? I said she's dead. Her body's in the morgue right now. I don't believe it. You will. You'll even get a chance to look at it. Meanwhile, I'm going to take a look through Rosita's stuff. You won't find anything, Sergeant. No, why not, Patsy? Well, that's another reason I took Rosita's place. I wanted to see whether there were any letters or anything that involved with Mr. Nigel. Well, good for you, Patsy. What did you find? Nothing. Just extra costumes, makeup, the, the things you expect to find. Oh, speaking of costumes, Patsy... You better get into your street clothes. That oriental costume. Oh, what's you... the matter? Don't you think I look cute in this outfit? Uh, you sure do, baby. As a matter of fact, Patsy, it doesn't look well on you at all. Well, I like that. Why not? Because the suntan pattern on your back doesn't match the lines of the costume. Uh, oh. This oriental costume is cut very differently from your bathing suit, around the shoulders. Say, I guess you're right. I noticed the same thing on another girl just a short time ago. Uh, look, Hall, uh, uh, what's this Rosita's home address? Well, uh, you got me there, Sarge. Oh, come now, Hall. She worked for you. Didn't she have any references? Uh, 
On a show like this, you don't ask for references. You take whoever you can get. Matty? Yeah, Nick. I think we'll give Hall a chance to spend some time with Mr. and Mrs. Nigel. What do you mean? I mean he's going back to the hotel and stay with them while you and I go to the city. Oh, for the love of Pete, Nick. Nick. There What's are labels in the girls' costumes, and the costumer may have a record of the sales. Of course. A good idea, Patsy. Uh, we can start our search there. Yeah, but look, what if Hall here tries to take a powder while we're gone? Have one of the local policemen keep an eye on him, Matty, and see that he doesn't get away. Patsy. Yes, Nick? For the last time, will you get out of that costume and into some decent clothes? You've got work to do. Oh. A lot of good it'll do us to make this trip, Nick. Well, we already got Rosita's address from the costumer, didn't we? Yeah, we already know her address, the morgue. Yeah. The costumes were sold to a dance team called the Casal Sisters. Yeah, yeah, and we'll find the address, and it'll be a theatrical boarding house where they won't even remember Rosita. Oh, yeah? This is the place right here. Huh? And it doesn't look like any cheap theatrical boarding house to me. No. Hey, you're right. This is a pretty fair-looking apartment building at that thing. Now, let's see, let's see. Hey, we're in luck. Oh, Yeah. Here's the nameplate, see? Oh. Roxanne Cassell, apartment 1C. Yeah. Okay, press the buzzer. <coughs> More luck, Matty. Somebody's home. Uh, good. You looking for me? You, Roxanne Cassell? Sure. What of it? Got something on you to say? Hey, just a minute. Your voice. Hey, you're Rosita Cassell. You're wrong there, mister. I'm Roxanne. What's up? Was Rosita your sister? No, we just worked together as a dance team. Then we had a fight and split up. Yeah? Last I heard, she was dancing in a cheap little carny show. Well, what's she done now? She's been murdered. Murdered? Sure. What? Was it a man who killed her? What? Why do you ask that? Well, she was running around with a guy before she left town. A big shot. He got sore at her and she was afraid of him. Scared half to death. You know the man's name? It was a kind of funny name. Something like, uh... Milton or Wilton? Uh, was it Wilton Nigel? That's it. I always wondered what a guy with a name like that would look like. Well, you're going to find out, Miss Cassell. And fast. <laughs> Patsy, I thought I told you nobody was to leave this hotel room. Where are Mrs. Nigel and Mr. Hall? They're with the local police, Nick. How come? Well, they wanted Hall to identify the body, and they wanted to question Mrs. Nigel about leaving that political breakfast before it was over. Sergeant Matheson, are the police questioning Stella because they think that she... Look, Mr. Nigel, this is a murder case. They'll be questioning you, too, when they hear what this young lady here has to say. What? Well, I don't know her, do I, miss? No, but you knew Rosita, all right. And knowing you didn't do her no good, either. That's preposterous. They brought you all the way out from the city just to accuse me of murder? Nobody's accused you of murder, Nigel. All I know is what Rosita said about a guy named Nigel. Oh, please, please, if Stella should come back and hear... Oh, 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 Stella, dear, you... Why, what's happened to your hat? What's happened to my hat, indeed? What's happened to me? Mrs. Nigel, where's Hall? Oh, where is he? When we got out of the car in front of the police station, that man literally threw me against the police and got away. Got away? The crazy fool. I only hope the police don't find him. What? Oh, now, see here, Matty, if they catch up with him, they may shoot to kill. You couldn't blame him either, except that he isn't guilty. He isn't? No. And Miss Roxanne Casal is going to help me prove it. Me? I don't get it. You will. We're going to open his Palace of Oriental Wonders show with you taking the part of Rosita. Well, no, I'd be afraid. You needn't be. Matty and I'll be there. And I have a hunch Hall will show up, too. His curiosity won't let him stay away. But if he's a murderer and thinks I'm trying to trap him, why he... You'll be protected. Patsy, is the costume you wore still in the tent dressing room? It should be. Let's go then. Well, Mr. Carter, you want Stella and me to come too? No, no, it's not necessary. Now look, Nick, a guy like Hall won't fall for that stunt. He's been around too much. Maybe not, Matty, but it's worth a trial. Now look, he ain't going to be thinking about the carnival. He'll be trying to get out of town fast. In his car? No, the police will be watching that. My hunch is he'll head for the freight yards. And that's where I'm going right now. But it's so hot in this tent, Wilton. Stella, dear, we have to stay here. Mr. Carter said so. And I suppose we have to watch that woman do a dance. I'm afraid you do, Mrs. Nigel. She should be about ready. Patsy's helping her get into the costume now. I don't see why anybody would need help to get into a skimpy thing like that. 
Oh, Mr. Carter, look. Coming down the aisle. Sergeant Matheson and... And Mr. Mr. Hall. Oh, wait till I get my hands on that man. Come on, Hall. Come on. Bring him back alive. That's me. <laughs> okay, Nick. Now who was right, look, huh? what's the idea? I ain't done nothing. No? no? Hall, who paid you to bring your show to Nigel's political rally? Nobody. The police are going to search you, Hall. If they find any substantial sum of money, you'll be in the spot. What do you mean? I heard your dancing girl say you hadn't been able to pay her, but that you had some money today for the first time in weeks. Okay, so what if I was paid to bring the show here? I wasn't told to do nothing crooked, just bring in the show and play here at the rally. Why? Look, I don't ask questions. If somebody wants to give me a grand with no strings tied to it... My opponent was responsible for that. He wanted to make my political rally look cheap and discredit me. Mr. Sal's all ready, Nick. Fine, I'll signal you when to start. What goes on here? We're going to have a private performance, Hall. All right, sit down, everybody. Go ahead, Patsy. What about the music? Look, Hall, now that you're here, suppose you play the organ, just the way you did for Rosita. Well, why should I? This ain't... Get busy, Hall. Do as Nick says. Oh, okay. Pull the curtains, Patsy. Right. Oh, good heavens. Of all the disgraceful... Quiet, please, Mrs. Nigel. Wait a minute, Miss Casal. Stay in the center of the stage. Don't try to talk to Hall. I said don't... What did she say to you, Hall? I just told him to play a little faster, that's all. Are you sure you didn't tell him how you murdered the woman we found in the bathtub? What? Me murder Rosita? Yes, you. You're crazy. I wasn't even here. I was in the city. Oh, no, you weren't. You were right here in town. What? Your name may be Roxanne, but you've been working for Hall under the name of Rosita. But it was the real Rosita who was murdered. You don't know what you're talking about. How about it, Hall? Is this the girl who worked for you or not? Uh, no. No, this ain't the one. I think she is. And now look, Nick, if Harry says she ain't the one, how are you going to prove different? Nobody else ever saw that dancer without her veil but him. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Carter. Prove I was the one who was working for Hall. All right, I will. Your costume's a dead giveaway. What a... The suntan pattern on your back, it fits the cut of your costume perfectly. Uh, come again? Standing out in the sun every afternoon doing the ballyhoo on your show hall, Roxanne got a tan that fits the lines of the costume she wore. The same costume she's wearing now. But the girl in the bathtub wasn't tanned that way. The pattern of her suntan didn't fit the costume. The dead girl never worked for you, Hall. Okay, you're right, Carter. No use trying to bluff any longer. No, you fool! I told you while I was dancing I'd split with you if you'd stick with me. I was giving you a chance to You'd make You'd have given him the same treatment you gave Rosita, the first chance you got. I've got a treatment for all of you if you try to stop me. A lead treatment. Under this veil that's draped over my right hand, I'm holding a gun named at Miss Bowen's back. Can I let her have it, Nick? Not if you want Miss Bowen to live. She's going to leave with me. And if any of you try to follow her, she gets shot. So if you want me bad enough to have her killed, come right ahead. Patsy slowly puts her hands up as the dancing girl reveals a new use for a veil. Nick hesitates as the two climb down off the platform. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Candidate's Corpse. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. With her veil-covered revolver pressed firmly against Patsy's back, the dancing girl moves toward the rear of the tent. Keep away from me if you want a live secretary, Mr. Carter. You heard her, so help it's me. It's all up to you. If you don't follow me, she'll be all right. Toss me your car keys, Harry. Ah, uh, now look. Be quick about it. Okay. Now, lift up the side wall of the tent, Miss Bowen. Lift up the what? The tent canvas. Lift it up so we can get under the tent. Oh, okay. There. <sighs> Higher, you dope. I can't. That's as high as it goes. Oh, all right, hold it steady while I get under it. Don't you... Hey, hey, I've got her, Nick. You've got me, have you, by your little son? Oh. Maddie, Maddie, let go the canvas up off so I can get a hold of it. Right, Nick. Now, watch out, Patsy. Don't let her... Get okay, right. I've got her. I'm Mr. Carter, before she kills somebody. All right, Patsy, you can relax. I've got a gun. Yeah, and I've got her. That's what you think. Why, I'm... Oh, no, you won't. Now, shut up and behave yourself. Are you all right, Patsy? I guess so. A couple of sore spots, but that's all. Knocking her over with your foot when she bent down to get under the tent wall was fast thinking, Patsy. Remind me to tell you later what a smart girl you are. Why, thank you. Know, she's not so hot. If I hadn't been off balance, I'd never. All right, all right, Roxanne. Why did you kill Rosita? Rosita had it coming to her. Why? She had me working in this Connie job under her name. Because she was working a blackmail racket and wanted an alibi if anything went wrong. And she could claim she was out of town with Hall's show? Yeah. Was Rosita planning to blackmail Mr. Nigel? No. 
gang that's trying to keep him from getting elected hired her to come up and sneak in his hotel room while he was out. Uh-huh. She's going to put on a big act about how she was his girlfriend and all that stuff. And when she was through with her act, Nigel would have had to withdraw from the race or face a nasty scandal. That's it, Mr. Carter. And if anything went wrong, Rosita would have taken your place in the show. Why, sure. She could have proved she was doing a dance act at the time she was supposed to have been putting on a rack with Nigel. Oh, I get it. Pretty clever. Clever? Disgraceful, you mean? But how did you happen to go to the hotel, Roxanne? I saw a chance to make myself a nice hunk of money. So I decided to sell what I knew to Nigel. Only when you got to the hotel, you found Rosita was already there. Yeah. Yeah. Rosita guessed I was there to double-cross her when we got into a fight. I knew I had to get rid of her, so I hit her over the head with a bookend. And you put her in the bathtub and turned on the water. Yeah. Then I went back to town to see if I could find where she kept her money. But you got there too soon. You mean you got there in time to save me from being the victim of a dirty political plot? It almost looks as if I'm a man of destiny. Save the speech for tonight, Wilton. Uh, yes, my dear. One thing, Mr. Nigel. When you came to my office, why wouldn't you tell me where you got the tip that somebody was plotting to ruin your career? Well, uh, it was an, an anonymous phone call from a, a girl. It was from me, in case I decided to sell out to you. Then why didn't you tell me that, Mr. Nigel? And have Stella know a beautiful young girl had been talking to me on the phone? Oh, dear me. I'd rather go through anything than have that happen. Well, Nick, what about the adventure that new post-war old Dutch cleanser will bring us next week? It's a story about a woman who writes soap operas, Mike, and does a good job of it. Until the murder she writes about actually happens in real life. And every suspect has a perfect alibi, too. But when the radio actress who plays the part of the murder victim disappears... Hey, wait a minute. This is getting too complicated. <laughs> Not complicated, Mike. Just puzzling. For such a simple murder, it was almost perfect. In fact, it might have been completely perfect if I hadn't bluffed. Well, it sounds wonderful, Nick. What do you call this adventure? I call it The Case of the Substitute Slayer. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Matty is played by Ed Latimer. Today's script was written by George B. Anderson. Original music is played by Henry Silvern. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Youth Month. And we are happy to join the salute to young America upon whom our country's future depends. But a salute is not enough. We must see that every American child has the opportunity to become a happy, useful citizen. To do this, we must make our homes our children's homes. We must know their schools, teachers, and playmates. We must provide the kind of recreation that results in physical and mental health. So let's make this month significant by observing its principles the year round thus assuring our children of an even better America. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the music. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction, Nick Carter, master detective. Johnny, I know how you feel. No, you don't, Mr. Carter. Nobody knows how I feel. For a couple of guys named Ford and Bisbee are going to find out. And soon. Now, wait a they minute. They framed me. They stole three years out of my life. They killed my mom. Now I'm going to do something about Johnny. it. Johnny. Johnny Nix, your friend. Listen I to me. I don't him. want any friends that work with the cops. Because I got a job to do that the cops ain't going to like. <laughs> And now, The Case of the Double Frame. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Today, Johnny Wade is being released from state penitentiary. 
And at 10 o'clock in the morning, Nick is waiting outside the prison gate. His secretary and assistant, Patsy Bowen, and Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad are in the car with him. Yeah, what's Johnny going to think when he sees a cop with you, Nick? Well, I'll simply tell him the truth, Maddie, that you and I are old friends and that you came along to get some fresh country air. <laughs> Johnny won't be suspicious of any friend of Nick, Sarge. Uh. Why, when Johnny was a member of the Downtown Boys Club, he simply worshipped Nick. Used to call him his big brother. Yeah, you see, Johnny never had any family except his mother, and she's dead now, so... Well, naturally, I wanted to meet him when he got out. You sure must have a lot of faith in him, Nick. I have, Matty. Even after he stole 20,000 bucks? Now, look, Matty, I don't believe he did. If I'd only known about it sooner, I might have been able to prove that Johnny was innocent. But we were out west on a case at the time of his trial. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was only recently when we learned he was being released today that we knew he'd been in prison. I made a few inquiries, but the evidence was all against him. And his employers, Ford and Bisbee, flatly refused to give me any help. Nick, mm. look, isn't that Johnny coming through the gate now? Why, it looks like him, It but... is. Oh, Nick. Nick, how he's changed. He's so thin. Now, wait a minute. I'll be right back. Right. Yeah. Hey, Johnny. Johnny! Johnny, wait! Yeah? It's me, Johnny. Nick Carter. Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. What are you doing here? Why, oh, I thought you'd like to have me meet you when you got out. We're old friends, aren't we? We used to be. Oh, we still are, Johnny. Come on. Patsy's in the car. She's anxious to meet you. And say, I've got a job lined up for no you. No, thanks. But listen, son. No soap, Mr. Carter. You was always swell to me, and I appreciate it, but I don't want any friends. Not anymore. Oh, don't be foolish, John. Okay, so I'm foolish. Maybe three years in stir makes you that way. But it needn't, Johnny. Now, look, I want you to forget all forget that. Forget it? Forget that Ford and Bisbee frame me? Forget that for the rest of my life people are going to say I'm a crook and a jailbird? I know it won't be easy. Maybe I ought to forget my mom, too. Maybe I ought to pretend that it wasn't grieving over me that killed her. Believe me, I understand how you feel, John. No, but... you don't. Nobody knows how I feel. There's a couple of guys that's going to find out. A couple of guys named Ford and Bisbee. Now, wait a minute. When they framed me, they stole three years out of my life. They killed my mom. Now I'm going to do something about it. Johnny, I'm speaking as your friend. You used to say I was the best friend you ever had. And I'm not forgetting it. But I got a job to do, and friends will only get in my way. Especially friends that work with the cops. So long, Mr. Carter. Johnny, wait a minute. You can tell Mr. Ford and Mr. Bisbee I'll be seeing them. Johnny's in a dangerous mood, Mr. Bisbee, and I think both you and Mr. Ford should be prepared for trouble. If you're such a friend of his, Carter, why did you come here to warn us? Because he's had trouble enough. I don't want him making any more for himself. I see. And it's not out of any regard for our safety. I'm thinking of that too, Mr. Ford. I don't blame Johnny for being sore if he's innocent of stealing that money. Innocent? He's a dirty crook, Miss Bowen, and he didn't get half what he deserved. That's what I thought at the time, Bisbee, but I'm beginning to wonder. You're out of your mind, Ford. If he didn't get the money, who did? Did you get it? Did I? I beg your pardon, Mr. Ford, but I have the report. Uh, Just a minute, Miner. Yes, sir. I put that money in the briefcase myself. Uh, You saw me, didn't you, Miner? Oh, yes, sir. As I testified in court, I brought the cash from the bank and handed it over to you, and I was there when you put it in the briefcase, fastened the case, and gave it to Johnny. And the young thief admitted that the briefcase never left his hands till he gave it to you at the airport, Ford. Well, the money certainly wasn't there then. All right, then. He took it. Nobody else could have. I don't care. Johnny wasn't the kind of a boy to steal. I see, Miss Bowen. You think either Mr. Ford or I stole our own money. That isn't what she said, Mr. Bisbee, but it still seems odd that neither of you gentlemen would give me any cooperation in trying to find out who did steal it. Right. Rubbish. We knew who got it. By the time you came around, he'd been tried and convicted. We were both pretty angry, Mr. Carter. This was a new business then, and 20000 was a serious loss. It was disastrous as far as I was concerned. You had money in the bank for it, but I was broke. Well, if you didn't put all your money on the horses or a roulette wheel... You don't have to give me another lecture for it. Then don't complain because you're always broke. Now, just a minute, gentlemen. You're getting away from the subject. Oh, you're quite right, Mr. Carter. And while both Mr. Bisbee and I appreciate your warning us about Johnny... I don't think there's any cause for alarm. But he blames you, too, for his mother's death, and there's no telling what he's likely to do. He'll most likely get that money from wherever he's got it hidden and leave this part of the country. It sounds logical to me. I don't think he'll want to attract any attention to himself by coming here. Gentlemen, I hope you're right. If he tries anything with me, I'll break his thieving neck. <laughs> Yes? 
what can I do for you, Letty? You Daddy Greer? What if I am, eh? My name's Johnny Wade. Link Garson told me to look you up when I got out. Link Garson, eh? Well, well, well. Link said that if I come to you, you'd take care of me. So? Well, I guess any friend of Link's is all right. So, uh, what do you want from Daddy Greer? Just one thing. A gun. Johnny, Johnny boy, it's good to see you. Hello, Mr. Miner. Still doing the bookkeeping around here? Yes. Oh, Johnny, you got thin. It must have been pretty bad up there, wasn't it? Skip it. Well, uh, Johnny, if there's anything I can do... No, thanks. Are Ford and Bisbee in their offices? Yes. Oh, but you don't want to go in there. Oh, don't you... I. Johnny. Johnny, listen to me. What's the idea of... Oh, it's you. Yeah, it's me. It's the guy you and that crooked partner of yours railroaded into the pen. Now, hold on, Johnny. Keep your hands on the desk, Mr. Ford. Put away that gun, you crazy fool. Maybe you didn't know my mom was dead, Mr. Ford. Or maybe you wouldn't care. She died thinking I was a crook and a thief. No, don't do anything you'll be sorry for, Johnny. I couldn't do anything to you I'd be sorry for. Or to Bisbee either. Now, wait. No, wait. I waited long enough. And now... Oh, watch out, Bisbee. He's got a gun. Grab it. Grab it or I'll break your arm. I... Uh... I've got it, Bisbee. That door hadn't knocked me off balance when you opened the it. The door isn't the only thing that's going to knock you off balance, you... Oh. Oh. Get up. Get up, you dirty... That's enough, Bisbee. Can't you see he's out cold? Is anything wrong in here? Oh. I ought to call the police and have him locked up. Oh, no. No, please, Mr. Bisbee. I I I'm sure he didn't know what he was doing. No, so you're a friend of his, too, are you, Miner? Well, not exactly. Well, sir. get him into the outer office, and when he comes to, tell him if he shows up here again, I'll send him back to jail where he belongs. Nick Carter speaking. Now, what's the matter, Ford? Did Johnny show up? Yes, yes he did. He came to the office there over this afternoon, threatened me with a revolver. Fortunately, he did. He got it away from him. Well, I'm glad to hear nobody was hurt. What did you do? Have him arrested? No, no. Bisbee was going to, but he changed his mind. And I'm glad he did. So am I. Sending him back to jail might be the worst thing in the world for him right now. You saw how bad he looks. I know. He was talking pretty wildly, too. Evidently, he's been brooding over his mother's death. That's what I mean, Mr. Ford. If I can get hold of Johnny, I'm sure I can straighten him out. Maybe it's because I take a personal interest in him, but I still don't believe he stole your money. That's why I called you, Carter. I'm not so sure he did either. What? You've changed your mind? Well, if he had the money hidden away, why would he come up here threatening me and take a chance in going back to jail? It doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. A guilty man would go get the money and leave town as quietly as possible. That's what I think. But if he didn't take the money, I'd like to know who did. Are you asking me to make an investigation? Mm, yes. If you don't think it's too late to find out anything after three years. As a matter of fact, I've been doing some looking around on my own hook, Mr. Ford. And I turned up one very interesting fact. Mm, what's that? may not mean anything, but... In August of 1945, your partner, J.T. Bisbee, bought $28,000 worth of stock in an East Texas oil company. He couldn't have. In 1945, Bisbee didn't have a dime. So he said, but he paid $28,000 for oil stock just the same. August 1945? Well, that was less than two months after that $20,000 disappeared. I, I wonder... Of course, there's an $8,000 difference between the amount that was stolen and the amount Bisbee invested in oil stock, but it still... Bisbee looked... was in charge of the office that year, Carter. I was on the road all the time. Well... Everybody will be leaving the office in a few minutes. But I think I'll stay down here and look over the books for 1945. Maybe I can discover where that extra 8,000 came from. Do you know enough about bookkeeping to recognize something wrong if you found it? I think so. And if anything does look suspicious, I'll have Miner come down and check with me on it. Good idea. Let me know how you come out. I'll do that. I'll give you a ring first thing in the morning. <laughs> Fine and cold weather, Charlie, but on a night like this, I'd rather be back pounding a beat of... Uh, two to one, it's some dame whose kid hasn't got back from the movies yet. 45th Precinct, Sergeant Lafferty speaking. This is... <coughs> Adam Ford, Jackson Billing. 
Oh, yes, Mr. Ford. What's the matter? I... I've been shot. I... I think I'm dying. Hold it. Uh, Charlie, get an ambulance over to the Jansen building on the double. Guy's been shot. Right, Sarge. You still there, Mr. Ford? Yes, I... Uh, just hold I... on. We got an ambulance on the way. Do you know who shot you? It was... <coughs> it was John Wayne. You're sure of that, Mr. Ford? Yes, I saw him. Johnny Wayne. Johnny... Mr. Ford! Mr. Ford! Snap it up, Charlie. I think he's croaked already, but I got the name of the guy that did it. As the police ambulance speeds toward the Jensen building, the alarm goes out to pick up Johnny Wade for murder. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now, back to The Case of the Double Frame. Today's adventure with Nick Carter... Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. It is an hour later. The photographers and fingerprint men have left. But Nick, Patsy, and Sergeant Matheson have remained at the office of Ford and Bisbee. The body of Adam Ford still lies beside the desk, his dead hand clutching the telephone with which his last call was made to police headquarters. Uh, wish we could get hold of Bisbee. But his housekeeper says he's been out all evening. Have you found any trace of Johnny yet? No, Patsy, but every cop in town is on the lookout for him. I see. We found out he's registered at a little hotel called the Meckley. Uh Uh-huh. I got a couple of boys stationed there, too. Oh, not that he'll be crazy enough to come back. Maddie, I have a hunch Johnny didn't do this. Oh, Nick, use your head. I know you like the boy, and I'm sorry, but we've got Ford's dying statement that Johnny Wade shot him. Yes, I know, but I think the killer himself made that call to police headquarters after Ford was dead. Oh, for Pete's sake, And then put the phone in Ford's hand to make the story look good. Well, if that's the best idea you can dream of... I'm not dreaming. Look at that phone. It's in Ford's hand backwards. What? Why, yes. The mouthpiece and the earphone are reversed. Ford's thumb is next to the mouthpiece. Well, I can see that. But what? No one would hold a phone that way, Matty. You'd have to twist your arm half out of its socket to speak into it. Hey, you're right, Nick. Now, how in... What, uh... That isn't the phone in Ford's hand, Sergeant. It's huh? the other one on the desk. He had two of them. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> uh, Sergeant Matheson speaking. Oh, you have, huh? Good. We'll be down to talk to him pretty soon. Did they find Johnny? No, Bisbee. He's down at headquarters. Oh. Uh, look, uh, how about Johnny Wade? You... What? Well, why didn't you tell me before that? Fourteen minutes after ten, huh? All right, Hanson, I'll see you in a few minutes. Ah, uh, that's funny. What is, Matty? Nick Hanson says Ford called Johnny's hotel tonight... Left a message that Johnny should come here to the office right away, no matter what time he got in. What was that, about 14 minutes after 10? That was the time on the message to the hotel, Patsy. They always mark it down when a guest isn't in. Hey, Matty. Yeah? thought you said Ford died at 8 minutes after 10. Well, that's the time he phoned headquarters. All right. Hey, wait a minute. Yes, Ford was dead before the call was made to headquarters. And that call was made six minutes before the call to Johnny. Then both of those calls were fakes. But, but why should anybody call Johnny? I can leave now. Oh, Nick, you don't suppose the killer could have found him on the street? No, it's not likely, Patsy. The police will pick him up when he returns to the hotel, if they don't locate him sooner. You know, I'm beginning to think you're right about the lad being framed, Nick. But who's doing it? We may find the answer in this open ledger on Ford's desk. Now, how can you tell anything from that with ink spilled all over it? Yeah, everything on the page has been blotted out. That's just the point. Looks to me as though the ink had been spilled purposely and then spread around. Oh, Nick, that's Hmm. the ledger for August 1945. That's an old one. Yes. Ford told me this afternoon he was going to look over the books for 1945 to see whether there was any evidence that something crooked was going on then. Well, Well, if somebody tried to destroy what was on those pages, he didn't get away with it. The lab boys can bring out what's under that ink blot as clear as it ever was. No, I don't want to wait for that, Matty. Suppose we talk to the bookkeeper tonight. Uh, Miner? Yeah. If anybody would know what was in this ledger, he would. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I sent a man over to his boarding house after him. You know, he was a witness to that brawl this afternoon. Good. He ought to be here any minute. I... Oh. Sergeant Matheson speaking. Huh? He did. Well, he never got here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'd better stay there and wait for him. Right. What was that matter? Miner isn't at his boarding house, Nick. He left for here quite a while ago. What? Yeah. It seems someone who said he was Adam Ford called and asked him to come to the office right away. What? Why, that's exactly the message that was left at the hotel for Johnny. Yeah. Only Miner got his message and started out. And he isn't here yet. But, 
But why should anyone... Well, maybe he did know something about that ledger, Nick. Maybe he knew too much. Perhaps you're right, Matty. Let's go down to headquarters and see whether Mr. Bisbee thinks so, too. I don't know anything about any phone calls. I didn't even know Adam was dead until the police officer told me. Where have you been all evening, Mr. Bisbee? That's my business. Yeah? It's police business now, mister. Well, I... If you must know, I was at the Blue Eagle. The gambling house? Yes. Can you prove that? Why, someone will remember me, but uh-huh. I... Uh-huh. Well, you better just hope that somebody does. Mr. Bisbee, your partner was examining the ledger for August 1945 at the time he was murdered. Well? That was the month you invested $28,000 in oil stocks, wasn't it? All right, it was. So what? Thought you were broke in 1945. Well, I... I... Where'd you get that $28,000? I... I won it in the poker game. Oh, you play for high stakes, don't you, Mr. Bisbee? Suppose I do? What of it? Can you prove that's where you got the money? After three years, don't be ridiculous. Hmm. Matty. Yeah? While you check Mr. Bisbee's alibi for tonight, I think Patsy and I'd better go over to Johnny Wade's hotel. Yeah? What for, Nick? I'm worried about it, Matty. And maybe the desk clerk or somebody there may be able to tell us where he went tonight. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but Mr. Wade checked out and he left no forwarding address. Checked out? When? Not more than five minutes ago. You mean he was here in the hotel and the police didn't... police... Oh, you mean those cops across the lobby are waiting for Mr. Wade? Didn't what? you know? I know, sir. I just came on duty. All right, all right. But how did he get out of here without us seeing him? Oh, Mr. Wade wasn't here. He phoned and said we could release the room. He paid in advance. So, Nick, another phone call. If the police are looking for him, they may be able to catch him at the office of Ford and Bisbee in the Jansen building. Why do you say that? Well, there was a message from a Mr. Ford that he should go there immediately, no matter how late it was. And you gave him that message? Of course I did, and, and he said he'd stop there on his way out of town. Oh, oh! thank goodness he's all right, Nick. When he gets to the office, the police will be waiting. Yes, but I think we'd better see whether we can catch him before he gets there. Why? Because it may be that whoever phoned him doesn't want him to reach the office. <laughs> Huh? Oh, Mr. Minor, what are you doing Mr. here? Ford went home, Johnny, but he asked me to wait here and drive you to his house. Come on, get in. What's he want to see me about? Well, I think he's found out that you didn't take that money after all. He has? That's the impression I got. Now hurry up, get in. Well, you bet I will. Hey, is this on the level? You're not kidding me? Take my word for it, Johnny. Before long, your troubles will be all over. <laughs> here, Mr. Miner. You said we were going to Mr. Ford's house. He's at his country place, Johnny. We're sure out at the end of nowhere. Don't look like there's three cars a year come over this road. It is lonely, isn't it? Well, here we are, Johnny. What do you mean, here we are? Where's the house? There isn't any house, Johnny. Only an old stone quarry about half full of water. But it's very, very deep, Johnny. I don't get it. You will. Get out. Hey, what's the idea of the gun? Get out, Johnny. You're going to join Mr. Ford. Right here. As Johnny Wade gets out of the car, there is no sign of mercy on the face of his supposed friend, the bookkeeper. Only a grim determination to kill. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Double Frame, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Beside a lonely country road, the headlights of a parked car shine upon the figure of an elderly man with a revolver in his hand and a young man standing helplessly at the edge of an abandoned rock quarry half filled with water. You're the one that took that 20 grand three years ago. 
You're the one that framed me. It was so easy, Johnny. After Bisbee put the money in the briefcase, he turned his back to get some papers off the desk, and I took the money out again. That's all. You put that ticket from Montreal in my pocket, too. Of course I did. It made the police think you were planning to run away. It was a very efficient plan, Johnny. Yeah, you're a smart guy, you are. So you bring me out here. Make me carry all this scrap iron over from your car. They make excellent weights, Johnny. Excellent. Now, I want you to take that roll of wire and fasten scrap iron securely around your ankles. Huh? Go on. Take a piece of that scrap iron. Okay, I'll take it. And give it right back to you. Why, you young... Keep away, Johnny. I don't want to kill you. Just yet. Okay, okay. What do you want to bump me off for? You framed me. You got away with it. You have to disappear, Johnny. You see, you murdered Mr. Ford tonight. I did what? I needed that money three years ago to cover a shortage in my accounts. And tonight the old fool started looking over the books. He found you'd faked him, huh? Unfortunately for him, yes. He phoned me to come down to the office to accuse me. But I wasn't going to the penitentiary as you did. So you knocked him off? Oh, no, Johnny. The police have Mr. Ford's dying statement that you killed him. I know. Because I made that dying statement myself over the phone. Well, you double-crossing... That's enough, Johnny. Get busy with that scrap iron. With his bullet in my arm? You're crazy. You're right. I'll have to attend to that detail myself. Later. Goodbye, Johnny. Now, look, Mr. Miner. It won't hurt much, Johnny. I'm just going to... What the... That's just a warning, Miner. Drop that gun or I'll shoot to kill. Mr. Carter... Where the devil did you come from? Patsy, take Miner's gun. Right, Nick. Look... Carter, I-, I can explain. Johnny confessed to killing Mr. Ford. He was going to kill me. Save so... your breath, Miner. For you, the highway back to town is going to be a one-way road to the electric chair. How's your arm, Johnny? Oh, it'll be all right. It's just a flesh wound. Oh, gee, you're lucky, Johnny. We were on our way to Ford's office when Nick saw you getting into Miner's car. And you followed us all the way out from town? Yeah. We had to drive without lights and stay quite a distance behind. Our Miner would have noticed us. I still don't know why he wanted to bump me off. After the way he framed me, I never could have proved I... I didn't kill Mr. Ford. Well, he couldn't take any chances on you having an alibi. Nick, Nick, how did Bisbee get that 28000 Did he really win it in a poker game? There's no reason to doubt it now, Patsy. Oh, Johnny, here's something Bisbee asked me to give you. Oh? Uh Uh-huh. Probably a nice little apology for sending you to the penitentiary for something you didn't do. I just don't like that man. Well, what is it, Mr. Carter? Here. Here, it's a check. For a thousand dollars. Oh. Mm-hmm. He thought it might make up for at least part of what you've been through. Oh, Johnny, that's wonderful. Now you can make a real start in life. Yeah. Yeah, gee, a thousand bucks. I wish Mom could be here to see this. And he has a job for you, too. A much better job than you had before. Gosh, Mr. Carter. That just goes to show you how wrong a fellow can be sometimes. Mr. Bisbee ain't a bad guy at all when you get to know what he's really like. You know, Johnny, that's generally true. Very few people are really bad when you get to know them. I'm glad you found that out while you're still young. It'll make your life a whole lot easier sometimes. Well, Nick, can you tell us something about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week? Yes, Mike. Next week, we're going to meet a young man who didn't commit murder because the victim wasn't running backwards. And the only way Nick could prove it was by tracing $5 worth of toy money to the real killer. Well, between running backwards and toy money, there ought to be plenty of excitement. What do you call this adventure? I call it The Case of the Bull and Bear. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. 
This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war old Dutch cleanser, famous for chasing dirt, presents... Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, master detective. But, Nick, that's fantastic. No one would cooperate in his own murder. Maybe fantastic, Patsy, but all the evidence points to it. Then I don't believe the evidence. Well, there's only one way to prove what really happened. It's a method I hate to use. Why, Nick? Because it puts an innocent person in danger. But we haven't any choice now. We've got to go through with it. Now, the case of the wrong Mr. Wright. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Even though she's 79 years old and confined to a wheelchair, old Mrs. Wright still enjoys picnics. And since her two great-grandnephews, John and Charles, expect to inherit the Wright Pharmaceutical Company one day, they're always willing to go along. One day early last fall, Charles' wife, Janet, wheeled old Mrs. Wright to the picnic grounds in a secluded corner of the estate and stopped the chair near the edge of a cliff overhanging the river. How's this, Aunt Madge? Just fine, Janet. Oh, I've always loved this view, looking down at the river, Mm. like being on top of the world. It is beautiful. Where are the boys? They went back into the woods looking for dead branches to build a fire with wine. I wear my shawl that you might know he wouldn't be around when I need him. I'll get it for you. Around when I need him. I'll get it for you, Aunt Madge. Thank you, Janet. I'll be right back. Uh. Oh, still wish she'd married Johnny instead of Charles. Oh, well. This is a beautiful spot up here where the sun's... Uh, uh, ah, Johnny, take your hand away from my eyes. I know it's you. Where are you wheeling me to, Johnny? Johnny! Charles! Johnny! Take your hand off my eyes. Oh, no! Oh! <laughs> America, you didn't drown, Mrs. Wright. If those two fishermen hadn't seen you fall in and got to you in time... Well, they did. Are you sure you're well enough to talk, Mrs. Wright? Yes, of course I am. But, Aunt Madge, you know what Dr. Myron said about your heart. No, pneumonia left it weak. May quit any time. All the more reason this thing has to be settled now. But, Aunt Madge, I Mr. don't... Mr. Carter, I sent for you to tell you someone has tried to murder me. You mean someone deliberately pushed your wheelchair over the cliff? Exactly. But, Aunt Madge, no one was near that part of the estate but John and Charles and me, and the boys were in the woods gathering firewood. I know it wasn't you, Janet. Well, that was a man's hand over my eyes, and Johnny wouldn't hurt me. He loves his old aunt. Then you think it was your other nephew, Charles? I know it was, and I want you to prove it, Mr. Carter. Well, I'm afraid you're asking the impossible, Mrs. Wright. Why? Well, don't you see? This all happened three weeks ago. Even if there were any clues, they'd, they'd be gone by now. Then investigate Charles. You'll find something, I'll be bound. I don't understand you, Aunt Madge. Talking about your own nephew like this, and in front of me, his wife. I'd just as soon say it to his face. Even as a boy, Charles used to sneak lie and steal money out of my purse. I could see the difference between him and Johnny even then. You've never given Charles a chance. I put them both through the same school, didn't I? Trained them both to be chemists so they could take over the business together someday, didn't I? And what happened? Charles went into real estate. With no more reason than that, you're accusing him of... Oh, Aunt Madge, you're being unfair. All right. I'll show you whether I'm unfair or not. Mr. Carter, I want you to investigate both Charles and John. Very well, Mrs. Wright. And let me know what you find out as soon as you can. I will. In the meantime, be careful. (laughs) He won't try it again. I fixed that. You fixed it? How? My lawyer was here this morning, and I changed my will. You did what? Changed my will. 
The way it stands now, I'm leaving everything to John. <laughs> Madge, how could you? Maybe I'll change it back later. But I want Charles to know that if anything happens to me before I do, <laughs> he won't get a red cent. Back so soon, Carter? It's only been three days, hasn't it? Well, there wasn't a great deal to find out. And I sure look, Mrs. Wright. You must be feeling a lot better. I wouldn't be out of bed if I wasn't. <laughs> this is Aunt Madge's 80th birthday, and we're getting ready to have a little party. Oh, now. never mind that, Janet. I want to hear what Carter found out. Well, frankly, Mrs. Wright, what I've learned doesn't prove a thing. I'll decide that. Okay. First of all, your nephew, John Wright, seems to be a pretty steady young fellow. No bad habits or associates... Lives within his income, saves regularly, and so on. I could have told you that. What about Charles? Well, Patsy can read that part of the report to you. Go ahead, Patsy. Right, Nick. Charles Wright. Credit rating, very poor. Business, heavily mortgaged. Overdue loan at the First Community Bank. Several large personal loans. I don't see any reason for parading Charles' business difficulties here. Be Janet. What else, young lady? Three days before Mrs. Wright's accident, Charles Wright attempted to consolidate his debts with a loan from the Halliday Trust Company offering as security the fact that he would soon inherit half the estate of his aunt, who was very ill and could not possibly live long. Ah, uh, couldn't possibly live long. Well, he did his best to make sure such a thing. This is right. It'd be very unfair to condemn anyone on such flimsy evidence. No, it only confirms what I thought before. Janet, if you want... Janet, if you want to live here with me, you're welcome. But I want Charles to pack. Up and get out today. Good at Madge, your birthday party. My mind's made up. Mrs. Wright, as a favor to me, go on downstairs, have your birthday party, and don't say anything to either John or Charles until tomorrow. Sleep on it first. Well, please, Aunt Madge, try to be fair. Oh, there goes that word fair again. All right, I won't say anything until tomorrow. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Oh, happy birthday, birthday to, to you. No, I don't like all this fuss. <laughs> you love it, Aunt Mad. Huh? Now, come on, open your present. Open this one first, Aunt Mad. Yes, it's from Charles and me. I can read the card, can't I? Hey, an amethyst brooch. That's good looking. Uh, very pretty. Thank you, Janet. Uh, you too, Charles. Well, I'm glad you like it, Aunt Madge. Oh, talk with your mouth full, Charles. I should think three pieces of cake would be enough for you anyway. I'm afraid my gift will look pretty sad after that, Aunt Madge. But anyway, here it is. With all my love. Ah, you know I like it, Johnny, whatever it is. Well, a music box. It's beautiful, Johnny. Well, open the lid. <gasps> How thoughtful of you. But where are my chocolates? Your what? Ah, now, stop teasing. You know you always give me a box of those special Swiss chocolates on my birthday. Well, you know, I have to order them from Switzerland, and this year it just slipped my mind. Oh, I don't believe it. What's that you're holding behind your back? <laughs> <laughs> Can't fool you, can I, Aunt Madge? Here, and many happy returns of the day. Ah, you can. Uh, my birthday just wouldn't be complete without these. Aren't they pretty? They always look as good as they taste. Here, I'll put them away for you, Aunt Madge. You know the doctor said no sweets for a while. Oh, Janet, give me those chocolates. But Aunt Madge, mm, the they doctor They do good, don't they? <laughs> well, I'm not on a diet. Charles, put that back. Those chocolates are for Aunt Madge. Well, yeah, too late now. I only took one anyway. Oh, you ought to be ashamed, Charles. Hmm. Doesn't taste so hot. Kind of... Dinner. Hand me that box, Janet, before he eats the rest of them. Well, all right, but... And Madge, don't... Don't eat those. What? Charles, what's the matter? That chocolate. Something wrong. I feel... <clears throat> Charles! Within seconds of eating one of his Aunt Madge's birthday chocolates, Charles Wright collapses. And even before Janet can reach her husband's side, he's dead. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now back to the case of the wrong Mr. Wright. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. An hour has passed, and Sergeant Matheson of the Homicide Squad is at the Wright mansion with Nick and Patsy, trying to arrive at the facts of Charles' death. A medical examiner says there must have been enough cyanide in that piece of candy to kill half a dozen men. But it couldn't have been the chocolate, Sergeant. Oh, stop pretending, John. 
This is one thing you can't blame Charles for. Well, I'm not trying to, but I could If that Madge had eaten that chocolate before she put Charles back in her will, you'd have inherited everything. That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Janet, stop. I won't stop. You've always protected and petted him. Now you know who tried to kill you last Aunt month. Madge, I swear I don't know anything about liar, it. Liar, liar, liar. Charles always had to take the blame for what you did. And even as he was dying, he tried to warn us, Madge. All right, all right. Now hold everything just a minute. Uh, Mr. Wright, why do you say the chocolates couldn't have been poisoned? Because they arrived by registered mail from Switzerland only this afternoon. I didn't even have time to unwrap the package before I gave it to Aunt Madge. The wrappings could have been taken off and put back again. Of course they couldn't. That's exactly what he did. I did not. If there was poison in those chocolates, somebody else put it there. Oh, sure, sure. As a biochemist, Mr. Wright. You have access to cyanide, don't you? Well, yes, but so do lots of people. And when Charles started to eat that chocolate, you tried to stop him, didn't you? I I don't remember. I do. He said, put it back, Charles. Those chocolates are for Aunt Madge. Uh Uh-huh. Well, I think we've heard enough. Come on, young fella. Come on where? To headquarters. Where do you think? I'm booking you for murder. Nickel, we have to wait here at the post office very long. No, no. Maddie said he'd phone ahead and get an okay for us to look at that receipt. Good. Oh, here's the inquiry window over here. Well, I hope the sergeant didn't forget to phone. Uh, yes, sir? My name's Nick Carter. I came to see you about a receipt for a registered package from Switzerland. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. I have it right here. The assistant postmaster said you'd be calling for it. Thanks. Oh. Why, Nick? John Wright didn't sign for the chocolate. Oh, the name seems to be... Yvette Fouchard. Yvette Fou... Why, that's Mrs. Wright's personal maid. Uh-huh. And look at the date. Yesterday. Then John was lying. He had that package a whole day before the party. It looks that way. But before we make up our minds, let's talk to Yvette. <laughs> Yesterday afternoon, I signed the, what you call him, the, the certificate? The receipt. Oh, oui, mademoiselle. I sign him, then I place the package on the old table where Monsieur Jean is sure to see him. Not a half hour have passed until I hear the voice of Monsieur Jean greeting madame, and I say to myself, why he is home so early, huh? And why was he? Madame, see, he have a headache. But what about the package? When I put the regular mail on the hall table about three o'clock, the chocolates are gone. Monsieur Jean has taken them. But you didn't see him do it. No, monsieur. But the package is there when he come home. It is gone after he passed through the hall. So I know he has found it. <laughs> Isn't it funny, Nick? The smartest men make stupid mistakes when they try to commit a crime. John left a trail of evidence a yard wide. How about you forgetting, Patsy, that if Mrs. Wright had eaten that chocolate, there probably wouldn't have been any investigation. You mean because of her weak heart? Sure. Everyone would have assumed that death was due to heart failure. (sighs) Well, what now, Nick? Let's go down to headquarters and see what the laboratory boys have found out. I'm sorry to keep you waiting, Nick. That box of candy was more interesting than we thought. How do you mean, Sergeant? Well, first of all, Patsy, the poison must have been put in with a hypodermic needle. The lab boys found marks like pinholes in the bottom of every chocolate. Nothing unusual about that, Matty? No, but what was unusual was the cyanide itself, Nick. In the lower layer, he used a solution so weak... It wouldn't have killed anybody but a person with a bad heart like Mrs. Wright. Well, what do you mean in the lower layer? (laughs) That's just it, Patsy. He gave the top layer a solution ten times as strong, enough to kill anybody. That is interesting. Yeah, and that's not all. There were some impurities in that cyanide, Nick. That'll be a cinch to prove where it came from once we locate the original supply. Yeah, sure. Chemical analysis should take care of that. Yeah, but the most important thing of all... Was a fingerprint. Whose fingerprint? I don't know yet, Patsy, but I bet it's John's. The chocolate must have got soft while he was holding it to put the poison in. Have you checked it against John's prints? Yeah, the boys are doing that now, Nick. Matty, where was the chocolate with the fingerprint on it? Top or bottom layer? Uh, The bottom. And that layer hadn't been touched until we got the box down here to the lab. So he can't claim that it got there by accident after the box was open. You're right about that. 
Could I go down to the lab and take a look at the chocolates myself? Sure you can, Dick. What for? I'd like to find out why the top layer was given a double dose. Sergeant Matheson was right, Nick. All these chocolates had the same kind of little pinholes in the bottom. No, no, not quite the same, Patsy. Look at these chocolates from the top layer. Holes are larger and not quite so regular. Well? Looks to me as though someone had put a second dose of cyanide in these and tried to insert the needle in the holes left by the first one. Well, yes, it does look that way. That's why the poison was stronger in the top layer. Why, of course. He decided that perhaps the weak solution wouldn't actually kill her, so he gave the chocolates on top another dose with a stronger solution. Perhaps. But why insert the needle in exactly the same place? Why not? Look at the pattern on the bottom of each piece of candy. The pinhole is right in the middle of that little dimple where you can hardly see it. It's the logical place to put the needle. You know, Patsy, I'm beginning to wonder whether that second dose of poison might not have been put in by somebody else. What? You mean two different people had the same idea at almost the same time? Could be. And both of them tried to kill Mrs. Wright with the same kind of poison in the same box of chocolates? Oh, Nick, that, that's too much of a coincidence. Well, stranger things than that have happened, Patsy. Let's visit John Wright's laboratory. I want to find out if the cyanide really did come from there. <laughs> Here's the only bottle of cyanide we have, Mr. Carter, but we don't use it because it's not a very good grade. Some kind of impurities in it. I don't know exactly what... Impurities? Nick, do you remember what the sergeant said? Yeah, I know what you mean, Patsy. Must be an interesting job, Mr. Jensen, laboratory assistant to a biochemist. Oh, the work's interesting enough. You don't happen to be working for a slave driver like John Wright. Oh, uh, don't you like him? Well, John's all right, I guess. Sure, a lot pleasanter working for Charles. You mean Charles used to be a chemist here, too? Oh, yes, yes. Before he went into real estate, I was his assistant then, and Janet worked with John. Then after John broke their engagement and Janet married Charles... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is getting complicated. Janet and John were engaged? Oh, yes, yes. But he changed his mind. Everybody thinks she broke it off. I know different. John just let her say that to save her feelings. Then Charles was Janet's second choice, huh? Yes, that's right. Have you seen either of them lately? Yes, yes. They were both up one day last week talking over old times. I see. Well, thanks for the information, Mr. Jensen. It's helped a lot. Uh, here's the report on that cyanide comparison test, Nick. Okay, let's see it. Here you are. Both of them analyzed exactly the same. Then the cyanide and the chocolates came from John Wright's laboratory. Not a doubt in the world, Patsy. Well, how about the fingerprint on that chocolate? Ah, we drew a blank there. Maybe it belongs to somebody in the candy factory in Switzerland. Anyway, it's not John Wright's. Uh, could it belong to someone else in the Wright household? Well, Patsy, the fingerprint boys are checking that now, but it, that's just routine. That print had to be made by either the poisoner or somebody in Switzerland. Nobody else had a chance to touch that bottom layer of candy. I'm beginning to get an idea, Matty. Huh? Pretty fantastic, but... Oh, excuse me. Sergeant Matheson speaking. Oh, yeah, Barker. Is it the report? Yeah, Patsy. What? Barker, you made a mistake. Oh, no, no. No, you must have. Yeah, but... I... Okay. Okay, Barker. Whose print was it, Sergeant? Nick, do you know who poisoned those chocolates? I think I do. Same guy that ate one of them and died, Charles Wright. Charles, oh, go on it, Nick, you're right. It was his fingerprint. Oh, but if Charles poisoned the chocolates, he must have known what he was doing when he ate one of them. Uh, yeah, Nick. Are you trying to tell me the guy committed suicide just so he could frame John for murder? No, Matty, I think Charles Wright cooperated in his own murder. Huh? What? And I'm afraid by doing so, he made it impossible for us to get one shred of evidence that'll convict the real killer. Well, do you know who it is, Nick? I think I do. There's only one way to prove it. How? Method I hate to use, Matty. Because it may be pretty dangerous for an innocent person. <laughs> You wanted to see 
me, Aunt Madge, so I... What in the world are you doing with these two laundry hampers here in your room? I'm looking for something with a chocolate stain on it. Here, Janet, you look through this hamper. Chocolate stain? What do you mean? The chocolate was soft. And whoever poisoned those candies must have got some of it on his fingers. It'd be the most natural thing in the world to wipe them off on something without even thinking about it. Aunt Madge, John poisoned them. You know that. All right. Then if we find chocolate on one of his handkerchiefs, that will prove it. Oh, it's just a waste of time, Aunt Madge. Maybe, but... <gasps> Did you find something? Uh, no. No, I didn't find a thing. And why are you looking so funny? I'm not. I'm not looking funny at all. I, Janet, would you run downstairs and ask Harvey to bring up some tea? You're just making an excuse to get me out of the room, aren't you, Aunt Madge? I know, Janet. Why should I? Why? So you can make a telephone call to Nick Carter. Oh, what an idea. Why should I want... Because you did find something in that clothes hamper. You're trying to hide... Why should I want... Because you did find something in that clothes hamper. You're trying to hide it under... Oh, the... Why, Janet, so... Oh, one of my handkerchiefs. And there is a smear of chocolate on it. I was more careless than I thought. And it was you. You did poison that candy. Of course I did. But you knew that if I died, everything would go to John. That's why I took the candy away from you before you had a chance to eat any of it. And that's why Charles grabbed the piece first. We had it planned very carefully. You mean Charles knew about the poison? Yes. But he thought there was only a tiny bit of it. Enough to make him convincingly sick. And make you think that dear Johnny was trying to kill you. Ah, now I'm beginning to understand. You thought that I'd blame Johnny for the other attempt, too. You thought I'd change my will and leave everything to Charles. Exactly, darling. But there was more poison in the chocolates than Charles thought. Because after he finished preparing them, I gave the top layer a second and stronger dose. Ah, can't believe it. You loved Charles. I hated him. That greedy fool. I only married him because I thought he'd be rich someday. And then you will. Why, do? Why did you kill him, Janet? I, so that I'd get it all for myself. And be rid of him at the same time. With Charles dead and John convicted of his murder, who could you leave it to but me? The poor, sorrowing widow. I didn't know anybody could be so evil. Well, you know now, darling. Any more last words? Last words? Yes. You're about to die of heart failure, dear. No. You don't think I'll let you tell the police about finding that handkerchief, do you? But I was just... So if you don't... Blow from behind your back. Yes. No, don't, please. You won't struggle much. Yes. Your heart won't last that long. Struggle much. Yes. Your heart won't last that long. All I need to do is press the pillow over your face. Yes. For a moment. Yes. Like this, that man. Yes. Like this. Yes. Weak and ill, Mrs. Wright hasn't the strength to defend herself against Janet's murderous attack. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the wrong Mr. Wright. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. Helpless in her wheelchair, Mrs. Wright struggles feebly against the suffocating pillow which Janet holds firmly over her face. Go on and die, you all. That's enough, Janet. I, where did you come from? We've been hiding in the closet, listening. Are you all right, Mrs. Wright? Yes, I, I'm quite all right, Mr. Carter. It was such an interesting confession, Janet. I'm sure the jury will enjoy it as much as we did when you go on trial for murder. <laughs> was Charles who pushed my wheelchair over that embankment, wasn't it, Mr. Carter? That's what Janet told us at headquarters. Well, that was Charles' own idea, but the poisoning scheme was Janet. I began to see through the plan when we found Charles' fingerprint on that chocolate. And obviously, Janet had to be in on the scheme, too. Why? Because when we found out that the chocolates had been poisoned the second time with a stronger solution, that made it pretty clear that somebody who knew what Charles had done was double-crossing him. And Janet was the most logical suspect. Yes, I suppose so. 
But we still didn't have any proof. Those things were only circumstantial evidence. Well, you had the handkerchief with the chocolate stain, Nick. <laughs> Shall we tell her, Mr. Carter? Might as well. There wasn't any chocolate stain, Patsy. There wasn't any... But there was. I saw it. I know. Maddie and I put it there ourselves. You... So that's why you went through all that rigmarole and let Mrs. Wright risk her life. Oh, I wasn't worried, knowing you were all there in the closet. <sighs> anyway, it was worth it to prove that I wasn't wrong about Johnny. <laughs> well, now you can be satisfied that you put your faith in the right, Mr. Wright. <laughs> Well, Nick, what sort of an adventure does new post-war old Dutch cleanser have for us next week? Next week, Ralph, we're going after a young fellow I really liked. He was hiding out because of a murder committed back in 1939. And he admitted killing another man in 1948. And you liked him? Why, Nick? Well, if you ask me, Ralph, I think it was because when Nick tried to keep him from getting away, he threw Nick halfway across the room. Oh, that's a fine basis for a lasting friendship with a murderer. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Ralph, that was exactly what convinced me that he wasn't a murderer, in spite of his own admission. No, I still don't get it. But uh, what do you call the adventure, Nick? I call it The Case of the Forgetful Killer. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at the same time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Ralph Camargo saying, when minutes count, use new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Famous for chasing dirt presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined as new post-war old Dutch cleanser brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, master detective. Move, any of you. Don, where'd you get that gun? Never mind, just don't make me use it. Don't be a fool, Don. I'm not. I'm going out of here and nobody's gonna... Don't be too sure. Nick! Anybody else want to try any smart tricks before I leave? Now, the case of the forgetful killer. Today's adventure starring Lon Clark as Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war old Dutch cleanser. In the back booth of a dingy bar in the slum district, a well-dressed young man takes a thick package of banknotes from his pocket and passes it across the cigarette-scarred table to the shifty-eyed little man who sits across from him. That's every cent I have in the world, Whitey. Six thousand dollars. I said ten. Where's the other four grand? I couldn't get any more. You better get it. Remember that letter I told you about? If anything happens to me, it'll be in the hands of the D.A. within 24 hours. That'll be the end of you. But why? I'll meet you here tomorrow night and you... Pre I can't come here again, Whitey. If anyone should okay, see me... Okay, okay. So I'll phone you at the office, tell you where to bring it. But why do I... I get the other four grand tomorrow night? Or I go to the cops. And you go to the electric chair. For murder. Don, if... If there were any way I could raise the money for you, I would. You know that. Oh, I know, Chris. I, I wouldn't have asked you, except I've tried everything else. You're the only real friend I've got. Sure. <laughs> now, when you need me, I can't come through. Oh, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Whitey phoned me about an hour ago. I promised to have the money at the corner of First and Water Streets at 1 o'clock tonight. 
I've got to have it there. But why, Don? What's he got on you? You can tell me. No, Chris, I, I don't want to talk about that. But if Whitey ever tells the cops who I really am, it's the end of everything. And that little rat's got me tied hand and foot. You mean that letter to the district attorney? Yes, but... Chris. Chris, do you think you could be lying about that letter? If I thought now, that... Now, Don, you're not getting any crazy ideas, are you? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm thinking. There's only one chance left. Yeah. Mr. Hughes gets back from Washington at 11 tonight. Nah, you'll never get him to part with $4,000. If I know our beloved employer, he'll never... But he's just... got to. It's my last hope. But what if he won't? Then I'll be waiting for Whitey just the same. And it'll be a meeting he'll never forget. It's you, sonny boy. So dark in that doorway, I couldn't see you. Okay, where's the four grand? It's right here. Oh, no, you don't. Let go of that gun. Try and double cross me with it. You... Oh, hi, Nick. Hello, Patsy. Good morning, Sergeant Matheson. Uh, Mr. Hughes, this is Nick Carter and Patsy Bowen. How do you do? Hello, Mr. Hughes. Well, thank goodness you're here at last. At last? Oh, Mr. Hughes, it's been exactly 17 minutes since Sergeant Matheson phoned and asked us to come down here to your office. I haven't even had my breakfast yet. What's this all about? Mr. Carter, my firm publishes children's and religious books. A notoriety, scandal, unfavorable publicity, anything like that can ruin us. Um, you see, Nick, there was a murder in the waterfront district last night. Cheap little two-bit crook named Whitey Gear was shot to death. We found this slip of paper on Whitey's body. What? Why, that looks like one of those slips of paper they have in phone booths for people to write phone numbers on. That's what it is, Patsy. Hmm. What's the connection, Matty? The phone number written on that paper is the number of the Hughes Publishing House. Oh, I see. Oh, hey, there's something else written here, too. Don Mason, 1 a.m., 1st Avenue and Water Street. Right. And Whitey was found dead at the corner of 1st and Water, shot to death about 1 a.m., according to the medical examiner. So Don Mason... Now, wait a minute. Is... Who is this Don Mason? Oh, that, Mr. Carter, is the crux of the whole thing. Don Mason is my sales manager, and he's engaged to my daughter. Oh, I see. And you think Mason kept the appointment with Whitey and murdered him, huh? Well, of course, don't you? I wouldn't know, Matty. This slip of paper with Mason's name on it certainly doesn't convince me. Well, I don't get you. From what you tell me, I doubt that Whitey was the kind of man who'd make a memorandum about anything. Oh, fooey. He did it this time, and that's all I care about, Nick. Maybe. Look, Matty, has anybody else handled this piece of paper except you and me? I know. I took it off the bottom myself. Why? Then let's put it in an envelope and see that no one else does touch it. Uh Uh-huh. Okay, if you want to. Uh, but there's another thing, Nick. Yeah? Why do was a skinny little runt, but from the looks of things, he must have put up a whale of a fight before he was killed. We found a couple of gray wool threads under his fingernails, like from a gray tweed coat. And Whitey's coat was brown. Oh. Then you think those threads came from the killer's coat during the struggle. Sure, Patsy. What else? Uh-huh. And uh, Mr. Hughes here tells me Don Mason wears a gray tweed coat. And so do lots of other people, Matty. You must understand, Mr. Carter... This company simply cannot afford to have one of its executives accused of murder. Now, I want you to prove that Don had nothing to do with this this whitey person. But what if he did have? Well, well, then we'll publicize the fact that Hughes Publishing hired the best detective it could get to see justice done, even though the culprit is one of our own executives. Now, that may help some. Well, how about it, Carter? Before I give you an answer, Mr. Hughes, I'd like to talk this over with Don Mason. He hasn't come down to the office yet, Nick. I was just waiting for you to get here before going over to his apartment after him. A good idea, Matty, except that he may leave for the office before we get to his place. Oh, I have an idea. Don shares an apartment with my star salesman, Chris Bentley. I could phone Chris down to keep Don there until you arrive. Yeah, I suppose you do that, Mr. Hughes. And unless he's got a mighty good alibi, that young fella's going to move to another apartment. A small one in the city jail. <laughs> Don. Don, uh, wake up. Oh, you're away. Wake up, you dope. Snap out of it. Uh, uh-huh. 
Oh, good morning, Chris. What's the matter? Old man Hughes just phoned that some people are coming to see you. He says to tell you to wait here until they arrive. Okay. Oh, I feel terrible. John, where were you last night? Huh? Get with it, Don. You, you didn't get in until after I went to bed, and that was three o'clock. Where were you? Well, I... What? Well, I don't know. I can't remember. Did you get the money from old man Hughes? Money. What money? The money to pay off that blackmailer. Did you get it? Good grief, Whitey. Yes, Whitey. Did you see him? I... I can't remember whether I did or not. You mean you had another one of those blackouts? I, I guess I must have. Now, let's see. I remember eating dinner here at the apartment with you. Yes, and afterwards I went out for a pack of cigarettes. But when I came back, you were gone. And so was that gun you keep in your dresser drawer. What? Oh, Chris, no. What did you do, Don? Why'd you take the gun? You, you, you've got to remember. Oh, I, I can't. I can't remember anything. I went all over town looking for you, but you just disappeared. Oh, from the way my head feels, I, I think I must have been in some bar, but, but I don't drink. Wait a minute. What are you doing? Looking for your gun. Yeah, here it is in the pocket of your top coat. And Don, three bullets have been fired from it. What do you mean, three bullets? It wasn't even loaded last time I saw it. Well, it is now. Don, are you sure you didn't meet that whitey oh, fella? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I can't remember. Hey, hey, maybe it's the police who are coming here. Maybe whitey turned me in. No, 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 get hold of yourself. We haven't much time. What are you doing now? I'm putting the gun on this little shelf over the door in the coat closet. Not much of a hiding place, but it'll have to do until we can get rid of it. Chris, I won't let you get mixed up in no, this. Don't be silly. Now, get this. You never even heard of this whitey person. You were here all last night. You never left the apartment, understand? Yeah, yeah. I never left the apartment. After dinner, you and I played gin rummy and listened to the radio until 3 a.m., and then we went to bed. You were here all last night. And I'll swear to it. <laughs> And you still say you didn't meet Whitey Gear at the corner of First and Water Streets last night, Mason? No, I never even heard of the guy, Sergeant. Then how come he had your name and phone number? I don't know. Can you prove where you were at one o'clock, Don? I was right here in the apartment. That's right, Mr. Carter. Don never stepped outside all last night. You'll swear to that? What? Well, sure I will. We played gin rummy until 3 a.m. Well, that sounds like a pretty good alibi, Sergeant. Yeah, if it holds up. Frankly, Don, you don't look as though you'd spent a quiet evening at home. I'd say you were suffering from a pretty bad hangover. Well, I... I Mason, I, Whitey Gear was killed with a thirty-eight revolver. You own such a gun? No. You own a gray tweed coat? Yeah. Why? Where is it? Oh, it's in the closet, but I... All right. Don! Uh, oh, darling, Daddy said you were in some kind of trouble. Don isn't in any trouble, Betty. No, honey, it, it's all right. Hey, wait a minute. Who's this? It's Betty Hughes, Don's fiancée. Say, hey, you're looking fine, Betty. That's a new hairdo, isn't it? Of course not, Chris. But what did Daddy mean I by... I guess it's just because I haven't seen you for so long. What are you talking about? You saw me only last night. But what was that? Chris came over to my house last night looking for Don. He said Don had disappeared and he thought... Uh, well... Don, something is wrong. Oh, you are in trouble, aren't you? You bet he is, Miss Hughes. So he was with you every minute last night, was he, Chris? Well, I, uh... Now, now look, Sergeant. I'll no... talk to you later. Get your hat, Don. I'm taking you in for the murder of Whitey Gear. Now, Matty, are you sure you have enough of a case to justify an arrest? You bet I have, Nick. Why would he frame a phony alibi if he wasn't guilty? Oh, Chris, if I'd only known... I tried to tip you off, Betty, but I guess I was pretty clumsy about it. You ready, Don? Yeah, I got my hat. And I got this! Oh, where'd you get that gun? Never mind. Just don't make me use it. Because if I do, somebody's gonna get hurt. Unmindful of the fact that his action is practically a confession of guilt, Don stands near the door, holding Nick, Matty, and the others at the point of his gun. In just a moment, we'll see what happens next. Now back to the case of the forgetful killer. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch cleanser. Holding Nick, Matty, and the others at the point of his gun... Don stands beside the door to the inner room of the two-room apartment he shares with Chris. Now, get into the bedroom. All of you. Let's do as he says, Matty. No use anyone getting shot. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Carter. I want to be sure nobody's going to... Oh, don't be too sure. Hey! Nick! 
Keep your hand away from your gun, Sergeant. Okay, okay. You hurt, Nick? No. Just got the wind knocked out of me. It went down through me. That was quite a stunt, Don. I, I was a commando in the war. Now, anyone else want to try any smart tricks before I leave? You're playing this awful dumb, kid. I'm playing it the only way I can. Now I'm going to lock this bedroom door. And then I'm getting out of here. And heaven help anyone who tries to follow me. So you both just stood there and let them walk out, did you? A fine pair of detectives you turned out to be. They didn't just stand there. As soon as they heard the outside door close, Nick and Sergeant Matheson were after him. Yeah, but by the time we got the door unlocked, he was out of sight. He left his wallet on the dresser, along with some small chains, keys, and so on. He won't get far without a cent in his pocket. Yeah, he left that gray tweed coat, too. I sent it down to the police lab. And if those threads under Whitey Gear's fingernails came from that coat... We'll know it in a couple of hours, Nick. Mm, that young scoundrel. When I think of all I did for him... What did you do for Don, Mr. Hughes? Why, well, I gave him a job, didn't I? He even promoted him to be sales manager when he wasn't in line for the job, simply because Betty was in love with him. Well, I guess she sees a mistake now. I doubt it. When a girl's in love... Oh, love, fiddlesticks. Before he came along, it was Chris. For him, somebody else. How long has Don worked for you? Ever since he came here from Toronto, 1942. He was just out of the Canadian Army. I thought I was being patriotic by helping a disabled veteran. Disabled? Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't anything disabled about the way he threw me clear across that room. It was, it was a head wound. That's why they discharged him from the Army. He used to have periods when he'd black out completely. He couldn't remember where he'd been or what he'd done for hours at a time, even days. That hasn't happened for a year or so now. Well, according to Chris, it happened last night. That's why Chris tried to give him an alibi. He said whatever Don did, he wasn't responsible. Oh, the guy's just getting ready for a plea of temporary insanity, Nick. But he won't get away with it. Maybe he will, Maddie. Unless you can prove a motive. I'll prove the motive. Don't you worry about that. Mm, it seems to me the first thing you've got to do is, is catch him. Yeah, well, I'll do that, too. Every cop in town is on the lookout for him. And five will get you ten. We have him rounded up inside of 24 hours. <laughs> Oh, Don, is that you? Yes. Are you alone? Yes. Oh, darling, where are you? Never mind. Betty, I need help. And I don't dare try to get in touch with Chris. The cops are sure to be watching the apartment. If there's anything I can do... There is. I've got to have some money so I can get out of town. A couple of hundred dollars. I'll get it. I'll bring it to you. No, no, I, I won't let you take any chances. Give the money to Chris. Tell him... I'll be waiting in the freight yards at the foot of 68th Street at midnight. Hey, Nick. Nick, we've got it. Got what, Matty? The only thing that was missing in this case. The motive. Look at this letter. Who's it from, Sergeant? From Whitey Gear, that's who. Whitey. Whitey. And let's see. Hey, you are. He was afraid Don might try to knock him off, so he left this with a friend to be mailed to the district attorney in case anything happened to him. <laughs> D.A. got it in the mail about an hour ago. What are those newspaper clippings, Nick? I don't know yet. A dated Portland, Oregon, 1939. It's all there. Even a picture of Don Mason. <laughs> His real name is Jimmy Burke, and he's wanted for murder. Murder? Yeah, Patsy. He was mixed up with a juvenile gang in Portland that robbed a warehouse and shot the night watchman. And Don was the one who killed him? That's what this clipping says. Oh. The gun that killed the watchman was positively identified as belonging to Don. He must have escaped into Canada and joined the army there under the name of Mason, huh? You wire Portland for confirmation, Matty? Sure, sure I did. No answer yet, Nick. Hey. Hmm? Look at the handwriting on this note that was with the clippings. What about it? Well, that's Whitey Gear's handwriting. At least his name is signed to it. So what? Well, it's nothing like the handwriting on that memo you found in his pocket. Why, Nick, you're right. Hey. Maybe Don wrote down the time and place he wanted to meet Whitey and then gave it to him. No, no, I don't think so, Matty. I have a hunch that memo was planted. Yeah? Well, the laboratory boys tested those gray threads under Whitey's fingernails, Nick. And they're definitely from Don Mason's coat. It's an airtight case. Yeah, sure. You seem to have everything except a prisoner. Uh, <clears throat> you haven't found any trace of Don yet, have you? No, no. He won't make a move until after dark. But like you said, he's got to have money. 
Probably he'll try to get it from Chris. And I've got all my men around that apartment. I don't think he'll go back to the apartment, Matty. What? My hunch is he'll try to contact Betty Hughes. Hey, maybe you're right. Well, I'll just plant some of the boys around the Hughes house, too. You won't have to, the... Matty. I phoned Walter McGlynn. He's watching the place now. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> then we got him, no matter which way he jumps. <laughs> I think I'll go on home, Nick. It's been a long day. Yeah, it's almost midnight. I know, but I wanted to stick around the office. Oh, hold it. Nick Carter speaking. Oh, Waldo. Huh? What? I see. Where'd she meet him? Betty met Don somewhere? No, she met Chris. Oh. Where? Why, that's the freight yard. Nick, what's happened? Good boy, Waldo. We'll get right on it. Nick, what is it? Betty just met Chris in a cafeteria on the east side and gave him a roll of bills. The getaway money for Don. That's what Waldo figured, so he trailed Chris out of the cafeteria and heard him tell a cab driver he wanted to go to the foot of 68th Street. So that's what you meant when you said the freight yards. Yeah. Chris just left a couple of minutes ago. We hurry, maybe we can get there first. Just ahead of us. I know it was. Yeah, I got a good look at him when he passed under the light. Where'd he go to? Maybe he went around the other side of this boxcar. We have a couple of hundred boxcars in this part of the yard. You can stop right where you are, Carter. Don! Thank heaven we found you, Don. I was afraid you'd... Save it. Chris? Yeah, Don? Get his gun. Okay. Now, wait a minute, Chris. You're in trouble already. You help him now, that's going to make you equally guilty. Well, what can I do, Mr. Carter? Don's making me do this at the point of a gun. Aren't you, Don? Sure I am. You got it? You bet. Don, listen to me. Don't be a fool. You give yourself up, I think I can prove your innocence. Innocence? But I, I'm not. I killed Whitey because he was blackmailing me. I must have. Do you remember killing him? Oh, no. I don't remember anything that happened last night, but I... I... don't think you did kill him, Don. In fact, I'm positive you didn't. Don't listen to him, Don. It's a trick. Look, Don, there's only one person who knew where and when you were going to meet Whitey. Only one person who could have drugged you. Drugged me? Yes, drugged you. That's why you thought you had a hangover this morning. So that's it. This person drugged you, then kept your appointment with Whitey wearing your gray tweed coat. Chris, it was you who... Okay, it... let's quit playing games. You drop met your gun, Whitey. Don. You met Whitey and you killed him. If you him. don't drop your gun, stupid, I'm going to use this gun I took from Carter. Okay. Now you're being sensible. But but I don't get it. You were my friend. I trust sure, you. Sure, I was your friend. I didn't mind a bit when you got the sales manager job I should have had. And I was tickled to death when you took my girl away from so me. So that's it. Sure. With you out of the way, I'll be the new sales manager. And I'll be the boss's son-in-law, too. Someday I'll own the whole business. You're going to have to work awfully fast to do all that before you go to the chair for killing Whitey, aren't you, Chris? Who's going to send me to the chair? Not any of you three. Because when Carter and Don get through fighting it out, I'm afraid there won't be any survivors. What are you talking about? It'll be easy, Carter. I've got your gun to shoot Don with, and then I'll take his gun to finish off you and Miss Bowen. Chris, Chris, you're crazy. The cops will think Carter tried to arrest you, and you shot it out. Why, that's ridiculous. Someone will hear the shot. That freight engine is going to pass on the other side of this boxcar in a few seconds. It'll make enough noise to cover anything, even gunshots. <laughs> With a passing freight engine to cover the sound of gunfire, Chris's finger tightens on the trigger. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Now for the conclusion of the case of the forgetful killer. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by new post-war Old Dutch Cleanser. In the freight yards at the foot of 68th Street, Chris Bentley is holding Nick, Patsy, and Don Mason at the point of a gun waiting only for the noise of an approaching engine to cover the sound of his shot before he fires. Here's the engine. So get ready. You first, Don, old pal. Nick, it's Sergeant Matheson. Unless you want me to point this Tommy gun lower the next time. About time you got here, Matty. I started as soon as I got your phone call, Nick. You're not going to take me in? Nick, he's getting away. Not so fast, chum. (laughs) There. That'll hold you for a while. Good work, Don. Holy mackerel, Don. What did you do to it? Didn't you recognize that stunt, Matty? It's the same one he used on me. And I can tell you from experience that Chris isn't going to do any more running away. Not for a minute or two. I can't thank you.
thank you enough for what you did, Nick. But, well, I guess it wasn't much use. They'll only send me back to Oregon to stand trial for for the killing that night, killing the night watchman back in 39. Oh, no, they won't, Don. Sergeant Matheson wired the Oregon police about you, and they wired back that the charge had been dropped. That's right, uh, Don. About a year later, the real killer was caught, and he confessed. For the love of Pete. You were completely cleared. But if Chris wanted to get rid of me, why did he kill Whitey to do it? Well, for all he knew, he only had to sit tight and let Whitey turn me in. He said you were going to Mr. Hughes for the money, and he was afraid you might get it. And he couldn't turn you in himself because you wouldn't tell him what Whitey had on you, or even what your real name was. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But even after he killed Whitey to make sure the D.A. got that letter, Chris tried to give me an alibi. Oh, it just doesn't make sense. Well, that was only a part of his scheme to put himself in a good light with Betty Hughes. He knew that alibi wouldn't stand up. In fact, he made sure it wouldn't stand up by going to a dozen places looking for you. He knew someone would remember that he'd said you disappeared and couldn't be found. And to think you figured the whole thing out from that piece of paper with my name on it. And the time and the place where I was supposed to meet Whitey. Oh, just a minute, Don. That's not quite true. That slip of paper looked a bit phony to me, but that was all. When Chris tried to incriminate you by putting that piece of paper in Whitey's pocket, he was actually furnishing the evidence that was going to convict him. What? Well, well, how do you mean? He forgot a very important thing. Fingerprints. Fingerprints? Yes. Whitey's fingerprints weren't on that paper. So obviously he couldn't have written it. But Chris's fingerprints were all over it. Wow. He did forget something important, didn't he? Uh Uh-huh. But, uh, say, Nick, you didn't know about those things until an hour ago. Mm -hmm. Why were you so sure Don was innocent? I became convinced the minute he threw me across the room at his apartment. What'd that have to do with it? Well, Whitey was a scrawny little fellow. Yet, Matty said he put up quite a fight before he was killed. Oh, 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 I see what you mean. If Don could put you flat on your back in two seconds, a little guy like Whitey would have been licked before he started. Right, Patsy. Well, this is the first time in my memory that a man has made a friend of me by knocking me down. How about the adventure new post-war old Dutch cleanser is going to bring us next week, Nick? Well, Ralph, it's about a young fellow who wanted to buy his wife a diamond ring and almost bought himself a one-way ticket to the electric chair instead. And he completely ruined my new look, not to mention almost giving me pneumonia. Well, that was my fault. You see, Ralph, the only way I could keep Patsy from being shot was by pouring cold water on her. (laughs) Sounds as though you had a rough time, Patsy. (laughs) Oh, I did. Uh, What do you call this adventure, Nick? I call it the case of the clue called X. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons. Original music is played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Ralph Camargo saying, when minutes count, use new post-war old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting... Stand by for Nick Carter, Master Detective. The Mutual Broadcasting System presents Nick Carter in another of his famous and exciting adventures, starring Lon Clark. The case of the perfect alibi. Patsy, what's the idea of phoning me here? What's up? Well, I... I, Nick, you've got to come to the hotel right away. Room 411. And bring that box with you. Oh, why, Patsy? What's the matter? I I can't tell you, but, but don't say anything to Chief Brody. If you do, they'll... I mean... Patsy, something's wrong. What is it? No, nothing's wrong. Only... Don't come, Nick! They're going to... Patsy! Patsy! Now, Nick Carter, Master Detective, and the case of the perfect alibi. It is midnight in the little upstate resort town of Lake Hillman. Chief Brody of the local police stands beside a flashy, expensive sedan. Behind the wheel is a dark, heavy set man wearing a huge diamond on his left hand. His face disfigured by a jacket scar. So I run through a red light. So what? So you get a ticket, mister. Let's see your driver's license and the car registration. 
Sure. You fellas think you can come up here from the city and do just about anything you want. I aim to show you different. Here. Huh? Oh, the license. Give me it. Robert J. Hey, you ain't one of the Crane brothers that's mixed up in all them rackets down the city, are you? Am I? Sure you are. Remember last year when that brother of yours got sent to the electric chair for killing an officer? From what I hear, this fellow Winston's going to get you and the other one before long, too. Yeah? Yes, and good riddance, I say. You take my advice, mister, you'll get out of this town fast. As soon as you've paid, you're fine. We don't want your kind around here. Nice and cozy, ain't it, Mr. Winston? Just you and me alone here in your apartment where we can talk without nobody to bother us, huh? I'm not afraid of that gun, Crane. And I'm not afraid of you. Now say what you came to say and get out. Sure, sure, but not for a while yet. (laughs) This ain't much of a dump for a big shot like you to live in. The DA's office don't pay the special prosecutors so good, huh? I'm satisfied. You like working for glory, huh? I'm working for the satisfaction of wiping out such scum as you, Crane. Murderers and racketeers. Yeah, yeah, and making a big name for yourself, too. You and your big campaign to clean up the town. Crane, if you weren't scared, you wouldn't have come here tonight. But it won't do you any good. I'll get you and the rest of your mob, just as I got that gun-crazy kid brother of yours. That's what I come to talk about, Mr. Winston, my brother Johnny. He was a killer, and he got what he deserved, the chair. Yeah, you sent Johnny to the chair just one year ago tonight, just at midnight. Now, do you know why I'm here? No. Why? It's one minute to midnight now, Mr. Winston. And when that clock starts to strike, I'm going to send you the same place you sent my kid brother. You can't bluff me. Why, every cop in town... Cops? You know what I think of cops? I'll show you. Pick up that phone if you want to. Go on, call the cops. See if they can help you. What is this, a trick? Go on, call them. All right, I will. Operator, give me the police, quick. (laughs) It's midnight, Mr. Winston. Hello, this is Special Prosecutor Winston... Send... Uh, Rocky... So long, Mr. Winston. Say hello to Johnny for me. Hello. Hello, this is Sergeant Matheson, Homicide. Sent out a call for Rocky Crane. Suspicion of murder. Send a couple of boys to every one of those gambling houses he owns. And send a couple to his apartment. Notify the radio cars to watch out for a 1949 Cadillac sedan. Light gray and loaded down with chromium. License number six. Yeah? Oh. Oh, yeah, Dolan. He... He's spending the weekend where? Lake Kilman, huh? Okay. I'll get in touch with the Lake Hillman police and have them bring him in. Look, Sarge, what's the idea of dragging me back to town in the middle of the night? Take a look out the window, Rocky. It's morning now. The sun's coming up. So what? What's the beef, Sarge? You were picked up just as you got out of your car in front of the Lake Hillman Hotel at exactly 13 minutes to 2. That's right. Where had you been? Just out for a little ride. Why? I'll say you'd been out for a ride. You rode back here to the city. Bumped off Leonard Winston from the DA's office. You and mean then you... somebody knocked off Mr. Winston? Well, now, ain't that too bad? It's too bad for you, smart guy. You hated Winston because he sent your brother to the chair. You swore you're getting for it. Did I, sir? Yes, you did. Well, you know how it is. And Winston was making things hot for you now, too. Another month, he'd have closed up every one of those gambling houses of yours and run you out of town. He couldn't have proved nothing on me. Sure, I'm glad he's dead, but I didn't do it. Look, you can't lie out of this one, Rocky. Winston called headquarters just before he was killed. He started to say your name. But, Sarge, I wasn't anywhere near the city last night. Oh, no? (laughs) You're going to have a tough time making a jury believe that. Why, Sarge, it ain't going to be tough at all. What? Take a look at this. Take a... What is it? It's a ticket for running through a red light in Lake Hillman, 150 miles from here, Sarge. 
And look at the time on it. Twelve o'clock midnight. Twelve... Midnight? What? Why, that's the same time Winston was killed. Yeah, I know, I know. And that traffic ticket proves I was 150 miles away when it happened. Now, try to break that alibi, copper. Just try it. <laughs> oh, I had to turn him loose, Nick. There wasn't anything else I could do. I suppose you checked with the Lake Hillman officer who gave him the ticket, Matty. Why, of course I did. It was the chief of police himself. Well, hmm. The chief of police was directing traffic? Yeah, Patsy, you know how it is in those small towns... They've only got three men on the force, and on Saturday night, all of them have to turn out to take care of the traffic. You're sure he isn't mistaken about who was in Rocky's car? Nick, he swears it was Rocky. He described him to me. Then I showed him pictures of Rocky, and he swears it's the same guy. Well, just what you want me to do? Nick, look, I got to crack this case, and I got to have help. I'll bet anything Rocky Crane bumped off Winston, no matter what kind of an alibi he's got. Well, I suppose the biggest clue you've got is the fact that Winston tried to speak his name when he called headquarters. But, Patsy, we don't know that he was going to accuse Rocky of shooting him. Well, maybe not, Nick, but here is the clincher. Rocky knew that Winston was bumped off at midnight. Now, how did he know it unless he did the job himself? I sure didn't tell him. But, Matty, that's not proof that you can take before a jury. Oh, I know, Nick, I know. But somehow, some way, we've got to get that proof. Uh, Sergeant, do you think Chief Brody could be lying? I don't know, Patsy. I'd hate to think it, but... Well, then let's not think it until we've exhausted every other possibility. How about Rocky's brother, Red? Didn't you say he was at Lake Hillman, too? Yeah, Nick, Why, what... Nick, Red's just as bad as Rocky. And he'd have had the same motive Rocky did for killing Winston. I'll bet You'll he... forget, Patsy. Huh? It was Rocky's name Winston tried to say on the phone. Yeah, and besides that, Red's got a better alibi than Rocky has. He is seen in the Lake Hillman Hotel about 11 o'clock and again at 12.30. Positive identification. Then, then maybe Red was driving Rocky's car when Chief Brody gave him the ticket. Look, Patsy, what? Rocky was driving his own car when Brody picked him up just before 2 o'clock. Oh. Okay, I give up. Well, just the same, Matty. A man can't be two places at the same time. Either you're wrong about Rocky's but being But I'm killed. not wrong, Nick. I'll stake my life on it. All right, then. Something's wrong at the other end. Suppose Patsy and I drive up to Lake Hillman and try to find out what it is. Even if we learn nothing, I'll enjoy a drive out in the country with an attractive girl. And Patsy, you're particularly attractive today in that new lavender dress. <laughs> Rocky, jeepers, I'm glad to see you. I was afraid something had gone wrong. No, no, they turned me loose about 2 o'clock this afternoon. Well, then where have you been all this time? It's after 10 now. I went around to the club for a while. Get your stuff together, Red. I want to pick up the old man. Well, and... Don't worry about him. I took care of that little matter myself this morning. You what? Sure. After the cops picked you up, this town was buzzing. I thought if the old boy heard anything, he started putting two and two together. You when... thought, since one of you got brains enough to think... I said we'd dump him on the way back to the city, didn't I? Yeah, but suppose he'd have got wise. Suppose he'd have gone to the cops. Yeah, yeah, maybe you were right at that. Yeah, sure I was. So had to meet me out at the edge of town, Never see? Never mind the blueprint. What about his stuff? His stuff? Yeah, his clothes and things. I guess they're still over at that crummy boarding house where he was staying. Why? Ed, you mean you didn't have him take all his stuff with him when he left? No. Why make him think something was up? Oh, you dumb ox, you stupid, fat-headed jerk. Uh, take it easy, Rocky. What's it got there anyway? A couple of shirts, an extra pair of socks, maybe. And the box, the box, bird brain. Oh, gee, Rocky. I forgot about that. If the cops ever find that box and hook the old man up with us, we're sunk. I might have known you'd louse things up for me. I, I can get it back, Rocky. I, I can go over there right now. Then See, get I'm... moving. And listen, Red. Yeah. Get everything else that belonged to him. Everything. Let him think he skipped his room right and beat it. But don't let nobody see uh, you. They ain't going to see me. If they do... If they I... do, just make sure they don't talk about it. Make sure they don't never talk about that or anything else. <laughs> I'm glad you're still in your office, Chief Brody. I was afraid I'd miss you. Well, you're just lucky, Mr. Carter. Comes half past 11 at night. I'm generally home in bed. What's on your mind? As Sergeant Matheson tells me, you positively identified Rocky Crane as the man you gave a ticket to at midnight last night. That's right, Carter. But, Chief, the sergeant is just as positive that Rocky Crane killed Winston. Not at midnight last night, he didn't. 
What makes the sergeant so sure it had to be Rocky? Well, Chief, the motive was revenge. Winston was killed exactly one year to the minute after Rocky's brother went to the electric chair for murdering a police officer. What about it? Well, don't you see? If it was revenge, Rocky would want to do it himself. And Maddie swears that Winston even tried to give the police Rocky's name. Well, look here, Carter. I hate crooks and killers as much as anybody. But at midnight last night, Rocky Crane was here in Lake Hillman. I saw him. I gave him a ticket for passing the red light at the corner of Main and Elm Streets. And he passed that light precisely at 12 o'clock? That's what I said. Uh, I can't help feeling that somehow he's using you for an alibi. Well, if he is, I've got to give him that alibi. I've got no choice. Come in. Oh, Mr. Brody, I didn't know you were busy, but I was passing the courthouse and I saw the light in your office. Well, for Pete's sake, Emily Dawson. What are you doing out at this time of night? And all dressed up like it was Halloween. Oh, I'm just coming home from the junior class play. We gave Romeo and Juliet. I was the old nurse. You should have seen me. Alas, alas, my lady's dead. Oh, well, a day. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I remember now. I meant to get to the play myself, but I've been so busy. And Miss Bowen, Mr. Carter, this is Emily Dawson. Oh, Hattie, Hello, dear. Emily. I'm worried about Mr. Worthington. I well, thought who's that Mr. Maybe... Worthington? Well, he's one of our boarders. The only one we've got this weekend, and I haven't seen him since right after breakfast. Well, after all, Emily, it's not quite 11.30 yet. Maybe he went to a movie or even to your play. Oh, but he didn't. He promised faithfully he'd come to the play, but he wasn't there, and he never goes to the movies. He told me so. Well, I still wouldn't worry, Emily. Just because a grown man isn't home by 11.30... Oh, something's the... happened. I'll bet he's been hit by a car and he's lying in a ditch somewhere. His poor, sightless eyes staring up at the cold blue oh, sky. Oh, Emily, stop acting. The show's over. <sighs> He hasn't been home all day, not even for dinner. Well, there's still no reason and he to... he promised th- faithfully to come to the play tonight. Now, look, Emily, Mr. Carter and me have got important things to talk about. Now, you run along home, forget about it. If you won't do anything, I will. Well, what can you do? I'm going to telephone the Crystal Club in the city and ask them to notify his folks. The Crystal Club? Yes, it's, it's a kind of a residential hotel, Mr. Carter. He told me that he... The always... Crystal Club isn't a residential hotel. It's a gambling house. Oh, no. Not only a gambling house, it's one of a chain that belongs to the Crane Brothers. The Crane Brothers? He caught her. I'd like to know why he's up here in Lake Hillman at this particular time. If you think Mr. Worthington is a gambler, you're wrong. He's an actor. An actor? Well, he used to be. After we got to be friends, he showed me a scrapbook. Why, well, he's played just about every kind of a part there is, I guess. Now, wait a minute. Miss Dawson, are you sure that Mr. Worthington didn't just pack up and skip out this morning? Of course I'm sure. Well, I looked in his room after supper. Maybe he's come back home while you've been down here. Well, when Mom is there, you could phone her and ask. We'll do better than that, Miss Dawson. We'll go and see for ourselves. <laughs> Thanks for calling me up, Susan. I'll tell Emily how much you enjoyed the play. No, I'm all alone in the house now, but I expect her any minute. She was worried about our new boarder. And... Huh? Oh, nothing important. You know how excitable Emily is. Yes, I'll tell you about it tomorrow. Bye, Susan. I wonder if I should have waited and come home with Emily. She may have run. What's that? Well, that must be Mr. Worthington. Mr. Worthington! That's funny. I better go see if he's all right. I'm sure that noise came from his room. Are you in your room, Mr. Worthington? Mr. Worthington, you're not sick, are you? Mr. Wor... The doctor says your mother's going to be all right. Then why is she still unconscious? She has a slight concussion from that blow on the head, Emily. In a few days, she'll be as good as ever. But why would anyone want to hurt Mama? I'm afraid we'll have to blame your friend, Mr. Worthington, Emily. Mr. Worthington? I don't believe it. Oh, but don't you see, darling? He had some connection with those racketeers. But he's such a nice old man. Oh, Patsy, I'm more inclined to think that it was someone else. Hmm? Someone who came here for his belongings. One of the Crane brothers? Maybe. What? And when Mrs. Dawson walked into the room, he socked her and got away. Then Worthington must have had something in his room that would incriminate them, some some piece of evidence. Well, if he did, it's not there now. Everything that belonged to him is gone. Well, everything that was in the room is gone. What? I have his makeup box. You do? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Worthington was just wonderful with makeup, and he promised he'd fix me up to look like an old lady for the class play tonight, but he didn't come home, so I... 
Well, I went up to his room and got it. Well, where is it, Emily? Right over here on the mantel. Oh, I wouldn't have kept it or anything like that. I just wanted to... Let me see the box, please. Oh, yes, sir. I know Mr. Worthington wouldn't have minded my using it. He told me that any... don't worry, Emily. I'm not blaming you for the box. I'm glad you did. Now, let's see what's in here. Looks just like every other makeup box, doesn't it? A lot of old, dirty sticks of grease paint. Yes, but everything isn't old, Patsy. Here's a brand new bottle of collodion and a new bottle of spirit gum. Oh, the spirit gum is what they use for sticking on false beards. False mustaches, too. And collodion makes an excellent artificial scar. An artificial scar? Then maybe it wasn't Rocky that Chief Brody gave the traffic ticket to after all. Maybe it was Mr. Worthington, made up to look like him. It could be. With only a dim light from the dashboard on his face, it wouldn't be hard to get away with a disguise. No. Emily, tell me. Is Mr. Worthington a heavy set man with a deep voice? Oh, no. No, Mr. Carter. He's little and skinny. He's got a high, sort of oh, cracked sounding voice. A man like that could never impersonate Rocky Crane, not with all the makeup in the world. No, but I know who could. You do? Patsy, get us a couple of rooms at the hotel. We won't be going back to the city tonight. All right, Nick, but what are we staying here for? I'm going back to see Chief Brody. I've got a nice new idea I want to test out. Hi, you dumb jerk. The one thing you should have gotten is the one thing you leave there. Oh, I tell you, Rocky, that box wasn't in his room. Then why didn't you search the rest of the house? I would have. But right after I slugged the old lady, I heard Carter and the two dames coming in. I had to beat it out the window. And Carter did find the box, you're sure of that? I told you, didn't I? I hung around outside to see what was going to happen. After about an hour, Carter came out with the box under his arm. I seen it plain under the street light. Okay, okay, so he's got the box. So maybe he'll even figure out how we worked it, but that still ain't proof, Red. Sure, sure it ain't, Rocky. That dumb police chief swore he was giving me a ticket at midnight, and a smart lawyer can tie him in knots if he tries to take it back in spite of what... Hey, wait a minute. Huh? What, Rocky? You didn't touch none of that stuff in the box, did you? There ain't nothing there that might have your fingerprints on it, is there? Well, I... Come on, come on. Did you touch anything or didn't you? Well, the old man had to make me up in the car, and I... A couple of times I had to hold things for him. You while... stupid idiot! Oh, Rocky, what's the matter? What's the idea of socking me like that? You know this? what you've done? You give them everything they want. You give them all the proof they need to send us both to the chair. Oh, we get the box back. How can we... we get it back? Tell me that, genius. Well, well, I. Hey, that girl that works for Carter. What about her? She's right here in this hotel. She was at the desk signing up for a room when I come in. Look, we. Hold it, we can... hold it, hold it. Maybe you got something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just might work. It's got to. Yeah, you see? I ain't always so dumb. Get on that phone, Red. Find out what room she's in. Sure, sure, Rocky. Then what, huh? Never mind. You get a room number. I'll take care of the rest. Yes, Carty, it was kind of dark inside that car when I gave Rocky that ticket. Then but... it could have been Red Crane made up to look like Rocky, couldn't it? The difference in height wouldn't show with him sitting behind the wheel. And they both have the same type of face, big and beefy. Yes, I guess it could have been if he had some kind of black dye on that red hair of Not his. dye. Mascara. Oh. Something that he could wash out quickly. And there's a big cake of mascara on this makeup box. And it's almost used up. Yes, and with paint on his face to give him a dark complexion like Rocky's, and a false mustache, and, and that scar painted on with uh, whatever it is. Claudian. <laughs> Professional actors use it all the time. All right, so maybe it could have been red instead of Rocky. But you don't have any proof that it was. Not a bit of proof. That's why we have to find Worthington's body. If we can't prove that Rocky murdered Winston, perhaps we can prove that Red killed Worthington and that Rocky was an accessory. What makes you so sure anybody killed the old man? Well, why else would he have disappeared without taking his things with him? And besides, he's the only one who could tell what really happened. The Crane boys would never be safe while Worthington was alive. Yes, yes, I see what you mean. But without having any idea where to look for him, it's going to be pretty hard finding the body. No, I don't think so. If they wanted us to think Worthington had run out, they'd hide the body where it wouldn't be likely to be found. Well, sure, There can't but... be too many places like that near here. No, I guess there ain't. But I can't do anything tonight. It's almost 2 a.m. Well, all right. Morning will be all right. But get every man you can on the job. The sooner we get up... Oh, for the love of Pete, what now? I want to get home, get to bed. 
Lake Hillman Police Station, Chief Brody speaking. Chief, this is this is Patsy Bowen. Oh, hello, Miss Bowen. May I? Is Nick there? In just a minute. For you, Carter. Oh, oh, thanks. Yes, Patsy. What's up? Nick, I. You've got to come to the hotel right away, room four eleven, and bring that makeup box with you. Oh, well, why, Patsy? What's the matter? I, I I can't tell you, but don't say anything to Chief Brody. If you do, they'll. Hey, Patsy, I something's mean... wrong. What is it? What is it? Nothing's wrong, but. Don't come, Nick. Patsy, no! Patsy, what? what's wrong, Carter? You're pale as a ghost. I don't know what's wrong. Let me have that makeup box. Well, sure, but what for? I'm taking it over to the hotel, to room 411. Come in, Carter. What's the score, Rocky? Where's Patsy? Sit down, Carter. Put your gun away. I've got one, too, you'll notice. What have you done with her? Nothing yet. And she ain't here in the hotel, so don't get any ideas. Where is she? I told you to sit down in that chair right across the table from you me. You hurt her, I'll see I her. haven't. She's with Red. If you do what I tell you to, I'll get him on the phone, and he'll have her back here in five minutes. Now sit down. Okay. But I'm keeping my gun pointed right at your belt. So what? You won't use it. Because if something happens to me, I can't make that phone call. It'll be too bad for the little lady. What do you want? I want that makeup box under your arm. I let you have it? You let Patsy go? Right away? Yeah, sure, sure. Now hand over that box and put away that gun. And leave you sitting there with a gun pointed at me? Oh, no. The way things are now, we're even. I've got you covered and you've got me covered. But I got an ace in the hole, don't forget. Your girlfriend. If I don't make that phone call in the next 15 minutes, Red... You're going to make that call, Rocky. I'm betting my life and Patsy's life that you're afraid to shoot it out. You lose that bet, wise guy. I just as soon die this way as in the chair, and if I do, you go with me. Not if I shoot first. Even if you shoot first. Look at the way I'm holding this rod, propped against the table lamp, pointed straight at you. I've already pulled the trigger, Carter. The only thing that's keeping the hammer from falling is my thumb. So what? So if you shoot me, my thumb lets go of the hammer and you get a bullet. Not only that, the girl will too. Red's got his orders. Doesn't look as though I have much choice, does it? No, Carter. I'm holding all the aces. But I'm holding the Joker, Rocky. Hey, you dirty... Keep away from that gun, Rocky. I hear you shot me. No, I I entered the gun itself. Your hand's only numb from the shot. Well, how? What? It's one bet you overlooked. Your gun was propped up and pointed at me, but my bullet knocked it aside and spoiled your ring. Okay, but Red still got the girl. You're forgetting that. I'm not forgetting anything. You're going to get on that phone and call Red. Ah, oh, no, I ain't. You'd rather have me break your arm? I ain't making any call. Let her die. Let no mercy. No, no, stop. Are you going to make that call? Yeah, yeah. But let up on my arm. All right, over here to the phone. You better make it sound convincing. Oh, my arm. Just a reminder. Now go ahead. I remember one wrong word. I now. won't try nothing. Okay. Take up that phone. The hello, desk. Give me room 619. No, you were lying. She is here in the hotel. Yeah, Red's Save room, your man. breath for Red. Hello, hello, Red. It's Rocky. Yeah, everything's fine. I got it. You can let her go now. Don't argue with me. Do what I tell you. Tell him to come here. Alone. Red. Get yourself over to my room fast. But let the dame go first. Yeah, right. But make it fast. Now let go of my arm. Sure, Rocky. I'm through with you for now. No. Now we have to get a reception arranged for your brother. When he arrives. Uh, Nick, did they find Mr. Worthington's body? Oh, yes, Matty. It was in the old stone quarry under 20 feet of water, weighted down with scrap iron. Yeah, but have you really got any proof that Red killed him? Plenty. Ballistics can prove that he was shot with Red's revolver. Oh, then I suppose Rocky will be convicted, too, as an accessory. So it doesn't matter whether or not you ever prove that he murdered Winston. Probably. Huh. But I think we can prove it. Yeah, Nick? How? Red's fingerprints were on two of the sticks of grease paint in Worthington's makeup box. Those fingerprints are evidence that Worthington did a makeup job on Red. Uh-huh. Well, after that, it won't be hard to convince a jury that Rocky's alibi isn't worth a nickel. I wonder how they ever thought up such an idea. Well, Worthington was out of work, was broke. Yeah. So he took a job as porter at the Crystal Club. Red found out he was an actor, and that started him thinking that 
Worthington's skill with makeup could be used to furnish Rocky with a perfect alibi. Uh, and the old man didn't even know he was mixed up in a murder plot? No, he was completely innocent. They told him they were going to play a practical joke on some friends of theirs. Well, just how did they work it, Nick? Well, the scheme worked like this, Matty. Rocky took Red's car, drove to the city, and killed Winston. Hmm. In the meantime, Red picked up Rocky's car, met Worthington, got made up to look like Rocky, then intentionally ran through that red light and got a ticket. Well, one thing I can't understand is why Rocky allowed Winston to call the police just before he shot him. Well, that was part of his alibi. Rocky wanted the police to know the exact time Winston was murdered, because that was the exact time Red, disguised as Rocky, was getting the traffic ticket. Yeah, but he even let Winston call out his name. Well, that was something Rocky didn't figure on. As soon as Winston identified himself, Rocky shot him. But Winston still had enough strength left to try to identify his killer. He was a brave man. Wish I could be like that. But, you know, when I opened the door to my room and saw Red standing there with a gun, I, I just froze. I was scared to death. Well, you weren't the only one, Patsy. I had cold chills, wondering if I was going to be in time to save you. Well, at least all this may give Emily Dawson an idea for the next high school play. Yeah? What's that? Another one of Mr. Shakespeare's little masterpieces. The one called All's Well That Ends Well. No, thanks, Laura. Not tonight. Okay, bye. Who was that, Patsy? Uh, Laura Bruce. She wanted me to go to a seance with her. Can mm. you imagine me going to a seance? Oh, why not? Spirit mediums can do wonderful things sometimes. Remember Madame Janer? Oh, that one. You'll have to admit that she told her clients things nobody in the world could possibly have known, except a ghost. Oh, she certainly did. But the way she found out those things ugh, makes me shiver. Well, save your shivers for next week, Patsy, when we tell all about Madame Janer and the case of the custom-made corpse. <laughs> Nick Carter, Master Detective, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick. Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Others in the cast were Brian Rayburn, Ken Lynch, Maurice Tarplin, and Cameron Prudhoff. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons with original music played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is Phil Tonkin inviting you to be with us next week at this same time for the case of the custom-made corpse. Another adventure with Nick Carter, Master Detective. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. New wonderful old Dutch cleanser, the only cleanser made with activated seismotite, invites you to stand by for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's Nick Carter adventure starring Lon Clark, The Case of the Vanishing Weapon. I, Dorothy, take thee, Wayne, to my lawful wedded husband, to love, honor, and cherish. Darling, please, let's move back from the edge. High places always frighten me, and I... Wayne, no, don't, Wayne, don't! Ah! I, Emily, take thee, Wayne, to my low for wedded husband, to love, honor, and... Don't keep swimming away from me, Wayne, help me. You know I can't swim, please, please. <laughs> Now, Nick Carter and the case of the vanishing weapon, brought to you by new, wonderful old Dutch cleanser. It's 4.20 in the afternoon of an extremely warm day. Driving back to the city, Nick and Patsy meet a car rushing toward them at top speed on the left side of the road. Get over, you idiot! Nick, it's a woman. She's going to hit us. Oh! oh. oh. Nick, she ran right into us. 
We couldn't get out of her way because of that fence. But at least we avoided a head-on collision. Oh. She only struck the back end of the car. Well, I wonder if she's hurt. Now, come on, let's see. Yeah. Oh, Nick, she caromed off your car right smack into that tree. She must have been ill. I saw her just before we crashed. Slumped over the wheel. There she is. Oh, Nick, she was thrown to the windshield. Yeah. She's in pretty bad shape. Oh. Seems to be conscious, though. I can't die. Can you hear me? I can't. You're not going to die. You're going to be all right. He'll marry again. He'll, he'll kill his next wife, too. What did you say? For the insurance. I know. I, I found out too late. I can't die. If I do, he'll do it again. He'll marry again. again. Oh, please don't think about it now. She's dead. Oh. Nick, Nick, she wasn't delirious. She knew what she was saying. Do you think her husband really killed her? I don't know, Patsy. But I'm going to make it my business to find out. In just a moment, we'll return to The Case of the Vanishing Weapon, today's adventure with Nick Carter. Yours, a thrilling new cleaning discovery. Yes, to give you faster, easier cleaning than any other cleanser, we've activated Seismatite in Old Dutch Cleanser. When there's a sink to clean, a touch of Old Dutch Cleanser works dazzling magic. Just see new sudsing Old Dutch Cleanser go to work. It dissolves grease on contact. Quickly, easily, its sudsing action sweeps away dirt and stains. Snowy white Old Dutch Cleanser cleans fast, safe, sure. Leaves no gritty sediment. Rinses away completely. Doesn't clog drains. Get two cans of Old Dutch Cleanser. One for the kitchen, one for the bathroom. Old Dutch Cleanser, the only cleanser made with activated seismatite. Now, back to The Case of the Vanishing Weapon. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new, wonderful old Dutch cleanser. It is a short time later. Nick and Patsy are talking with the chief of police of Elm City, the town the dead woman lived in. Well, that's the story, chief. I've given you her exact words. Mm. Oh, I've known Kay Bolton since she was a little girl. Well, do you know her husband, too? Sure. He came here from out west someplace, I understand. They've been married long? About a year, I guess. I see. Kay was a widow with a good farm, a little money in the bank. I guess Bolton knowed a good thing when he seen it, and he just swept her right off her feet. Uh, what did her family think about it? She don't have no family except her brother, and he was away at the time. You see, he builds bridges. I see. Hey, Chief, did you notice that the windows in Mrs. Bolton's car were all shut up tight? A day like this, it must have been sweltering in there. Yeah, it would be. Well, Kay had hay fever kind of bad. I heard her say many times she'd rather roast than sneeze her head off from the pollen in the air. Yes, but that's no reason to have the heater on. The, the heater? Yeah. When I examined the wreck, I noticed that the heater was on full blast. Uh, Nick, you said she was slumped over the wheel as though she were unconscious just before the collision. Yeah. Maybe she passed out from the heat. Well, now, that don't make sense, Miss Bowen. If it was that bad, seems like even Kay would stop and cool off. Hay fever, no. I would think she would. But suppose she were unconscious from carbon monoxide fumes or something. Huh? You mean Bolton might have done something to the exhaust pipe so them fumes go inside? Maybe. But she wasn't unconscious when you got to her? No. But the shock of the wreck could have snapped her out of it. Well... Look, Chief, suppose we don't say anything about our suspicions until after we talk to her husband. Yeah. Yeah, and let him think he's put it over on us, huh? And I'll have the autopsy performed as soon as we get back to town. Yeah, but you'll need the husband's permission, won't you? And he'll never give it if he's guilty. Uh, you've got something there, Miss Bowen. Well, nevertheless, let's try it anyway. Maybe we can learn something from his reaction when we suggest that autopsy. <laughs> An autopsy? Nothing doing. Kay suffered enough already. Just a minute, Bolton. Kay was my sister as well as your wife. And if the chief thinks an autopsy would serve any useful purpose, I'm in favor of but it. But what useful purpose? An autopsy would show whether there was anything in her system that would make her unconscious, what Mr. Bolton. What difference does it make? She's dead. Autopsy won't bring her back. Did she have any insurance, Mr. Bolton? I... Yes, we had a joint policy for $20,000 payable to the survivor. Mm. And this farm, who gets that? Well, I... I don't know. We never discussed it. Well, you get it, Bolton. Huh? Kay wrote me she'd made a new will after she married you, leaving you everything. I didn't know. 
Well, there won't be any autopsy, and that's final. As Kay's brother, I have something to say about that. And if there's any suspicion that her death wasn't accidental... You have any reason to think that, Mr. McEwen? Well, why else would you want an autopsy? And why would you want to know who benefits by her death? If there's any doubt, I want it cleared up. And you should too, Bolton. Well, I... I do, Mac, of course, but... Well, then just sign this paper, giving your consent. I... Well, uh, very well. Give it here. There you are. Mr. Bolton, I, I don't like to butt in, but I can't find the housekeeper well, no she place. went to her room, Sam. She's all upset. Oh. Well, Mr. Mac, that five gallons of ice cream Mr. Bolton got for the party tomorrow, she didn't put in the deep freeze and it's all melted. I was ah, wondering... throw it out. Do anything you want with it. Only get out of here and go back to your work. Oh, yes, sir. Who's that, Chief? That's Sam Webb, the hired hand. Hmm. Hey, what you doing here, Chief? Ain't nothing wrong, is there? Yes, Sam. It's Mrs. Bolton. She's dead. No. Wrecked the car, did she? What makes you think that? Huh? Uh, why, uh, uh, just the first thing that popped into my head, I guess. Besides, I, I thought she wasn't in no condition to drive when she came out to the barn and drove off. What? You mean she was ill? Oh, no, ma'am. She was mad. Blazing mad, if you ask me. Folks can't keep their mind on their driving when they're like that. What were you doing in the barn? I thought I told you to mend that fence at the bottom of the west pasture. Well, I I finished up early, Mr. Bolton. So I, I thought I'd clean out the stalls and, and do some repairing. I, I was there when you come in. Sam, did Mrs. Bolton tell you what she was angry about? No, sir, but she was good and mad. Oh, it wasn't anything, Mr. Carter. Uh, Bolton was late getting back with the car, and Kay had an appointment in Elm City. She was mad because she was going to be late. I couldn't help being late. I was delayed. Oh, uh, was there a quarrel, Mr. Bolton? Of course not. Kay was always flying off the handle, but it didn't mean anything. I sent Mac out to the car for the rest of the supplies I'd brought back while I tried to talk her out of it, but uh, I couldn't. I see. Well, thanks for giving your consent to the autopsy, Mr. Bolton. May I answer some very important questions? Oh, good morning. Oh, yeah, hello, Carter, Miss Bourne. Hello. Oh, gosh, what a night. I was down at the Blaine garage till 6 o'clock this morning. Oh, uh, did the mechanic find anything suspicious? Well, the car was smashed up pretty bad, but he swears the wreck didn't affect nothing that could have caused the accident. Oh, did he check the steering gear, the brakes? And... Yeah, and the muffler, too. Nothing had been tampered hmm. with. And the autopsy showed absolutely no trace of carbon monoxide in her lungs or blood. No other poisonous gas for that matter. And mm-hmm. she wasn't drugged either. I guess we was wrong about Bolton doing it. Maybe she did fall asleep at the wheel. No, I doubt that, Chief. Anyone who was as upset and angry as Sam said Mrs. Bolton was just wouldn't doze off. Are you still trying to make out it was more than an accident, are you? Oh, we're sure it was. Well, now, if Bolton caused that wreck without tampering with the car and without drugging her in any way, he's committed a perfect crime. A murder without a single clue. I wouldn't say that, Chief. Every unexplained fact is a clue. And there are several in this case. Such as what? Well, why was Sam so sure she'd been killed in an auto wreck? Why should her dying words have been about murder for insurance? And why was she driving with the heater turned on? Okay, if you're looking for unexplained facts, what about the ice cream? Well, what about it? Well, now, Bolton brought that back from town at 4 o'clock. Uh-huh. And when we was there at 7.30, it was all melted, according to Sam. Oh, well, that's only natural. The housekeeper forgot to put it in a deep freeze. Miss Bowen, we get them five-gallon containers of ice cream for picnics and such. We get them early in the morning. And they're still as hard as a rock when we eat supper. By George, that's it. Huh? Huh? Well, what's what? That's what killed Mrs. Bolton. The weapon that vanished into thin air. Vanished? Literally and completely, without leaving a trace. What? Well, then that, there's no way of proving it, is there? Not unless we can get a confession. And anybody smart enough to think of a scheme like that won't be easily bluffed. Now, Lucardo, where would you get a weapon that would vanish that way? At your local creamery, just as Bolton did. Oh, Nick, you're not saying that Mrs. Bolton was murdered with five gallons of ice cream. No. If it wasn't for that ice cream, she'd be alive right now. Oh, Nick. Come on, let's drive out to the farm. Now I've got something to work on. I know, Carter. I carried that container of ice cream into the house from the car without opening it. But Bolton... Yes, McEwen, were you going to say something? Well, uh, only that when I went through the kitchen to get the other things out of the car, 
I noticed that the seal on the container was broken. Well, I didn't break it. Perhaps the housekeeper... Uh, no, Mr. Bolton, I asked her. She was upstairs at the time. Well, what's the ice cream got to do with it anyway, Mr. Carter? Plenty, McEwen. Those five-gallon containers are in two sections. One for the ice cream itself, and one that holds dry ice to keep it from melting. Well, so what? Did you ever notice how drowsy you get in the crowded room with the air stale? Well, sure. That's because the oxygen in the air has been used up. And replaced with carbon dioxide, which people have exhaled. That's what happens when we breathe. Well, come to the point, Carter. All right, I will. When I examined your car just after the wreck, Mr. Bolton, I found a few small pieces of dry ice in the heater. Dry ice is nothing but carbon dioxide in a solid form. In the heater of your wife's car, it melted. Fast. And flooded the car with carbon dioxide. And with all the windows closed, it must have been ten times as bad as the most crowded, stuffy room you ever saw. And that's why she went to sleep at the wheel. That, that's fantastic. You think somebody took the dry ice out of that ice cream container and put it in the heater of the car to... To, to, to make her wreck the car and kill herself. Yeah, Mr. Bolton, that's exactly what we think. Then, then it must have been Mac. Why, that's a lie. You went through the kitchen when I left the ice cream and, and then went out to the car for the rest of the things. Uh, you must have opened the package and... Are you accusing me of murdering my own sister? It, it had to be you. Nobody else could have done it. No? Well, uh, who got her to take out that insurance policy? Huh? Who inherits this farm and everything else she owns? That doesn't mean... I don't get anything out of her death, and I don't want to, but you get plenty. Now, calm down, Mac. Calm down. She was all I had, and he killed her. He killed her. I did not. You did it yourself, and now you're trying to... All right, all right, hold it. it. Hold it. I know how we can find out who put that dry ice in the heater. How? Ask Sam, your hired man. Sam? What would he know about it? He was in the barn from the time you drove in with the ice cream, Mr. Bolton, until your wife left about ten minutes later. Dry ice melts fast, very fast. To be effective, it'd have to be put in sometime during that ten minutes. Sure. You're right, Mr. Carter. Sam must have seen him putting that stuff in the heater. That's why he figured Kay was killed in a wreck. Yeah, maybe he didn't think nothing of it at the time, but afterwards he realized what he saw. And then maybe he figured he could get paid for not talking. Well, he'll talk now. He'll talk or I'll break him in two. All right, no, no, McHugh. And you and Bolton will stay here with the chief. Patsy and I will go talk with Sam. And after we do, Chief, I think you'll have a new boarder at the county jail. Nick, you didn't really find any dry ease in the heater of that car, did you? Why, of course not, Patsy. I told you I'd have to bluff. Yeah, but if Sam did see something, it won't be a bluff any longer. Oh, yes, it will. You may have seen something. But he couldn't tell what was actually going on inside the car from back in the stalls where he was working. No, no, I guess not. But maybe we can use Sam's testimony to frighten the killer into giving himself away. Oh, here, this must be Sam's shack. Uh Uh-huh. He must be here. We know he's nowhere else on the farm. Yeah. Let's see if the door's locked. No, it isn't. Come on in. Right. (gasps) Oh, Nick, look. They're on the floor. Oh, that's Sam. Nicky, he's dead, isn't he? Yeah. Shot through the head. Probably sometime last night. Look around the floor. See if you can find an empty cartridge. Right. If he was killed with an automatic, there's a chance the empty shell's on the floor somewhere. Well, if it is, I'll find it. Here. Here's something. What is it? Somebody knelt down beside the body. There's a perfect knee print and a smear of blood. You can even see the weave of the material the trousers were made of. Some sort of coarse tweed. Nick, I found it. The cartridge shell? Yes, it was under the table. Here. Uh Uh-huh. Now we can really get down to business. Yes, this time we've got a weapon that can't vanish into thin air. An empty cartridge case. The first bit of concrete evidence the wife killer has left in a series of five murders. But Nick still faces the problem of proving his guilt. We'll see what happens in just a moment. An important announcement. Coming next week on Nick Carter, Old Dutch Cleanser's Big New Contest. Listen so you can get an early start in this easy, fascinating contest that pays off with loads of valuable prizes. And remember, we've activated Seismatite in Old Dutch Cleanser. Its amazing sudsing action sweeps away dirt and stains, cuts grease on contact, cleans fast, safe, sure, leaves no gritty sediment, rinses away completely, saves you time and work, helps you keep your house at its shining best. New sudsing Old Dutch Cleanser is at your grocer's now in the same familiar package. 
Get two cans tomorrow. One for the kitchen, one for the bathroom. Old Dutch Cleanser, the only cleanser made with activated seismotype. Now, back to The Case of the Vanishing Weapon. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. At the farmhouse, Nick and the chief are trying to find the automatic with which Sam Webb, the Bolton's hired hand, was killed. Mac has admitted owning such a gun, and they've gone to his room to get it. There you are, Mr. Carter. But I swear I haven't touched that gun since I came back two weeks ago. Did Bolton know where you kept it, Mac? Well, I don't know, Chief, but it wouldn't have been hard to find. I didn't even know he had a gun. Well, this is a thirty-eight. Sam was killed with a thirty-two. A thirty-two? Then... Then Bolton must have used Kay's gun. What are you talking about? Kay didn't own a gun. Why, you're a liar. She had a thirty-two automatic for years. Kept at her bedside table, and you know it. That's not true. You can come and look for yourself, Chief. Our room is right across the hall. But she won't find any guns there. No, don't expect to. Not now. Oh, uh, here's your gun, McEwen. Oh, thanks, Mr. Carter. But uh, Kay did have a gun. Charlie must have seen it hundreds of times. Don't worry, don't worry. We'll get at the truth. There, look for yourself. Do you see a gun in that drawer? Kay wouldn't have a gun in the house. All right, let's forget about that for a minute. Who owns a tweed suit? A tweed suit, Mr. Carter? Why? We found evidence proving that Sam's killer was wearing a suit of coarse tweed at the time of the murder. You have one? Oh, I no. Neither do I. Well, you shouldn't have said that, Bolton. I've seen you wearing a tweed suit a hundred times. Well, I... I did have a tweed suit, but Kay gave it away last week. It was worn out. Who'd she give it to? I... I don't know. She didn't say... Why, Bolton, I saw that suit hanging in your closet only yesterday. I'll bet it's there right now. What? Well, it's gone. Naturally. Of course it is. Any fool would know enough to get rid of a piece of evidence like that. I tell you, I haven't had it for over a week. Wait a minute. You went down in the cellar carrying a bundle this morning, Bolton. That was the garbage. Mrs. Lawrence always puts the garbage in a paper bag. The bundle you had was wrapped in newspaper. It was not. It was a paper bag. And then I heard the furnace door. I always burn the garbage in the furnace. You know that. Bolton, suppose we take a look in that furnace and see what else you was burning. Here's another scrap of tweed that didn't burn. That's part of your suit, ain't it, Bolton? Yes, but... I didn't put it there. Mac did it. He's framing me. Oh, sure, sure. He is, I tell you. Everything you found could have been done by him, couldn't it? He could have put that dry ice in the car heater as well as me. He could have shot Sam and put that suit in the furnace. And now, wore the he? suit to kill Sam, too, I guess. Why, you blame fool. Anybody can see that Mac couldn't get into your clothes to shoehorn. He's twice as big as you are. And I never owned a tweed suit in my life. Anyway, the knee print by Sam's body had exactly the same weave as this tweed that was burned in the furnace. Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Did you find something else, Nick? I'll say I did down among the ashes. Look. That's it. That's Kay's gun. I never saw that gun before in all my life. Any fingerprints on it, Carter? Afraid not, Chief. The whole outside is burned clean. Yes, but a ballistics test will show if it's the gun that Sam was killed with. Won't it, Nick? Without a doubt. Even if it's the same gun, that doesn't prove anything. Well, here's something that does, Bolton. A perfect set of fingerprints. Prints? Well, I thought you said the gun was burned clean. The outside was, yes. But there's a fine set here on the cartridge clip. I thought they might have been overlooked. That's smart thinking, Carter. Well, how come the cartridges didn't explode in the fire, Nick? Well, the clip's empty, Patsy. Oh. But the prints are nice and clear. They're, they're not my prints. I never saw that gun. Yeah? Well, now, I'll just take that clip over to the county seat and let the fingerprint man there have a look at him. Oh, uh, if you don't mind, Chief, I'd rather take this to the fingerprint lab in the city. Huh? What's the matter with Joe Parker over the county seat? Well, he may be perfectly all right, but... Well, look, let me have my own way, will you, please? I'll stay at the hotel in Elm City tonight, drive into the city tomorrow, and have a report you can depend on before tomorrow evening. Well, okay, keep the blame clip. And you, Bolton, come on. I'm locking you up where you can't get out to commit no more murders. Who's there? 
Who's in the room? Who is it? Don't move, Mr. Carter. You're a fine target under that bed lamp. McEwen. What are you doing here? I came to get something that belongs to me. That clip with the fingerprints on it. What? And those are your prints. Bolton was telling the truth. You killed Sam. Sure I did. I couldn't let him tell about seeing me put that dry ice in the heater of Kay's car, could I? And he said he had been in the barn at the time. I had to get rid of him. And all the evidence against Bolton. You planted it yourself. Why not? Somebody had to be the patsy. And I could see you suspected him already. Nobody knew I had that thirty-two, So I said it belonged to Kay. And who can prove that it didn't? And you planted it in the furnace for us to find, together with a tweed suit. <laughs> sure. That suit was the smartest part of the whole frame-up. Kay gave it to Sam. It was hanging right there in front of me when I shot him. But you couldn't have worn it. It was too small for you. No. But I could wrap it around my knee and then make a print in that blood stain, couldn't I? Didn't tell you I saw Bolton trying to burn it. You thought of everything, didn't you? Everything but that cartridge clip with my fingerprints on it. Where is it, Carter? Or do I put a bullet in your head? All right, you win. It's in the left-hand top dresser drawer, wrapped in a handkerchief. Yeah? Thanks for making it easy. First, we'll wipe these prints out. And then, Mr. Carter, I'm afraid I'll have to get rid of you. And I hold on, McEwen. and you've destroyed the proof against you, and I let it go at that. I can't let you talk about this little visit. Look, McEwen, don't Shut drive. up. I said I was going to get rid of you, and I am. So... <laughs> As Mac points his gun at Nick's head and pulls the trigger, he stands only a few feet away, too close to miss. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Here's a wash day tip. Keep your washer sparkling clean inside and out with wonderful new sudsing Old Dutch Cleanser. Yes, a touch of Old Dutch Cleanser cuts grease on contact, sweeps away dirt and stains almost like magic. You'll be amazed at the new sudsing action of Old Dutch Cleanser. Snowy white, leaves no gritty sediment, rinses away completely. It's been granted the good housekeeping seal. Yes, ladies, for faster, easier cleaning than you've dreamed possible, switch to new sudsing Old Dutch Cleanser, the only cleanser made with active Activated seismatite. And next week, Old Dutch Cleanser's wonderful new contest starts. Easy to enter, easy to win. It's loads of fun with loads of valuable prizes. Hear all about this sensational new contest and how you may win next week on Nick Carter. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Vanishing Weapon. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new, wonderful old Dutch cleanser. In Nick's hotel room, he faces a killer with a gun who says, I said I was going to get rid of you, and I am. So... Oh! oh you had a gun all the time under the bedclothes. Sorry, Mac. I tried to warn you. Nick! Nick, are you all right? I'm okay, Patsy. But our friend here is a bullet in his arm. Come on in. Give you all down a shorthand, Nick. The microphone picked up every you word mean he said. This was a trap? You bet it was. See, I expected you to come for that cartridge clip. If my gun hadn't jammed... It didn't jam. I took all the bullets out of it when I examined it out at the farmhouse today. But I couldn't be sure you hadn't discovered that and reloaded it, so I had to shoot first. What's the matter in there? Who fired that gun? What's going on? Everything's under our control. Call the chief of police, will you? Sure, Mr. Carter, sure. I'll get him here in two shakes. Where's your proof, Carter? My fingerprints aren't on the cartridge clip anymore. Your confession before two witnesses is proof enough, McEwen. And as for those fingerprints, I was bluffing you. Why, you... So far as I know, there weren't any prints on that clip. Nick, how did you know Wayne McEwen killed his sister and Sam Webb? Well, I was pretty sure of it from the moment we found out how McEwen's sister was killed. Done that? Mm Mm-hmm. Furthermore, every bit of evidence we had against Bolton came directly from McEwen. Uh, a chief, did you find out why he killed his sister? Yeah, he told us all about it at the jailhouse. Seems his bridge-building business ain't been so good these last few years, so McEwen drummed up a sideline of getting married and then killing off his wives for their insurance. Oh, then he was the one Mrs. Bolton was talking about just before she died. Right, Patsy. Yeah, but how'd she ever find out about this? McEwen says she was cleaning up his room the day before she was killed, and she came across some of his private papers that he'd forgotten to put away. Uh Uh-huh. 
She didn't know he'd been married at all. So when she found a marriage certificate, she got curious. Oh. And what she found in the rest of the stuff gave her a pretty good idea of what had been going on. Then that night she accused him of killing the two girls, and he admitted it. When he asked her what she was going to do about it, she said she hadn't made up her mind. Well, if I'd been in her place, I'd have turned him over to the police. Oh, she wanted to, Miss Bowen, but he was her only brother, and she couldn't quite make up her mind to do it. Mm. But Mac didn't dare to take any chances. So... He killed it. Yeah. He was pretty clever about it, too. He almost got away with it. Yeah. But when he killed Sam, he outsmarted himself. Well, you know the old saying, Nick. Give a killer enough rope and he'll hang himself. So he will, Patsy. So he will. Every time. Well, Nick, that's the last of them. Okay, Patsy, that's all for now. You better go home and change. Remember, we're meeting Bill and his wife at 7.30 for dinner. Well, how about after dinner? I want to know how to dress. Well, Bill said something about taking in an amusement park and ending up with a boat ride on the river in the morning. Oh, morning. hold on. Take it easy, Carter. Hey, for heaven's sake, Patsy. Oh, amusement park, boat rides, redheads, penicillin. <laughs> okay, I get it. I don't want to end up at the bottom of the river just because the ticket seller was a beautiful redhead who posed as a mom. Hey, hold on, Patsy. Let's tell about that adventure next week. We'll call it The Case of the Purloin Penicillin. Ladies, have you discovered Delrich margarine? Delicious rich Delrich makes friends at first taste. Full flavored, it's the perfect spread for bread, rolls, toast. Try Delrich in your cooking and baking, too. Mighty good, mighty economical. Only Delrich gives you the original easy color pack, the easy modern way to color margarine. And where state laws permit, ask for Delrich in golden yellow quarters. Delrich, America's new favorite. Dell for delicious, rich for rich full flavor. Get Delrich margarine tomorrow, for Delrich makes friends at first taste. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this same time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick and Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Jim Parsons with original music played by Henry Silburn. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new, wonderful old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Cudahy Packing Company, makers of Old Dutch Cleanser and Delrich, is happy to bring you today's Nick Carter adventure transcribed. This was done so that everyone connected with this program would be able to spend Christmas Day at home with their families. And now... New wonderful Old Dutch Cleanser, the only cleanser made with activated seismatite, invites you to stand by for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Today's Nick Carter adventure starring Lon Clark, The Case of the Phantom Shoplifter, brought to you by new, wonderful old Dutch cleanser. It is mid-afternoon as Sergeant Matheson and Nick Carter in a speeding police car turn into a street of cheap rooming houses. Uh, you can understand, Nick, that Warren's specialty shop can't stand losing all those expensive fur coats even if it is a big woman's store. You sure it's the work of shoplifters? Sure. And we think Peggy Matthews, the girl we're going to see, is one of the shoplifters. Mm -hmm. Any reason to pin it on her? Well, one of the store detectives spotted her in the store this afternoon, but she got away from it. But after she left, another fur coat was gone. You just found out where she lives, huh? Yeah. We learned who she was from a beautiful set of fingerprints she left on the plastic case she'd been handling. So I got a warrant to pick her up on suspicion. How many fur coats have they lost, Matty? Oh, a dozen or more, Nick. Each of them worth over 3,000 bucks. Hey, quite a loss. Yeah. Must have been mink, huh? They were. What do you want? What? Well, who are you? This is my rooming house. I'm the landlady. We want to see Peggy Matthews. Eh, what do you want Peggy for? Take a look at this badge. 
couple of flat feet. Whoa, yo, yo. Okay, second floor, turn right into the hall. Well, that's better. Come on, Nick. Right with you. I hope you fall and break your head. Thanks. He said turn right at the top of the stairs. This must be the room. Mm. I don't hear anything, Nick. Well, with this warrant, we can go right in. Hey, door is unlocked. Great Scott. Someone moved faster than we did, Matty. She's been strangled with one of her own nylon stockings. In just a moment, we'll return to The Case of the Phantom Shoplifter. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. Maybe you were up way past midnight last night, trimming the tree, wrapping last-minute packages, planning wonderful surprises to greet your youngsters when they hopped out of bed at dawn this morning. You see, Christmas does get here, even though the youngsters think it's slow in coming. And you do somehow manage to get your thousand and one extra jobs done in time. And isn't it wonderful? Right now, chances are you're all together, the whole kit and caboodle of you with your Christmas tree lights glimmering in the twilight, your radio turned on. A perfect opportunity for us to bring you this special message. The makers of Old Dutch Cleanser are happy indeed for the privilege of bringing these radio programs into your home throughout the year. Happy, too, that Old Dutch Cleanser itself is a trusted and helpful friend in so many of your homes. We hope you've all had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas day. Never to be forgotten. Now, back to The Case of the Phantom Shoplifter. Today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new, wonderful old Dutch cleanser. Nick and Matty are back in the murdered girl's room after unsuccessfully searching the house for the killer. Several men from the homicide squad have just arrived and are going to work as Patsy Bowen hurries in. I came as fast as I could, Nick. Oh, You didn't tell me it was a murder. Uh, We called you, Patsy, because we thought this needed a a woman's touch. Oh? Yeah, this dead woman is Peggy Matthews, Patsy. Uh Uh-huh. She's a shoplifter who was seen acting suspiciously in the Warren Specialty Store this afternoon, just before another mink coat disappeared. Is this the coat here on the chair? No, we found that one in a clothes closet. Uh, She bought it a month ago in a small fur shop downtown. Now there's a label in the coat, and we phoned the store to check it. She paid $400 for it. Four hundred. For this rabbit skin? Yeah. Oh, she got stuck, but good. That's why I wanted you to see it, Betsy. I needed your opinion. Oh. Hey, Nick. Look, I've been thinking. Maybe we ought to bring the manager of the fur department of Warren's specialty shop down here to look at her, just to be sure this is the girl he saw, huh? Good idea, Maddie. Come on, Betsy. We'll bring her back here as soon as we can, Maddie. So this girl was murdered before you could talk to her, eh, Mr. Carter? That's right, Mr. Dodd. You sure you'd recognize her again? Oh, yes. This particular girl snooped around the fur department for some time. Although I didn't see her take anything. But you kept an eye on her. I'm afraid I didn't. You see, I was very busy with Miss Robard. Miss Robard? She's a fashion expert on one of the women's magazines, isn't she? That's right. Too bad this girl is dead, Mr. Carter. One of our most expensive fur coats was missing right after she left the store. Maybe she could have told us what happened to it. Well, we want to know where that coat went. We'll have to find out some other way, Mr. Dodd. The final curtain has fallen for Peggy Matthews. Well, uh, Mr. Dodd, is this the woman you saw in your department store this afternoon? Yes, Sergeant, I'm certain of it. No question at all. Uh Uh-huh. Well, okay, Mr. Dodd, and thanks for coming down. Oh, Patsy and I will run you back to the store, Mr. Dodd. We want to get a full description of the stolen coats anyway. Uh, can we leave at once, Mr. Carter? You see, Miss Robot is waiting for me to get back. We've been in conference all afternoon, but there's still a lot left to do. Sure, sure. We'll leave in just a moment. Hey, Matty. Yeah, Nick? Did you dig up anything while we were gone? Well, just one thing, Nick. The landlady broke down, uh, <clears throat> finally, 
told me that Bruno Celia has come here to see Peggy a couple of times recently. Bruno Celia? That's a smart character. I'll have a talk with him shortly. Oh, uh, Mr. Dodd, would you give me your expert opinion as to the value of this fur coat? It belonged to Peggy. Hmm. He didn't shoplift that from our store, Miss Bourne. I'd roughly guess it was worth about $150. Uh-huh. Well, Nick, I guess I'm a fairly good judge of fur values. Patsy means that she told us Peggy Matthews was cheated when she paid $400 for this coat, Mr. Dodd. You just backed up her opinion. I see. Well, I don't think Miss Matthews minds being cheated anymore. Shall we go? Miss Bourne, Mr. Carter, this is Audrey Robard, the fashion expert I told you about. Hello, Miss Robard. How do you do? How do you do, Miss Robard? I, uh, I'm familiar with your work in the magazines. Lovely. Why, thank you, Miss Bowen. Oh, Nick, just look at all these gorgeous fur coats hanging on the racks here. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Dodd, tell me, just how many coats have shoplifters taken from this store? Why, uh, I can't say exactly. Uh, I don't have the figures. Are the prices on the coats? I mean, could anyone tell they were getting the best just by looking at the price tags? No, no, indeed. Each coat is marked with a code number. Only the sales lady knows what it sells for. And you have no idea how the coats were smuggled out of here? None at all, Mr. Carter. The store detectives assigned to this department have spotted shoplifters dawdling about, followed them to the street, and stopped them. But although we found a number of stolen items, there wasn't a single fur coat. Well, I don't think you're too careful with your coats, Mr. Dodd. All the time we've been talking, there's been a lovely coat lying right there on that display table with no one near it. Oh, that's my coat, Miss Bowen. I threw it down there as I came in. And it's not as nice as it looks from here. Oh, well. well, you've had it a good many years, Audrey. Nothing lasts forever. <laughs> How right you are. Uh, Mr. Carter, why don't you go up and see Mr. Warren, the owner of the store? He might be able to tell you things I couldn't. Yeah, good idea. Is he here? Well, it's almost closing time, but I'm sure he's here. He never leaves until later than this. His office is upstairs, fourth floor in the rear. Good. I'll go see him. We need every scrap of information we can get. Sit down, sit down, both of you. Thank you, Mr. Warren. I don't mind telling you, Mr. Carter, how glad I am that you're helping us. Tell me, Mr. Warren, just how many coats have been stolen? Fifteen. And the cheapest of them retail for $3,100. Oh, say, they really made a haul, didn't they? Over $50,000, Miss Bowen. Golly. Your store detectives haven't seen anything suspicious? Well, there is one rather odd thing. What's that? Lately, we seem to be attracting an unusual number of professional shoplifters. Many of them are known to our detectives. But they haven't caught them with anything? Well, just small miscellaneous items, Miss Bowen. Never anything really valuable. There's no way of smuggling the coats out to a crooked employee, perhaps. Absolutely not, Mr. Carter. Why, we've checked that thoroughly. Yet we're completely at a loss to know how the coats get out of the store. Well, thanks, Mr. Warren. Oh, not at all, Mr. Carter, not at all. Now, please don't hesitate to call on me for any sort of help at any time. I will. And we may have news for you soon. Good. We've got one clue that may lead us somewhere. In fact, we're going to see the man in question right now. Uh, this is the place, Nick. Sealy's Bargain Outlet. So that's what he called it. Uh, Wonder how legitimate a business it really is. Well, Bruno's already done one stretch as a fence for stolen goods. If anybody's in the position to direct a shoplifter's ring, Bruno Sealy's the man. Well, Matty, come on. Let's see what he has to say. All right. Nick, all the fur coats that were stolen were the very best quality, weren't they? According to Mr. Warren, they were. Mm -hmm. But, Nick, if Peggy Matthews got chipped on the coat she bought for herself, how would she know enough to pick out a really good one? The prices weren't on the coat. Say, that's a very good thought, Patsy. If Peggy got cheated so badly when she bought her own fur coat, it's proof she didn't know good furs from bad. Hey, that's right. Oh, oh, Patsy, it takes a woman to notice a clue like that. And if I'm right, Peggy had nothing to do with stealing any of those coats. Not unless someone pointed out the good ones to her first. Yeah, Nick. Well, come on, let's go in and see if Sealy can throw some light on this. <clears throat> Hello. Anybody here? Hello. That's funny. 
Hey, Bruno. Bruno! Hey, Bruno! Maybe he's in the back room. Yeah, could be. Hey, the back room's empty, too. What's that? Sounds like somebody in pain. It's coming from inside that closet. Rich gut. It's Bruno. He's been stabbed. He's badly. Listen to me. Just a minute. He's trying to tell us something. Can't speak breathe. I... Bruno, I'm Nick Carter. Who stabbed you? I don't know his name. Not his real name. I... Uh... Yes, Bruno. See, si. Marge Panet. Go see Marge Panet. Marge Barnett. In... All right, Bruno. In my pocket. Key. Post office box. Clark Street Station. Package. Nick, I better call an ambulance. That won't be necessary, Matty. He's dead. Nick and Matty are faced with a second murder. We'll see what happens in just a moment. There are no words for Christmas. The wreath of holly on your front door, the mistletoe, the glow of candles in your window. Yes, and the stately Christmas tree, brilliant with lights, shimmering with tinsel. The dinner, the gifts and gay wrappings. All these are merely frosting on the cake. Outward symbols of the deep inner meaning Christmas really has for us. There are no words for Christmas. Just as there are no words for the love you feel for a a tousle-haired youngster. The joy you feel with a close friend. The warmth you feel when you say Merry Christmas. May this day be so filled with everything fine, everything good, that you'll never forget a single golden moment of it. That's the Christmas wish to you from the makers of famous Old Dutch Cleanser. Now, back to The Case of the Phantom Shoplifter, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by Old Dutch Cleanser. After summoning the homicide squad to take over at Bruno's store, Matty, Nick, and Patsy have hurried to the Clark Street branch of the post office, where they have just opened Bruno's post office box. Well, yeah, there's a package here, but it don't weigh anything. Well, open it up, Sergeant. Yeah, that's what Bruno wanted us to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, will you look at this? Well, what in the world is it, Sergeant? Ah, a string of beads string from the of Warren beads. Specialty Shop. And the price tag says only fifteen dollars. Yeah, I don't get it. Hey, let me see that wrapper, will you? Yeah, sure. This package was postmarked early this afternoon at a postal substation near the Warren store. And this necklace was stolen from that store today and mailed to Bruno. Yeah, probably from a mailbox right in the store. Wall into the branch post office on the fourth floor. Say, it's a smart idea. You nab something small, have an envelope all addressed, you just slip the loot inside, seal it, and mail it. Yeah, but what is all this to do with stolen fur coat? I don't know, Patsy. But we can be sure of one thing, Nick. The murders of Peggy and Bruno are tied up together somehow. And to one man, Matty. Bruno said it was a man, but we didn't know who he was. And just who is this Marge Barnett Bruno wanted us to see? She used to be a pretty good confidence woman, Patsy. Confidence woman? Yeah, yeah Patsy. Lots of these confidence women turn to shoplifting when they begin losing their nerve or their looks. Look, I can get her address from our records, Nick. And you and Patsy can go and see it, huh? Sure, Matty. I'm going back to Bruno Seeley's store. I want to finish my report. Okay, Matty. Patsy and I'll see Marge Barnett. We better hurry, because the murderer may have the same idea. Oh, Nick, this is Marge Barnett's apartment. Here's the name below the bell. Hope she's home. Well, the police certainly keep an up-to-date file on crooks, don't they? Sergeant Matheson got this address for us in only a few minutes. Yeah, Patsy. People only knew how... Yes? Hello, Marge. I, I beg your pardon. Am I supposed to know you? I know you. You must have slipped to turn to shoplifting. Who are you? I'm Nick Carter. Oh, Nick Carter, huh? Well, what do you want? Shall we talk out here in the hall where everybody can listen? Oh, 
Come on in. Snooping coppers give me a pain. Thanks. This is Patsy Bourne, my assistant. Hmm. Trying to make a cop out of her, too? You ought to be ashamed. Why, I like it. Marge, Bruno's dead. Bruno dead? He was murdered, Marge. So was Peggy Matthews. <laughs> Who did it? Suppose you tell me. Oh. Goodbye, Carter. I'm not talking about nobody. Now, wait, Marge, wait. Bruno was stabbed. When we found him, he still had a few seconds to live. And the last thing he told us was to come and see you. Bruno said that, did he? He did. I wonder why. Maybe he was trying to save your life. Hey, come on, tell me. How'd you get into this anyway? Oh, I'm getting old, Carter. As you know, I've been everything from a cheap shill to the operator of a big store. From the best roper he ever saw to a plain subway dealer. You've been what? In English, Patsy. She means she fronted for con men and rose to become the operator of an important con man, con game herself. She worked from the top as the smart, pretty girl who brings in the suckers. Being a subway dealer means she was reduced to dealing cards from the bottom of the deck. Well, it sounds almost fascinating, if I could understand it. How many of these small, inexpensive items did you steal, put into a package, and mail to Bruno, Marge? So you're wise to that, huh? I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, it was. Until fur coats and murder got mixed up in it. Uh, where do fur coats come in? Look, Bruno paid you to steal these small articles for him. And paid you more than you could get anywhere else, didn't he? Yeah. He said he had a particular customer for a lot of that junk. All right. Just what orders did he give you? Well, I never did understand it, Carter. We were supposed to show up at Warren's specialty shop at a certain time and just wander around. Did those instructions include visiting the fur department? Why, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, we had to pass through the fur department on our way to the counter where this certain kind of glass junk was sold. And you, uh, lingered in the fur department. <laughs> What woman wouldn't? She's got a point there, Nick. Yeah. And this business is getting a little clearer. Well, so help me, that's everything I know. Well, thanks, Marge. All right, Patsy, come on. We'll make another call on Hugh Warren, who owns the store. I think we can do something for him, if he'll do something for us first. I hate to bother you at your home like this, Mr. Warren. Oh, it's perfectly all right, Mr. Carter. Perfectly all right. I hope we're not interrupting your dinner, Mr. Warren. Dinner? Why, Miss Bowen, it's after nine o'clock. Oh. Well, so it is. We've been pretty busy. Well, have you learned anything? Enough so I think we're on the right track, Mr. Warren. Good, good. We'd like a key to your store and permission to go inside tonight. I want to look around a bit. Why, I think that could be arranged. But a word of warning, Mr. Carter. This store is wired for burglar alarms. Not only the outer doors, but many places inside the store. For example, the door to the cashier's office will flash an alarm if it is entered without a key. And there are other things to look out for, too. We'll be careful, Mr. Warren. I think you'll have no trouble if you follow my directions. Now, if you have a pencil, I'll give you a list of things to watch out for. Golly, Nick, I never realized how lonesome a store like this can be after everyone's gone. Yeah. Wonder where the watchmen are. Mr. Warren said there'd be two of them here. We haven't run into either one of them yet. Oh, it's positively eerie in here with just our, our two flashlights for company. I see. According to Mr. Warren's directions, we turn right here. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Hey. White's around in here. Oh, Nick, look at all the fur coats. Dozens of them. All second-hand, Betsy. Huh? Oh, yes, so they are. But some of them are still lovely. I know, I... Well, that's funny, Nick. What's funny? Remember how I thought for a minute this afternoon that Audrey Robard's coat was a new one? Yeah, what about it? Well, this coat here is her coat. The one I saw this afternoon. You sure? Positive. I took a close look at it as we went by, and I noticed this funny jagged tear on the lining. <laughs> I'd know it anywhere. Good for you, Patsy. Hmm? Now I know I'm right. What do you mean by that? He means you have good eyesight what? and an excellent memory, Miss Bowen. It's Miss Robard. Don't move, either of you. My father taught me to use a gun when I was a girl. I see Jason Dodds with you. Showing you all those coats he has in his arm, no doubt. Keep your hands up, Carter. You too, Miss Bowen. 
Yes, Jason and I stole those missing coats. We knew you'd find out, so we came back tonight to clean out the place. And we're going to. You can't stop us, Carter. Jason had his own keys, and he's arranged for the watchman to be in another part of the store for a while. Too bad we came in just when we did. Yes. It's too bad for you, Carter. Jason, put down those coats and walk around behind Carter and search him. Uh, look, I, I, I... And do as I say, you fool. I know everything. We heard that much. Yes, yes, we, we've got to finish it up. Keep your hands in the air, both of you. And don't reach for your purse, Miss Bowen. I know there's probably a gun in it. Looks as if you hold all the cards, Miss Robard. Jason, stand right behind Carter. Now reach over his shoulder. He probably carries his gun in his shoulder. Uh, and she cut the lights and run you... for it. Back, back to the cashier's office. We left the There's a phone there. We can call the police. Audrey, what happened? Oh, you fool, Jason. Letting him throw you like that. I, I couldn't help it. He moved so fast. When I reached oh, over his shoulder... never mind. They're headed for the cashier's office to phone. Well, we can stop that. The switchboard's right over there. I can even find it in the dark. Then find it. If we can stop them from calling for help, we've got them cornered. Carter? Carter, I know you're in that cashier's office. Then come and get it. Audrey, let's get out of here. Not before I take care of Carter and the girl. How? How are you going to do it? Listen, they're in the cashier's office. And that's the only door right ahead of us. Yes, but... Oh, stop sniveling. We've got Carter's gun. Miss Bowen dropped her handbag and I found her gun in it. Yes, That means yes, they're but... unarmed. We, we can smash the glass panel in the door of the cashier's office and get them that way. But, Audrey... Grab one of those chairs and throw it through the glass. Okay, I guess you're right. Here goes. Oh, there, that does it. Carter... You can come outside and get it. Or I'll come in after you. It makes no difference to me. Nick and Patsy are trapped in a small office without weapons and with the telephone cut off. We'll see what happens in just a moment. Once again, the makers of Old Dutch Cleanser and the entire cast and the director of your Nick Carter program join in adding their warmest Christmas wishes to the many you have already received. We hope that today has been a truly beautiful Christmas for you and that the coming new year will be filled with an abundance of pleasure, prosperity, and peace. Now for the conclusion of The Case of the Phantom Shoplifter, today's adventure with Nick Carter, brought to you by new, wonderful old Dutch cleanser. Cautiously, Audrey Robard moves up to the broken glass in the door, reaches inside, and unlocks it. Jason Dodd hovers uncertainly behind her. Carter, are you coming out? All right, if you won't come out, I'm coming in. Stay beside me, Jason. There aren't many places they can hide. Oh, please hurry. It's been at least ten minutes since I smashed that door. You were so darn careful. Take it easy. Even without a gun, Carter's still... Okay, pretty... you two. <laughs> drop the guns or we'll drop you. Call the police. I oh. said drop those guns. In one second we start shooting. Okay. Okay, we give up. Yeah. You, Doc, kick those guns my way. All right. Uh, that's better. Nick. Hey, Nick. Are you in there? Right here, Maggie. What kept you? Get, what kept me? Listen, it's not ten minutes since the alarm came into headquarters. <laughs> what alarm are you talking about? The alarm you sent in, Miss Robard. What? I made you smash the glass panel in the door to the cashier's office. When the glass broke, a burglar alarm went off automatically in police headquarters. You turned yourselves into the police. <laughs> All right, Nick. Give with the details. You say it was work with second-hand coats, huh? That's it, Matty. Miss Robart would go out and buy a cheap second-hand fur coat worth practically nothing. Uh. Then when she came to the store to see Dodd, which was practically every day, she'd leave the old coat and walk out with a new mink coat. Uh-huh. She was well known in the store, so no one ever thought of suspecting her. And when she came in with the cheap coat, she'd carry it over her arm so it wouldn't show how cheap it really was. 
What a racket. Yeah. Ben Dodd would put the old coat with the used coats the store had for sale and fix the records to account for it. And another nice, new, valuable mink was missing without a trace. And the shoplifters were just part of a setup to confuse us, huh, Nick? Yeah, Matty. Dodd arranged that with Bruno. The shoplifter stole some small object and mailed it to Bruno's post office box right from inside the store in previously prepared envelopes. Just so we'd think the professional shoplifters were stealing the furs. And they killed Peggy Matthews because she got wise and wanted a cut. Dodd admitted that. He killed Bruno, too. Yeah. When we connected Bruno and Peggy, I suppose Dodd was afraid of how much Bruno might know. Mm. So we had to put him out of the way, too. So he sent Patsy and you to see Mr. Warren so you'd be out of the way while he killed him. Yeah. Well, I think we better let him lock up the store now. Oh, in just a minute, Nate. Hey, Patsy, where are you going? Into the fur department. After all, it's a woman's privilege to look at those beautiful mink coats, even if she can't have one. <laughs> I want a quarter. Oh, come on, come on, Patsy. You've had enough lemonade and hot dogs. Let's go right in the carousel. Oh, no. I want to have my handwriting analyzed in this machine. Handwriting analyzed? Yeah. Hey, Patsy. Remember that case down in the Smokies? Oh, do I? How could I ever forget Sheldon Corey, the man who wrote letters to his uncle just so he could forge a will? And will you ever forget how the sheriff trapped us in the cemetery when I was trying to have a look at a dead man's hands? Yeah. Wouldn't that make an exciting adventure to tell about next week? Yeah, it would at that. Good. And I'll call it the case of the perfect penman. It's been only a few short years since Delrich Margarine was first introduced. But in those years, Delrich has won many, many friends. More than any other margarine, in fact. And at this holiday season, the makers of Delrich want to thank you most sincerely. In many homes, Delrich has played an important part in your big and bountiful Christmas dinner today. We hope this has been the merriest Christmas you've ever had, and that next year's will be even better. Nick Carter, Master Detective, is presented each week at this same time by the Cudahy Packing Company. It is produced and directed by Jock McGregor and is copyrighted by Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. Lon Clark is starred as Nick and Charlotte Manson is featured as Patsy. Ed Latimer plays Matty. Today's transcribed adventure was written by Norman Daniels with original music played by Henry Silverne. This program is fictional and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. This is Michael Fitzmaurice saying, when minutes count, use new wonderful old Dutch cleanser. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. What's the matter? What is it? Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... State's prison evidence on Nick Carter and the mystery of the midnight robbery. Pardon me, uh... Could you let me have a line? Certainly. There you are. Swell night, isn't it? Yes, indeed. It's a pleasure to walk on a night like this. Yeah. Well, thanks. Not at all. Good night. Good night. Yes, even in a big city like this, the stars are just... Oh! What? Oh! I wonder what's wrong with her. Oh. I beg your pardon, but is there anything I can do? Oh. Can I help you? Is, is something wrong? Murder! Murder? Who is it? My uncle. When did it happen? I don't know. Well, where is he? In the library. In this big house right here? Yes. Oh, it's awful. Now, you shouldn't be out here in your night clothes. It's too chilly. Come, let me take you back to the house. Come on. Yes. Back to the house. Did you call the police? No, I, I just saw him lying there in, 
pool of blood. Then I, I came out here to get help. Well, I'm Nick Carter, the detective. I'll be glad to help you if I can. Now, careful going up the steps. <laughs> there we are. Now, if you'll show me the library. He's, he's in there. Oh, yes, I see. He's dead, all right. Who found him? The housekeeper. She came in late and saw a light still on in here. And she looked in to see if he needed anything and saw... Then she called you? Yes. And you are... I'm Ella Jabot, his niece. I, I've lived here with him for the last five years since my mother died. I see. Has anything been touched since the body was found? No. Nobody's been in here at all. Good. Uh -huh. Shot through the head... Close range. Well, it looks as if he did it himself. No. No. Well, here's the pistol that was used right beside him. Did you hear the shot? No. I sleep at the opposite end of the house. Oh, Mr. Carter, please find whoever killed my uncle. What makes you think he didn't kill himself? He wouldn't do a thing like that. I know it. Well, that's hardly evidence, Miss Ella. Did you see this note? Note? I know. Your uncle apparently left it propped up here in his desk. It's addressed to Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau, 7 Dunner Street, City. You know her? I never heard of her. What does it say? Let's see. My dear madam, you've been a widow, in fact, ever since the hour following our marriage. But before day breaks, you will be a widow in name also, for I shall be dead. I have at last learned the truth. The one who told me right after our wedding ceremony that you were everything evil has at last confessed that you were really as good as I believed you to be. It's too late for me to ask you to forgive me for the great wrong I've done you. So I'm taking this way of making what amends I can. The upper drawer of my desk is my will. which leaves everything to you, a repentant husband, Enos Jarbeau. Well, that's a remarkable document. Did you know anything about your uncle ever having been married? No, I, I never heard that before. Well, that note would seem to prove it was suicide. I know better. May I see that note? Of course. Here. I knew it, Mr. Carter. My uncle didn't kill himself, and he didn't write this note either. Isn't that your uncle's handwriting? It looks very much like it, but he didn't write it. Uncle didn't use this kind of pen. What do you mean? Uncle Enos was very proud of his handwriting, and he never used anything but a special type of old-fashioned steel pen point. It has a very fine point. I see. Yes. This note was undoubtedly written with a stub point. Another thing, Mr. Carter. Uncle never wrote anywhere except at his desk here. And this desk has been locked since yesterday morning, and I have the key. How long have you had it? I borrowed it yesterday morning because I had some letters to write. And I've had it ever since. Was there another key to this desk? No. And Uncle would never write anywhere else. You're quite a convincing detective, Miss Ella. And if you're right, this can't be suicide in spite of the other evidence. I know I'm right. Uncle would never have taken his own life. I believe you. And I'm just curious enough about this to do a little investigating myself. If I'm as good a detective as you are, I'll find your uncle's murderer in short order. You think this Mrs. Sarah Blake is the woman you want, Nick? I'm not sure, Patsy. But when the maid told me that she never heard of Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau, but that Mrs. Sarah Blake lives here, I thought I'd better talk to her. She might be Mrs. Jarbeau using her maiden name. Here she comes now. You uh, wish to speak to me? I'm looking for Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau. Do you know her? I do. I am Sarah Jarbeau. You were right, Nick. My name is Bill Peters. I'm a reporter. I'm writing a story on the sudden death of your husband, Enos Jarbeau. Oh, the poor man. He died to make up to me for my years of heartbreak. Yes, I, I saw the note he left. Would you please tell me what happened? Well, I met him one summer on the coast of Maine. We were married in the fall. We took a train for Boston, and on the way he went into the smoking car to smoke a cigar. I never saw him again. Why, well, that's terrible. Why didn't he come back? I only know that when the train reached the station, a messenger gave me $500 and a note. Oh. It said that he had learned I was not a good woman, and that I should never see him again. But didn't you try to clear it up? No. If he believed it, I would never seek to persuade him otherwise. I've worked as a governess ever since. I see. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Jarbo. Come along, Patsy. Goodbye, Mrs. Jarbo. I hope you'll be happy now. Thank you. And goodbye. 
Hmm. She certainly got a tough break. You know, Patsy, I was prepared to doubt everything she told me, but somehow I'm inclined to believe her story, even if it does spoil my theory that she's part of an elaborate put-up job. Which way are you going from here? Oh, I think I'll... Pardon me, uh... Would you let me have a light? Yes, of course. Here you are. Thanks. Nice day, isn't it? Yes, very pleasant. Thanks. So long. So long. Oh, come along, Patsy. Uh, wait a minute. Hmm? I've met that man somewhere before. He asked me for a light just that same way. Where was it? Well, of course. It was outside Jarbo's house last night right after the murder. You mean you think he... Wait a minute. Watch a minute. I want to see if he... Yes. He's going into the house we just left. Right. If he and Mrs. Jarbo know each other, the chances are her story is a phony. Oh, but Nick, she's... Yes, I know what I know, Patsy, but this changes things. Patsy, I want you to find out what you can about old Eno Jarbo's past. Find out about that marriage, if there ever was one. But first, call Scubby and tell him to get here right away. Okay. That man leaves before Scubby gets here. I'll follow myself. Otherwise, Scubby can tail him. But I've got to know where he goes and what he does. Right now, he's our one positive clue. <laughs> Is it all right to talk in here, Nick? The lobby of the big hotel is probably the safest place in the world to talk in, Scubby. Well, what'd you find out? Well, I followed him over to a saloon over on 3rd Avenue. Yeah? There was a fellow waiting there for him. I tried to hear what they talked about, but all I could get was the name Jarbo. Yeah, I heard that several times. I thought so. But just as I was really getting in close, a couple of plain clothes cops came along and pinched him. Pinched him? What for? Well, it seems he broke out of state's prison three days ago. I heard the cops call him Barney McCoy. Barney McCoy. Yeah. Jailbird from State's Prison. Ah, pardon me, Scubby. Want to speak to the desk clerk? Oh, sure, Nick, but what do you have to... Oh, clerk, I'd like to speak yes. to the governor's suite, please. Yes, Mr. Carter. Uh, use booth number two right over there, please. Thank oh, you. Nick, what in the world do you want to talk to the governor for? Just have to remember, Scubby. He's stopping at this very hotel for a few days. I want him to do me... Uh... Hello, Mr. Secretary. Well, this is Nick Carter. I'd like to speak to the governor a moment, if I may. Thank you. Hello, Governor. This is Nick Carter. Fine, thanks. Governor, I want to go to state's prison. Oh, no, not as a visitor. I want to go as a convict. Nick, are you nuts? No, I mean it. If you can spare me five minutes, I think I can convince you. Thanks. I'll be right up. Ella, I asked you to meet me here at my office... Because I'm going to be out of town for a few days. And I want to have everything straight before I leave. Uh, has anything further happened? Nothing, Mr. Carter. Except that Mrs. Jarbo has installed herself in the house as its mistress. She's very unpleasant to me. And I know she'd like me to leave. Well, you stay right there. Did the will leave anything to you? No, Mr. Carter. Everything went to her. I can't understand it. I can. That will is forged. But the will is an uncle's handwriting, and both the witnesses to the will have identified their signatures as genuine. And the will was found where the note said it would be. But nevertheless, I'm convinced the will's a fake. Betsy, what did you find out? Nina Charbeau and Sarah Blake were married right enough. I found the record in a little church on the south side. Hmm. Sarah really is his wife. Forged will doesn't make sense. And neither does a suicide note, which Charbeau didn't write. Maybe he did kill himself after all, Mr. Carter. Maybe he just forgot about me. No, I don't believe it, Ella. I don't either. And, Ella, I'm going to prove I'm right, even if I... even if I have to go to jail to do it. Oh, you're the new man. Yeah, Warden. What's your name? Max Herbert. Where were you born? Buffalo, New York. How old are you? Thirty-three. Nationality? American. Married? Nope. Crime? Housebreaking. Very well. The guard will take you to the photographers and then to the laboratory. Well, fella, you've been here three days. How do you like working in this shoe shop? I don't like it. I'm not cut out for it. What are you in for? Second story job. What'd I get you for? Crack in a safe. It was four of us. Two of them got away. Me and McCoy was nailed cold. McCoy? Hey, you wouldn't mean Barney McCoy, would you? Yeah. Yeah, you know him? Sure. Know him well. Great guy. Yeah, sure is. And you know his wife? Yeah, some. He's a darn smart woman, Eddie is. Eddie? Yeah. Thought her name was Sarah. No, no, his wife's Eddie. Sarah was his sister. 
Yeah, they look so much alike, you couldn't tell one from the other. Yeah. Well, what became of Sarah? I don't know. She married some rich guy for his money, but he left her flat. I don't know what happened after that. And he's still in town waiting for Mac to get out. Yeah, he did break out. A few days ago. He just caught him and brought him back here. Yeah. And yeah, they got him on the rock pile for trying to escape. Hey, cut out that talking, you guys. Get back to work. Okay, okay. So Barney McCoy is on the rock pile now. I rather think I'd like to be transferred to the rock pile myself. <laughs> me now for almost two weeks. Yeah. So what? You know, I wouldn't give you a bum steer, don't you? What are you leading up to, Max? I'm working on a way to get out of here. Before I come up here, I heard you on the level. I'd like to let you in on it. Where did you ever hear of me outside this place? Oh, the big town. A girl named Sarah told me about you. What? You married her sister, Eddie. You know Sarah? Sure. About five, six years ago. I haven't seen her since, though. So. Uh, Sarah's, uh, Sarah's in Europe now. Yeah. When are you planning on getting out of here? As soon as I get the necessary people lined up. If I had some dough, we could get out of here tomorrow. How much do you need? About 200 to start with. Okay. I'll have it for you tomorrow. Okay, Max. You get that stuff and we'll be out of here in two days. <laughs> You get five minutes to talk. Hey, Nick, why don't you... Hold it, hold it. I'm Max Herbert in here. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have remembered. How in the world did you ever get in this place? Well, the governor fixed it so that I was caught red-handed robbing the home of a friend of his. Yeah. When they caught me, I had the family silver in one hand and the family jewels in the other. <laughs> it was easy. And now you arranged to be transferred to the gang where McCoy's working. Well, have you found anything? Yes, but it's all circumstantial. But Barney McCoy and I are breaking out of here day after tomorrow. And I'm hoping to get some proof then. Are you sure you're getting out of here? Yes. One of the keepers is working with us. Huh. I think this same keeper fixed McCoy's getaway last time. And I also think, from what I've heard, that he may have helped in Jarbo's murder. Yeah? I've learned positively that he was absent from the prison on leave that day. But isn't there danger if you're getting hurt if you try to break out of here? Of course there is. I have to take that chance. I've got to stick to McCoy. Don't worry, Scubby. I'll be all right. I hope... <laughs> All set, McCoy? All set. Everything's fixed. Good. You see that delivery truck over there, Max? Yeah. Well, that's going to break down when it tries to start. I get it. We'll have to help it get out of the yard here. Right. Listen. He's trying to start it now. The guard all set? Sure. Mike's with us all the way. Same as before. Hey! You over there! That's us. Come on. Yeah, give us a hand with this truck. Okay. What's the matter? Motor won't start. Have to give him a push. You two get a hold here and give him a start. Okay, Mike. Rest of you guys get back to work. All right, get your shoulder behind it, Max. Okay. Let's go. All right. Heave. All right, again. Heave. Once more. Oh, come on, get it going. We ain't got all day. Heave. As soon as the motor starts, jump on the truck. Right, I got you. Okay, again. There. Come on, Max. I'm in. Get down so they can't see you. Look, bridge over the railroad tracks is just ahead. When we get over the tracks, be ready to jump. Be right with you. All right, now. Come on. Right behind you, Barney. Jump on the tender of that engine below us. Now. Okay. You all right, McCoy? Yeah. Come on, engineer. Give her all the steam you got. Don't stop the talk. You, fireman, feed the coal to her. I don't want to use this gun unless I have to. Watch out, Max. The outside wall of the prison is just ahead. You'd better duck. There's going to be shooting. Right, McCoy. All okay so far? Oh, here it comes. Watch it. Uh, look at him pour it out. <laughs> well, we're out of jail now. And for good. It's good to see you back in your office again, Mr. Carter. Yes, it's good to be back here, Ella. 
Now, tell me, have you learned anything interesting since I last saw you? I think so, Mr. Carter. Now, let's have it. A few months ago, our housekeeper spent about a month visiting her son in California. Before she went, she put an ad in the paper for a temporary housekeeper. Several women answered the ad, and uh, Mrs. Martin was given the job. She had light brown hair and wore dark glasses. I disliked her on sight, and I'm sure she disliked me. When our housekeeper returned, this Mrs. Martin left, and I never saw her again until the day my uncle was buried. What do you mean, Ella? On that day, she presented herself as my uncle's widow. Your uncle's widow? Yes, Mr. Carter. When she first came to live in the house after the funeral, I thought there was something very familiar about her. But not until a few days ago did I suddenly realize that Mrs. Jarbeau was Mrs. Martin, with black hair instead of brown and without her dark glasses. Ella, could you swear to that? No, but some of her little mannerisms, certain tricks of speech, uh, a funny way of walking, all make me positive. And that explains the mystery of how the fake will was forged. While Mrs. Martin was substituting for the housekeeper, she could have found out about the will, taken it out, had a new one forged, and then returned it. The night your uncle was murdered, the forged will was substituted for the original one in the desk drawer by using a duplicate key that had been prepared in advance. And it might interest you, Nick, to know that when Ella told me this the other day, I checked at the house where we first met Mrs. Jarbeau. The woman there told me that Mrs. Jarbeau was away on a visit during the month that Mrs. Martin took the place of Ella's housekeeper. Good work. That settles it, Betsy. Just a minute, Mr. Carter. There's another thing you better know. Something else? Yes, Mr. Carter. Last evening, a strange man came to the house. He and Mrs. Jarbeau were apparently old friends because she called him Mac. Barney McCoy. She took him up to her room where I heard them talking for a long time. I tried to hear what they were saying but couldn't get close enough. But I did hear him say it was time to get that girl out of the way for good. And then Mrs. Jarbeau said that now that Mac was back, it was time to wind up the job. Well, Ella, if everything goes as I hope it will, we'll be the ones to wind up the job, not Mrs. Jarbeau. Anything else you want me to do? Yes. Meet me in the rear of your home tomorrow night at 11 o'clock. Mm-hmm. We'll make our final arrangements then. In the meantime, sit tight and keep your ears and eyes open. Mr. Carter? Mr. Carter? That you, Ella? Yes. Come into the living room here. We can talk better. Okay. Sure there's no one around? Not now. That man, Mac, was here earlier, but he left quite a while ago. Mrs. Jarbeau has gone up to her room. We can talk safely here. All right. Don't turn on the light. Maybe seen. We can talk just as well in the dark. Whatever you say. Now tell me, does Mrs. Jarbeau know you've ever seen this man, Mac? Oh, no. I've kept out of the way whenever he's been around. Good. Do you know what he came here for this evening? There was talk about chloroform and poison. And then she told him the lawyer for the, for the estate was here this afternoon mm-hmm. and said that she would be in full legal possession of the estate in another few days. I see. And then he said that if that was the case, it was the time to act before it was too late. Well, now it's time for us to act, too. I think we'd better... Quiet. <gasps> Somebody's unlocking the door through which we came. Maybe they won't come in here. Who's in this room? I can't see you in the dark, but I know you're there. Who's there? Who are you? None of your business. Speak up or I'll shoot. If you do, you'll never live to see another What's day. What's going on in here? Why isn't the light on? Mrs. Jabot. Ella. What are you Barnaby doing Barnaby Coy, you... Max Herbert, by all this holy. What are you doing here? Why, I, uh... Oh, you see, Barney, I, uh... Yeah? He's here because he loves me. Don't you know this man is an ex-convict? You ought to be serving a sentence in state's prison right now. Yes, I know that. Well, that's why we had to meet like this, Barney. Is this true, Ella? Yes, Mrs. Jarbeau, it is. Hmm. Look here, you. You interviewed me a couple of weeks ago, said you were writing a story for your paper. You said then your name was Peters. Now you say it's Herbert. Well, my real name is Herbert Peters, ma'am. You see, I... And you? I, uh... What are you doing here? I'm a night watchman on duty in this neighborhood. I... Saw this man come in here and followed him. Recognized him as a suspicious character. You're both lying. Get out of here, both of you, immediately. And as for you, Ella, get upstairs at once. I'll deal with you later. Well, that's all the thanks I get for trying to protect your place against thieves. I will get out. Come on, you. Go ahead, Barney. I'm coming. Good night, Ella, dear. And see that you never come back. Either of you.
Hey, Max. Yeah? Was that story about you and the girl straight? Why, sure, Barney. Wasn't your story on the level? Well, to tell you the truth, I was going to see if I could find a few things I could swipe. <laughs> I'm flat broke. You haven't got a few bucks on you, have you? Sure, Barney. I can let you have a ten spot. What? Here. Gee, thanks, pal. I won't forget you for this. Forget it. Yeah, we sure were lucky to get out of there so easy. Yeah. I thought the old dame was going to have us pinched. You're under arrest, both of you, so don't try to get me right. There you go. Sit down. Let go of me. Stop. Stop or I'll shoot. No, you don't. You let go of my arm. You made me miss it. So what? Yep. Well, I got you anyway. You won't get away. You're going back to state's prison again, Mr. Max Herbert. Oh, you know my name, do you? I sure do. And I know yours, Ben Lyons. But, what? You know me? Hey, let me look at you. Gladly. Come over on the street light. All right. You know me now? Uh, well, Nick Carter. <laughs> well, I'll be... Well, gosh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but a, a woman just called the station, said she'd passed two escaped convicts in front of her house, and if we hurried, we could pick them up. Even give us their names, too, well, so I... Now, Ben, listen to me. I'm on the trail of something big. Have the lieutenant and eight men meet me at 12 o'clock tomorrow night at the back of the Jarbeau place across the street where they won't be seen. Okay. Be sure to tell them not to fail me, because I expect to capture the murderers of Enos Jarbeau. Posted as we agreed, Scubby? Yes, Nick. Outside and inside the house. Good. They have orders to let anybody come up here, but to let nobody go downstairs again. And we're ready for the finale in this case. What's that you've got there, Nick? It's a new type of microphone, Patsy. Oh. I've attached it to the wall between this room and Mrs. Jarbo's room. Mm -hmm. Through the vibration of the wall, it'll pick up whatever is said in her room. Then whatever is picked up is amplified so that it's loud enough for us to hear it. The amplifier also has a recording device which makes a permanent record of the conversation on a wire tape. Gosh, what will they think of next? Quiet now. Let's listen. I'll turn it on. But I tell you, Barney, we can't lose. In a few more days, the whole Jarbeau estate will be mine, legally. I know, Addy, but can you handle that girl for a few days more? Well, That's if I point. can't, we'll give her what we gave the old man. Do we have to? If she's dead, we know she ain't going to bother us. Yeah. So we bet... Hey, what the devil's that? Quiet. How do I know? The housekeeper's answering it. Hey. Somebody's coming up here. Did you tell anybody you were coming up here? Anybody here? Mike! Come on. What are you doing here? Well, that's a fine question to ask me. I'm here because you sent for me. Who sent for you? You did, McCoy. Are you crazy? I did nothing of the kind. I got your note this morning. It is. What? Come to Sharpo House tonight, but not before 12. Everything okay? Very important. And it's signed, Barney. Listen, I never wrote that note. Well, if you didn't, it means trouble for us. Somebody else knows about this business besides us three. You, you mean we're caught? We ain't caught yet. But we will be if we don't watch our step. Even now, I was baby. afraid of this. I knew I should have kept me out of it. Ah, shut up, you rat. You're not in jail yet. But I'm going to be. I can feel it coming. Don't shut up, Mike. I'll bring you. You did it, McCoy. You fired the shot that killed the old man. I just shut up. You just get it. I Come on, kids. That's enough of that. Let's go. Right with you, Nick. Tom, you gotta get out. I'll take it easy, Sarah. Wait a minute, will you? I can't wait any longer. Get your hands up, both of you. And no funny business. Max, what are you... No, McCoy, not Max. Nick Carter. Nick Carter? You ain't got nothing on us. Oh, I Nick's think... got enough on you three to send you to the chair. Yes, McCoy, we know the whole plot from beginning to end. Tell him what we found out, Nick. What do you mean? It means I know that Sarah married Jarbo, and that shortly afterwards she died. You, Eddie, her sister, married McCoy. When Sarah died, you found her marriage certificate and decided to use your resemblance to her to get the old man's money. McCoy was in prison then. But you arranged with the guard, Mike, here to help McCoy escape when the time was right. Then to pay Mike for his trouble, you cut him in on the deal. Then you, Eddie, got that temporary job here as a housekeeper, which was an unexpected break. While you were here, you had the fake will made. Then when all was ready, McCoy escaped as planned. Mike came with him. And between the three of you, you chloroformed old Jarbeau and then shot him in such a way that it looked like suicide. How do you know it wasn't suicide? The suicide note you left for the old man. Whoever Addy got to forge that will for her did such an expert job that the witnesses recognized their own forged signatures as genuine. But whoever wrote that suicide note was so clumsy that he wrote it with a blunt-pointed fountain pen instead of the sharp-pointed steel pen that was the only pen Jarbo ever used. That ain't proof. That's guessing. We've got plenty of proof, McCoy. And if that isn't enough, to top it all off, the conversation in this room between you three crooks has been recorded in full for the past 20 minutes. 
And if that isn't practically a confession and good legal evidence in any court, my name isn't Nick and Carter. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called State's Prison Evidence, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Midnight Murder. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time each week by W.O.R. Mutual. And now, Nick, what about our story for next week? Well, next week's story started off as a simple question of who stole the firm's funds. But it ended up by being the very perplexing question of who killed two men and caused the death of a third. And not the least puzzling part of the case was to find out who fired the fatal bullet which started off the murders. Isn't that usually the most puzzling part of a murder story? Well, yes, it is. But in this case, the man who was killed was standing by my side in the corridor of a large office building. And there was no one around at the time who could have fired the gun that killed him. I'm afraid I'm getting more mixed up all the time. <laughs> That's exactly how we felt about it. But Nick cleared it all up in spite of everything. And we'll tell you all about it next week. So long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. See you next week. In the strange adventure you've just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled An Angle on Murder. Or Nick Carter and the mystery of the mutilated bullet. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Monday evening at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Body on the Slab, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband. But Mr. Wallace, people disappear every day in a big city like this. Such things are really no concern of mine. They're a matter for the police. But, Mr. Carter, it isn't just anybody who's disappeared. It's my husband. I'll pay you anything to find him. Well, I suppose it can do no harm to listen to the story. All right, Mr. Burnett. Where was the last place you saw him? In a sort of saloon gambling house on West Street, down by the waterfront. A two-story house. A very run-down. Wait a minute, Burnett. That wouldn't be the place that's run by a one-legged soldier they call Bill. Oh, so you know it, do you? Certainly do. By reputation, at least. Here, I want you to look at this picture. You recognize it? Yes, that's the place I'm talking about. I thought so. Mrs. Wallace, I'll take the case. Oh, Mr. Carter, I knew you would. Yes, I have a score to settle with that old rat with a wooden leg. And this may be my chance to do it. All right, Mr. Bennett. Let me have all the details. Well, Vernon, that's Vernon Wallace, my friend. Vernon and I have been making a night of it. And we ended up at this Bill's place. How did you happen to go there? Well, Vernon had heard that it was a great place for a fast poker game, and he was determined to try it. I'd heard it was a pretty tough place, and I attempted to talk him out of it, but I couldn't do it. So about 1.30 or 2 o'clock this morning, we went down there. We were the only ones there. To make a long story short, Vernon and that old guy who owns the place got into a game, and no matter what the old guy did, Vernon won. I was afraid for him in a dive like that, and I tried to get him to quit and go home with me, but he refused. 
He told me to get out and leave him alone. And Vernon hasn't been home since then. And he, he hasn't been seen anywhere since then. Afraid that he... that he never left that place alive. Well, let's see. The place to start looking for clues is certainly the old soldier's tavern. I'm going down there tonight. I know enough tricks with cards so that I can be sure of winning. And maybe old Pegleg will try to treat me as he treated Vernon Wallace. Well, stranger, I gotta admit I'm licked. You broke the bank. Yes, luck's been with me ever since I sat down here. Well, it's getting late. I've got to be getting home. Uh, how about a drink before you go, stranger? You'll not refuse me that. Why, no. I'll have a drink with you. But only one. Sure, sure. One will be okay. Hey, Mike, two beers and make it snappy. Yeah, coming up. You want all my money tonight, stranger, but I don't harbor no ill feelings. Nice to you. You want fair and square, and that's all there is to it. Here's your beers. Uh, here you are, stranger. Drink hearty. Excuse me, stranger. I'll be back before you can shake a stick. Well, that's all right. I'll enjoy my drink while you're gone. Uh, stranger, Mike and I have taken a fancy to you. We don't want no harm to come to you. Look, why don't you stay here all night? Mike's got an extra bed upstairs. He'll be glad to let you have. Then tomorrow you can go home and nobody will bother you. Well... Well, if you let me pay for the use of the room and bed, I believe I will. Stay. Good, you're a smart man, but we couldn't take no money for doing you a favor. Uh, Here, Mike, show the gentleman his room. Yeah, sure. Will you follow me, Mister? Oh, uh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, I want to get to bed. I'm, I'm tired, Oxen. Uh, give me your arm, Mister. No, 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 no. I'm all right. I, I don't need any help. Well, I'll come along just to be sociable. I don't want to be sociable. I just want to go to sleep. Well, here's your room, mister. I'll leave a candle on the table for you. Okay, okay. Thanks very much. Good night. There you are, stranger. Sleep tight. Yeah. We'll see you later. Yeah, we'll see you later. Yeah, I'll see you later. Good night, good night. I gotta go to sleep. I'm awful tired. I'm awful tired. <sighs> Well, got myself into this easy enough. Hope I'll find it as easy to get out again when the time comes. Uh, no light, but a candle. Why it'll do to give me a look around instead of this bed. Uh, it doesn't look too comfortable, but... Oh, blood. Let's see. If a man were lying on this bed, that blood is just about where a dagger would go through his heart. If the man were drunk enough or had been drugged, he'd never know what hit him. Well, let's look around here. I wonder what's in this closet. Uh-huh. Locked. Well, that won't keep me out long. Not as long as I still have my keys with me. Try this one. Nope. Ah, this one does it. Well, this is interesting. Old clothes. Here's a vest with blood on it. And here's a shirt and a jacket. Both of them bloody. Unquestionably, these came from some of the victims. Well, nothing to do now but wait for that one-legged scoundrel and his pal to make the next move. <sighs> well, I guess I'll be safe if I merely sit on the edge of the bed now. Oh, yes, I won't need this candle anymore, either. Now to wait for them. Oh, there they come. Ah, oh, He's asleep, all right. I can hear him snoring. Well, with the slug I put in his bed, he'd have to be either sleeping or dead. All right. Easy does it. Is he still asleep? Yeah. You hold this light while I... Get your hands up, both of you. Well, well I'll be... And drop that knife you got in your hand, Bill. How... How can you be awake when we... Really very simple, Bill. Keep those hands up. I just poured that drink you gave me on the floor instead of down my throat. What are you going to do with us? I'm going to turn you over to the police. 
the evidence of the bloody clothes in the closet and what other evidence they'll undoubtedly find when they search this place, you both should have an interesting time of it. Why don't you kill us now and be done with it? Because I want some information first. Why should we tell you anything? Because if you do, I shall probably be able to get your sentence reduced somewhat. If you don't... I got you. What do you want to know? Last night, a young man won all your money. He hasn't been seen since. You mean that fellow with a little mustache? I do. You murder him the way you try to murder me? I didn't do nothing with him. Maybe I wanted to, but I didn't. Isn't it a fact that this chap's friend tried to get him to leave you and go home? Yeah. And when he wouldn't go, the friend finally went off without him? No, that's a lie. They left here together. What? You trying to tell me one of them didn't leave before the other? No, they went out together. You know where they went? How should I know? There was a taxi waiting right outside the door here. Seemed to be waiting for them to come out. Then the guy with the money gets inside and his friend sits in front with the driver. Oh, friend sat in front with the driver, huh? But you know that cab, if you saw it again. Sure, it had a big dent in the back of the body. Painted with red lead. I've seen him around this part of the city before. I see. Well, Bill, as soon as I can turn you and your pal over to the law, I'll have Penny find that taxi with a dent in the back. Trail seems to lead direct to him. Nick Carter's office. Oh, hello, Patsy. Is Penny there yet? Penny? Who's Penny? Oh, I forgot, Patsy. You were away yesterday when all this happened. Scotty got a rush assignment to cover the Balkan campaign for his paper, and they had to leave on a boat till it sailed last night. Scotty gone without saying goodbye to me? Well, he couldn't, Patsy. You weren't here. He asked me to do it for him. Oh, Nick, I'm going to miss Scotty. Well, of course, Patsy. We'll both miss him. But while he's away, I'm having Penny Eagles work on my cases with me in Scotty's place. Who's this Penny Eagles? I never heard of him. Oh, he's an old friend of mine. Very clever fellow. When he was younger, he was an expert forger. How did you happen to get mixed up with him? Well, he was accused of a murder he had nothing to do with, and he had me come clear. Then he got interested in law enforcement, turned over a new leaf, and has gone straight ever since. You like him, Patsy? I hope so. We should be in a minute now. As soon as he shows up, have him call me at Shermore 31222. Shermore 31222. Right. I'll wait here for his call. Right, Penny. That's the taxi we're looking for. And I know that driver. You do? Yes. He's John Hagen, ex-convict and confidence man. Friend of yours? Hardly. Seen him in court several times, but he's never seen me. What's he been doing since you've been watching him? Well, all afternoon and the early part of this evening, he's acted like any other cabbie. Taking whatever fares he could get. But the latter part of the evening, he's been fussy about who rides in his cab. How do you mean? Well, I've seen several parties try to take his cab. But all he's picked up in the last two hours were two drunks, and all oh, were they pie-eyed. I see. I think I know what he's looking for, Penny. And I'm going to give him just the kind of a passenger I think he wants. Wish me luck. But, Nick, what are you going to do? Well, so long, old fellow. i got to be getting home now. I'll see you tomorrow, maybe, huh? Okay. So long, but don't take any wooden nickels. <laughs> okay, pal, that's fine. Don't take a wooden nickel. <laughs> I, I had too much. Hey, taxi, time mister? Huh? Taxi? Taxi, hey, mister? Hey, what do I want a taxi for? I got a well, car a my own. A friend told me to come for you and take you home. Oh, a friend of mine. Yeah. Huh? Oh, and I saw it. It's okay. Where's the, where's the door? I can't find it. Hey, what's the address, mister? I did the address. It's um, the, the, the corner of 2nd and 5th. And don't bother me anymore, but I got to get me some sleep. Okay. Yes, Drive on, Mick. The Now, I'll wager it won't be toward second and fifth. Wait a minute. What's that smell? Perfume? I know. That's ether. So that's the stunt. Picks up drunks who are too far gone to know what's happening, then doses them with just enough ether to put them soundly asleep. Well, it won't happen to me. If I open one of these windows a little bit, that'll keep the air clear. There. Now, Mr. Hagen, the next move is up to you. It's certainly plenty deserted way out here. Wonder how much further we're going. I'd better get this window shut again so he won't suspect anything. So we're near the end of our journey, huh? Very well, Mr. Hagen. 
I'm ready for you. <laughs> Sleeping like a babe, ain't you? Well, let's see what you got in your pockets, then I'll dump Make you Make a move, Hagen, and hey. I'll blow your brains out. What? Who the deuce are you? I'm a detective. See this? Oh. Well, what you want with me? I wanted to find out what your scheme was, and I found out. Now I want you to tell me about the man you picked up at Peg Lake Bill's Tavern down on West Street last night about 3 o'clock. And I... I don't know nothing about it. Oh, no? Look, you waited for him outside of Bill's place. He rode in back. His companion rode up front with you. During the ride, you gave him ether through that devilish device you rigged up in this taxi of yours and made him unconscious. Yeah, if you, if you know all that, why do you ask me? Huh? Because there are two things I don't know. And if you want to avoid further trouble, my friend, you'll tell me. Now, first, who was the man who rode up front with you? I don't know. No? No. Ah, well, uh, I've done a few odd jobs for him in the past, but... Yeah, well, I don't know his name. They call him the captain. He made a deal with me early last night to be outside of Bill's place uh, about 2.30 this morning. Can you describe him? He's sort of an ordinary guy. About my size, maybe. Well, he's kind of good looking. If he, if he didn't have a hunk out of one ear. Burnett. Now, what did you do with the man who was in the back? After I quieted him, we took him to a friend of the captain's, other side of town. What was the address to which you took the body? Hey, there wasn't no body. He's just as alive as you or me. Now he took him to 14 Wanton Place. Left him there. All right. Get back in your cab and drive me to 2nd and 5th. Then I'm through with you, unless you've lied to me. If you have, keep out of my way, or you'll go to jail for life. This is where Mrs. Wallace lives, Patsy. Well, I hope she's home. But, Nick, what do you expect to find out here? I don't know, Patsy. The thing that puzzles me about this case is why Burnett wanted to do away with Wallace. The bell, will you? Mm -hmm. It wasn't the money that Wallace won that tempted Burnett. As he could have taken that while Wallace was unconscious. Now there's a stronger reason. You hope Mrs. Wallace can throw some light on it? I hope so, Patsy. If she can only help in that way. Oh, hello, Mr. Carter. Won't you come in? Thank you, Mrs. Wallace. May I present my assistant, Patsy Bowen? How do you do, Miss Hello, Mrs. Wallace. Uh, please sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Tell me, Mr. Carter, have you found out anything about my husband? Well, nothing definite, I'm sorry to say. We have learned, though, that he fell into bad hands. But we don't know what happened to him after that. Oh, Arthur assured me you'd find out the truth if anyone could. Arthur? Oh, you mean Mr. Burnett. Yes. Yes, he's been so kind to me. He's done so much to cheer me up. Oh, except for his kindness, I'd have gone crazy. You've known him long, Mrs. Wallace? All my life. We were brought up together. And then, too, he and my husband have been business partners for, oh, the best of friends for years. You think a great deal of him, then? Yes, indeed. Mr. Carter, at one time before I met Vernon, I would have married him, if he'd asked me. Then I met Vernon and really fell in love with him. But even after I married Vernon, Arthur continued to be my best friend. I think very highly of him. And you're lucky to have such a friend, Mrs. Wallace. But he could never take my husband's place. You must find Vernon, Mr. Carter. If it's possible to find him, Nick will do it. Yes, Mrs. Wallace. You may rely on me for that. Well, shall we be running along now, Patsy? Where did you say you're calling from, Penny? I'm at a pay station near the house where Hagen left Wallace that night. It's owned by a queer old character they call the Weasel. He works in a crematory about a mile down the road. I see. Well, Hagen's story seems to be straight enough. A couple of guys in a saloon near here says they saw the weasel and another guy carrying a man-sized bundle into the weasel's place about daybreak a couple of mornings ago. And it hasn't come out again, as far as I can find out. Well, did you learn anything about the firm of Wallace and Burnett? Yeah, yeah, I picked up a lot of rumors, Nick, but not many facts. Here's how it goes. Burnett ruins the firm and throws the blame on Wallace. And those who know don't think that Burnett lost much money when the firm failed, but Wallace did. So I was right. What else? Well, Burnett was the one who started Wallace gambling and drinking. Wallace is a nice guy, but he seems to be the weak sister. But nobody seems to know what Burnett's got against him. Well, by putting together what Mrs. Wallace told us and what you've learned, Penny, I think I begin to see the answer. I think that... Hold it, Nick. A guy who looks like Burnett is going into the weasel's place. Good. Don't let him get away from you, Penny. I'll meet you there as soon as I can. You're right. You're right, Nick. 
They did bring that casket here to the crematory. I thought they would. But I wish I could get closer and see what they did with it after they carried it inside. Look, Nick. That window over there is open a little. Huh? Maybe we could hear something from there. Good idea, Penny. Come on. But quiet. Yeah. But, Weasel, are you sure they won't be suspicious? Not a chance, Captain. That's why we're doing this tonight. The owners of the crematory are going to make a test of a new heating fixture tomorrow morning. And they told me to have the ovens hot by ten o'clock. I'm just getting them hot a little ahead of time. Uh, What do you use when you make a test like that? Well, they sent me the body of a dead calf. It's over there in the closet. Yeah, but the test we're going to make tonight will be even better, eh, Captain? Yes, how does this thing work? Oh, simple. The body's laid here on this slab and strapped down the way you saw me fix this fellow. In the next room, there's a lever attached to the slab. When the lever's pulled, the slab slides into the up. The door closes behind it, and the destruction of the body begins. Do we have to, to watch it burn? You can't see the slab nor the ovens from the room where the lever is. How long does it take to... Reduce the body to ashes. Six or eight hours. It'll be all over by daylight. Even if the body isn't... You mean uh, even if the body ain't dead yet? Yes, that's what I mean. Then Wallace is still alive. Well, it's a little unusual to cremate a live body, but it works just the same. You'll never know what happened. It'll be all over in an instant. Well, we got nothing more to do here. Might as well go in the next room and wait for the ovens to get hot enough. Uh, then you can pull the lever and slide the body. You mean I have to pull the lever that sends him into... Sure. He's your friend, Eddie. Come on, Penny. There's no time to waste. We have to work fast. Mr. Burnett to see you, Nick. Oh, yes. Come in, Mr. Burnett. I just want to take enough of your time to tell you that Vernon Wallace's body was found last night. Really? Where was it? Floating in the river. Mrs. Wallace has identified it by a ring and certain other articles found on the body. Oh, must have been a terrible blow to her. She's badly broken up, naturally. But I hope to be able to console her, in part at least, for her great loss. I'm sure you will. Uh, will this repay you for your trouble? Oh, amply, Mr. Burnett. And thank you. Good. Good day, Mr. Carter. Good day, Mr. Burnett. But if you think I'm going to drop this case now, Mr. Burnett, you're crazy. Nick, here I am, over here. I got here as soon as I could after I got your call, Penny. About my new helper, too, as you see. Yeah, so I see. Hi there, helper. Hello, Penny. I hope I'm going to be able to help you and Nick. You'll do all right on this case. Now, what's the dope, Penny? Well, a couple of hours ago, a taxi pulls up in front of Mrs. Wallace's house. Mm-hmm. The driver goes into the house. About 15 minutes later, he comes out again with Mrs. Wallace and her maid. They get in the cab, drive away. With you after him, of course. That's right. Well, they drive around and finally end up way out here. There must have been a couple of guys in the cab when the women got in. Because when they got out there, they were both gagged and their hands were tied behind them. Well, they took him in the old house. I found a phone to call you. Did they hurt them? Well, not so far as I could tell. Gee, I wish I could see what they're doing now. I hope they're all right. Oh, Millie, this is terrible. (gasps) My mouth is still sore from that dirty old cloth they used for a gag. Where do you suppose we are? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Wallace. I've never been this far from town before. Could you see anything out of the window? Oh, nothing I recognize. Oh, I should have known better than to be fooled by such a simple trick. I might have known that old Mrs. Parker couldn't be so sick she had to see us at once. Why, well, I saw her only the day before yesterday. No, fool me, all right. I thought... I hope uh, you're comfortable, ladies. We are not. We certainly are not. What's the idea of bringing us here? Well, I'll tell you. Cap says is how he's going to collect some big dough from you two. You mean we're being held for ransom? Yep. Well, how much money do you want? Well, uh, Cap says he won't take less than $50,000. Oh, Mrs. Wallace, we'll never get out of here. Nonsense. <laughs> he 
must be insane to expect me to pay him that amount of money. Well, he says he won't take a cent less. Well, he won't get it. Never. And he's a dangerous man. You better not get him mad at you. I'll be back at 8 o'clock tonight for your answer. Oh, he'll kill us. I know he will. Be quiet, (laughs) Millie. He won't kill us as long as he thinks there's any chance of getting the money out of us. But what if we get... A man at the window. It's Mr. Burnett. Oh, Arthur. Arthur, I hoped you'd come. Are you... Are you safe, Louise? Have they hurt you? No, Arthur. We're both safe. But how did you ever find us? I just climbed up the porch to the roof, then over to your window. (gasps) Have they told you why they brought you here? Yes. They want ransom. Fifty thousand dollars. And they'll kill us if you don't save us. Not while I'm here. I'll see that no harm comes to you. But what can you do? You're only one against the two of them, and they're both vicious criminals, I know. Do be careful, Arthur. Louise, if I save you from these rats, do you think that you... Ask me later, Arthur. Not now, please. Very well, if you say so. Now, tell me, what time are the men coming back again? Do you know? The man we talked to said they'd be here at 8 o'clock. That gives us just over an hour. Now, here's my plan. When they come, I'll be here... Now, you each know what you're supposed to do, don't you? Sure, Nicky, sure. You know, this ought to be fun. I haven't played cops and robbers since I was a kid. Same here. This should be good. Well, I hope you two aren't disappointed. But you can't tell about these things. So watch your step, both of you. Here they are. Leave everything to me. Well, you made up your mind to pay the ransom the cap wants? We'll pay you nothing. Not a cent. You know what that means, don't you? It means that you better get your hands up, all three of you, if you want to live. Who are you? I'm here to save these two ladies from you and your gang. Oh, yeah? Let them have it, fella. Oh, I warned you. Hey. Ah. Arthur, you've killed them all. It's their own fault. I warned them. Oh, you were wonderful, Arthur. Oh, Arthur, are you hurt? No, Louise, dear. Fortune was with me. I'm not even scratched. Oh, Mr. Burnett, I, well, I never in my whole life saw anyone so brave as you. Any man would be brave when defending the woman he loves. Please, Arthur, you promised. I'm sorry. I'll take you home now. Just let me drag these bodies out of the way and I'll... Not yet, you won't. Wait, you can't. <laughs> What's the matter with you men? What's the idea? Shut up, you. Arthur, are you hurt? Mrs. Wallace... The time has come to explain a great many things. First, let me remove this beard. There. You recognize me now, don't you? Mr. Carter! Nick Carter! Oh, Mr. Carter, what are you doing to Arthur? Mr. Burnett? I'll answer that later. First, I want you to meet my assistant, Penny Eagles. Your assistant? Sure. How are you? The other man is an old friend of yours, Mrs. Wallace. An old friend of mine? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure I don't well, perhaps know... Perhaps if he took off his makeup, you might recognize There. Do you know me now? Bernard! Oh, Vernon. Oh, Louise, my darling. But Vernon, Arthur told me that you... That I was dead? Oh, yes. Arthur Burnett told you a great many things that were not true. But Vernon, he showed me your ring, your lodge pin. He he said he took them off of your dead body that the police found in the river. Burnett took those articles from your husband's body. Right enough, Mrs. Wallace. But it was while your husband was still alive. And it's no fault of his that I'm not dead now. You don't mean that Arthur... That's exactly what I do mean. He's been lying to you for years, Mrs. Wallace. It was he who ruined your husband's business and caused him to lose so much of his money. It was he who first induced your husband to drink and gamble. And it was he who was responsible for your husband's disappearance a few days ago. That's a lie. Oh, no, it isn't. As a matter of fact, Louise, dear, if Mr. Carter hadn't fooled him by putting a dead calf in my place on that crematory slab, Arthur Burnett would have been my murderer. Oh, no. No, that can't be true. Uh, Furthermore, it was Burnett who arranged for your kidnapping this afternoon. Oh, but... He did it so that he could suddenly appear and rescue you from the members of the kidnap gang, who were in reality men in his employ. But why should he do all these horrible things? Because he's been in love with you ever since he first met you. And ever since your marriage to Wallace, he's been insanely jealous of him. Everything Burnett's done has been to make you despise your husband and turn instead to him. That's a lie, Carter. Oh, no, it isn't, Burnett. I can easily prove it. Penny, let me have the gun with this Burnett shot us during the battle a few minutes ago. Sure, Nick. Here you are. Thanks. Now look here, Mrs. Wallace. This pistol has eight shells in it. Burnett fired five shots at us. 
But there are still three shells left. And here they are. Why, those are blanks. They couldn't hurt anybody. Exactly, Mrs. Wallace. And the shells and the pistols that his men were to use in the fights were blanks also. And if I were a beautiful woman in distress and a man came to my rescue with his pistol loaded with blanks, I think I should find it extremely difficult to believe that he was being on the level with me. was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Body on the Slab, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Missing Husband, another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, how about a few hints on next week's story? It's a story of a body which was washed up on the beach, tied up in a sack. And the only identifying mark on the body was one of Nick's cards. I had to solve that murder to prove I didn't do it myself. And I found that the real culprit was the killer who used a clue that pointed directly to him to prove that he couldn't have done it. And the killer tried to down both Nick and myself when the chase got too warm for comfort. But as you can easily see, he didn't succeed. So, so long until next week. So long, folks. And so long to you and Nick for now, Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious expenditure of Nick Carter entitled... The Drug Ring Murder. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Left-Handed Killer. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... The Substitute Bride. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Night Ferry. Here, here, take your hands off me. Now, what are you doing? Let me go. Don't put me down. No, no, stop it. Nick, there's a young man here to see you. Says he's an old friend of yours. Well, hello, Nick. Alan Marvin. Well, Alan, it's good to see you again. And what brings you to this part of the country? I came east to get married, Nick. Well, congratulations. Oh, wait a minute. I'm afraid your congratulations are a little premature. What's the matter? I don't know. I can't find her. Can't find her? Well, what on earth do you mean by that? Well, look, it's like this, Nick. Alice Evans and I have been engaged for about four years. But for the past three years, she's been living in South America with friends of her family. She was due back in this country yesterday on the Gallia, so I came on from Chicago to meet her. Her boat got in ahead of schedule, and my train was late, so we missed connections. I'd already told her I was coming, but in spite of that, she was gone by the time I got to the dock last night. Didn't she leave any message for you? No, not a word. That's odd. And she has no friends in this part of the country that she could stay with. Well, didn't anyone at the boat know where she went? Well, apparently not, Nick. The stewardess says a boy brought her a note, and as soon as she read it, she got dressed and went ashore. There was a taxi waiting for her, and she went off in it. An hour later, an expressman called for her trunks. Perhaps she went to a hotel. Hotel? But oh, why should she do that when I told her that I'd meet her at the boat? No, Nick. Something has happened to her, I'm sure of it. Nick, the hmm? morning paper says that there's a Miss Alice Evans registered at the Hamilton Park Hotel. What's that? Would that be the same girl? Here, let me see that, will you, quick? Hmm, right here. Uh... 
<laughs> well, and she did go to a hotel. Oh, gee, what a fool I was for worrying you, Nick. I'll take nothing of it, Alan. Glad you found her. Well, if you, uh, if you don't mind, Nick, I think I'll... Uh... Sure, go right ahead. I know how anxious you are to see her. Hey, look, Nick, why don't you come with me? I'd like very much to have you meet her. Well, Alan, this seems hardly the time to... Oh, drink. come on. No, Nick, come on. I want you to meet her. You'll like her. Well, all right, if you insist. But I've heard it said that three is usually a crowd, especially after two of them have been separated for three years. Taxi! Taxi! Second and fifth rabbit. Well, Ellen, I gather that you feel that our visit to the young lady was not a complete success. Nick, something's wrong. I, I don't know what. So I noticed. That's why I stayed until you left. I tell you she's changed. I can't put my finger on it, but she's different somehow. Well, three years is a long time, Ellen. Some change would be quite natural. Oh, but it isn't that kind of change, Nick. And doesn't she look the same? Yes, she does, and she doesn't. You mean you don't think she is, Alice Evans? Well, she must be, and yet... Then you're not sure. Uh, I wish her father were here. He'd know immediately whether she's his daughter or not. Where is he? Chicago? I don't know. He told me he was meeting the boat, but as far as I know, he hasn't shown up. She said she hadn't seen him. Well, he probably was delayed in getting away. Look, you, you don't suppose anything could have happened to him, do you? You know, like so many rich men, he always carried several hundred dollars with him. Well, it's possible, of course, Ellen. Was there anything distinctive about his appearance? Well, he was a shortish man, stout, white hair. Oh, yeah, he wore old-fashioned side whiskers. Well, those should make him easy to identify. I'll have Lieutenant Riley get in touch with the Chicago police and see if they know anything about him. Oh, good. Then I'll have Patsy make the round of the hospitals here in town. I'll send Penny to the terminal and the ferries to see if he can pick up any information about him there. Mm-hmm. Well, we ought to find out something that way. And I think my next step will be to visit the Galliard or Dock. See what I can learn there. reason I'm taking you to see Miss Evans, Purser, is that I want you to tell me whether or not she's the girl who made the trip up in South America with you. I understand, sir. Now, you, the purser of the Gallia, probably had as good a chance to see her as anyone. Oh, why, yes, sir, but none of us saw her very much. Uh, she took ill right after we sailed and stayed in her room almost the entire trip. But you say you'd be able to identify her positively. Oh, yes, sir. I have an excellent memory for faces, and uh, she was a real looker, she was. Here's her hotel. Come on. Right, Ozer. Here, we can take this elevator. Three, please. This is your floor. Our room's right across the corridor here. Oh, oh, come in, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Miss Evans. You, of course, know this gentleman, Miss Evans? Why, I... I... Well, let me see. Oh, it, it's hardly fair to expect her to remember me, Mr. Carter. She was so ill every time I saw her that I doubt if she'd ever really got a good look at me the old voyage. Oh, why, of course. Now I know who you are. You're one of the officers off the Gallia. We came up from South America together. That's right, Mum. See, sir, she knows me right enough. Oh, I knew I'd seen you somewhere. If, if I hadn't been so sick, I'd have remembered you at once. I see. Well, Miss Evans, our call is really in the nature of business. The purser found a valuable lot of jewelry left behind in the ship, and I was called in to help find the owner. As it was near your cabin, we come to you first. I haven't missed any of my jewels, but I'll let you know if I do. Thank you. Have you had any word from your father yet? No, not a word. Do you suppose anything's happened to him? What did he look like, Miss Evans? Why, he was... Here. I'll show you his picture. You can tell better by that. Here you are, Mr. Carter. That's my father. Are you a detective? Yes, Miss Evans. I am. Then you must find him for me. I don't care what it costs. Very well. I'll see what I can do. Shall we go, Purser? Uh, oh, yes, sir. Good day, miss, and good luck to you. Goodbye, and, and thank you. I'll let you know as soon as I learn anything, Miss Evans. Good day. Well, Purser, 
Was that the Miss Evans who made the trip with you in the galleon? Oh, positively, sir. I'd know her anywhere. You're sure? Ah, oh, there's no question whatever, sir. I'd swear to it on a stack of Bibles a foot high, I would. I couldn't find a thing, Nick. There's nobody in the hospital who answers to the description of Mr. Evans. I hardly expected you'd find anything, Patsy. But we had to be sure. Well, did the Chicago police know anything about him? Riley said they had no report of anything having happened to him there. Mm-hmm. What did Penny find? Well, Penny hasn't come in yet. Oh, hey, he... Nick, I couldn't find any traces of the old boy at the terminal, but I did find something at the ferry. What'd but you I... find? Oh, that'll keep, Nick. Right now, I got a taxi waiting outside, and the driver of the taxi's the fellow who took Alice Evans from the boat to the hotel last night, and he knows something. How'd you find him? Oh, well, the stewardess on the galley pointed him out to me. I'm afraid if I try to bring him in here, I'll scare him. I already asked him a lot of questions. I'll go outside and talk to him myself. Oh, driver, I'm Nick Carter. So what? I ain't interested. But I am. I'm interested in what you can tell me about a young lady you picked up at the galley last night. You took her to the Hamilton Park Hotel, didn't you? All right, so what if I did? Look, you'll save yourself time and trouble if you'll answer my questions. You picked her up about 8 o'clock, didn't you? Yeah, about that. How long a drive is it to the hotel? Yeah, about a half hour. Maybe if the lights was against you, 45 minutes. And how does it happen that you didn't register in at the hotel till nearly 10 o'clock? Well, I did... Where'd you go between the time you left the galley and the time you reached the hotel? I stopped over the house on 22nd Street for a while. Did Miss Evans leave the cab? Yeah. She said she wanted to see Winslow's daughter. Said they went to school together. You mean it was David Winslow's house you stopped at? Yeah, I said so, didn't I? Yes, you did. Thanks. Here. This will pay you for what's on the meter and for the information. Okay. So long. Find out anything, Nick? That depends, Patsy. Now, Penny, what is the dope you got at the ferry? Well, it's like this, Nick. I found one of the ferry guards who remembered seeing an old guy with big white side whiskers get on the ferry about the time Evans' train must have got in from Chicago, see? Well, this guard got such a kick out of the whiskers that he watched for the old guy to get off the boat at the other side so he could get another gander at him. And did he? Nah, the old guy didn't get off. What? What? Was he sure? Sure. And the old guy wasn't on the boat anywhere. Well, that would sound as if something might have happened to him during that ferry well, ride. Nick. Oh, Alan. Nick, I've got some news. Mr. Evans was alive this morning. Is that so? How do you know? I'll tell you. I went to see Mr. Evans' banker this afternoon to see if he had any word from him. He showed me a check that Mr. Evans had made out this morning. A check for $50,000. Dated this morning? Mm-hmm. Yes. It was made out to John Smith and endorsed by David Winslow. David Winslow? You're sure of that, Ellen? Yes, I'm sure. Why, Nick? Here's why. Last night, a girl who claims to be Alice Evans, but apparently isn't, stops off at Winslow's house on the way to the hotel. Yeah? Mr. Evans disappears last night. And yet a check made out by him this morning turns up endorsed by Winslow himself. Hey... Wait a minute. That does look suspicious. Certainly does. Patsy, tomorrow morning, you and I are going to call on Mr. Winslow. It's very good of you to see me, Mr. Winslow. I'm Nick Carter, the detective. Yes, I've heard of you, Mr. Carter. This is Miss Bowen, my assistant. How do you do, Miss Bowen? Good morning, Mr. Winslow. What can I do for you, Mr. Carter? Mr. Winslow, do you know James Evans? Only very slightly. Are you acquainted with his daughter, Alice? No, Mr. Carter, I'm not. I see. Did a check of Mr. Evans recently pass through your hands? Why, yes, it did. I cashed one of his checks yesterday. Did you know that Mr. Evans disappeared the day before the date on oh, that no, check? I didn't. Well, he did. You don't say. Would you be in a position to know if the signature on the check were a forgery? Well, the signature was genuine, all right. When Mr. Smith presented for payment a check in the amount of $50,000, I naturally sent the check to Mr. Evans' bank for verification. They said it was good, so I paid Smith the money. I see. You said a few moments ago that you didn't know Alice Evans. Yes, I did. But didn't she call here night before last? Why, well, yes, she did. She called to see my daughter. They were classmates at school. My daughter was not at home, so she talked to my wife for a while and left. I thank you for your trouble, Mr. Winslow. Not at all. Come on, Patsy. Time we're running along. Okay, Nick. Good morning, Mr. Winslow. Good morning. Good day, Mr. Winslow. Good day to you, sir. 
Patsy, I'd be tempted to believe what he said, even if I didn't know that he has an excellent reputation in banking circles here in town. Well, what he told us certainly sounded straightforward enough to oh, allow... Hold it, Patsy. Hmm? See that man going in the house next door? Oh, yes. What about him, Nick? I saw that man at court a few weeks ago, charged with murderous assault. What? And now we found him going into the house next door to Winslow's. Patsy, mm -hmm. I want you to get back to the office immediately. Tell Penny to see what he can find out about that house. The address is 832 West 22nd Street. Yes, Nick. I want to know more about that place. Uh, talk plainer, Nick. What did you say that address was? 832 West 22nd Street, Riley. Uh, well, no, Nick. That's a curious thing. Hmm? One of the boys picked up a bum this morning, and when we searched him, we found a slip of paper in his pocket with that same address on it. Swell, Riley. Hold him. I'll be right down. I don't know, I tell you. How many times I got to keep on saying that? You don't know who pushed the man off the ferry, who kidnapped his daughter, where she is now, or anything about it? No, I tell you, no. Who's the girl who's staying at the Hamilton Park Hotel under the name of Evans? Where's the Hamilton Park Hotel? All right, Baker, all right. Guess I must have you all wrong. I'll say you have. You live at 832 West 22nd Street? Well, I don't exactly... No. Who does live there? Oh, how should I know? Where does David Winslow live? Ah, uh, right next... Who's David Winslow? Riley. Yeah, Nick? I'm through with Baker. Not the fellow I thought he was. All right, Baker. The guard's waiting for you just outside the door. He'll take you back to your cell. Okay. I hope you're getting what you're looking for, Carter. Well, Nick, what did you find? Riley, Baker thought he told me nothing. But his answers weren't as clever as he thought they were. Yeah. Actually, he told me that Evans was thrown off the ferry into the river and that he was picked up in a rowboat which was waiting for him. Well... And I also discovered that he knows David Winslow and that he knows what goes on at 832 West 22nd Street. Gee. All of which, while not conclusive evidence, tells me I'm on the right track. Nice going, Nick. Well, what's next? Riley, I want you to release this man, Baker, at once. What? Well, release him, Nick? But, but why? I want to be sure the rest of the gang knows I'm on their trail. The first thing Baker will do when he gets out of here will be to tell them. They'll undoubtedly make some move to try and stop me. And that may bring him out in the open. <laughs> Penny, what'd you find out? Well, I'll tell you, Nick. Whoever's running that gang's keeping it pretty secret. None of my old pals know anything about it. All I could find out is that the address is the hideout of what they call the Secret Six. Yeah? An ex-convict that they call the butler takes care of the place during the day and keeps it cleaned up. That would be the man Patsy and I saw. Well, what about David Winslow? Ah, nobody connects his name with it nowhere. Hmm. You must be extremely clever. Or I'm extremely much of a dope. Ah, you're no dope, Nick. Uh, no. Hey, where's Patsy? She asked me to bring her back some peanuts. Oh, she wants to see that girl who's posing as Alice Evans at her hotel. Hey, wait. I didn't realize it was so late. She should have been back by now. Found this note at her desk when I came in about lunchtime. Yeah. yeah. And dear Nick, girl who calls herself Alice Evans just called to say she had information on her father's disappearance. When I told her you weren't here, she asked me to go over and she'd give it to me and I could get it to you. We'll take a run over to the hotel and see what she wants. See you at the office when I get back, Patsy. And that was almost five hours ago. Say, look, should we go over there and have a look, see? Well, first I'll phone Miss Evans. Hamilton Park Hotel. That's, um, Shermore 32423. Gee, if that bunch of crooks has tried anything on Patsy... Hamilton what? Park Hotel? Good afternoon. Miss Alice Evans, please. Miss Evans, I'll connect you. Thank you. You know, I ain't known Patsy long, but she's a pretty swell kind of dame for... A... I'm sorry, Miss Evans does not answer. Thanks. Nobody home? No, Penny. And I don't like it. I think we better get going and... Wait a minute. Nicholas Carter's office. Nick Carter? Yeah? Who's this? If you want to see your girlfriend Patsy again, Carter, keep out of the Evans case. What do you mean? If you make another move to try and find out what happened to old man Evans or his daughter... You can kiss your girlfriend goodbye. It'll be curtains for her. Hey, but look, Nick. 
Just because the Secret Six meets here doesn't mean that they'll be keeping Patsy a prisoner here. I know that, Penny. But we saw a couple of members of the gang go in here a few minutes ago, didn't we? Yeah, sure we did. Well, if I can't make them tell me what they've done with Patsy, my name isn't Nick Carter. Oh, whatever you say, Nick. You say that man they call the butler is upstairs on the first floor now? Yeah, he's writing in the back parlor. Then let's get into the basement, quick. Oh, but the door's locked, Nick. It's got a special Townsend lock on it. Well, that won't be the first door with a Townsend lock on it. That my little pick lock is opened. There. Quiet now. Wonder where this door goes. Oh, that leads into the basement of the house next door, Nick. Then I'm right. That's the basement of the house where that banker Winslow lives. He is in on this. Hey, Nick, sounds like somebody's coming down here. You're right, Penny. Here, quick. There's a storage closet. Get in here. I'll leave the door open a crack so we can watch him. It's that butler, Penny. You, you're not going to gag me again, are you? That must be old man Evans. Uh, what's that stuff you have there? Now, if you call that food, you can take it away. Penny, Penny. If one of us stands on each side of that door, we can grab the butler when he comes out. But don't let him call out. Those other guys might hear him. Well, whatever you say, Nick. Like this? Go on. Yeah, that's get the out idea. of here. Go on. Get out. Here he comes. Now. Hey. Good. All right. Let's drag him into Evan's room. Here, quick. Now. Shut the door. Okay. <laughs> What's this? What are you doing? You're Mr. Evans, aren't you? Oh, yes, yes, well, I I'm am. the detective, Nick Carter. Well, oh, thank heavens. You know where the other two men are that we saw come in here a little while ago? They're probably in the room where the gang meets at the end of this hallway, Butler! sir. Butler! That's Winslow. Quick, Mr. Evans. Yes? What did this butler's voice sound like? Well, very much like yours, except that he had a kind of dialect, no particular country, just foreign. Butler! Confound How does the butler address you? Winslow? Uh, just Senor Winslow, I, I think, see. sir. Yes, Senor Winslow. You call me? I have called you several times. Where have you been? I've been trying to find something in the back of the storage closet. You wish something, Senor? Yes. When the boys come in for the meeting tonight, tell them not to leave until I get here, no matter what time it is. You understand? But of course. They must not leave until you come. I will tell them. All right, and don't forget... Wait, that was amazing, Mr. Carter. It was almost a perfect imitation. All right, Penny. You better get this butler chap tied up and gagged before he comes to. Well, whatever you say, Nick. Mr. Evans. Yes? You know why you were kidnapped and brought here? Why, yes, Mr. Carter. They want my fortune. I know they've kidnapped my daughter and substituted in her place a girl who looks enough like her to be her double. They plan to have her get possession of everything she can, sir. Then they forced you to write that check for $50,000, didn't they? Yes. But, Mr. Carter, do you know where my daughter is? I'm sorry, Mr. Evans, I don't. But I expect to know very soon. Oh, Come on, Penny. Let's get down the hall and let those thugs tell us where Patsy is. Whatever you say, Nick. What do I do then, boy? Well, I really... Yeah, all right. Hold it, Benny. I'll turn the knob on the door very gently. Then when I give the word, okay, we'll rush him, just in case there may be more than two in there. Whatever you say, Nick. Easy now. Yeah, all right. Right. Get your hands up, all of you. What is it? Nice shooting, Nick. He should have known better than to pull a gun on you. All right, you get up. Get some of your wrists, that's hurt. Come on, get up. Now drop your guns on the floor. Come on, let's have them. Now then. What have you crooks done with my assistant, Patsy? You heard what I said? What have you done with her? We don't know nothing about her. No? Well, maybe you don't know it, mister, but when I get mad, I can be dirty and mean, and somebody gets hurt. Now, where is she? I tell you, we don't know Butler. anything. Butler! It's Winslow again. Penny, keep your gun on these two. If they open their mouths, let them have it and shoot to kill. Butler, why don't you answer me? Pardon, senor. We are having a conference. We did not expect you until later. You are coming in here? I just wanted to tell you that I don't expect to be... Put him up, Mr. Winslow. I'll do the telling from now on. Why, what's the meaning of this, Mr. Carter? You can't... Dis- Shut up. Where's Patsy? Where's who? You heard me. What have you done with my assistant, Patsy Bone? I don't know anything nope. about... Where is she? Oh, no, don't. Where is she? You don't. You'll break my arm. Stop. For the last time, where is she? Oh, stop it. Stop it. I'll tell you. Oh, my arm. Well? Oh, she's upstairs. Second floor back bedroom. Door locked, I suppose. Oh, I'll get her, Nick. Oh. I took the butler's keys away from him. Good boy, Penny. Make it snappy. 
I'll watch these two for a nickel thugs. Yeah, whatever you say, Nick. All right, Winslow. Get over against the wall with the rest of your cheap bums. And if you've hurt one single hair on Patsy's head, you'll be lucky if you live long enough for me to turn you over to the police. She's all right. We did nothing to her at all. Lucky for you. Tell me, Winslow. Why'd you throw Evans off the ferry boat? Wouldn't it have been easier to have kidnapped him someplace else? I had the ferries watched for several days. And found at the time of night, in the bitter cold weather we've been having, the rear deck of the ferry's almost always deserted. So we planned it that way. We had other plans ready in case that didn't work out. Oh, Nick, am I glad to see you. Oh, Patsy, are you all right? Uh, Anybody hurt you? No, Nick. They were a little rough, but they got as good as they gave me. Look at that black eye on the guy on the left. Good for you, Patsy. Ah, uh, hey, Nick. After I got Patsy loose, I looked in some of the other rooms, and I found this dame in the front room up there. Say she's Marion Blake. My name is Marion Blake. You're not Marion Blake. You're Alice Evans. No. No, I'm not Alice Evans. I'm Marion Blake. Aren't you saying that you're Marion Blake because you're afraid the gang will hurt your father if you admit you are really Alice Evans? What? Well, you're quite safe now, Miss Evans. Oh, Mr. Evans. Yes? Will you come in here, please? Why, yes, Mr. Carter. My father here... And free? Yes, Miss Evans. Here he is. Oh, oh Alice, Alice, my dear. Oh, I'd be oh, Penny, so worried about you. You better go get Riley. You You'll right? find him waiting just around the corner. He can Please take over now. Don't tell me where you were. Uh, Mr. Carter, I can never thank you enough for what you've done. We owe you our lives, Alice and I. You don't owe me anything, Mr. Evans. Getting rats like these out of circulation gives me more satisfaction than anything else ever could. This is her room. You two wait here till I call you. Come in. Good morning, Miss Evans. Oh, good morning, Mr. Carter. Have you discovered anything about my father? I was about to ask you the same question. Have you heard from him? No, Mr. Carter. Nothing. Well, let me be the first to bring you the good news. Good news? Yes. Your father has been found. He... He's been found? Yes, he was kidnapped and imprisoned by some crooks who were trying to steal his fortune. Oh, my poor father. Where was he found? In a basement room where the gang was keeping him prisoner. Has he... has he told you what happened to him? Oh, yes. He told us everything. Everything? Oh, by the way, Miss Evans, I brought a friend with me this morning. I thought you might like to meet her. May I ask her in? Yes. Yes, of course. Ellen! Will you bring the young lady in? Okay, Nick. <gasps> Do you recognize this young lady, Miss Evans? All right, Mr. Carter. You can drop that Miss Evans stuff now. I see you know the whole story. Practically the whole story, yes. Oh, Alice, have you met the real Marion Blake? No, I haven't. My goodness, she does look like me, doesn't she? Yes, but she didn't fool me, dear. No, I suppose I was crazy to believe that I could fool a man who was as much in love with you as he is, Miss Evans. Resemblance is certainly close enough to fool almost anyone else, though. Why, she even sounds like me. Miss Blake, whose idea was it to substitute you for Alice Evans? My husband's. He was the head of a Chicago gang. Saw a picture in the paper and the idea came to him. Her coming back from South America seemed to be the ideal setup for carrying out the scheme, so we came east to do it. We knew Winslow from a couple of jobs we did from Chicago. Didn't it occur to your husband that when you threw my father off the ferry, he might get pneumonia in the icy water and die? We didn't worry about that. We knew he'd live long enough for what we wanted. Why, well, you cold blooded Alice, Alice, take it easy. But did you hear what she... That's all over with, dear. The police will take care of her now. I'm not usually bloodthirsty, but I hope she gets the electric chair. Well, the chair is hardly the sentence for attempted extortion, Alice. But by the time she gets out of jail, she'll no longer be young and pretty. And with the marks that prison will leave on her, she'll never again be able to double for you. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called The Substitute Bride or Nick Carter in the Mystery of the Night Ferry. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at this time by WOR Mutual. And now, Nick, what strange adventure are you and Patsy going to tell us about next week? Next week, I want to tell you about a case that never seemed to be twice the same. What do you mean by that, Nick? Well, what Nick means is this. The case started out as a suicide, 
turned into a murder, and then disappeared entirely. And I disappeared with it. Well, all this sounds very screwy to me. Are you sure you're talking about next week's story? Nothing else but. But I'm afraid that if you want any more details, you'll have to listen to the story itself. And if you're wise, you won't miss it. It's one of our best. That it is. But for now, so long, folks. So long. And so long to you both until next week. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week, at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Disappearing Corpse. For Nick Carter and the mystery of the apartment house murder. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Wednesday evening at 8.30 Eastern War Time. This is Mutual. of all manhunters, the detective's ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... Nine hours to live. Or Nick Carter and the Death House Mystery. And now, a late news bulletin. Nine hours from now, at the stroke of midnight... Johnny Waldron, the blonde-faced killer convicted of the murder of Mrs. Cornelius Fielding, will go to the chair. Just 30 minutes ago, the condemned man made a last request. But Johnny Waldron did not ask for a sumptuous last meal in the tradition of the condemned. Nor did he ask to see his nearest and dearest relative, his wife, Laura. No, Johnny Waldron's request was for something much more dramatic. He asked to see the great detective, Nick Carter. Now, just what this last-minute conference means is anybody's guess. Perhaps a reprieve for Waldron. Perhaps a clue as to what happened to the fielding jewels, which up to now have not even been found. At any rate, the master detective, Nick Carter, has consented to talk with Waldron and is probably at this very moment entering Death House Row. Keep tuned to this station for further dramatic developments. He's at number one. We moved him to number one this morning. You see, it's a shorter ways to walk to the chair. Number one. You all ready to go? Yeah, the barber was in and shaved his head and legs about an hour ago. How's you taking it? Oh, there ain't been a peep out of him. Don't want nothing to eat. Don't want a chaplain. Nothing at all. The only request he's made is to see you. <laughs> Funny time to ask to see a detective, huh? Now, if you don't mind my asking, Mr. Carter... What made a big shot like you decide to see him? Well, maybe I'm curious to know what's in his mind. Or maybe I'm just a softie about a fellow who's going to die in a few hours. Oh, I don't believe that you got any sympathy for a criminal. Uh, not you. Not when a man's a killer. Well, here we are. Here's your company, Waldron. Oh, hi. Hello, Waldron. Oh, Mr. Carter. You got five minutes. All right, guard. Well, Johnny? Oh, so you did come. Gosh, I was afraid you wouldn't. Well, I must admit, I was surprised when the warden called me and said you wanted to see me. Yeah, I, I imagine you were. Gee, it was sure nice of you to come. Let's skip the formalities, Johnny. Time's too short for chit-chat. Come to the point. What's on your mind? 
Mr. Carter, you think I'm guilty, don't you? Well, didn't follow your case too closely. But you had a fair trial, and you were found guilty. What would you have me believe? I'd like to have you believe that, that I'm innocent. Pretty late in the game to convince anybody of that, Johnny. Oh, I'm not looking for a last-minute reprieve. That isn't what I asked you to come out here for. When I got word a little while ago that the governor refused my last request for a reprieve, I... Oh, I just made up my mind that I'd only be kidding myself if I hoped any longer. Why did you want to see me, Johnny? Mr. Carter, I know I haven't got a chance. I'm, I'm going to be gone in, in just a few hours now. But I could go a lot easier if, if I thought that, that maybe someday the world would know the truth. They'd know that, that Johnny Waldron was innocent. Johnny, if I thought you were innocent, I'd start the wheels turning right now to get your reprieve. Oh, wait. Let, let me finish, Mr. Carter. I know you don't believe me. Nobody does. I guess I couldn't expect you to believe me after the way things went at the trial. But sitting here in death row, waiting, the idea came to me that, that maybe Nick Carter would show him someday. Of course, I'd be gone, but, well... You see, there's there's Laura, my wife. She's going to keep on living, and and it'll be hard for her. I suppose she believes you're innocent. Oh, she she stuck by me swell. She's she's a wonderful woman, and I don't want the world to look on her as as the widow of a murderer, Mister Carter. All I'm asking is that that after I'm gone, in your spare time, will you try to prove that they executed the wrong man, J just for my wife's sake. Johnny, if you're innocent, who do you think did rob the Fielding safe and kill Mrs. Fielding? I don't know, Mr. Carter. What? There's nobody you even suspect? Well, the only one that... that... No. No, I, I, I'm not going to accuse somebody I'm not sure of. I've only got a few more hours to live, and I, I don't want... If you want... don't want me to do anything for you, Johnny, you better tell me everything you can about this. No. No. You'll find it for yourself once you start looking. <laughs> Well, I've got to have some kind of evidence to go on. I don't have any. Cards were stacked so well against me, but go see Laura. She's never stopped working for me. Maybe she knows more by now. Look here. If that's the case, why haven't you had a lawyer working for you right up to the last minute? Uh, lawyers. I never had that kind of dough. Oh, a couple of shysters came around thinking maybe I had the feeling jewels tucked away someplace. When they found out they weren't going to get a cut, they faded pretty fast. Even if you decide to do anything for me, Mr. Carter, I, I wouldn't be able to pay you for your trouble. You, you'd you have to do it just just as a favor to a dying man. You don't know where the jewels are? Why, no, Mr. Carter. How could I know? I didn't do that job. Look, you, you go see Laura. She'll tell you whatever she can. All right. Time's up, Mr. Carter. All right, Garrett. Well, Johnny, I'll look into your case. I I don't suppose you believe me. <laughs> I bet he's been telling you an innocent man is being sent to the chair, huh? He tells that to everybody. Did it ever occur to you, Guard, that he might be telling the truth? No. Why? Well, so long, no. Johnny. Good luck. Oh, thanks for coming, Mr. Carter. And, and, and thanks for whatever you can do for me, sir. I'd very much like to know what happened to those fielding jewels. Huh? Oh, 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 yes, well... Maybe they'll turn up while you're investigating. Think so? I wonder. Say, guard, uh, how, how long is it until I... Eight hours, Johnny. Just eight hours more. Nick Carter's office. Oh, Patsy, this is Nick. Oh, Nick, thank heaven you called. This place is a madhouse. The office is filled with reporters. The newspaper and broadcasting companies have been telephoning. And the district attorney has been trying to reach you. And what's the trouble? They want to know if you're going to try to get a reprieve for Johnny Waldron. Hmm? The DA said he'd stick around his office all evening. And he's contacted the governor, and he'll be on tap ready. Reprieve? Oh, great heaven, I just talked to the fellow. I don't have any evidence, none whatsoever. What's the matter with the D.A.? Well, when Nick Carter goes to work on a case, even at the zero hour, something usually pops. Well, tell him to hang on to the hats a while. And you, Patsy, go up to the courthouse and get a transcript from the Walden trial. Dig up what you can out of our files about Walden. I'm heading back from state's prison right away. 
Meet you in front of the office. All right, Nick. But we're going to have to work fast. They throw the switch in exactly seven hours and 40 minutes. Waldron was really hired as a chauffeur. It was brought out of the trial that he ingratiated himself with the old lady every chance he got. Oh? You know, Mrs. Fielding was an invalid. Waldron used to carry her up and down stairs and waited on her and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. He was inside the house a great deal. Then, um, let's see now. Oh, the gun was traced to Mrs. Fielding's stepson, Tom Fielding. But the prints on the gun were Waldron's. Her stepson lived there with her? Yes, just the two of them. Mm-hmm. Walden and all the other servants slept out and reported for work in the mornings at 8. When was the body found? On a Thursday night at 10 o'clock, the library of the house. Tom Fielding came home from his club and found her. The safe was open and the jewels and money gone. Of course, any of the servants, as well as Tom Fielding, might have known the combination of the safe. Mrs. Fielding often opened it in front of all of them. The defense harped on that at the trial, but Waldron's prints on the gun and his alibi being so flimsy cooked his goose. I see. See. How did Walden strike you, Nick? Guilty? It's the evidence that tells the tale in any case, Betsy. If we could find the party who has the missing fielding jewels... It would look pretty grim for that party. Yes, it wouldn't look good, that's sure. Oh, Nick, look at the time. Ah, 5.50. In six hours and ten minutes, an innocent man may be electrocuted. Oh, no, Patsy. No innocent man will be electrocuted for a crime he didn't do. Well, my name's Nick Carter. And here's our first stop, Patsy. His old tenement house. Laura Waldron lives here. You're very nice to come to see me, especially today. Mrs. Waldron, this is my assistant, Patsy Bourne. How do you do, Miss Bourne? Hello, Mrs. Waldron. Won't you two sit down? Here, let me dust the chair. Oh, no, no, don't. It's perfectly all right. Since Johnny's been away, I haven't been as good a housekeeper as I used to be. I know heart for it anymore. Mrs. Waldron, I came to see you because... I know you went to see my husband. I heard on the radio. Yes, that's right. But it's too late to get Johnny off, isn't it? Besides, we don't have any money to pay a famous detective. Mrs. Waldron, the only thing Nick Carter ever asks is that justice be done. Now, Mrs. Waldron, tell me about Johnny. His habits, what he likes, what he doesn't like. Johnny's good, Mr. Carter. You see, I know he's innocent. But have you proof, Mrs. Walden? Proof? No. Just my heart tells me he wouldn't kill anybody. But more than that, I know because he was with me at the time the police say she was killed. The prosecution tore his alibi to shreds. Yes, a wife's testimony doesn't count for much in court. Oh, yet how thankful I am that he was with me that night. That I know he's innocent. You understand what I mean, don't you, Miss Bourne? You understand when I say the world can stand against your man if you know he's right and good and true. You... <laughs> Mrs. Waldron, isn't there any way at all it can be proved that your husband was home with you that night? No. No. <laughs> You don't think of providing alibis for staying in your own home. There isn't much I know, but it's ours. Tom Fielding has offered to help me. Now Johnny's going to be... Tom Fielding? You mean the stepson of the woman your husband's convicted of murdering? Yes. In what way is he offered to help you? Money. He knows Johnny isn't a murderer. His testimony in court didn't follow that line, Mrs. Waldron. Of course not. Mr. Feeling had himself to protect. That's right, Nick. Feeling was under suspicion. Just this afternoon, he called me again. And where's the jewels, I said to him. If my Johnny did it, where's the jewels and the money? Would I be begging for work if Johnny had done it? You're working now, Mrs. Walden? Day work. Scrubbing up places where they don't ask too many questions. Oh, but I'd mop the streets of this town from one end to the other every day. Johnny didn't have to die. Oh, don't, Mrs. Waldron. Don't cry, please. Please don't cry. You have to excuse me. Just, uh, I can't stand to think. I, I'm counting the minutes and seconds now. Only a few more hours, Johnny will be gone. 
<coughs> Mrs. Waldron, I'd like to ask you another question. No, all right. Maybe Nick can save your husband yet, you know. Oh, if he only could. There isn't time left for me to chase down every witness and question them. Tell me, Mrs. Walton, whom do you suspect of robbing and murdering your husband's late employer? Who? Oh, Mr. Carter, I have no proof against anyone. I didn't ask if you knew who murdered Mrs. Fielding. I only said, whom do you suspect? But I have no right to suspect him. Right? What do you mean? He's been so kind and offered to help. Tom Fielding. That's who you think did it. Oh, I never dared think it out loud before. He was her stepson, you know, but she loved him like her own. Oh, they had their quarrels. Oh, they were just money, Pat. I'm not saying he did it, only... Only what? You talk to him, Mr. Carter. All right, I will. We'll go right over to the feeling house now. Oh, but you won't find him at home at this hour, Mr. Carter. He's always at the club at this time. I know from when Johnny used to drive for him. That's the old hunt club, isn't it? Yes. The tenth and fifth. Mm-hmm. Come on, Patsy. Let's hurry. Time's precious. Okay. Goodbye and thank you. I'll be right here waiting and praying you find the guilty man in time to save Johnny. <laughs> Nick, there's something puzzling you. What is it? Didn't you think Mrs. Walden's story made sense? Well, it did, and it didn't. But, Nick, doesn't it seem a bit odd for Tom Feeling to offer her money? Yes, if that's true. Well, then her story does make sense. Patsy, it's not what Mrs. Walden said that's bothering me. It's something else. Something else? Well, what is it, Nick? I wish I knew. But there's something about her Something that doesn't fit into the picture. It's in the back of my mind somewhere, but I can't quite get the key to it. Well, if you ask me, Tom Fielding is the one who could straighten out a lot of things. And he's the man we're going to tackle right now. Now, well, this hunt club's pretty swanky, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Uh, good evening, sir. Can I park your car for you? Fancy place. Still has doormen and porters. Oh, I beg your pardon, miss. Uh, ladies aren't permitted in the old hunt club. I'm sorry. Well, that lets you out, Patsy. I guess it does. You better wait for me here. Yes, I guess I'll have to. Oh, Nick. Hmm? It's 8.15. Only three hours and 45 minutes to go until midnight. again, Nick. Fielding wasn't at his club, so he's got to be home here. Uh Uh-uh. Your womanly intuition isn't working right tonight, Betsy. Not a light in the whole house. I don't think anybody's home. Oh, Mr. Fielding, if you only knew how much time we've wasted looking for you. Well, Patsy, maybe we can uncover enough evidence without seeing Mr. Fielding face to face. What are you going to do? A little high-class lockpicking in the interest of Johnny Waldron and his wife, Laura. There we are. All right, come on in. Stay behind me. Gee, it's dark in here. Shut the door and I'll use my flash. Where are we headed for? The library. Oh. That's the room Mrs. Fielding was killed in, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Now, let's see. These old houses, the library is usually back this way, off the center hall. Come on. All right. You think there's anybody beside us in the house? I hope not. Ah, here we are. The door. This must be it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is the library. What are we looking for? Well, right now, I'm looking for Mrs. Fielding's safe. Safe? Mm hmm. Safe. Oh, oh, it, it's behind that portrait up here. That oh. was in the testimony. Yeah, you're right. Thanks, Betsy. Well, turn on that small lamp, will you? Mm-hmm. Take a glance through the papers on the desk while I open this safe. Say. Mrs. Fielding held her son and heir down while she was living. He's certainly making up for it now. Look at that wine cabinet. It's filled to the hilt with pre-war stuff. Oh, and look at this black market stuff. Half a gold-tipped cigarette, Miss Bowen. Yes, thank you. I will. That's a shame on you. How'd you feel if Tom Fielding walked in here right now and caught you swiping his expensive cigarettes? Only one, Nick. 
And for that matter, how would you feel if Mr. Fielding saw you about to open his face? Oh, Nick! Yes? You okay? Yes, I, I guess so. They shot through that window there. And the bullet went right in the side of the desk here. Oh, we better get out of here, Nick. Now, one minute, Patsy. Got to see what's in this safe. It's almost open now. Well, who do you think shot at us, Mr. Fielding? Oh, Patsy, will you pick that bullet out of the desk? It'll be a handy piece of evidence. All right. Say, you're taking this attempt to murder us awful lightly, Nick. I don't think it was murder, Patsy. Not murder? No. You were standing by the wine cabinet, not four feet from the window. And I was a perfect target standing here. No, Betsy, I think you'll find somebody was just trying to scare us away. Oh. Well, I got the bullet out. Looks like a thirty-two. Ah, there we are. Betsy. Yes? Look here. The missing jewels. Oh, Nick. Yes, right here in the safe. Oh, Nick, that's wonderful. Hey, Patsy, what are you doing? Oh, I'm getting the DA on the phone for you. You've got the evidence for Johnny Waldron's reprieve. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know he wasn't guilty, Nick. Mrs. Waldron was telling the truth. Patsy, put down that phone. Yes, Nick. Now, get me police headquarters first. I want a general alarm sent out for Tom Fielding. But Johnny Waldron... I still have two hours, Patsy. If Waldron's innocent, I'll prove it in time to save him from the chair. Why should you want to talk to Mrs. Waldron again when you haven't asked for the reprieve? Only make her feel worse. There's something about her that doesn't add up, Betsy. And I've got to know what it is before I go any further. This is her door, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Nick Carter, your thinking on this case is beyond me. Well, Betsy, it's hard to explain. When I don't know myself what the missing link is, how can I explain it to you? But you found the jewels. Tom Feeling had them in his safe. Why, it's obvious, Nick. He didn't get along with his stepmother, and he... Nick, what are you doing? Going to open Mrs. Walden's door? Oh, no, don't do that, Nick. I'm sure she's here. She's, she's probably been crying and doesn't want to see anybody. Let me call her first. Mrs. Walden? Mrs. Walden? Oh, sorry, Betty. We haven't any time to waste. Now, let's see. Where's the light switch? It's here by the door. Oh, she isn't here. So it seems. Nick. Hmm? Look here. There's a gold-tipped cigarette in this ashtray, the same kind we saw at Fielding's house. Let's have it. Hmm, no lipstick on it. Kind of pinched in here at the end. He's been here. I never would have believed it of him. Believe what? What well, that a man like Fielding would come to a place like this. Why, a man like that wouldn't get his hands dirty putting them on the doorknob of a hovel like this. Say that again, Patsy. What? Well, a man like Feeling wouldn't dirty his hands on the doorknob of a place like... I got it. Patsy, you just gave me the key I've been looking for. Come on. We've got to get back to Feeling's library or there'll be another murder. You know, Patsy, there are times when having a siren on this car comes in handy. And tonight's one of them. Hope we're in time. Do you think the police have picked Fielding up yet, or do you think he'll be at his home? He's at home. I'll bet my bottom dollar on that. Nick, do you know what time it is? Stop worrying about the time and come on. I'm right with you. The place is still dark. There's a little light shining in the hallway. Now, he's here, all right. Watch your step, Betsy. Don't worry about me. I slipped the latch in the front door when we left. Let's see if it's been bolted. No, nope, still open. All right, come on. Where do you think he is? The library, probably. Oh, I hear someone, Nick. Yeah, they're both here. Well, that's Mrs. Walton's voice. Open the door, Nick. Oh, it's locked. I'll try to pick it. Oh, Nick, hurry. I am hurrying. Stay away from me! Help! He's killed her. There. Oh, Mrs. Walton. Oh, thank heaven you came. He was just going to shoot me. I got the gun away from him. And, oh, you I, shot him. Yes, Mr. Carter. But it was self-defense. Anyone can see that. Oh, I'm so sorry for you, Mrs. Walton. It was worth it. It was worth it. Now Johnny will be saved. He won't have to die in the chair. Oh, Nick, you've only got seven minutes to call it. Seven minutes to twelve. Hurry, Mr. Carter. Just a minute. Calm yourself, Mrs. Walton. Here, have a cigarette. A cigarette? All right. May I light it for you? Thanks. Wait a minute till I get my cigarette holder out of my bag. So, you do use a cigarette holder. 
I thought so. <laughs> Nick, the time is getting awfully short for your call to the DA. I'm not going to make that call. Why, Nick, not going to make it? No, Mrs. Waldron. It was a nice frame-up you and your husband tried against Tom Fielding, but it didn't work. Frame-up? Yes, frame-up. You and Johnny staged this whole thing to get him a last-minute reprieve. It was pretty clever, but you made a couple of mistakes. For example, this gold-tipped cigarette butt I found in your apartment tonight. What about it? When I found this butt in your apartment, all pinched in at the end from having been smoked in a holder, I knew you'd lied about not having seen Tom Fielding. These particular cigarettes are made to order for him. I didn't leave it there. I couldn't be sure of that until I found that you used a cigarette holder. Then I knew I was right. You did leave it here. Go on, prove it. Another thing. Patsy, hmm? take a look at Mrs. Walden's hands. My hands? Why, oh, they're beautiful. Beautifully manicured. Exactly. Mrs. Walden, with hands like yours, you don't scrub floors for a living. That dingy apartment of yours is merely a front. Look out, Nick. Gun. Huh? Yes, and I know how to use this gun, too, and I'm going to. Uh, oh! So sorry to hate you, Mrs. Walden. Patsy. Yes? Take a look at Tom Fielding. See if he's still alive. Right, Nick. You haven't got anything on me. You can't get he's me He's still breathing, Nick. Good. Run for an ambulance, quick. Okay. Oh, but Nick, can you prove this charge against Mrs. Walden? Can you be positive she and her husband frame Fielding? Not yet, Patsy, but I'm so sure I'm right that I'll risk my reputation on it. But Nick, as long as there's the slightest doubt about it, shouldn't you call the DA and give Johnny Waldron the benefit of the doubt? No, Patsy. As far as I'm concerned, there's no doubt whatsoever. I'm so sure I'll even risk Johnny's life on it. Nick Carter's office. Oh, yes, Lieutenant. Yes. Yes. It was. He is. Oh, I see. Well, thank you, Lieutenant. Yes, I'll tell Nick. Goodbye. Was that the report from police headquarters, Pansy? Yes, it was Lieutenant Riley. And you were right, Nick. That gun you took from Mrs. Walden was registered in Johnny's name. And she lied about taking the gun away from Fielding and shooting him in self-defense. Fielding's fingerprints weren't on the gun anywhere, but hers were all over it. Did they check with the bullet when you picked out of that desk? The one that was fired at us? Yes, and it came from the same gun. Fine. And what about Fielding? Did Riley say? He's going to live. What's more, he regained consciousness long enough to make a statement. Good. Oh, Nick, that Mrs. Walden was certainly clever. She was planting the jewels in Fielding's safe when he came in the room and caught her. So she... She held him at the point of her gun and knocked him out, bound his wrists and ankles, gagged him, and hid him away in another room. What? How did you know that? Very simple, Betsy. The marks where he'd been tied were still on his wrists when I examined him, and oh. also there was a bump on his head. Nick, you're always holding out on me. And one other thing. What made you think Fielding's life would be in danger way back when we were in Mrs. Walden's apartment the second time? Curious, huh? Well, Patsy, after your inspired remark about hands, I suddenly realized what it was about Mrs. Walden that puzzled me. It was her hands. I knew that with hands like hers, she couldn't be earning her living scrubbing floors. Oh, I see. And if she were lying about that, it was very probable she was lying about everything. And the whole thing was a plot to make Fielding look guilty. But why should that make you suddenly afraid that something might be going to happen to Fielding? Patsy, if she and Johnny were so anxious to get Johnny a reprieve that they were willing to give up the jewels to make it look as if Fielding were really the guilty man, it was entirely possible that she might go further and kill Fielding and try to make it look as if he killed himself. But how would that help Johnny Waldron? Well, if it was done right... It would look as if he were remorseful at having let Johnny take the blame. And she almost got away with it. But she didn't, because Nick arrived in the nick of time. You're a wonderful detective, Mr. Carter. And so, ladies and gentlemen, at midnight last night, Johnny Waldron went to the electric chair to pay for the crime of having murdered Mrs. Cornelius Fielding. His dramatic last-minute attempt to get a reprieve failed, thanks to the quick action of that master detective, Nick Carter. In those few short hours that Carter was actually on the case, he found the missing jewels, uncovered a well-laid plot between Johnny and his wife to pin the murder on Tom Fielding and save Fielding's life. Tom Fielding and the entire community owe a debt of gratitude to Nick Carter. This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at this time by WOR Mutual. Well, Nick, what happens in your next week's story? Well, I want to tell you the story of the time that I quite accidentally stumbled onto a terrible crime. Or to be more correct, 
I stumbled onto evidence that a terrible crime had been committed. That doesn't sound like a very unusual thing for you to do. Except for one little fact, Mr. Ripley. We didn't know where or when the crime had been committed. In spite of the fact that we heard the story of the murder from the victim's own lips. As a matter of fact, we even heard the murder committed. And we were powerless to do anything about it. If you're trying to make me curious about it... We are. You're certainly succeeding. Well, it's as unusual a tale as I've had the pleasure of telling in a long while, I assure you. So, until next week, so long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Conray. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week, at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... Records of Death. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Unclaimed Box. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Saturday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern Wartime. And don't forget that the adventures of Nick's adopted son, Chick Carter, are broadcast over most of these stations Mondays through Fridays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the case of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... The Corpse in the Cab. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Murder in the Park. Taxi? Taxi? Uh, Mr. Ramsey, you are very kind indeed to take such an interest in this uh, problem. My dear fellow, I consider it my civic duty. Uh, taxi! Ah, here's a cab now. Yes. Okay, gents, make it snappy. We're blocking traffic. All right. You get in first. My party, you know, my party. Uh, thank you. Where to, gents? I guess the quickest way to get there is through the park. Yes, drive through the park. I'll tell you where to turn. Okay. I believe it is on West 54th Street. And there's a flag out there. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, driver. Yeah? Uh, do you mind if I shut this glass partition between us? Go right ahead, boss. You're paying the fare. Here, let me do it for you. Uh, well, that's better. Nice winter evening. Stars twinkling. Ought to pick us up for the grim business ahead. Ah, lucky thing I ran into you. Lucky thing. <laughs> yes, indeed, Mr. Ramsey. It seems fate destined me to make your acquaintance this afternoon. Yes, lucky thing. Mr. <laughs> Ramsey. Just my little way of keeping air out of the windpipe. <laughs> Oh, there you are, my dear fellow. <sighs> Mighty lucky thing I ran into you tonight. You gotta help me, Nick. You gotta. They'll slap me and stir. Now take it easy, Shorty. Take it easy. Now, tell me again exactly what happened. Like I said, two guys hail my cab. One of them says to drive through the park. He'll tell me where to turn out. And when you get out of the park? The one guy opens the petition again and says to pull up. He's getting out. 
He tells me to drive the other guy to the precinct police station. And, Nick, if I hadn't looked around when I came to the intersection and seen what I seen, I'd have driven right up to the bull house with a dead body in my cab. Me, Shorty Bentano. You don't remember what the man looked like, Shorty. In the dark? I ain't got cat's eyes, Nick. <laughs> Gee, what's that? You are jumpy. And just Patsy buzzing me in the talkback. Oh. Nick, in the inimitable words of Mr. Winchell, my stomach and my backbone are now a twosome. When do we eat? You'll have to order yourself a sandwich, Patsy. We've got work to do. Work? Tonight? Mm Mm-hmm. And, Patsy, get me a police headquarters. Lieutenant Riley. Okay, Nick. You're going to turn me in, Nick? I thought you'd help me. I am going to help you, Shorty. But the sooner the police know about the murdered man outside in your cab, the better it is for you. You're crazy, Nick. I done time. I ain't got a chance. If the cops find that stiff in my buggy, it's curtains for me. I'm getting out of here. Shorty, sit down there. Nick, they'll give me the hot seat for something I never done. No, they won't, Shorty. Not while my name's Nick Carter. Stand back, stand back. Just a little accident, that's all. Get back on the sidewalk, buddy. Nobody gets through here. Uh, it beats all, Nick. Not one bit of identification on this body. No bullet trace, no knife, no nothing. Well, what did you want the murderer to do, Riley? Leave his calling card? Uh, I'm always getting stuck with one of these dud cases. It takes months to solve them. We don't even know who this tiff is. Now, Riley, flash your light inside here again. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. You see something? I'm just looking. You see, his pockets are turned inside out. Uh, the motive was robbery, all right. No, Riley, I don't think so. Huh? Doesn't look prosperous enough to rob. Ah, Nick, you're always looking for what's not there. That might mean something, too. Huh? Well, Riley, evidently the murderer didn't care to have his victim's identity uncovered too soon. Say, what are you looking at his hands for, Nick? Riley, have your laboratory analyze this white powder under the nail of his right index finger. Well, say, that there is something under his fingernail. Yes. I have an idea. You'll find it's chalk. Chalk? But sure, you're a smart one, Nick. Yeah, with these lily white hands, it... hey, this guy was a pool player, a professional, maybe, huh? Maybe, but don't bank on it. Now, Riley, about Shorty. I'm holding him, Nick. Never fear about that. Now, look, Riley, he's a favorite of me. Don't pull him in yet. Oh, great jumping banshees, Nick. I've got to. Listen, Riley, he had nothing to do with this murder. If he were a party to it, he'd have dumped the body out somewhere, wouldn't he? Well... Well, Certainly he would. Shorty's been on the right side of the fence ever since he got out of the big house. And he's given me a hand on cases from time to time. I know. You owe him a favor, and I owe you a barrel of them. Well, that's about it. Well, okay. I'll shut my eyes for 24 hours. No longer, though, mind you. Thanks, Riley. Uh, Nick, where where are you going? To find a murderer. Boy, this is some buggy you got here, Nick. Four speeds ahead, a siren, two searchlights... Anytime you need a chauffeur regular, I'll hire on. Like driving my car, huh? It's like handling a baby carriage. Uh-oh, we're turning into 54th Street now, Nick. All right, Shorty. Slow down a little. Now, what was it you heard your passenger say? One says the quickest way to get there is through the park. I'll tell you where to turn off. And then the other guy says it's on West 54th Street and there's a flag out. And then the other guy shuts the partition, and I don't hear no more. On 54th Street doesn't run very far here on this side. I don't see nothing on this block. Flags, flags. Usually in public buildings, aren't they? You think maybe this is going to be a clue, Nick? Shorty, everything's a clue when you don't have much to go on. Nick, look. Flagpole. Yeah, very handsome flagpole. Yeah, but it's a police station. A police station? Good. What's good about it? Let's get out of here. You're safe until tomorrow night, Riley. Riley keeps his word. You want I should uh, keep going slow? Nope. I got the first link in our chain. You can put the speed on again. Where to now? To pick up Patsy. I sent her to the Bureau of Missing Persons on 30th Street. Ah, Nick. Another cop house. I don't like them places.
George Day, 2345 Elmhurst Drive, occupation truck driver. When last seen, was wearing gray coveralls. No, he's not the one. Gee, Nick, the guy ain't been missing long enough for anybody to get excited about it. He's only been dead a few hours. I'm playing a hunch, Shorty. Oh. You want me to read the rest of the names on the list, Nick? Wait a minute, Patsy. Hmm? Do you have a school teacher on the list? Yes. How did you know? Never mind. What did it look like? Well, uh, let me see. Um, here. Ivan Johnson, number two, St. Anne's Drive, occupation, professor of ancient history. Good. When last seen, was wearing dark blue overcoat, gray hat, white shirt, blue tie, and always wears... Wears pince nez glasses. Yes. So did our corpse. The glasses were missing at the time, but the bridge of his nose bore prints of them. Boy, I'm glad I'm going straight. Even the dead wake up and talk when Nick Carter gets on the case. Nick, how in the world did you know it would be a school teacher? Well, I didn't for sure. But nose glasses, plus chalk under the nail of the index finger, plus a sensitive face and the general appearance added up to teacher for me when I looked at the corpse. Next, I figured if he were a school teacher, he'd be expected home by five o'clock. His wife or family would be unduly worried if he hadn't showed up by eight or so and would call the missing persons bureau. But who'd want to murder a poor school teacher? One step at a time, Betsy. And we know this much already. Our Mr. Johnson intended going to the 54th Street police station when he and his murderer hailed Shorty's cab. Oh, I see, Nick. Then you think that Professor Johnson was killed because of something he intended to tell the authorities. Mm -hmm. Simple the way he tells it, ain't it? One, two, three. Yes, you're very clever, Mr. Carter. But don't you think maybe his wife could tell us what it was he was going to tell the cops? Perhaps he told her first. Yes, Patsy, that's just what I do think. Uh, what was his address? Mm, just a minute. Oh, yes, here it is. Number two, St. Anne's Drive. Right. Okay, Shorty. Take us to number two, St. Anne's Drive. And hurry. <laughs> Mrs. Johnson, I'm Nick Carter. And this is my assistant, Patsy Bowen. How do you do? How do you do, Mrs. Johnson? Did the police send you, Mr. Carter? Did they find him? Did they find my husband? I'm only here to ask you a few questions concerning your husband. Oh, then they haven't found him. I, uh, I really can't say. Now, tell me, did your husband mention whom he was going to see after school hours today? Ivan always comes right home after his classes. I thought that he might have had some special appointment today. Oh, no, no. Mr. Johnson, how was your husband feeling when he left for school this morning? Oh, he, he was in such a mood this morning... Talked about right and justice until my, my head fairly whirled. You know, he doesn't like to see people cheated, Mr. Carter. Ivan's a very honest person. What do you mean, cheated, Mrs. Johnson? He said he wasn't going to stand by and see the students in his school tricked out of their dimes and quarters. He was going to see right and justice done. The kids are being cheated. Uh, uh, what school is this? Central High School. Ivan is the ancient history professor. He's taught there for 12 years. And where's his office there? Why, he's had the same office all that time. Number 12 on the first floor. I've always been happy about that. It's such a sunny little room. Well, Mrs. Johnson, you've been very helpful. Do you think they'll find him tonight? Do you think something terrible has happened? Why, the police will keep you informed. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Johnson. Try to get some sleep. Oh. Thank you, but I, I, I couldn't. Not till Ivan's home. Safe. But, Nick, I thought you were going to the school where Professor Johnson taught. That's not over here in the West Side Business District. Glad to see you on your toes, Patsy, and working on all four cylinders. Nose to the grindstone, shoulder to the wheel, and all that. I'm proud of you. All right, all right. But what are we doing over here? In just a moment, you'll see for yourself. This is the place, Nick. Right, Shorty. All right, come on, Patsy. Want me to go with you, Nick? No, you stay here and keep your eyes open. Okay, and good luck. Come on, Patsy. We still got a lot to do if we want to keep Shorty out of Lieutenant Riley's foul clutches. I'm glad they didn't lock the front door in this office building tonight. Hey, that's funny. There's no night watchman here. There usually is. Well, Patsy, never look a gift horse in the teeth. No watchman, no trouble. Hey, it's spooky in here. There's one little light in this whole foyer. Wish we'd brought Shorty in with us. He'll do us more good, keeping watch outside. 
You really think this is where Ivan Johnson was this afternoon? Well, we know Shorty picked him up in front of this building. And this is the only office building in this block. All the rest are warehouses. It's pretty deserted, if you ask me. Mm-hmm. And the elevators, of course, have stopped for the night. And this is a ten-story building. Well, Nick, maybe if we look at the directory board, we'll be able to figure out what office Professor Johnson might have visited. Well, that's what I'm hoping. Now, let's see. Ah, there doesn't seem to be a name on this directory that helps us out at all. There isn't, is there? Oh, Nick, what'll we do? Doesn't take much brain work to figure that one. Maybe we can tell if we have a look at the doors of the offices in this building. So, we'll just have to go from office to office. Now, come on, let's start climbing. <laughs> There's nobody on this floor. All doctors and dentist offices. Don't think Johnson's business was with any of them today. Come on, up we go. See anything on this floor, Nick? No, nobody or nothing to interest a school teacher. Nick, I don't think I can make another floor. You've got to, Patsy. We must cover every floor. Well, this is the top. Yeah, and we don't know any more than we did before. Nick, this place is as empty as a number two ration book. We might as well... Shh! What is it? I thought I heard something. Nick, there's someone in that office. Yeah, and yet the lights are out. The name on the door says Gerald Ramsey, promotion counselor. Let's pay him a visit. Stay behind me now, to the left of my flash. All right. <laughs> and who is flashing that pretty light in my office at this time of night? Mr. Ramsey. That's my name. And yours? Nick Carter. Surely you don't mean that you're Nick Carter, the great detective. That's who he is, Mr. Ramsey. Sorry to bother you, Mr. Ramsey, but my assistant and I were just having a look around this building. Oh, well, too bad the fuse is blowing out of my office here. Or you could have a good look. <laughs> who are you after? You don't happen to know of any business in this building that might have dealings with a school teacher, do you? A school teacher? Mm-hmm. Let me see. A school teacher. Why, no, uh, no, if there is, I never heard of it. But then there's such a lot I never heard of. Uh-oh. Oh, you... You knocked over that whole stack of packages. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Ramsey. I, I dropped my handkerchief and I was leaning over to pick it up. Uh, anything breakable in them? Oh, no, 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 it's quite all right. Uh, oh, thank goodness for that. Yes, uh, just some things a friend of mine left here until he came back. Just leave them there, I'll take care of them. No, at least let me pick them up. No, 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 no. Uh, never mind. <laughs> just leave them there, they, uh... They won't mind staying where they are for a while, I'm sure. Well, all right, if you say so. Yes, I do. So you can just run along and continue your search for whatever it was you were looking for. Good evening. Good evening. Now, Patsy, if you're okay, we better be on our way. Sorry we disturbed your uh, reverie, Mr. Ramsey. Reverie? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> really? He was an odd specimen. You think he knows anything, Nick? Well, if he does, he isn't talking. Come on. Oh, gosh, Nick, all that climbing up and downstairs just for nothing. I'm worn out. Maybe it wasn't all for nothing, Patsy. You mean you found a clue somewhere here? I don't mean anything yet. Oh, but Nick... I hope you can still walk well enough to get down the ten flights of stairs ahead of us, Patsy. I don't feel quite like carrying you just now. I guess I can make it under my own power. Where to now? Central High School. Time's a-wasting. And we still haven't uncovered a clue to the murder of the man in Shorty's cab. Gosh, Nick, what do you expect to find in a schoolhouse at this time of night? Clues to Johnson's murder, I hope. Well, it's no use, Nick. The janitor's not here. I'll have one more try. That racket should wake up the ghost of Hamlet. Hmm. No answer. 
So? So Nick Carter's trusty pick lock will do the trick. Mm-hmm. Ooh, it's black as pitch in there. Stay right beside me. Mm, seems to me I heard that one before tonight. And look, Nick. Hmm? I barked my shins in the dark in that, that character's office. And so if you don't mind, this time I'd like to see where I'm going. Okay, Betsy. I'll use my flash and keep it down low. Shin height. No, well, that's better. Now, come on. Better hurry or our friend Shorty's going to be sitting in the clink with a murder rap pinned on him. Okay. And she said his office was on the first floor, didn't she? Mm, yes, number 12. All bright and sunny. Here we are, Nick, number 12. I wish it were bright and sunny in here now. This time we'll just dispense with the formalities of announcing ourselves. Well, the door's open, Nick. Yes, so it is. Come on. Snap on the light, Betsy. Switch is right behind you. Okay. Hey. Well, looks like somebody else has given Mr. Johnson's room a going over. I'm afraid we got here too late. Papers all over the floor, window wide open. What do you suppose they were looking for? Same thing we are, Patsy. Clues. Except for a different reason. You think it was the murderer? Could be. Well. What are you reading, Nick? This poster on the wall here. Oh. A dollar buys a destroyer, high school students. Subscribe just one dollar to the high school victory league and help buy a destroyer. That's the second time tonight I've seen something like that. A do... do... <laughs> Oh, where's my hanky? Need any help? No, I've got one right here in my pocket. There. Hey, wait a minute. Mm. Why'd you get this? What? The sticker that came out of your pocket with a handkerchief. Well, I don't know, Nick. Why? Why? It's got the same legend stamped on it that that poster has. Victory League. Well, so it has. Did you buy this sticker? No, I buy my destroyers by buying war bonds. Well, think, Patsy. Why did you get it? It was in your pocket with your handkerchief. Well, I don't know, Nick. I, I never put anything in this little pocket except my handkerchief. I can swear this stick away. Well, but... See anybody? No. Well, nobody here now. Are you okay, Patsy? Why, well, I guess so. What happened? I just happened to look up in time to see a man poking a gun through the open window. So that's why you pushed me out of the way so fast. Yes, there was no time to be polite. Oh, thanks, Nick. Did you recognize the man at the window? No. Too bad. But he got away. Gee, Nick, you certainly shot that light out fast. Well, if he can't see us, he can't shoot us. A very logical deduction, Mr. Carter. Hey, Patsy. Hmm? Give me that sticker you picked up tonight. You think it means something to this case? You bet I do. I've just remembered where I've seen one like it. Oh, where, Nick? Never mind now. Well, Patsy, this case is beginning to add up. I'm not mistaken, the sticker splits it wide open. Come on. I've got a job for you to do on your own, and right now. That means you've got a job that you're going to do on your own. Right. Now, this is the plan. And if it works, we'll nail our murderer red-handed. Boss, you in here? My dear fellow, you know I'm in here. Did you get the fuse fixed? Yeah, and while I was fixing it, I got something else, too. Come on in, you. Hey, snap on the light and see what I picked up snooping around down the basement of this building. See? Nick Carter. Well, well, well. Mr. Carter, back again. Still looking for the same thing? No, I found what I was looking for. Oh, good. Good. It's very fine. I already lifted his rod, boss. What'll I do with him now? Huh? You've had your chance, my dear fellow. Now it's mine. You know, I have a general impression you men don't like me very well. Oh, sure, Mr. Carter. We love you. But we'll love you a lot better when you don't talk no more. Put very bluntly, Mr. Carter, but that is the idea. Now, Mr. Ramsey, just what do you think I could say that would harm you? Now, don't let him fool you, boss. When I was hiding in the bushes outside the window back there at the schoolhouse, I heard him tell the dame the case was wide open. Shut up, Lefty. Oh, so it was you who took those shots at us through the window. Yeah, and you ain't gonna do nothing about it. Hmm, it was pretty smart, though, figuring out it was Mr. Ramsey what rubbed out the school teacher. You are a complete idiot. Stop that fool tongue of yours. Ah, what's a dip, boss? He ain't gonna live to tell it. Hmm, true. That's true. Yeah, since you know so much already, we have only one recourse, Mr. Carter. 
Give me the gun, Lefty. Here you are, boss. Uh, this one's on me. Just a minute, Ramsey. As long as I'm not going to live to tell it, maybe you'll confirm a deduction I made. Certainly, my dear fellow. A condemned man is always granted one last request. Speak up. This high school victory league's a phony, isn't it? You're playing on the patriotism of school kids to get them to donate their money to build destroyers and planes. But the money never gets any further than your own pocket. Isn't that it? Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. Since you put it bluntly that way, I am forced to admit that you're entirely correct. But may I ask what it was that led you to believe that I was behind the league? Yes. When I was at Professor Johnson's office, I saw a poster on the wall advertising your dirty league. Oh, please, Mr. Carter. I mean just that. Swindling high school students out of their few dollars in the name of a patriotism that you never knew the meaning of is about the lowest form of stealing that I know of. Boy, just let me take a poke <laughs> at him, will you? No, no, no. We can afford to be good-natured. Mr. Carter hasn't much time left, you know. Do go on, Mr. Carter. As I said, I saw the poster on the wall advertising your dirty racket. And then Patsy found one of your stickers in her handkerchief where she'd picked it up off your floor. I recall then seeing that each of the packages she knocked over in here had a sample sticker pasted on it. It was easy enough then to put two and two together and get the required four. It's too bad that your undoubted excellence in mathematics can't save you. And all because one little school teacher suspected his kids were being cheated. Poor Professor Johnson. It is too bad for him that I found him wandering around this building, looking for the offices of the high school victory league. He told me he suspected it was a phony outfit, and he was going to see right and justice done. <laughs> I offered to take him right to the police station, and I did. <laughs> Although I wasn't with him when he got there. <laughs> Very funny. Yes. Hurry up, boss. We got way to do. Yes. Well, Mr. Carter, this is it. <laughs> Blast and banshees, Nick. Don't do this to me again. I tell you, my nerves won't stand it. Oh, what's the matter, Riley? You got your men. They're lying on the ground here, howling like stuck pigs. Yeah, sure, but, but what if I hadn't hit him when he aimed at you, Nick? What if I'd missed? Oh, Nick, your plan worked beautifully. The whole thing. Getting yourself found by Ramsey's henchman and my getting Riley up here to hear the confession and everything. Yeah, Patsy, but, but gee, don't run such a split-second chance of life and death again, Nick. My heart won't stand it. Well, that was worth it. Just to see Ramsey walk into the trap like a bear looking for honey. Hey, Nick. Oh, Shorty, come on in. Take a look at our handiwork. Gee, so that's the bum who tried to frame me to the hot seat. He'll be getting it himself before long, thanks to Nick Carter. Early, I want to tell you something. Of all the criminals I've tracked down, catching Ramsey gave me the most pleasure. A fellow like that, trading on the patriotism of school kids, is about the lowest rat in the world. Why, bad as the Nazis are, a guy like this is worse. You're right, Nick. You said it, Nick. Well, Riley, you've got all the evidence you need. Mm -hmm. The package of posters in the next room, the package of stickers here, and the confession. Right, Nick. We can take over from here. Thanks. Okay, Riley. So long. So long, Nick. So long, Patsy. So long, Lieutenant. Well, Patsy, come on. Chin up. Carry on and all that sort of thing. It's oh. not my chin that's worrying me, Nick. It's having to walk down those ten flights of stairs again. That'll be the fourth trip tonight. Why, Patsy. And at your age, too. Look, Nick, can't we just sit here on the top step for the next six hours? You think you'd be rested enough then to walk down the tent flights? I think that by then the elevators will be running again. And what a wonderful invention the elevator is. This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly each week at this same time by WOR Mutual. Now, tell us a little about next week's story, Nick. Well, next week's story includes rather more adventure than actual detecting. But if Nick hadn't been able to make the first few deductions that really started him off on the right track, there would have been no adventure. And there was adventure and plenty of it. I came nearer to meeting my match when I met Dr. Donaldson than in any other time in my career. This Dr. Donaldson was a specialist in secret and dangerous poisons, and he tried one of them out on Nick. But in the end, I managed to get the better of him and solve a mystery that had the police completely stopped. We call it the empty coffin because it was an empty coffin that gave us the first clue. And it was two different doctors making out two separate death certificates for the same death that led to that first clue. Well, that's enough for now. Join us next week for the story of the empty coffin. So long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. Until next week. 
In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Conry. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. Next week at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Empty Coffin. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Doctor's Poison. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Saturday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern Wartime. And don't forget that the adventures of Nick's adopted son, Chick Carter, are broadcast over most of these stations Mondays through Fridays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective.